couldn't remember when his son died and his reaction to the report of his mishandling of classified documents. Plus, the crucial case at the Supreme Court on whether President Trump can be kicked off the ballot in some states, an indication on how the justices may rule. Extreme weather, the first ever February tornado on record in Wisconsin. The historic conditions fueling the storm and the damage reported overnight. Hailed a hero, the teenager credited with doing the right thing and preventing an alleged mass shooting plot from being carried out at his school, the suspect's text messages revealed. Plus a plane stolen in California where police tracked down the suspect. New this morning, new abuse allegations against former Marvel actor Jonathan Majors as he awaits sentencing in his domestic assault case. In Las Vegas, the big surprise at the pre-Super Bowl activities, the British Royal who shocked the crowd. And later, a back of checks mix, $13, the outcry online over the cost of food at the airport. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Friday morning, everyone. I'm Rhiannon Alley. And I'm Lionel Moyes. In for Andrew, we begin with President Biden firing back against accusations that his memory is so poor he failed to remember when his son died. The accusations came to light in a special counsel report on Biden's handling of classified documents. And last night, in a hastily announced news conference, Biden got emotional addressing those claims about his memory and his record keeping. Hey, President Biden last night angrily defended his ability to do his job after a special counsel investigating his handling of classified documents described his memory as hazy, fuzzy, faulty, and having significant limitations. My memory is not good. My memory is fine. The concerns about Biden's memory intensified after the release of special counsel Robert Hur's report, which found Biden did hold on to classified materials after his time as vice president, some of it top secret. But Hur added the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. I take responsibility for not having seen exactly what my staff was doing. While Biden will not face charges, her describes their interview from October, noting Biden did not remember when his term as vice president either began or ended. Her also writing, Biden would likely present himself to a jury, as he did during our interview of him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I'm well-meaning and I'm an elderly man and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. But Biden seemed to undercut those assurances moments after that comment last night when he misspoke and said Mexico instead of Egypt when talking about Egyptian President El Sisi. The president of Mexico, El Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. But the president lashed out at Hur's assessment of his memory, especially her statement claiming Biden did not remember even within several years when his son Bo died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. I wear since the day he died, every single day, the rosary he got from our lady of Every Memorial Day, we hold a service remembering him, attending by friends and family and the people who loved him. I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away or he passed away. Special Counsel Her, who was appointed by former President Trump, did not release the full transcript of Biden's interview, so some context is unclear. His report quickly came under fire from former President Trump, who faces criminal charges over his mishandling of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. In contrast to Biden, who cooperated with the investigation, Her writes that Trump not only refused to return the documents for many months, but he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. Former President Trump argues his classified documents case should be dropped, calling it a case of selective prosecution. President Biden also made headlines last night with his strongest criticism yet of Israel's actions in Gaza. He said Israel's response to the Hamas evasion has been, quote, over the top. Biden has faced growing protests here at home over civilian deaths in Gaza. And we turn now to the Supreme Court and the historic argument over whether a state can ban former President Trump from their ballot. 
ABC's Ike Ajachi has reaction from the justices. Ike, good morning. Good morning, Rhiannon. The Supreme Court appears unlikely to kick Trump off the ballot in Colorado. Now, back in December, Colorado's top court ruled Trump should not appear on the state's presidential ballot because of his alleged role in the January 6th riot at the Capitol. The Colorado court ar uh, argued Trump violated the 14th Amendment, which prevents people who engaged in insurrection from holding office. But during three hours of arguments yesterday, the Supreme Court justices were highly skeptical of Colorado's decision. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. It doesn't seem like a state call. Uh, I would expect that uh, you know, a goodly number of states will say, uh, whoever the Democratic candidate is, you're off the ballot, and others, uh, the, for the Republican candidate, you're off the ballot, and it'll come down to just a handful of states that are going to decide the presidential election. Now, Trump's team argues the term officer of the United States in the 14th Amendment applies to an appointed official, not the president. A ruling from the Supreme Court is expected within weeks. Lionel? I right, thank you for that update. A major shakeup in the war in Ukraine. President Zelensky has fired his top military commander. He has replaced the officer who led Ukrainian forces since Russia's invasion nearly two years ago. Zelensky's office says Ukraine is facing a severe ammunition shortage with U.S. funding for the war still hung up in Congress. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin is calling for the U.S. to help negotiate a potential end to the war. Police in Northern California have arrested a man. They say stole this, a small plane from an airport near Stanford University. They say he made an emergency landing on a beach about 30 miles away. That is where they took him into custody. There is no word on a motive. Now to Ohio, where a student is being hailed a hero for helping stop a mass shooting at his school. His dad says despite threats on his son's life, his son did the right thing. Here's ABC's Andrea Fujii. This morning, a 15-year-old is credited with helping thwart a school shooting, allegedly plotted by his classmate at this high school in Ohio. That was more important than his life was protecting his classmates. And I could not be more proud of him. And I mean, he's a hero for what he did. Zach Swallen says his son, Boom, wasted no time earlier this week telling him that his classmate had revealed a plan to shoot people at Marymount High School. The swift action was definitely warranted. And I'm grateful that my son reached out. Investigators say that classmate allegedly planned to kill eight students and a teacher. It was an obvious. Um, threat. There was no doubt that this was going to occur. Authorities say text messages revealed the would-be shooter was conspiring with an adult who was out of state. The teen suspect allegedly texting, I need them dead really soon. The adult allegedly responding, I got you, bro. Police say the teen responded, can you do tomorrow? Swallen says his son saw the teen's plan on paper and told him Tuesday. The next day, the teen was arrested and is now accused of a conspiracy to commit aggravated murder. Swallen says the suspect had threatened Boom if he told anyone about the plan. But that didn't stop Boom from doing the right thing. He literally told me that he didn't care if, uh, if he got killed as long as he was able to protect his classmates. Officials say the adult who was texting with the suspect was texting from a Colorado area code. They wouldn't say if that person has been arrested. As for the teen, the prosecutor is asking for him to be tried as an adult. Rhiannon, Lionel. Really scary, Andrea. Thank you for that. It is time now for a look at your Friday weather. Several homes and buildings have been damaged after a tornado near Madison, Wisconsin. That is the state's first ever February tornado on record. Thousands were left in the dark. Record high temperatures helped fuel that storm. The record warmth begins moving out of the upper Midwest today with spring-like temperatures. Those have arrived in the Northeast. They will stick around into the weekend. Elsewhere, high temperatures in the mid-40s in the Pacific Northwest today, 70s on the Gulf Coast, 38 in Salt Lake City, 60 in Phoenix. Coming up, why prescription drugs are often much more expensive in the U.S. compared to other countries. Also ahead, a new proposal to ban laundry detergent pods, and it's because of environmental concerns. And later, the kangaroo on the run in Florida. Whenever news breaks. 
We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Oh, my. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're going to be tuning in for Usher, too. You're going to do it, do it big. Oh, my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there, too. Baby, let me love you Usher down. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey, man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We are back with a new effort to ban laundry detergent pods. New York City's council is considering a bill that would make the pods illegal. Supporters of the ban claim the plastic used in the pods can pollute waterways. But Procter & Gamble, maker of Tide Pods, disputes that, saying federal regulators disagree. The high cost of prescription drugs is an issue that is front and center for so many families. And on Capitol Hill, there was a showdown between drug company executives and lawmakers. Here's ABC's Rena Roy. Pharmaceutical CEOs in the hot seat Thursday testifying before senators about high prescription drug costs in the U.S. Even though the price of Keytruda is one quarter of the price in Japan, does Merck make a profit selling Keytruda in Japan? We do. The heads of Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Bristol-Myers Squibbs getting grilled about why costs are so high, citing research and development while defending the billions paid in dividends to stockholders. Our priority is investing in R&D. We have spent uh, $77 billion since 2016, and yes, we have to pay dividends because it's the only way that the company can remain operational and sustainable. The Senate Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, chaired by Senator Bernie Sanders, hoping to lower costs for Americans. As we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, 10 of the top pharmaceutical companies in America made over $110 billion in profits in 2022. They are doing phenomenally well while Americans cannot afford the cost of the medicine they need. The committee says Johnson & Johnson charges Americans with psoriatic arthritis $79,000 for Stellara, while the same product is about $16,000 in the UK. Similarly, saying Merck charges diabetes patients $6,900 for Genuvia, when that same product can be purchased for $900 in Canada and $200 in France. That unfortunately comes at a fairly significant cost for those patients outside of the U.S. In Canada, patients will wait roughly three and a half to four years to get access to a medicine that is available in the U.S. Some senators also criticizing Congress for failing to act when it comes to lowering costs for Americans. Rhiannon, Lionel. Our thanks to Rena Roy for that. Coming up, the growing battle against dollar stores, why critics want to limit where they can open. Also ahead, new allegations against former Marvel actor Jonathan Majors. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift, you're going to be tuning in for Usher, too. You're going to do it, do it big. Oh, my 
They say uh, Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there too. Usher Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I did, I did, I did, I did. Oh, my God, look. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Two more women are accusing actor Jonathan Majors of abuse as he awaits sentencing for assaulting his ex-girlfriend. Majors' ex-fiance tells the New York Times that he choked her, threw her around, and threatened to kill her. And a woman he dated for two years claims he emotionally abused her. The Times reports Majors is also accused of volatile behavior on the set of Lovecraft Country. Majors' lawyer denies the allegations of physical abuse. We turn now to the increasing presence of dollar stores all across the country. They are known for deep discounts, but critics say there's a downside and they want to limit their growth. This morning, Chicago is the latest city taking steps to rein in dollar stores. Critics claim the stores can be a danger to communities. Their stores are filthy. They don't keep the trash up in front of the communities. The proposal, up for a vote next week, would ban dollar stores owned by the same company from opening within one mile of each other. Dozens of smaller cities and towns in the U.S. have already taken similar steps. The small box retailers have been under fire, accused of violating health and building codes. Stores in Chicago have racked up more than $600,000 in fines since 2017 for everything from overcharging customers and selling tobacco to minors to selling expired infant formula and medicine. Safety, also a concern. Literally, my daughter was asked by her manager to bring her carry and conceal because he did not feel safe. In response, Dollar Tree says it has spent $1.5 million upgrading and repairing stores and boosting staffing levels. It says the Chicago proposal will limit one of the few low-cost, high-value options for essential household goods and force residents to travel further and likely pay higher prices. But some critics argue dollar stores drive out grocery chains, leaving access only to less healthy processed and canned foods. The Chicago proposal would exempt stores from the new restrictions if they dedicate at least 10% of floor space to fresh produce or meat. Coming up, the new honor for Kobe Bryant. We will hear from his widow. Also a big oops at the pre-Super Bowl festivities in Las Vegas. We'll show you what it was, plus a surprise from, yes, Prince Harry.
Tonight, President Biden's handling of classified documents, the special counsel's report, plus the historic Supreme Court ballot case. What happens next? More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Sunday, the legal blockbusters, President Biden and the special counsel report, former President Trump and the Supreme Court hearing. Now, Sunday, all the fallout, the impact on the 2024 race and what happens next for both sides on ABC's This Week. Oh, my. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're going to be tuning in for Usher, too. You're going to do it, do it big. Oh, my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there, too. Baby, let me love you. Usher Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey, man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah. Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from the 2024 campaign trail, I'm Rachel Scott in Des Moines, Iowa. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse. We begin with the NFL's glitzy award show in Las Vegas last night. Yeah, the event included a surprise appearance by Prince Harry, just back from seeing his father in the UK. Harry presented Cam Hayward of the Steelers with the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. Hayward could not believe it. Prince freaking Harry. <laughs> Man, I'm, uh, I'm in shock. That's, that's Prince Harry. So cool. Hayward was recognized for his charity work. Meanwhile, there was a big oops when the Coach of the Year was announced. Take a look. And the AP Coach of the Year presented by Verizon is... Steven Stefanski. <laughs> Kevin Stefanski, sorry. Uh-oh, yes. Kevin Stefanski of the Browns. One coach of the year, the most valuable player, went to Lamar Jackson. The lineup in Las Vegas is stacked with stars. Usher is, of course, the headliner at halftime. Post Malone will sing America the Beautiful before the game. During yesterday's news conference, ABC's Kid Reporter had this question for Post Malone. What is the best advice you ever gotten? I don't know. The best one I got is my dad told me he you'll you'll never make everybody happy. Mm -hmm. So just be yourself and um, just do your best at at you know uh, everything you do and uh, do it your way and do it with love. Great advice. The national anthem will be performed by Reba, who you see sitting right there. Next, an honor for Kobe Bryant. The Lakers unveiled a 19-foot-tall statue outside their arena four years after Kobe and his daughter Gigi died in a chopper crash. His widow says Kobe would be proud. It goes without saying that today is an especially sad day for us since Kobe and Gigi aren't here for what is supposed to be an incredibly joyous moment in Kobe's legacy. Kobe picked the pose you're about to see. So if anyone has any issues with it, tough The statue also features a Kobe quote, leave the game better than you found it. Next, a $13 bag of Chex Mix igniting a firestorm. That was the price at the Las Vegas airport. People on social media have been posting outrage over airport snack prices after a woman shared the price of Chex Mix in three airports, $9.99 at LaGuardia in New York, only $4.76 in Dallas. But $13.29 in Vegas takes the cake. One person saying we have failed as a society. Finally, a wild kangaroo chase. Not in Australia, but in Tampa, hopping around the pool at this apartment complex. They eventually caught it, returning the root to its owner. 
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift, you're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy, you should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you Usher now. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Checking more top stories, President Biden declared last night that his memory is fine, pushing back on the special counsel's report, depicting him as an elderly man with a fuzzy memory who couldn't remember crucial dates. The investigation into Biden's handling of classified documents found he willfully retained and shared some classified information, but concluded that no criminal charges are warranted. The FCC has outlawed robocalls that use voices generated by artificial intelligence. The ruling allows states to take legal action against bad actors during this year's election. New findings from the CDC show that stress is a critical factor driving teens to use drugs and alcohol. Researchers say improving teens' mental health is crucial. Today's weather, spring-like temperatures in the Northeast, the same warmth that fueled a tornado in Wisconsin, rain from Texas to Kentucky, and snow in the Rockies. Finally, from food to family, the Super Bowl is about so much more than just football. Here's Danny New. Heading back to the Super Bowl. All right, the Super Bowl is finally here. One last football game before eternal boredom sets in, and there's a lot on the line. Come Sunday, could we officially have our next football dynasty? If Patrick Mahomes wins, he'd be almost halfway to Tom Brady's unthinkable seven Super Bowls. Looking, looking, throwing in the end zone. If the 49ers triumph on Sunday, San Fran would now be tied for the most Super Bowl titles ever with six. And listen to this. The last time they won in 95, the team's offensive coordinator, Mike Shanahan. One of the team's receivers, Ed McCaffrey. Well, cut. 30, McCaffrey! The Niners star running back is the latter's son, Christian McCaffrey, and their head coach is Mike Shanahan's son, Kyle. If San Francisco prevails, the Shanahans would become the first father-son coaching duo to both win Super Bowls. Just going through that and knowing how your dad is before him, after him, all that stuff, you just, you get the, even though you don't realize you're learning it, but you know, those are your life experiences. You got a very good idea of how it works. Ah! But hey, maybe you're looking to win something yourself. According to the American Gambling Association, a record 67.8 million people are expected to bet on this year's game, wagering a total of more than $23 billion. And if you should win your big bets, maybe you can buy fancy culinary creations like the ones on the menu for the multi-million dollar suites at Allegiant Stadium. This year, we start you off with a little Wagyu loaded hot dogs, then throw in some lobster mac and cheese, stuffed potatoes, and for dessert, we'll cap it off with griddled donuts smothered in ice cream. I mean, I could make it work. There will also apparently be surf and turf nachos combining the Wagyu beef and the lobster on top. Guys, could that work for you? Well, it would work for me, but not for this guy. He's vegan. <laughs> Have a great day. Go Chiefs! Go Chiefs!
Right now on America This Morning, Biden fights back. How in the hell dare he raise that? The president angrily responding to claims that his memory is so bad he couldn't remember when his son died and his reaction to the report of his mishandling of classified documents. Plus the crucial case at the Supreme Court on whether President Trump can be kicked off the ballot in some states, an indication on how the justices may rule. Extreme weather, the first ever February tornado on record in Wisconsin. The historic conditions fueling the storm and the damage reported overnight. Hailed a hero, the teenager credited with doing the right thing and preventing an alleged mass shooting plot from being carried out at his school, the suspect's text messages revealed. Plus a plane stolen in California where police tracked down the suspect. New this morning, new abuse allegations against former Marvel actor Jonathan Majors as he awaits sentencing in his domestic assault case. In Las Vegas, the big surprise at the pre-Super Bowl activities, the British Royal who shocked the crowd. And later, a bag of checks mix, $13, the outcry online over the cost of food at the airport. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Friday morning, everyone. I'm Rhiannon Alley. And I'm Lionel Moyes. In for Andrew, we begin with President Biden firing back against accusations that his memory is so poor he failed to remember when his son died. The accusations came to light in a special counsel report on Biden's handling of classified documents. And last night, in a hastily announced news conference, Biden got emotional addressing those claims about his memory and his record keeping. Everybody. President Biden last night angrily defended his ability to do his job after a special counsel investigating his handling of classified documents described his memory as hazy, fuzzy, faulty, and having significant limitations. My memory is not good. My memory is fine. The concerns about Biden's memory intensified after the release of special counsel Robert Hur's report, which found Biden did hold on to classified materials after his time as vice president, some of it top secret. But Hur added the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. I take responsibility for not having seen exactly what my staff was doing. While Biden will not face charges, her describes their interview from October, noting Biden did not remember when his term as vice president either began or ended. Her also writing, Biden would likely present himself to a jury, as he did during our interview of him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I'm well-meaning and I'm an elderly man and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. But Biden seemed to undercut those assurances moments after that comment last night when he misspoke and said Mexico instead of Egypt when talking about Egyptian President El Sisi. The president of Mexico, El Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. But the president lashed out at Hur's assessment of his memory, especially her statement claiming Biden did not remember even within several years when his son Bo died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. I wear since the day he died, every single day, the rosary he got from our lady of Every Memorial Day, we hold a service remembering him, attending by friends and family and the people who loved him. I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away or passed away. Special Counsel Her, who was appointed by former President Trump, did not release the full transcript of Biden's interview, so some context is unclear. His report quickly came under fire from former President Trump, who faces criminal charges over his mishandling of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. In contrast to Biden, who cooperated with the investigation, Her writes that Trump not only refused to return the documents for many months, but he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. Former President Trump argues his classified documents case should be dropped, calling it a case of selective prosecution. President Biden also made headlines last night with his strongest criticism yet of Israel's actions in Gaza. He said Israel's response to the Hamas evasion has been, quote, over the top, 
Biden has faced growing protests here at home over civilian deaths in Gaza. And we turn now to the Supreme Court and the historic argument over whether a state can ban former President Trump from their ballot. ABC's Ike Ajachi has reaction from the justices. Ike, good morning. Good morning, Rhiannon. The Supreme Court appears unlikely to kick Trump off the ballot in Colorado. Now, back in December, Colorado's top court ruled Trump should not appear on the state's presidential ballot because of his alleged role in the January 6th riot at the Capitol. The Colorado court ar uh, argued Trump violated the 14th Amendment, which prevents people who engaged in insurrection from holding office. But during three hours of arguments yesterday, the Supreme Court justices were highly skeptical of Colorado's decision. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. It doesn't seem like a state call. Uh, I would expect that uh, you know, a goodly number of states will say, uh, whoever the Democratic candidate is, you're off the ballot, and others, uh, the, for the Republican candidate, you're off the ballot, and it'll come down to just a handful of states that are going to decide the presidential election. Now, Trump's team argues the term officer of the United States in the 14th Amendment applies to an appointed official, not the president. A ruling from the Supreme Court is expected within weeks. Lionel? I right, thank you for that update. A major shakeup in the war in Ukraine. President Zelensky has fired his top military commander. He has replaced the officer who led Ukrainian forces since Russia's invasion nearly two years ago. Zelensky's office says Ukraine is facing a severe ammunition shortage with U.S. funding for the war still hung up in Congress. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin is calling for the U.S. to help negotiate a potential end to the war. Police in Northern California have arrested a man. They say stole this, a small plane from an airport near Stanford University. They say he made an emergency landing on a beach about 30 miles away. That is where they took him into custody. There is no word on a motive. Now to Ohio, where a student is being hailed a hero for helping stop a mass shooting at his school. His dad says despite threats on his son's life, his son did the right thing. Here's ABC's Andrea Fujii. This morning, a 15-year-old is credited with helping thwart a school shooting, allegedly plotted by his classmate at this high school in Ohio. That was more important than his life was protecting his classmates. And I could not be more proud of him. And I mean, he's a hero for what he did. Zach Swallen says his son, Boom, wasted no time earlier this week telling him that his classmate had revealed a plan to shoot people at Marymount High School. The swift action was definitely warranted. And I'm grateful that my son reached out. Investigators say that classmate allegedly planned to kill eight students and a teacher. It was an obvious um, threat. There was no doubt that this was going to occur. Authorities say text messages revealed the would-be shooter was conspiring with an adult who was out of state. The teen suspect allegedly texting, I need them dead really soon. The adult allegedly responding, I got you, bro. Police say the teen responded, can you do tomorrow? Swallen says his son saw the teen's plan on paper and told him Tuesday. The next day, the teen was arrested and is now accused of a conspiracy to commit aggravated murder. Swallen says the suspect had threatened Boom if he told anyone about the plan. But that didn't stop Boom from doing the right thing. He literally told me that he didn't care if, uh, if he got killed as long as he was able to protect his classmates. Officials say the adult who was texting with the suspect was texting from a Colorado area code. They wouldn't say if that person has been arrested. As for the teen, the prosecutor is asking for him to be tried as an adult. Rhiannon, Lionel. Really scary, Andrea. Thank you for that. It is time now for a look at your Friday weather. Several homes and buildings have been damaged after a tornado near Madison, Wisconsin. That is the state's first ever February tornado on record. Thousands were left in the dark. Record high temperatures helped fuel that storm. The record warmth begins moving out of the upper Midwest today with spring-like temperatures. Those have arrived in the Northeast. They will stick around into the weekend. Elsewhere, high temperatures in the mid-40s in the Pacific Northwest today, 70s on the Gulf Coast, 38 in Salt Lake City, 60 in Phoenix. Coming up, why prescription drugs are often much more expensive in the U.S. compared to other countries. Also ahead, a new proposal to ban laundry detergent pods, and it's because of environmental concerns. And later, the kangaroo on the run in Florida. Lust, greed, betrayal. 
This is one of the most complex investigations I've ever seen. 2020 true crime. They had gunshot wounds to their heads and torsos. It was hard to believe. We discovered she had a second career as an escort. She had three cameras at her apartment. Did these cameras capture her killer? Sealed with a kill. No one could have fathomed how twisted this story would become. 2020, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. ABC next Thursday night. I was one of nine wives. I had eight mothers, 62 brothers and sisters. I became the 65th wife of Warren Jeffs. I believe that polygamy breeds abuse. We've always been taught law enforcement was out to get us. Back off! While Warren was imprisoned, his power grew. If the law officials doesn't stop Warren, thousands will die. Doomsday Prophet, next Thursday night on ABC. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from Atlanta, I'm Steve Osinsami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We are back with a new effort to ban laundry detergent pods. New York City's council is considering a bill that would make the pods illegal. Supporters of the ban claim the plastic used in the pods can pollute waterways. But Procter & Gamble, maker of Tide Pods, disputes that, saying federal regulators disagree. The high cost of prescription drugs is an issue that is front and center for so many families. And on Capitol Hill, there was a showdown between drug company executives and lawmakers. Here's ABC's Rena Roy. Pharmaceutical CEOs in the hot seat Thursday testifying before senators about high prescription drug costs in the U.S. Even though the price of Keytruda is one quarter of the price in Japan, does Merck make a profit selling Keytruda in Japan? We do. The heads of Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Bristol-Myers Squibb getting grilled about why costs are so high, citing research and development while defending the billions paid in dividends to stockholders. Our priority is investing in R&D. We have spent uh, $77 billion since 2016, and just we have to pay dividends because it's the only way that the company can remain operational and sustainable. The Senate Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, chaired by Senator Bernie Sanders, hoping to lower costs for Americans. As we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, 10 of the top pharmaceutical companies in America made over $110 billion in profits in 2022. They are doing phenomenally well while Americans cannot afford the cost of the medicine they need. The committee says Johnson & Johnson charges Americans with psoriatic arthritis $79,000 for Stellara, while the same product is about $16,000 in the UK. Similarly, saying Merck charges diabetes patients $6,900 for Genuvia, when that same product can be purchased for $900 in Canada and $200 in France. That unfortunately comes at a fairly significant cost for those patients outside of the US. In Canada, patients will wait roughly three and a half to four years to get access to a medicine that is available in the U.S. Some senators also criticizing Congress for failing to act when it comes to lowering costs for Americans. Rhiannon, Lionel. Our thanks to Rena Roy for that. Coming up, the growing battle against dollar stores, why critics want to limit where they can open. Also ahead, new allegations against former Marvel actor Jonathan Majors. 
Tonight, President Biden's handling of classified documents, the special counsel's report, plus the historic Supreme Court ballot case. What happens next? More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Sunday, the legal blockbusters, President Biden and the special counsel report, former President Trump and the Supreme Court hearing. Now, Sunday, all the fallout, the impact on the 2024 race and what happens next for both sides on ABC's This Week. Oh my! Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God! They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there too. Usher Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. (laughs) Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. (laughs) Usher, baby. Yeah. Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Oh, my God! I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Two more women are accusing actor Jonathan Majors of abuse as he awaits sentencing for assaulting his ex-girlfriend. Majors' ex-fiance tells the New York Times that he choked her, threw her around, and threatened to kill her. And a woman he dated for two years claims he emotionally abused her. The Times reports Majors is also accused of volatile behavior on the set of Lovecraft Country. Majors' lawyer denies the allegations of physical abuse. We turn now to the increasing presence of dollar stores all across the country. They are known for deep discounts, but critics say there's a downside and they want to limit their growth. This morning, Chicago is the latest city taking steps to rein in dollar stores. Critics claim the stores can be a danger to communities. Their stores are filthy. They don't keep the trash up in front of the communities. The proposal, up for a vote next week, would ban dollar stores owned by the same company from opening within one mile of each other. Dozens of smaller cities and towns in the U.S. have already taken similar steps. The small box retailers have been under fire, accused of violating health and building codes. Stores in Chicago have racked up more than $600,000 in fines since 2017 for everything from overcharging customers and selling tobacco to minors to selling expired infant formula and medicine. Safety, also a concern. Literally, my daughter was asked by her manager to bring her carry and conceal because he did not feel safe. In response, Dollar Tree says it has spent $1.5 million upgrading and repairing stores and boosting staffing levels. It says the Chicago proposal will limit one of the few low-cost, high-value options for essential household goods and force residents to travel further and likely pay higher prices. But some critics argue dollar stores drive out grocery chains, leaving access only to less healthy processed and canned foods. The Chicago proposal would exempt stores from the new restrictions if they dedicate at least 10% of floor space to fresh produce or meat. Coming up, the new honor for Kobe Bryant. We will hear from his widow. Also a big oops at the pre-Super Bowl festivities in Las Vegas. 
We'll show you what it was, plus a surprise from, yes, Prince Harry. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Sunday, the legal blockbusters, President Biden and the special counsel report, former President Trump and the Supreme Court hearing. Now, Sunday, all the fallout, the impact on the 2024 race, and what happens next for both sides on ABC's This Week. Lust, greed, betrayal. This is one of the most complex investigations I've ever seen. No one could have fathomed how twisted this story would become. Sealed with a kill. 2020, tonight on ABC. Reporting from Manhattan, I'm Diane Macedo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse. We begin with the NFL's glitzy award show in Las Vegas last night. Yeah, the event included a surprise appearance by Prince Harry, just back from seeing his father in the UK. Harry presented Cam Hayward of the Steelers with the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. Hayward could not believe it. Prince freaking Harry. <laughs> Man, I'm, uh, I'm in shock. That's, that's Prince Harry. So cool. Hayward was recognized for his charity work. Meanwhile, there was a big oops when the Coach of the Year was announced. Take a look. And the AP Coach of the Year presented by Verizon is... Steven Stefanski. Kevin. <laughs> Kevin Stefanski, sorry. Uh-oh, yes, Kevin Stefanski of the Browns. One coach of the year, the most valuable player, went to Lamar Jackson. The lineup in Las Vegas is stacked with stars. Usher is, of course, the headliner at halftime. Post Malone will sing America the Beautiful before the game. During yesterday's news conference, ABC's Kid Reporter had this question for Post Malone. What is the best advice you ever gotten? I don't know. The best one I got is my dad told me, he, you'll, you'll never make everybody happy. Mm -hmm. So just be yourself and um, just do your best at, at you know, uh, everything you do and uh, do it your way and do it with love. Great advice. The national anthem will be performed by Reba, who you see sitting right there. Next, an honor for Kobe Bryant. The Lakers unveiled a 19-foot-tall statue outside their arena four years after Kobe and his daughter Gigi died in a chopper crash. His widow says Kobe would be proud. It goes without saying that today is an especially sad day for us since Kobe and Gigi aren't here for what is supposed to be an incredibly joyous moment in Kobe's legacy. Kobe picked the pose you're about to see. So if anyone has any issues with it, tough The statue also features a Kobe quote, leave the game better than you found it. Next, a $13 bag of Chex Mix igniting a firestorm. That was the price at the Las Vegas airport. People on social media have been posting outrage over airport snack prices after a woman shared the price of Chex Mix in three airports, $9.99 at LaGuardia in New York, only $4.76 in Dallas. But $13.29 in Vegas takes the cake. One person saying we have failed as a society. Finally, a wild kangaroo chase. Not in Australia. 
area, but in Tampa, hopping around the pool at this apartment complex, they eventually caught it, returning the root to its owner. Lust, greed, betrayal. This is one of the most complex investigations I've ever seen. 2020 true crime. They had gunshot wounds to their heads and torsos. It was hard to believe. We discovered she had a second career as an escort. She had three cameras at her apartment. Did these cameras capture her killer? Sealed with a kill. No one could have fathomed how twisted this story would become. 2020, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Checking more top stories, President Biden declared last night that his memory is fine, pushing back on the special counsel's report, depicting him as an elderly man with a fuzzy memory who couldn't remember crucial dates. The investigation into Biden's handling of classified documents found he willfully retained and shared some classified information, but concluded that no criminal charges are warranted. The FCC has outlawed robocalls that use voices generated by artificial intelligence. The ruling allows states to take legal action against bad actors during this year's election. New findings from the CDC show that stress is a critical factor driving teens to use drugs and alcohol. Researchers say improving teens' mental health is crucial. Today's weather, spring-like temperatures in the northeast, the same warmth that fueled a tornado in Wisconsin, rain from Texas to Kentucky, and snow in the Rockies. Finally, from food to family, the Super Bowl is about so much more than just football. Here's Danny New. Heading back to the Super Bowl. All right, the Super Bowl is finally here. One last football game before eternal boredom sets in, and there's a lot on the line. Come Sunday, could we officially have our next football dynasty? If Patrick Mahomes wins, he'd be almost halfway to Tom Brady's unthinkable seven Super Bowls. Looking, looking, throwing in the end zone. If the 49ers triumph on Sunday, San Fran would now be tied for the most Super Bowl titles ever with six. And listen to this, the last time they won in 95, the team's offensive coordinator, Mike Shanahan. One of the team's receivers, Ed McCaffrey. Well, cut. 30, McCaffrey! The Niners star running back is the latter's son, Christian McCaffrey, and their head coach is Mike Shanahan's son, Kyle. If San Francisco prevails, the Shanahans would become the first father-son coaching duo to both win Super Bowls. Just going through that and knowing how your dad is before him, after him, all that stuff, you just, you get the, even though you don't realize you're learning it, but you know, those are your life experiences. You got a very good idea of how it works. Ah! But hey, maybe you're looking to win something yourself. According to the American Gambling Association, a record 67.8 million people are expected to bet on this year's game, wagering a total of more than $23 billion. And if you should win your big bets, maybe you can buy fancy culinary creations like the ones on the menu for the multi-million dollar suites at Allegiant Stadium. This year, we start you off with a little Wagyu loaded hot dogs, then throw in some lobster mac and cheese, stuffed potatoes, and for dessert, we'll cap it off with griddled donuts smothered in ice cream. I mean, I could make it work. 
There will also apparently be surf and turf nachos combining the Wagyu beef and the lobster on top. Guys, could that work for you? Well, it would work for me, but not for this guy. He's <laughs> vegan. <laughs> Have a great day. Go Chiefs! Go Chiefs! Right now on America This Morning, Biden fights back. How in the hell dare he raise that? The president angrily responding to claims that his memory is so bad he couldn't remember when his son died and his reaction to the report of his mishandling of classified documents. Plus the crucial case at the Supreme Court on whether President Trump can be kicked off the ballot in some states, an indication on how the justices may rule. Extreme weather, the first ever February tornado on record in Wisconsin. The historic conditions fueling the storm and the damage reported overnight. Hailed a hero, the teenager credited with doing the right thing and preventing an alleged mass shooting plot from being carried out at his school, the suspect's text messages revealed. Plus a plane stolen in California where police tracked down the suspect. New this morning, new abuse allegations against former Marvel actor Jonathan Majors as he awaits sentencing in his domestic assault case. In Las Vegas, the big surprise at the pre-Super Bowl activities, the British royal who shocked the crowd. And later, a bag of Chex Mix, $13, the outcry online over the cost of food at the airport. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Friday morning, everyone. I'm Rhiannon and Allie. And I'm Lionel Moyes. In for Andrew, we begin with President Biden firing back against accusations that his memory is so poor he failed to remember when his son died. The accusations came to light in a special counsel report on Biden's handling of classified documents. And last night, in a hastily announced news conference, Biden got emotional addressing those claims about his memory and his record keeping. Everybody. President Biden last night angrily defended his ability to do his job after a special counsel investigating his handling of classified documents described his memory as hazy, fuzzy, faulty, and having significant limitations. My memory is not good. My memory is fine. The concerns about Biden's memory intensified after the release of special counsel Robert Hur's report, which found Biden did hold on to classified materials after his time as vice president, some of it top secret. But Hur added the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. I take responsibility for not having seen exactly what my staff was doing. While Biden will not face charges, her describes their interview from October, noting Biden did not remember when his term as vice president either began or ended. Her also writing, Biden would likely present himself to a jury, as he did during our interview of him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I'm well-meaning and I'm an elderly man and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. But Biden seemed to undercut those assurances moments after that comment last night when he misspoke and said Mexico instead of Egypt when talking about Egyptian President El Sisi. The president of Mexico, El Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. But the president lashed out at her's assessment of his memory, especially her statement claiming Biden did not remember even within several years when his son Bo died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. I wear since the day he died, every single day, the rosary he got from our lady of Every Memorial Day, we hold a service remembering him, attending by friends and family and the people who loved him. I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away or passed away. Special counsel Her, who was appointed by former President Trump, did not release the full transcript of Biden's interview, so some context is unclear. His report quickly came under fire from former President Trump, who faces criminal charges over his mishandling of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. In contrast to Biden, who cooperated with the investigation, her writes that Trump not only refused to return the documents for many months, but he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. 
Former President Trump argues his classified documents case should be dropped, calling it a case of selective prosecution. President Biden also made headlines last night with his strongest criticism yet of Israel's actions in Gaza. He said Israel's response to the Hamas evasion has been, quote, over the top. Biden has faced growing protests here at home over civilian deaths in Gaza. And we turn now to the Supreme Court and the historic argument over whether a state can ban former President Trump from their ballot. ABC's Ike Ajachi has reaction from the justices. Ike, good morning. Good morning, Rhiannon. The Supreme Court appears unlikely to kick Trump off the ballot in Colorado. Now, back in December, Colorado's top court ruled Trump should not appear on the state's presidential ballot because of his alleged role in the January 6th riot at the Capitol. The Colorado court ar uh, argued Trump violated the 14th Amendment, which prevents people who engaged in insurrection from holding office. But during three hours of arguments yesterday, the Supreme Court justices were highly skeptical of Colorado's decision. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. It doesn't seem like a state call. Uh, I would expect that uh, you know, a goodly number of states will say, uh, whoever the Democratic candidate is, you're off the ballot, and others, uh, the, for the Republican candidate, you're off the ballot, and it'll come down to just a handful of states that are going to decide the presidential election. Now, Trump's team argues the term officer of the United States in the 14th Amendment applies to an appointed official, not the president. A ruling from the Supreme Court is expected within weeks. Lionel? I thank you for that update. A major shakeup in the war in Ukraine. President Zelensky has fired his top military commander. He has replaced the officer who led Ukrainian forces since Russia's invasion nearly two years ago. Zelensky's office says Ukraine is facing a severe ammunition shortage with U.S. funding for the war still hung up in Congress. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin is calling for the U.S. to help negotiate a potential end to the war. Police in Northern California have arrested a man. They say stole this, a small plane from an airport near Stanford University. They say he made an emergency landing on a beach about 30 miles away. That is where they took him into custody. There is no word on a motive. Now to Ohio, where a student is being hailed a hero for helping stop a mass shooting at his school. His dad says despite threats on his son's life, his son did the right thing. Here's ABC's Andrea Fujii. This morning, a 15-year-old is credited with helping thwart a school shooting, allegedly plotted by his classmate at this high school in Ohio. That was more important than his life was protecting his classmates. And I could not be more proud of him. And I mean, he's a hero for what he did. Zach Swallen says his son, Boom, wasted no time earlier this week telling him that his classmate had revealed a plan to shoot people at Marymount High School. The swift action was definitely warranted and I'm grateful that my son reached out. Investigators say that classmate allegedly planned to kill eight students and a teacher. It was an obvious um, threat. There was no doubt that this was going to occur. Authorities say text messages revealed the would-be shooter was conspiring with an adult who was out of state. The teen suspect allegedly texting, I need them dead really soon. The adult allegedly responding, I got you, bro. Police say the teen responded, can you do tomorrow? Swallen says his son saw the teen's plan on paper and told him Tuesday. The next day, the teen was arrested and is now accused of a conspiracy to commit aggravated murder. Swallen says the suspect had threatened Boom if he told anyone about the plan. But that didn't stop Boom from doing the right thing. He literally told me that he didn't care if, uh, if he got killed as long as he was able to protect his classmates. Officials say the adult who was texting with the suspect was texting from a Colorado area code. They wouldn't say if that person has been arrested. As for the teen, the prosecutor is asking for him to be tried as an adult. Rhiannon, Lionel. Really scary, Andrea. Thank you for that. It is time now for a look at your Friday weather. Several homes and buildings have been damaged after a tornado near Madison, Wisconsin. That is the state's first ever February tornado on record. Thousands were left in the dark. Record high temperatures helped fuel that storm. The record warmth begins moving out of the upper Midwest today with spring-like temperatures. Those have arrived in the Northeast. They will stick around into the weekend. Elsewhere, high temperatures in the mid-40s in the Pacific Northwest today. 70s on the Gulf Coast. 38 in Salt Lake City. 60 in Phoenix.
Coming up, why prescription drugs are often much more expensive in the U.S. compared to other countries. Also ahead, a new proposal to ban laundry detergent pods, and it's because of environmental concerns. And later, the kangaroo on the run in Florida. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Oh my. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're going to be tuning in for Usher too. You're going to do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you Usher. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey, man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from the devastating mudslides here in Los Angeles, I'm Jacqueline Lee. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We are back with a new effort to ban laundry detergent pods. New York City's council is considering a bill that would make the pods illegal. Supporters of the ban claim the plastic used in the pods can pollute waterways, but Procter & Gamble, maker of Tide Pods, disputes that, saying federal regulators disagree. The high cost of prescription drugs is an issue that is front and center for so many families. And on Capitol Hill, there was a showdown between drug company executives and lawmakers. Here's ABC's Rena Roy. Pharmaceutical CEOs in the hot seat Thursday testifying before senators about high prescription drug costs in the U.S. Even though the price of Keytruda is one quarter of the price in Japan, does Merck make a profit selling Keytruda in Japan? We do. The heads of Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Bristol-Myers Squibbs getting grilled about why costs are so high, citing research and development while defending the billions paid in dividends to stockholders. Our priority is investing in R&D. We have spent uh, $77 billion since 2016, and yes, we have to pay dividends because it's the only way that the company can remain operational and sustainable. The Senate Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, chaired by Senator Bernie Sanders, hoping to lower costs for Americans. As we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, 10 of the top pharmaceutical companies in America made over $110 billion in profits in 2022. They are doing phenomenally well while Americans cannot afford the cost of the medicine they need. The committee says Johnson & Johnson charges Americans with psoriatic arthritis $79,000 for Stellara, while the same product is about $16,000 in the UK. Similarly, saying Merck charges diabetes patients $6,900 for Genuvia, when that same product can be purchased for $900 in Canada and $200 in France. That, unfortunately, comes at a fairly significant cost for those patients outside of the U.S. In Canada, patients will wait roughly three and a half to four years to get access to a medicine that is available in the U.S. 
Some senators also criticizing Congress for failing to act when it comes to lowering costs for Americans. Rhiannon, Lionel. Our thanks to Rena Roy for that. Coming up, the growing battle against dollar stores. Why critics want to limit where they can open. Also ahead, new allegations against former Marvel actor Jonathan Majors. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're gonna be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are gonna be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I did, I did, I did, I did. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? <laughs> here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Two more women are accusing actor Jonathan Majors of abuse as he awaits sentencing for assaulting his ex-girlfriend. Majors' ex-fiance tells the New York Times that he choked her, threw her around, and threatened to kill her. And a woman he dated for two years claims he emotionally abused her. The Times reports Majors is also accused of volatile behavior on the set of Lovecraft Country. Majors' lawyer denies the allegations of physical abuse. We turn now to the increasing presence of dollar stores all across the country. They are known for deep discounts, but critics say there's a downside and they want to limit their growth. This morning, Chicago is the latest city taking steps to rein in dollar stores. Critics claim the stores can be a danger to communities. Their stores are filthy. They don't keep the trash up in front of the communities. The proposal, up for a vote next week, would ban dollar stores owned by the same company from opening within one mile of each other. Dozens of smaller cities and towns in the U.S. have already taken similar steps. The small box retailers have been under fire, accused of violating health and building codes. Stores in Chicago have racked up more than $600,000 in fines since 2017 for everything from overcharging customers and selling tobacco to minors to selling expired infant formula and medicine. Safety, also a concern. Literally, my daughter was asked by her manager to bring her carry and conceal because he did not feel safe. In response, Dollar Tree says it has spent $1.5 million upgrading and repairing stores and boosting staffing levels. It says the Chicago proposal will limit one of the few low-cost, high-value options for essential household goods and force residents to travel further and likely pay higher prices. 
But some critics argue dollar stores drive out grocery chains, leaving access only to less healthy processed and canned foods. The Chicago proposal would exempt stores from the new restrictions if they dedicate at least 10% of floor space to fresh produce or meat. Coming up, the new honor for Kobe Bryant. We will hear from his widow. Also, a big oops at the pre-Super Bowl festivities in Las Vegas. We'll show you what it was, plus a surprise from, yes, Prince Harry. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Oh, yeah. I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. I've never seen a place like this in my life. Oh my God, look! Wow. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. I'm Rob Marciano reporting from Steamboat, Colorado, where the avalanche danger remains high because of this. It continues to snow here. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse. We begin with the NFL's glitzy award show in Las Vegas last night. Yeah, the event included a surprise appearance by Prince Harry, just back from seeing his father in the UK. Harry presented Cam Hayward of the Steelers with the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. Hayward could not believe it. Prince freaking Harry. <laughs> Man, I'm, uh, I'm just shot. That's, that's Prince Harry. So cool. Hayward was recognized for his charity work. Meanwhile, there was a big oops when the Coach of the Year was announced. Take a look. And the AP Coach of the Year presented by Verizon is... Steven Stefanski. Kevin. <laughs> Kevin Stefanski, sorry. Uh-oh, yes, Kevin Stefanski of the Browns. One coach of the year, the most valuable player, went to Lamar Jackson. The lineup in Las Vegas is stacked with stars. Usher is, of course, the headliner at halftime. Post Malone will sing America the Beautiful before the game. During yesterday's news conference, ABC's Kid Reporter had this question for Post Malone. What is the best advice you ever gotten? I don't know. The best one I got is my dad told me, he, you'll, you'll never make everybody happy. Mm -hmm. So just be yourself and um, just do your best at, at you know, uh, everything you do and uh, do it your way and do it with love. Great advice. The national anthem will be performed by Reba, who you see sitting right there. Next, an honor for Kobe Bryant. The Lakers unveiled a 19-foot-tall statue outside their arena four years after Kobe and his daughter Gigi died in a chopper crash. His widow says Kobe would be proud. It goes without saying that today is an especially sad day for us since Kobe and Gigi aren't here for what is supposed to be an incredibly joyous moment in Kobe's legacy. Kobe picked the pose you're about to see. So if anyone has any issues with it, tough 
The statue also features a Kobe quote, leave the game better than you found it. Next, a $13 bag of Chex Mix igniting a firestorm. That was the price at the Las Vegas airport. People on social media have been posting outrage over airport snack prices after a woman shared the price of Chex Mix in three airports, $9.99 at LaGuardia, New York, only $4.76 in Dallas. But $13.29 in Vegas takes the cake. One person saying we have failed as a society. Finally, a wild kangaroo chase. Not in Australia but in Tampa, hopping around the pool at this apartment complex, they eventually caught it, returning the root to its owner. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're going to be tuning in for Usher, too. You're going to do it, do it big. Oh, my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there, too. Baby, let me love you Usher now. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey, man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Checking more top stories, President Biden declared last night that his memory is fine, pushing back on the special counsel's report, depicting him as an elderly man with a fuzzy memory who couldn't remember crucial dates. The investigation into Biden's handling of classified documents found he willfully retained and shared some classified information, but concluded that no criminal charges are warranted. The FCC has outlawed robocalls that use voices generated by artificial intelligence. The ruling allows states to take legal action against bad actors during this year's election. New findings from the CDC show that stress is a critical factor driving teens to use drugs and alcohol. Researchers say improving teens' mental health is crucial. Today's weather, spring-like temperatures in the Northeast, the same warmth that fueled a tornado in Wisconsin, rain from Texas to Kentucky, and snow in the Rockies. Finally, from food to family, the Super Bowl is about so much more than just football. Here's Danny New. Heading back to the Super Bowl. All right, the Super Bowl is finally here. One last football game before eternal boredom sets in, and there's a lot on the line. Still not telling. Come Sunday, could we officially have our next football dynasty? If Patrick Mahomes wins, he'd be almost halfway to Tom Brady's unthinkable seven Super Bowls. Looking, looking, throwing in the end zone. If the 49ers triumph on Sunday, San Fran would now be tied for the most Super Bowl titles ever with six. And listen to this, the last time they won in 95, the team's offensive coordinator, Mike Shanahan. One of the team's receivers, Ed McCaffrey. Well, cut. 30, McCaffrey! The Niners' star running back is the latter's son, Christian McCaffrey, and their head coach is Mike Shanahan's son, Kyle. If San Francisco prevails, the Shanahans would become the first father-son coaching duo to both win Super Bowls. Just going through that and knowing how your dad is before him, after him, all that stuff, you just, you get the, even though you don't realize you're learning it, but you, those are your life experiences, you got a very good idea of how it works. Ah! 
But hey, maybe you're looking to win something yourself. According to the American Gambling Association, a record 67.8 million people are expected to bet on this year's game, wagering a total of more than $23 billion. And if you should win your big bets, maybe you can buy fancy culinary creations like the ones on the menu for the multi-million dollar suites at Allegiant Stadium. This year, we start you off with a little Wagyu loaded hot dogs, then throw in some lobster mac and cheese stuffed potatoes, and for dessert, we'll cap it off with griddled donuts smothered in ice cream. I mean, I could make it work. There will also apparently be surf and turf nachos combining the Wagyu beef and the lobster on top. Guys, could that work for you? Well, it would work for me, but not for this guy. He's <laughs> vegan. <laughs> Have a great day. Go Chiefs! Go Chiefs! It's Friday, February 9th. Well, everyone's going to remember this. We start here. The special counsel declines to charge President Biden over classified documents, but these allegations could be politically damaging on their own. They have expressed concerns about your age. That is they, your judgment. They, that is your is judgment. judgment. This has sparked a full-fledged controversy over the president's memory overnight. That's one reason that yesterday was good for Donald Trump. Here's another. The argument that he should be kicked off the ballot didn't fare well in front of the justices. The Supreme Court looks poised to add his name back on the ballot in Colorado. And if your kid doesn't like the parent you divorced, could they be taken away from you forever? It's like textbook brainwashing. Lawmakers are taking a closer look at custody rules. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. One of the biggest legal threats to Donald Trump is the fact that for months after he left office, he kept boxes and boxes of classified information at his home at Mar-a-Lago. He maintains these belonged to him, but the FBI, the judicial system, and the law generally all disagree. The big question is whether he acted criminally when trying to hold on to them. However, he's not the only former official to be found with classified documents at his house. We saw it with Hillary Clinton after serving as Secretary of State. We saw it with Mike Pence and Joe Biden after they left the vice presidency. Unlike Trump, no one's alleging these people lied to investigators about the documents. However, Mike Pence had just been out of office for months when he alerted authorities. For Joe Biden, it was apparently years. A special counsel was appointed to look into this, and yesterday, that special counsel turned in his findings. What happened next has opened up new debates, not just about Biden's own actions, but also perhaps his mental acuity. My memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. An absolutely bizarre day in Washington that culminated in angry remarks that could have a real impact on Biden's re-election campaign. Let's go straight to ABC's national correspondent, Stephen Portnoy. Stephen, first of all, can we talk about this special counsel report? What were the takeaways from, the guy's name is Robert Herr. Yeah, Brad, this report was more than a year in the making. Robert Herr is a Republican who previously served as the Trump-appointed U.S. attorney for Maryland. And he dug into the presence of the classified documents at Joe Biden's home in Wilmington, his office here in D.C. at the Penn Biden Center, and at the University of Delaware, where Biden had kept papers from his 36 years in the Senate. And his report finds that Joe Biden had quite a bit of classified materials on hand, mainly from his eight years as vice president. They were in boxes in his garage, his basement, his offices. They were in folders. One of them marked eyes only. And significantly, there were also notebooks, handwritten notes from Biden himself about the period of time in 2009 when he fiercely debated with fellow Obama administration officials about whether the president, Barack Obama, should be sending more troops to Afghanistan. Biden was against that, and he kept these documents and documents around it, as well as his own notes about that period of time. And why would he do that? Well, the Her Report says that Joe Biden worked with a ghostwriter on his 2017 book, Promise Me Dad, and that as he discussed this period of time from 2009 with his ghostwriter, Biden referred to the classified information in those notebooks in his chats with the ghostwriter. The ghostwriter recorded these chats, and at least three times, the Her Report says, the former vice president read aloud from classified material. Joe Biden's conduct in all of this, Brad, is described as willful. Wait, wait, Stephen, that seems like 
a shocker here because the Biden team has always basically said, yeah, we mistakenly packed up some boxes when Biden was leaving the vice presidency. Yeah, some of those boxes had classified documents. And the minute we learned otherwise, we contacted the authorities. Her is what saying Biden knew he had this stuff. Yes. And this report really is damning in that respect. But the reason why Robert Hur is not recommending criminal charges is significant and damning for the president politically, because here's what's behind it. Here's the quote from the report. At trial, Mr. Biden would likely present himself to a jury, as he did during our interview with him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning, elderly man with a poor memory. Wow. Now, Robert Hur says, during his team's talk with the president, which took place over two days at the White House last October, the president at times seemed to forget which years he served as vice president and even which year his son, Bo, died. It's essentially the view that it would be difficult to convict Joe Biden because his memory has faded. By the time he's no longer a sitting president, he'll be well into his 80s. And the, the, uh, the case that Robert Hur makes to his seniors at the Justice Department is that it would just be too difficult to secure a conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, OK, Stephen, but like I remember the investigation in a Hillary Clinton's email back in the day. And people said, listen, if you got charges against somebody, you should announce those charges. Otherwise, generally, law enforcement doesn't go saying stuff that can't be charged. Like you either say you got a case or you don't. How did Biden respond to all these kind of like extra details, these extra allegations? Biden responded forcefully last night, Brad, in an exchange with reporters in the diplomatic reception room of the White House, hastily arranged by the White House. Reporters came in, and the president started by saying that essentially Robert Hur got it all wrong. I've seen the headlines since the report was released about my willful retention of documents. This, these assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. And he specifically said that Hur misread Biden's own handwritten notes about what went on in 2009 vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan and his argument to Obama. The president said he did not share classified information with his ghostwriter, that he could guarantee that he did not. I did not share classified information. I did not share it. With your ghostwriter? With my ghostwriter. I did not. Guarantee you did not. But the special counsel said it. Well, no, he did, did not say that. Okay. I've just got to say it, Brad. That seems to be the president's opinion, his own view of what he had in his documents. What Robert Hur says in his report is that those handwritten notes were taken to the FBI, to the intelligence community. And it was an assessment by the intelligence community, a classification review that determined that what was in those handwritten notes was classified, mm. top secret, at the highest levels. So it seems like it's a difference of opinion. The president very firmly holds that opinion, but it's his opinion versus the U.S. government's opinion. In his description, you are a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I'm well-meaning, and I'm an elderly man, and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president, and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. It's and Biden bad. really got into it with reporters when it came to what Hur said about his memory. Uh, I, I have rarely heard Joe Biden get this fired up, but he was particularly angered over the idea that Robert Hur would say in his report that Biden couldn't remember when his son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. And then there were these real flashes of anger from the president when reporters asked about his mental acuity, asked about his ability to carry forward in this term and the next term. Many American people have been watching and they have expressed concerns about your age. That is they, your judgment. They, that is your is judgment. On the whole, it was a fiery, defiant response, an angry response from the president about this, her report that really does embarrass him. But frankly, Brad, there was a moment as the president was wrapping up his brief exchange with reporters that further embarrassed him. The conduct of the response in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip has been um, over the top. The president stopped to answer one last question about Israel. And in his response, he tried to invoke the name of the president of Egypt, but he said... Initially, the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. Look, Joe Biden is not the first president to get things wrong. 
I talk into microphones every day, and I get things wrong. I, I bet sometimes you do too. Right. But when you are putting yourself forward as president of the United States, when the weight of the world literally is on your shoulders, and when there are questions about whether, as an 81-year-old man, you are going into a decline that is so normal, this is a real political liability. And increasingly, Americans are wondering, not just about Joe Biden personally, but what it means for the country. Hey, and lastly, Stephen, Biden also tried to use this all as an opportunity to draw a bright line between himself and Donald Trump because Donald Trump is under investigation for his handling of classified documents. Will Americans distinguish that line as we move forward from this bizarre back and forth? Well, look, for Trump, for Trump's campaign, for Trump's allies, this whole thing, in addition to being embarrassing for Biden, proves to them that there's a two-tiered system of justice because Trump is being prosecuted for his handling of classified information and Biden would not be under hers recommendation. But remember, and the president himself pointed this out repeatedly yesterday, there are important differences between the two cases. As a special counsel wrote, and I quote, several material distinctions between Mr. Trump's case and Mr. Biden's are clear. And by the way, this is a Republican counsel. Biden's retention of documents, according to her, was willful. But when the investigators came calling, Biden was cooperative. He opened his home to the investigators. He sat for an interview. And it's alleged by federal prosecutors that Donald Trump tried to keep the National Archives and the Justice Department at bay, that he lied to his own attorneys, that he had his staff move classified documents around Mar-a-Lago to hide them, and that he tried to have video evidence of those documents being moved destroyed. So the lack of any evidence of obstruction is another mitigating circumstance that weighs in Biden's favor. Yet yeah, Biden gave the documents back right away is the other difference. I guess the thing I'll always remember about this, Stephen, is that Biden had already responded to this report. Then he went out again last night as if he wanted to kind of go back and forth with reporters again. And he ended up digging perhaps this deeper political hole. And he's not just president, right? He's also running for re-election. He's running to reapply for this job. And now Americans see him getting this stuff wrong as he's trying to make sure they know he's got it right. Stephen Portnoy, big potential day in Washington here for a number of reasons. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Meanwhile, you remember the case out of Colorado, where the state Supreme Court there ruled that the 14th Amendment prohibits Trump from going back on a presidential ballot because of his role in the January 6th attacks on Congress. Well, yesterday, Trump's team went to the U.S. Supreme Court to get him back on the ballot. Kate Shaw is a constitutional law scholar and ABC Supreme Court contributor. Kate, we kind of teed this case up yesterday. How did the justices react to this argument that Trump should be kicked off the ballot somewhere? Um, Trump got a very friendly reception in the Supreme Court, and the argument that he should be kicked off the ballot didn't fare well in front of the justices. It sounds awfully national to me. Um, so whatever means there are to enforce it would suggest that they have to be federal, national means. There was actually a surprising amount of cross-ideological agreement among the justices. They all seemed really concerned about what Colorado had done and what the Supreme Court of Colorado had done here, which was to say Trump can't be on the ticket. And the concern that they were voicing was a really pragmatic one. If we affirmed and we said he was ineligible to be president, yes, maybe some states would say, well, you know, we're going to keep him on the ballot anyway. But I mean, really, it's going to have, as Justice Kagan said, the effect of Colorado deciding. And it's if an true, individual state can throw someone off the ballot, what does that mean for a national election and a president of the whole country? And I'm not exactly sure how they're going to get there, but I feel pretty confident coming out of yesterday's argument that Trump will be back on the Colorado ballot and no serious effort in any other state is going to get much traction. Really? You could hear that just from, from all these justices and their questions to the councils? Absolutely. Sometimes it's hard to read how justices are thinking just from their questions. This wasn't one of those arguments. Mm. It was very, very clear that they were troubled by the notion that a state could do this, and they wanted to find some path to reverse. Do you agree that the state's powers here over its ballot for federal officer election have to come from some constitutional authority? Members of this court have disagreed about that. I'm asking you. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the majority of this court has said that those powers come from Article 2. Interestingly, they weren't really grappling with this core question of whether January 6th or Trump's involvement in it was an insurrection. They were just asking essentially what it would mean, again, on the ground, 
for a system like ours if each state got to decide for itself whether someone was disqualified under the 14th Amendment because Congress hasn't taken any action and so states can't unilaterally do that. I'm just trying to get you to grapple with what some people have seen as the consequences of the argument that you're advancing, which is that there will be conflicts in decisions among the states, that different states will disqualify different candidates. Justice Alito even raised the possibility that, well, if a state like Colorado can kick Trump off the ballot, what if other states can retaliate and kick Biden off the ballot, suggesting that he's ineligible, that maybe something that he did was tantamount to insurrection, and that it would set in motion kind of this tit for tat, or at least it might, that might destabilize our presidential elections broadly. Wow, that's interesting. And again, like they don't even have to rule on whether they think he's an insurrectionist, just whether a state like this can kick him off the ballot. Apparently it looks like they might not. Then they're also going to have to rule on whether the former president is immune from prosecution. We'll see what happens there. Uh, Kate Shaw, thank you so much. Thank you, Brad. It's not uncommon for kids to grow up with separated parents, right? To have one parent with primary custody, another parent who you visit on weekends and holidays. It's also not uncommon to have one of those parents talk about the other one, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes not. And when it's counterproductive, when this is actually turning a kid against one of their parents for no good reason, there's a name for this. It's called alienation. And you can imagine how much this concept gets brought up in family court, in custody battles. Well, this year, there have been more and more calls to end a controversial practice that courts have been using for years that's meant to restore these relationships. I was depressed and suicidal. That's not a happy kid. He wanted a way to get back at me because I'm the one that wanted the divorce. He didn't. I had no friends. I had, I had nobody. It's like textbook brainwashing. Kristen Thorne is an investigative reporter for our affiliate WABC here in New York, and recently she took a deep dive on how these programs affect parents and perhaps more importantly, their children. Kristen, thanks for being with us. I mean, what are these programs? These programs, Brad, are called reunification programs or reunification treatment. Sometimes people use the word camps with them, which is a word that people who support these programs really do not like. But the idea is to allow the child or the children who have been alienated according to if the judge decides that they have been to reconnect with that other parent. Mm. These are the most severe child custody battles that you can imagine. To really get to this level means that there has been an incredible amount of toxicity in these households. Mm. So much so that the judges are like, look, this has gotten so bad that I'm going to put you in one of these treatment programs. Brad, also so you know, there are only a very few of these treatment programs in the country because as you can imagine, this is a very unique treatment. Yeah, how does this work from the kids' perspective? Like, how, how do the kids describe them? So I ended up speaking with a young man. His name is Ashton Goff. You felt safe with your mother? 100%. There was never a time where I never felt safe with my mom. He was living in Delaware at the time. He's 14 years old. But you felt unsafe with your father. Of course, yeah. He, I mean, I, every time I saw him, it was, I would, ha I would have, like, stress-induced heartburn. He kept taking her to court every, you know, two, one year, two years, whatever. And she didn't have the money to fight him. After a judge rules that, yes, this these children or this child needs to be taken away from the alienating parent, which in this case, Ashton's case, was his mother, Kelly. For about a year, I didn't see my dad. Then he got Linda Gottlieb and turning points involved. And our judge thought it was a good idea, I guess. So Ashton and his brother are enrolled in a program called Turning Points for Families, which is based in New York, and it's run by a woman by the name of Linda Gottlieb. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and a licensed clinical social worker by the state of New York. Linda Gottlieb hailed the idea of reunification treatment back in 2014. That's when she testified in front of a Connecticut state committee. If a parent says, I will not participate and facilitate the relationship with the other parent, well, maybe then they shouldn't have physical custody. Ashton told me that himself, his younger brother, his father, his stepmother and her children would all go to Linda Gottlieb's house and talk about memories, that mm. good memories they had as a family before all of this really started. But during this time, Brad, he's not allowed to have any contact with his mother. What were they saying about your mother? 
Well, Gottlieb explained that my mom was alienating us from my dad, and that's bad because my dad's a really good person, and all of my ideas about my dad have been implanted in me by my mom. He's sent away with his younger brother for four days. Linda Gottlieb often recommends that a judge in orders another 90 days. This works in periods of 90 days. Oh, and 90 so, days of no contact with that primary caregiver. 90 days, Brad, without speaking to, communicating, texting the alienating parent, which in Ashton's case was his mother. I mean, it was absolutely terrible. Not only did I not get to see my mom, I couldn't talk to her mom, my grandparents on her side, who I'm very close with. Not only his mother, Brad, anybody connected to his mother. This goes under the... That sounds, like alienate, that sounds alienating in itself, if extended family is a big deal to you. This is what I've said, and I have said this to Linda Gottlieb, and we had some conversations, because I really do not understand how this is not alienating the child from the other parent. But what, I've, what I have learned and what people have explained to me who support these types of programs is this, unfortunately, is the only way that the courts feel that this relationship can be restored with the other parent. We need to treat it like any other case of child abuse. That's removal from the alienating parent because they are abusing the child. So Linda Gottlieb, we gave her many opportunities to talk to us about her program, about Ashton's case. She said that she is not allowed to discuss Ashton's case specifically with us or any other case because of medical privacy laws. But in Ashton's case, he didn't see his mother for more than two years. Two years? How would, wait, how would that fall under the, the 90 days of the program rule? So Brad, here's the thing. If the parent meaning the alienating parent, Ashton's mom in this case, does not follow the rules of Linda Gottlieb's program. The judge orders after Linda Gottlieb recommends that the no contact period keep going and keep going and keep going. She was supposed to write these letters and that they basically admitting to alienating us, which she did, wasn't gonna do. The alienating parent must write an apology letter to the child and to the other parent. And in some cases, the alienating parent has to present this letter in person to the other parent, to the child, and there also must be a witness. She did write the letters, but then um, Gottlieb said that they contained hidden messages and therefore were not good enough and she needed to rewrite them. And she wrote, rewrote them several times, but they were never good enough. In another case, Brad, we have Ariana Jones. My father left, um, literally just dropped us off on my mom's doorstep and just left for a few years. And after a few years, he wanted to come back and that's when the reunification process started. Ariana Jones was uh, 16 when she and her younger brother were enrolled also in Turning Points for Families with Linda Gottlieb. They were living in Florida at the time. And Ariana, same thing. Her father it was considered to be the alienated parent. My brother and I had to go to New York for, I think it was four or five days. Same thing, four-day intervention with Linda Gottlieb. They go back to Florida. And Ariana will tell you, I thought that I was going to go back to my mom. We were initially told that after the program, we might have to stay with my father for a few days, but we would go back to our mom and we'd see our mom again. That turned into a year. And under the rules of the program, the child must not contact the alienating parent. I was already on antidepressants before I left. And I just, I had to keep constantly increasing my dose. Honestly, it was definitely the hardest time of my life. Well, and like you said, like the, these are considered extreme circumstances, right? At least that, that's what the judges have decided, that these are extreme enough to warrant these. But if it's all about child welfare and all about keeping the kid connected to their family, how do the children feel about it now? Like th this has been years now, right? So wh what's the reaction from the kids looking back on it? In Ashton's case, he went back to his mother and has not seen or spoken to his father since. He also has not seen or spoken to his brother in years. And that is very upsetting to him. Ariana Jones also... Uh, ran, you know, at 17, went back to her mom 
and has not spoken to her father. She was required to speak to her father until she was 18. She's now 22, and she has not spoken to her father since she was 18. When you heard that your family was going to become part of the Turning Points program, what was your reaction to that? Uh, relief. I spoke at length with David Jones, Ariana Jones's father, which was really a great opportunity to speak with the alienated parent about his perspective. How did he feel when he was going through all this? At the time, I mean, the kids were made scared of me. I had a strong belief in the court and that honesty would, would prevail. He really felt that Turning Points for Families was a good program. He thought it was effective. The respectful tone of the children, you know, talking to me, not calling me by name, but as a dad. You know, there were good times that we were able to share, um, you know, moments. And it kind of, it was as simple as, you know, laughing at a TV show. But when I asked um, him, what is your relationship like now with your children? He said that his children are 18 years old and he believes that they are living with their mother. Have you talked to them at all since they have now aged out of the program? Um, I, I send them, you know, birthday cards, occasional texts. Uh, and things like that. Well, and obviously, like you spoke to the practitioner who obviously believes in this. I'm sure there's other parents who, who feel like they've reconnected to their families from this. But this idea of, of maybe not using this program has kind of gained traction across the country, right? Can you tell me how, how much sort of bigger this gets? There's a lot of focus on this across the country. There are several programs, as I mentioned, Brad, that deal in this sort of treatment program. In California, for example, though, in October... Governor Gavin Newsom signed a law called Peaky's Law. There is specific language about reunification programs, reunification treatment, and how they should not be allowed in the state of California. Colorado just passed a bill to ban reunification and to mandate training for judges in domestic violence and child abuse. In New York State, there's no state agency that oversees these programs. The judges are making these final decisions. There is a lot of talk about whether these programs are beneficial or hurtful to the children, but it still remains this very murky, these murky waters. All right, Kristen Thorne with our affiliate WABC here in New York. Really great reporting. Thank you so much. Thank you. And one last thing. The Super Bowl kicks off on Sunday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Each team will have 54 people in top physical condition. 53 of them will be players, and one of them will be their mascot. KC Wolf and Sourdough Sam are having their moments. And more and more often, these are universally known characters, which is why ABC's own Ashen Singh has been learning their ways. You've now spent a lot of time around mascot costumes. What does that smell like? Oh, man, that smell is rank, Brad. It's, uh, Recently, Ashen traveled to Indiana, which I did not know is home to the Mascot Hall of Fame. On the walls are the likes of the San Diego Chicken, Mr. Met, Benny the Bull. Harry the Hawk, uh, uh, the Phoenix Suns Gorilla, the San Antonio Spurs Coyote, and, and Rocky the Mountain Lion. If you know any of these names, it's because these big, fluffy characters have become bigger and bigger brands under themselves. They can make as much as $600,000 a year just being a salaried mascot by the team from the team alone. The biggest earner, by current estimates, is Rocky the Mountain Lion, who prowls the sidelines of Denver Nugget scams. Super mascot Rocky is going to be attempting his world-famous ladder shot. Once you add your salary to paid appearances outside the arena, some of these guys pull in more than a million a year. Most mascots make far, far less, which is why across the country, lesser known performers are trying to level up. So Dave Raymond, who's considered the OG uh, and godfather uh, of the mascot world, hosts this mascot boot camp at the Mascot Hall of Fame in Indiana. That's right, a weekend devoted to the art of mascotting. I know what you're wondering, and yes, Ashen enrolled himself. And you went to this? Went to the mascot boot camp, got put in a suit myself, not a traditional mascot suit. Dave brings uh, these blue kind of bubble suits for, for people who may not have their own costumes. You got the generic, you got the training wheels. I get the generic mascot costume and I was put through the ringer, man. Hands in the face, sitting around the circle. Up in the air, hey. No, 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 we oh, got no, the... Right. Yeah. This is tough. Yeah, this is the hot. 
This is where you realize how much goes into the modern mascot game. Years ago, mascots walked around and waved. Then in the 1970s, Dave Raymond came up with a new mascot, the Philly Fanatic. You guessed it, the Philly Fanatic has found George's box. <laughs> He's over having a little fun. And that's oh. Eddie, Eddie the driver. Oh, Eddie. Drives Mr. Steinbrenner around. <laughs> Look, he gets a head full of popcorn. The Fanatic is, well, who can really say what he is? He's like a huge fuzzy green monster who gets in a dance contest with fans, who gets in a staged fight with opposing players. The Fanatic became a show unto himself. People kept coming back, but it wasn't just for the Phillies. They were coming back for the Fanatic. Raymond went on to create a new mascot for the Philadelphia Flyers across town. This was the bright orange googly-eyed furball named Gritty, who's become an instant icon. Hanging out with Gritty, I felt like I was meeting the Pope, man. See, I heard that you actually came into the game with a little bit of a chip on your shoulder because of how people treated you when you started out. Is that true? On a given night, Gritty might pull a prank, film a TikTok, and throw a football 40 yards. He can do it all, which is why Raymond's classes are part stunt work, part clown school, and part business seminar. You start with an authentic story, and it's got to combine all of the things that are good about you. Nowadays, just like in sports, there is a pipeline for mascot talent, from the amateur ranks to college to the big leagues. We met a 17-year-old kid named Justin, who is mini thunder for a minor league baseball team, and he's just 17 years old, man, and he's got real big league mascot dreams. But the key to mascotting will forever be crowd work, and that's tough to teach. I had to sneak to him that I'm from Boston. Before you know it, I'm getting thrown in the closet by Gritty. Gritty literally grabs him by his hoodie and throws him out. Luckily, Ashen says, he wasn't expecting to become a celebrity mascot because just like me, he likes talking too much. All right, go sourdough Sam, go Niners. You can tell I'm not unbiased on this. Start Here is produced by Kelly Therese, Jen Newman, Brenda Salinas Baker, Vika Aronson, Cameron Chertavian, Anthony Ali, Mara Milwaukee, and Tara Gimble. Ariel Chester is our social media producer. Josh Cohen is director of podcast programming. I'm our managing editor. Laura Mayer is our executive producer. Thanks to Lakia Brown, John Newman, and Liz Alessi. Special thanks this week to Chris Berry, Josh Margolin, and John Parkinson. I'm Brad Milkey. See you next week. Tuning in for Taylor Swift, you're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my god. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you. Usher Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. Right now on America This Morning, Biden fights back. How in the hell dare he raise that? The president angrily responding to claims that his memory is so bad he couldn't remember when his son died and his reaction to the report of his mishandling of classified documents. Plus the crucial case at the Supreme Court on whether President Trump can be kicked off the ballot in some states, an indication on how the justices may rule. Extreme weather, the first ever February tornado on record in Wisconsin. The historic conditions fueling the storm and the damage reported overnight. Hailed a hero, the teenager credited with doing the right thing and preventing an alleged mass shooting plot from being carried out at his school. The suspect's text messages revealed. Plus a plane stolen in California where police tracked down the suspect. New this morning, new abuse allegations against former Marvel actor Jonathan Majors as he awaits sentencing in his domestic assault case. In Las Vegas, the big surprise at the pre-Super Bowl activities, the British royal who shocked the crowd. And later, a bag of checks mix, $13, the outcry online over the cost of food at the airport. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning.
Good Friday morning, everyone. I'm Rian and Ali. And I'm Lionel Moyes. In for Andrew, we begin with President Biden firing back against accusations that his memory is so poor he failed to remember when his son died. The accusations came to light in a special counsel report on Biden's handling of classified documents. And last night, in a hastily announced news conference, Biden got emotional addressing those claims about his memory and his record keeping. Hey, President Biden last night angrily defended his ability to do his job after a special counsel investigating his handling of classified documents described his memory as hazy, fuzzy, faulty, and having significant limitations. My memory is not good. My memory is fine. The concerns about Biden's memory intensified after the release of special counsel Robert Hur's report, which found Biden did hold on to classified materials after his time as vice president some of it top secret. But her added the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. I take responsibility for not having seen exactly what my staff was doing. While Biden will not face charges, her describes their interview from October, noting Biden did not remember when his term as vice president either began or ended. Her also writing, Biden would likely present himself to a jury as he did during our interview of him as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I'm well-meaning and I'm an elderly man and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. But Biden seemed to undercut those assurances moments after that comment last night when he misspoke and said Mexico instead of Egypt when talking about Egyptian President El Sisi. The president of Mexico, El Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. But the president lashed out at her's assessment of his memory, especially her statement claiming Biden did not remember even within several years when his son Bo died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. I wear since the day he died, every single day, the rosary he got from our lady of... Every Memorial Day, we hold a service remembering him, attending by friends and family and the people who loved him. I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away or passed away. Special Counsel Her, who was appointed by former President Trump, did not release the full transcript of Biden's interview, so some context is unclear. His report quickly came under fire from former President Trump, who faces criminal charges over his mishandling of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. In contrast to Biden, who cooperated with the investigation, Her writes that Trump not only refused to return the documents for many months, but he also obstructed Instructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. Former President Trump argues his classified documents case should be dropped, calling it a case of selective prosecution. President Biden also made headlines last night with his strongest criticism yet of Israel's actions in Gaza. He said Israel's response to the Hamas evasion has been, quote, over the top. Biden has faced growing protests here at home over civilian deaths in Gaza. And we turn now to the Supreme Court and the historic argument over whether a state can ban former President Trump from their ballot. ABC's Ike Ajachi has reaction from the justices. Ike, good morning. Good morning, Rhiannon. The Supreme Court appears unlikely to kick Trump off the ballot in Colorado. Now, back in December, Colorado's top court ruled Trump should not appear on the state's presidential ballot because of his alleged role in the January 6th riot at the Capitol. The Colorado court ar uh, argued Trump violated the 14th Amendment, which prevents people who engaged in insurrection from holding office. But during three hours of arguments yesterday, the Supreme Court justices were highly skeptical of Colorado's decision. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. It doesn't seem like a state call. Uh, I would expect <laughs> that uh, you know, a goodly number of states will say, uh, whoever the Democratic candidate is, you're off the ballot, and others, uh, the, for the Republican candidate, you're off the ballot. And it'll come down to just a handful of states that are going to decide the presidential election. Now, Trump's team argues the term officer of the United States in the 14th Amendment applies to an appointed official, not the president. A ruling from the Supreme Court is expected within weeks. Lionel? 
All right, thank you for that update. A major shakeup in the war in Ukraine. President Zelensky has fired his top military commander. He has replaced the officer who led Ukrainian forces since Russia's invasion nearly two years ago. Zelensky's office says Ukraine is facing a severe ammunition shortage with U.S. funding for the war still hung up in Congress. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin is calling for the U.S. to help negotiate a potential end to the war. Police in Northern California have arrested a man. They say stole this, a small plane from an airport near Stanford University. They say he made an emergency landing on a beach about 30 miles away. That is where they took him into custody. There is no word on a motive. Now to Ohio, where a student is being hailed a hero for helping stop a mass shooting at his school. His dad says despite threats on his son's life, his son did the right thing. Here's ABC's Andrea Fujii. This morning, a 15-year-old is credited with helping thwart a school shooting, allegedly plotted by his classmate at this high school in Ohio. That was more important than his life was protecting his classmates. And I could not be more proud of him. And I mean, he's a hero for what he did. Zach Swallen says his son, Boom, wasted no time earlier this week telling him that his classmate had revealed a plan to shoot people at Marymount High School. The swift action was definitely warranted. And I'm grateful that my son reached out. Investigators say that classmate allegedly planned to kill eight students and a teacher. It was an obvious um, threat. There was no doubt that this was going to occur. Authorities say text messages revealed the would-be shooter was conspiring with an adult who was out of state. The teen suspect allegedly texting, I need them dead really soon. The adult allegedly responding, I got you, bro. Police say the teen responded, can you do tomorrow? Swallen says his son saw the teen's plan on paper and told him Tuesday. The next day, the teen was arrested and is now accused of a conspiracy to commit aggravated murder. Swallen says the suspect had threatened Boom if he told anyone about the plan. But that didn't stop Boom from doing the right thing. He literally told me that he didn't care if, uh, if he got killed as long as he was able to protect his classmates. Officials say the adult who was texting with the suspect was texting from a Colorado area code. They wouldn't say if that person has been arrested. As for the teen, the prosecutor is asking for him to be tried as an adult. Rhiannon, Lionel. Really scary, Andrea. Thank you for that. It is time now for a look at your Friday weather. Several homes and buildings have been damaged after a tornado near Madison, Wisconsin. That is the state's first ever February tornado on record. Thousands were left in the dark. Record high temperatures helped fuel that storm. The record warmth begins moving out of the upper Midwest today with spring-like temperatures. Those have arrived in the Northeast. They will stick around into the weekend. Elsewhere, high temperatures in the mid-40s in the Pacific Northwest today, 70s on the Gulf Coast, 38 in Salt Lake City, 60 in Phoenix. Coming up, why prescription drugs are often much more expensive in the U.S. compared to other countries. Also ahead, a new proposal to ban laundry detergent pods, and it's because of environmental concerns. And later, the kangaroo on the run in Florida. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Oh my. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're going to be tuning in for Usher too. You're going to do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you now. Usher. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless.
necklace. Hey, man, that's what I do. It's Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. We are back with a new effort to ban laundry detergent pods. New York City's council is considering a bill that would make the pods illegal. Supporters of the ban claim the plastic used in the pods can pollute waterways, but Procter & Gamble, maker of Tide Pods, disputes that, saying federal regulators disagree. The high cost of prescription drugs is an issue that is front and center for so many families. And on Capitol Hill, there was a showdown between drug company executives and lawmakers. Here's ABC's Rena Roy. Pharmaceutical CEOs in the hot seat Thursday testifying before senators about high prescription drug costs in the U.S. Even though the price of Keytruda is one quarter of the price in Japan, does Merck make a profit selling Keytruda in Japan? We do. The heads of Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Bristol-Myers Squibbs getting grilled about why costs are so high, citing research and development while defending the billions paid in dividends to stockholders. Our priority is investing in R&D. We have spent uh, $77 billion since 2016, and just we have to pay dividends because it's the only way that the company can remain operational and sustainable. The Senate Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, chaired by Senator Bernie Sanders, hoping to lower costs for Americans. As we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, 10 of the top pharmaceutical companies in America made over $110 billion in profits in 2022. They are doing phenomenally well while Americans cannot afford the cost of the medicine they need. The committee says Johnson & Johnson charges Americans with psoriatic arthritis $79,000 for Stellara, while the same product is about $16,000 in the UK. Similarly, saying Merck charges diabetes patients $6,900 for Genuvia, when that same product can be purchased for $900 in Canada and $200 in France. That unfortunately comes at a fairly significant cost for those patients outside of the U.S. In Canada, patients will wait roughly three and a half to four years to get access to a medicine that is available in the U.S. Some senators also criticizing Congress for failing to act when it comes to lowering costs for Americans. Rhiannon, Lionel. Our thanks to Rita Roy for that. Coming up, the growing battle against dollar stores, why critics want to limit where they can open. Also ahead, new allegations against former Marvel actor Jonathan Majors. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Oh, my God. Oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh, are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamal Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. 
Two more women are accusing actor Jonathan Majors of abuse as he awaits sentencing for assaulting his ex-girlfriend. Majors' ex-fiance tells the New York Times that he choked her, threw her around, and threatened to kill her. And a woman he dated for two years claims he emotionally abused her. The Times reports Majors is also accused of volatile behavior on the set of Lovecraft Country. Majors' lawyer denies the allegations of physical abuse. We turn now to the increasing presence of dollar stores all across the country. They are known for deep discounts, but critics say there's a downside and they want to limit their growth. This morning, Chicago is the latest city taking steps to rein in dollar stores. Critics claim the stores can be a danger to communities. Their stores are filthy. They don't keep the trash up in front of the communities. The proposal, up for a vote next week, would ban dollar stores owned by the same company from opening within one mile of each other. Dozens of smaller cities and towns in the U.S. have already taken similar steps. The small box retailers have been under fire, accused of violating health and building codes. Stores in Chicago have racked up more than $600,000 in fines since 2017 for everything from overcharging customers and selling tobacco to minors to selling expired infant formula and medicine. Safety, also a concern. Literally, my daughter was asked by her manager to bring her carry and conceal because he did not feel safe. In response, Dollar Tree says it has spent $1.5 million upgrading and repairing stores and boosting staffing levels. It says the Chicago proposal will limit one of the few low-cost, high-value options for essential household goods and force residents to travel further and likely pay higher prices. But some critics argue dollar stores drive out grocery chains, leaving access only to less healthy processed and canned foods. The Chicago proposal would exempt stores from the new restrictions if they dedicate at least 10% of floor space to fresh produce or meat. Coming up, the new honor for Kobe Bryant. We will hear from his widow. Also a big oops at the pre-Super Bowl festivities in Las Vegas. We'll show you what it was, plus a surprise from, yes, Prince Harry. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? <laughs> I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. I've never seen a place like this in my life. Oh, my God, look! Wow. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse. We begin with the NFL's glitzy award show in Las Vegas last night. Yeah, the event included a surprise appearance by Prince Harry, just back from seeing his father in the UK. Harry presented Cam Hayward of the Steelers with the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. Hayward could not believe it. Prince freaking Harry. <laughs> Man, I'm, uh, I'm just shot. That's, that's Prince Harry. So cool. Hayward was recognized for his charity work. Meanwhile, there was a big oops when the Coach of the Year was announced. Take a look. And the AP Coach of the Year presented by Verizon is... Stephen Stefanski. <laughs> Kevin Stefanski, sorry. 
Uh-oh, yes, Kevin Stefanski of the Browns. One coach of the year, the most valuable player, went to Lamar Jackson. The lineup in Las Vegas is stacked with stars. Usher is, of course, the headliner at halftime. Post Malone will sing America the Beautiful before the game. During yesterday's news conference, ABC's Kid Reporter had this question for Post Malone. What is the best advice you ever gotten? I don't know. The best one I got is my dad told me he... You'll, you'll never make everybody happy. Mm -hmm. So just be yourself and um, just do your best at, at you know, uh, everything you do and uh, do it your way and do it with love. Great advice. The national anthem will be performed by Reba, who you see sitting right there. Next, an honor for Kobe Bryant. The Lakers unveiled a 19-foot-tall statue outside their arena four years after Kobe and his daughter Gigi died in a chopper crash. His widow says Kobe would be proud. It goes without saying that today is an especially sad day for us since Kobe and Gigi aren't here for what is supposed to be an incredibly joyous moment in Kobe's legacy. Kobe picked the pose you're about to see, so if anyone has any issues with it, tough The statue also features a Kobe quote, leave the game better than you found it. Next, a $13 bag of Chex Mix igniting a firestorm. That was the price at the Las Vegas airport. People on social media have been posting outrage over airport snack prices after a woman shared the price of Chex Mix in three airports. $9.99 at LaGuardia, New York. Only $4.76 in Dallas. But $13.29 in Vegas takes the cake. One person saying we have failed as a society. Finally, a wild kangaroo chase. Not in Australia, but in Tampa, hopping around the pool at this apartment complex. They eventually caught it, returning the route to its owner. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families truck. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Yeah. I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift, you're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy, you should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you Usher now. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Checking more top stories, President Biden declared last night that his memory is fine, pushing back on the special counsel's report, depicting him as an elderly man with a fuzzy memory who couldn't remember crucial dates. The investigation into Biden's handling of classified documents found he willfully retained and shared some classified information, but concluded that no criminal charges are warranted. The FCC has outlawed robocalls that use voices generated by artificial intelligence. The ruling allows states to take legal action against bad actors during this year's election. New findings from the CDC show that stress is a critical factor 
driving teens to use drugs and alcohol. Researchers say improving teens' mental health is crucial. Today's weather, spring-like temperatures in the Northeast, the same warmth that fueled a tornado in Wisconsin, rain from Texas to Kentucky, and snow in the Rockies. Finally, from food to family, the Super Bowl is about so much more than just football. Here's Danny New. Heading back to the Super Bowl. All right, the Super Bowl is finally here. One last football game before eternal boredom sets in, and there's a lot on the line. Still not oh, what a run! Come Sunday, could we officially have our next football dynasty? If Patrick Mahomes wins, he'd be almost halfway to Tom Brady's unthinkable seven Super Bowls. Looking, looking, throwing in the end zone. If the 49ers triumph on Sunday, San Fran would now be tied for the most Super Bowl titles ever with six. And listen to this. The last time they won in 95, the team's offensive coordinator, Mike Shanahan. One of the team's receivers, Ed McCaffrey. Well, cut 30. McCaffrey! The Niners' star running back is the latter's son, Christian McCaffrey, and their head coach is Mike Shanahan's son, Kyle. If San Francisco prevails, the Shanahans would become the first father-son coaching duo to both win Super Bowls. Just going through that and knowing how your dad is before him, after him, all that stuff, you just, you get the, even though you don't realize you're learning it, but you, those are your life experiences. You got a very good idea of how it works. <laughs> But hey, maybe you're looking to win something yourself. According to the American Gambling Association, a record 67.8 million people are expected to bet on this year's game, wagering a total of more than $23 billion. And if you should win your big bets, maybe you can buy fancy culinary creations like the ones on the menu for the multi-million dollar suites at Allegiant Stadium. This year, we start you off with a little Wagyu loaded hot dogs, then throw in some lobster mac and cheese, stuffed potatoes, and for dessert, we'll cap it off with griddled donuts smothered in ice cream. I mean, I could make it work. There will also apparently be surf and turf nachos combining the Wagyu beef and the lobster on top. Guys, could that work for you? Well, it would work for me, but not for this guy. <laughs> He's vegan. <laughs> Have a great day. Go Chiefs! Go Chiefs! for Vegas. And there it is. The 49ers are going to the Super Bowl. The San Francisco 49ers are ready to go head-to-head -head with the Kansas City Chiefs in Super Bowl 58. You got to fight for your right to fight! Who will take home the title? And which famous faces will we see in the stands? Let's do it the old school way. And the Super Bowl ads we cannot wait to see. The Clydesdales are back and joining us in Times Square. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we're taking you behind the scenes. Usher, baby. And Usher prepares his halftime performance. The superstar revealing how long he's been preparing for this moment. Hello and welcome to GMA's Countdown to the Big Game. And I'm Stephanie Ramos. You're looking great. You're going to cheer on your Kansas City Chiefs as they face off against the San Francisco 49ers in Las Vegas for the chance to take home the Lombardi Trophy. The players are already there in Vegas, but they're staying away from the action. They're in separate hotels 25 miles away from the Strip. Some 330,000 visitors are expected in Sin City, a projected economic impact of over $600 million. Huge, huge impact. We are counting down to the big game with a preview of the competition, the commercials, and that highly anticipated halftime performance. But first, how did we get here? We'll hear as a recap of the AFC and NFC championship games. That's right, it was quite a day of football. The 49ers will be making their eighth Super Bowl appearance in franchise history after that thrilling comeback win against the Detroit Lions. And they're going up against the Chiefs, who are in their fourth Super Bowl in the past five years after they upset the Ravens on the road. Take a look. And there it is! The 49ers are going to the Super Bowl! The Super Bowl showdown set after a stunning come-from-behind win. Here's the NFC Championship trophy for the Super Bowl bound San Francisco 49ers! Celebrations rocking the Bay Area. And here's Patchley from 21, and he buries it. The Detroit Lions were up 17 points at halftime. Thousands of fans jubilant watching from Ford Field in Detroit. 
But then, this circus catch from Brandon Ayuk off a Lions defender changing the game. Oh, he caught it off the ricochet! Ayuk crediting a ladybug for the extra luck. Before the game, a ladybug landed on my shoe. Hey, y'all know what that means. I don't know. Just great luck. God was with us today. Great win. Bay Bay Niner game. It's crazy. And this fumble recovery by defensive end Eric Armstead helping turn the tide. San Francisco scoring 27 consecutive points, crushing Detroit's Super Bowl dreams. GM delaying shifts in Flint so employees could support their team. Lions coach Dan Campbell gambling big in the fourth quarter, opting to go for it on fourth down instead of kicking a possibly game-tying field goal. It's easy hindsight, and I get it. I don't regret those decisions, and that's hard. Now 49ers quarterback Brock Purdy, the very last pick in the 2022 NFL Draft, set to become the lowest drafted quarterback ever to start a Super Bowl. I've never been the biggest, the fastest, the strongest, or any of that. I feel like I've always sort of had to fight for what I get and uh, work for what I get. He'll be facing the defending champion Kansas City Chiefs. Here's Kansas City from the 19 and it's caught by Kelsey for the touchdown. KC jumping out to an early lead with this elite touchdown grab from Travis Kelsey who broke the NFL record for most career playoff receptions. Ravens QB and likely league MVP Lamar Jackson trying to do it all for his team even catching his own batted pass. Second and five. Ball batted up into the air and caught by Jackson. He caught his own pass. But Kansas City dominant. The Chiefs now returning to the Super Bowl for the fourth time in five years. You gotta fight for your right to party! The joy just as pure this time around for Chiefs fans. And a love story on display. Kelsey embracing his girlfriend, Taylor Swift, on the field. Travis finding big brother Jason after the game as well, sharing an emotional moment. Jason telling his younger brother. Both teams are now in Vegas getting ready for the big game. And if the 49ers win, they'll be tied for the most Super Bowl wins ever with six. If the Chiefs win, they'll be the first back-to-back -back champs since the Patriots nearly 20 years ago. Cannot wait. And this morning we are looking at who will be in the crowd, not just on the field at the big game. Stephanie, I think I know the answer, but are you a longtime Chiefs fan? You know oh. what? I am. So this hasn't been a swift decision? <laughs> I'm a fan of hers, but no, it's, it has not been a swift decision. I am a Chiefs fan through and through. I started my news career in Chiefs country. I got married there. Both of my kids were born there. And to make it extra special, I sang the national anthem at the first game Taylor Swift attended this season. And I wore this jacket when I sang, and the Chiefs gave it to me. Thank you so much. And they won, so maybe it's a good luck charm. It looks great. You and Taylor <laughs> Swift have both performed at the same stadium. No one can take that away from you. So Thank it you. isn't all about Taylor Swift for you, but the big question is, will Taylor make it from her concert halfway around the world in time for the big game? Lara Spencer fired up the Pop News investigative unit to find out if she can make it work. Take a look. The day before the Super Bowl, Taylor will be across the globe performing in Tokyo. Uh, it's the last night of her era's tour. Tokyo, 17 hours ahead of Vegas. Um, so basically, she'll be in the future, and that works in Taylor's favor. Most likely, she wraps up her show around 11 p.m. Saturday. That's 6 a.m. Saturday, Vegas time. So if Taylor hops on her plane, Right after the show ends, or even an hour later, she can cross the Pacific. That will take about 13 hours to cross the Pacific. That puts her in Vegas by dinner time that same day, hence the reference to time travel. Taylor will literally be traveling back in time to land earlier than when she takes off, which means she can have a nice meal, get a good night's sleep, and make the Super Bowl that she on the Chiefs with no problem at all. So it looks like Taylor will make it to Vegas in time, but the next stop on tour is back across the globe in Australia on Friday, February 16th. She's got a lot of traveling to do. So if and when the Chiefs win, she won't have much time to celebrate with Travis Kelsey. But if the 49ers win, Superfan and GMA anchor Whit Johnson will be present and available for all celebrations. He gets a super surprise of his own. Who's ready for some football today? In case you haven't heard, there's a super fan among us. The 49ers are going to the Super Bowl. 
And full disclosure, born and raised in San Francisco. So, you know, I, the 49ers are my team. I got my Niners red. My Niners looking to bounce back. You got to deal with my Niners coming up a little bit later, though. Planning to cheer on his Niners from home. There you go. Go yeah. Niners. Go Niners. But getting the surprise of a lifetime with tickets to the big game. Congratulations. I'm going. You, you want to do it? We're going to the game. It's our Friday giveaway. Right? Oprah Friday gives away cars. We give away Super Bowl. Yeah. All right, Stephanie, you're the Chiefs fan. Hopefully, there's there's no bad blood between you and Wit. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Good luck to Wit. Good luck to the 49ers. It is all good. I love his dedication, though. Mm. Coming up, I've got an exclusive interview with some of the most majestic stars of the whole Super Bowl. Yes. Plus, we'll hear from Usher. Usher. Is that how you say Usher? I say Usher, baby. Usher. Okay. He's down. Usher. We'll hear from him as he prepares for his halftime performance. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Lust, greed, betrayal. This is one of the most complex investigations I've ever seen. 2020 true crime. They had gunshot wounds to their heads and torsos. It was hard to believe. We discovered she had a second career as an escort. She had three cameras at her apartment. Did these cameras capture her killer? Sealed with a kill. No one could have fathomed how twisted this story would become. 2020, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. And that's why at Good Morning America, we're right here. And we got you. We got you. We got you. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Hey, America, I'm Brandon, your next kid correspondent. See you at Super Bowl 58. Welcome back to GMA's countdown to the big game. That's GMA's Super Bowl kid correspondent for 2024, Special Olympics athlete Brandon Turquado. Super Bowl commercials are always highly anticipated. This year is no different. Will Reeve shows us there is a special reason to get excited about one ad this year. The Clydesdales are back. They are back and one is here. That's Olaf. Ads are an essential part of the Super Bowl viewing experience and the Clydesdales have been an essential part of Budweiser's Super Bowl ads for decades. They took a break last year. Now they're back for the big game. Big budget ads are a game day staple no, 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 that no. often feature stars brighter than the Hollywood like Walk of Fame. Like Chris Pratt matching mustaches with Pringles. I'm going to get out there. And soccer star Leo Messi grabbing a beer beachside. I think you're just going to see a ton of celebrities. I think it's just going to be a lot of humor the whole way through. And with the highly anticipated halftime entertainment from Usher, yeah, yeah, yeah. companies are saying yeah to the nearly $7 million price tag for a 30-second spot. The ad plus three to five million on the production, the celebrities, the ad agency you're paying, so your total investment can get close to $20 million for one minute in the game. Some Super Bowl commercial moments have a permanent place in pop culture, like these ladies who just wanted a decent burger. Where's the beef? Or mini Darth Vader, whose force was strong enough to start a car. And the ever-popular Clydesdales, starring in Super Bowl ads for Budweiser since 1975. What do you want to do? Hey! Now this year, making a grand return in a GMA first look. Let's do it the old school way. In Bud's old school delivery, this small town weathering a snowstorm, but committed to getting its beer to a local bar, with the help of Clydesdales and a furry friend leading the way. In the last 20 years, they've become more of an emotional appeal, often having some kind of close relationship with either a person or an animal in the ad. And so the Clydesdales are just kind of one of those iconic parts of advertising that they're going to be beloved. Good job, Bubba. Joining us now, 
is Clydesdale handler Lane Sonker, his helper Zane, which is great, and one of his co-workers, Olaf, which is even better. Hello to all of you, especially you, you superstar. We're excited to chat with you in a second uh, through Lane here. Why exactly are Clydesdales so special? So the Clydesdales are a staple for Anheuser-Busch with their long-standing heritage, and they're an American icon. So really, when you think Super Bowl, you think commercials, and when you think commercials, you think Clydesdales. Yeah, and you're, I see you holding that hay. I assume that is food for Olaf. How much of that and whatever else does Olaf go through in a given day? So Olaf will eat a couple pounds of grain a day, twice a day. Um, he'll roughly eat about 40 pounds of hay a day and drink around 30 gallons of water. Whoa, 30, yeah, they, they tell you to drink like eight cups for humans. Okay, just for context. Um, a few more stats. How big is Olaf? How big are the feet? How fast can he run? So Olaf here is a perfect representative for us. Um, he stands 18 hands at the top of his shoulder or his withers. Uh, he has a beautiful bay coat. He's got a black mane and tail, four white legs or feathers, what we call them. And he's got a beautiful blaze down the center of his face. Now, is Olaf and his friends and siblings, whoever else is in the commercials with him, are you training them to act, or are these horses doing what they would typically do anyway? So it's what they would typically do anyways. But any horse you see solo shots in the commercial are specially trained for that specific commercial. So they'll go out to our trainer in Wyoming a month prior and start training for what they're going to do. Uh, if you see a full hitch in the commercial, that's one of our three traveling teams that okay. travel the country roughly 300 days out of the year. So there's a lot of thought and time and effort put into all of this, and, and we're the ones who reap the benefits. And then finally, how do you prepare them for a commercial or an appearance like this or wherever else they go? So on the road, when we have the full hitch on the road or something like this, it takes roughly five hours of prep work before we get to the actual show. So that takes all of us handlers four hours to polish the brass wow. and clean the leather on the harness. And then the other handlers are getting the eight horses that are going to the show ready. So that's grooming them, washing them, washing all four white legs. Um, so that's really what goes into it. Sounds like after getting Olaf ready, you deserve a beer. You work at the right place. <laughs> Lane Zane, Olaf, thank you so much. Can't wait to see that ad in full at the big game. He's gonna enjoy his hay. Thanks so much, Will. Cannot wait to see all the commercials. And if you're hosting a big Super Bowl party, listen up. From a new TV to Super Bowl snacks, Lori Bergamato is helping you shop all the best gear for the big game. Looking for party must-haves and some of the biggest Super Bowl sales of the season, this is your gal, lifestyle <laughs> contributor, Lori Bergamato is with us with everything you need for a total touchdown. There, is that it? Yeah, I got Touchdown. It. All right, good. So let's talk TV first off. You've yeah. got two really good deals, a little bit different. Yes, exactly. And this is a great time to buy TV. So if you're in the market for one, pounce on this right now. We're going to start here with this Hisense U6HF. This is available on Amazon. It's a Fire TV. Lara, this one is great. First of all, it's over $250 off of the original retail price of $599. So snap that up. Snap that up. It's 58 inches. It has quantum dot technology. What does that mean? It means you're going to see a wider range of color. So you're going to get that really bright picture, right? Really awesome. clear. So this one is just around $300. You said it's Alexa compatible, and too. And it's Alexa compatible. Good for gamers. Good for gamers. If you have an Amazon connected house, this this, this is a great sure thing to have for now, convenience. Now, if not, bigger might be better. Exactly. So Samsung, you know them. They're an industry leader yep. in the marketplace, right? This one is from Walmart, which is an industry leader in all that price savings. Yep. So this one you're going to save over $200 on. And what we love about this is it has something called motion accelerator. Again, what does that mean? Yeah. It means that if you're seeing action on a screen, you're not going to get that sense of being disoriented. It's going to be really crisp and really clear. This is a great one to get if you're looking for that big screen, high quality I mean, purchase. The prices are unbelievable. The prices are great. great job. Yeah. Now the sound bar, I like this idea. Okay, so if you already have a TV, but you're looking to sort of level up that experience, it's all about a sound bar. It is a game changer for the big game. You have to have one. So basically the sound bar, what it will do is it will enhance your audio quality. This one, which is from Samsung, has a built-in center speaker. So what you're gonna get there is enhanced dialogue. So even when the crowd is cheering, 
wildly on Sunday, you will still be able to hear every single call. You'll be able to hear every Usher lyric when everyone's going wild for him. And for this savings, it's almost $100 off. So it's a great buy right now. All right, I love it. Thank you so much. Now, the important part, the <laughs> snacks. All right, and for this, we've got two pros, literally <laughs> two former football <laughs> players from the NFL. Um, over there, I'm there, coming yeah. over there. <laughs> Hi, Nick. Hello. Nick, you guys know Nick Mangle <laughs> from the Jets and, of course, What's up? I'm a giant fan, <laughs> lifelong uh, Mari Tumor. Sorry, it's okay. I'm from Long Island, so I, I, I'm, I'm conflicted. Oh, yeah. Strong Island, baby. Strong um, you guys are going to judge. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we've got a really good deal on an assortment of top-notch snacks. Exactly. So this is from a company called Bordery. A lot of you guys may have heard of it because it was on Shark Tank. It was also one of Oprah's favorite things. And what they do for you here, they create these charcuterie boards. So you can see they have high quality meats, cheeses, nuts, chocolates, dried fruit, olives, crackers. And Lara, what's so great about this is it comes packaged and prepared for right. you. It's so if you've decided simple. to have a last minute party, if you're you know, going to somebody's house, you wanna bring a hostess gift, or really if you're just hanging out at home, you wanna have yeah. some delicious you know, food, it is fantastic. I and like that it's pre-cut. It's, mm. it's, it's all arranged the, for you. I love making a charcuterie, charcuterie board, but it yeah. takes a bit of time. It takes a bit, this and it takes does, the work out for you. And it does add I've got up. a snacker over here, uh, a snack alert. What do we think? Nick, what do we think? Was it not allowed to Thumbs touch up? No, we, we <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Right. Ooh, yeah. Really Very good, good, right? So, so what's the deal? So here on this one, they're going to do a special promo code for us. So you're going to want to scan that QR code to find out what it is. These start just upwards of $100. All right. And thumbs and, up and from And the shipping's included guys. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all right. And we can't forget, once you've got all that food, you want a little sport uh, team decor, I right? I love that. Yes, let's okay. talk decor. So you want, we, you have coasters. I like, the, I like these coasters. They're, and they're really, really cute. affordable. They come for every team, Lara. So if your team's not in the Super Bowl this year, you can get them for you guys. But these are great because they offer a 3D um, view of the stadium. And yeah, then we neat. also have some fun pillows for comfort or if you just want to scream into the void if there's a fumble. Right? <laughs> love it. Love it. So you everything's guys, affordable. You guys, we, get, we really, I think we got it covered, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Now we just need a winner. Any predictions? Ooh, not yet. Not nope. yet. Saving my time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nick, Amari, thank you so much. Guys, shop all these products on GoodMorningAmerica.com. Lori, you've done a great job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. When GMA's countdown to the big game returns, Usher, the superstar, giving us details on his Apple Music halftime show. Plus, we've got a huge surprise for a very deserving 49ers fan. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. This is the GMA Countdown to the Big Game. Usher will take center stage at the Apple Music Super Bowl halftime show. Kelly Carter sat down with him to talk about how he's preparing and how his kids are even helping him pick the set list. Take a look. Usher, baby. The countdown to the Super Bowl and Usher's halftime is on. It's been a dream of mine and a bucket list, yeah. you know, thing to be able to get it. You know, they say, what is it, Todd, uh, uh, Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy, right? Yeah. yeah. You should put Super Bowl on there too, right? <laughs> 30 years of being this level of successful. Uh, what do you attribute that to for yourself? Because I ain't about to let you forget about me. You remind me of a Nine number one singles. You got it, you got it bad. If you miss a day, we're not just bringing your whole lives off track. Over
over 80 million records sold worldwide. These are my confessions. Just when I thought I said all I can say, my shit on the side. How do you possibly pack that into 13 minutes? Where do you start? I'll try to get back as far as I can and go back to the first album if I could, but you know, it's just, you know, literally 13 minutes. And I think I just started by making certain that um, my kids approved. I got my portion of it for, yeah. for the, you know, for the, the 30 and up, I got them. Yeah. But for my youngins, you know, I'm, I'm asking on uh, Cinco and Naveed, I'm taking notes. Mm -hmm. They've been like taking conference calls with my entire team, <laughs> giving notes. Will this show be an Usher solo show or Usher and Friends? It's gonna be a great show. <laughs> no and spoilers. I had, yeah, well, you know what they say in, in Vegas, you know, it's dealer's choice. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start rehearsing for the show? Actually, you know what? I'm playing the Super Bowl the first time as a support uh, for the Black Eyed Peas. Since that day, I think I I had it in my mind that I wanted to go back to the stage. So you get the call from Jay-Z that this is actually happening. It took a minute, you know. It's kind of like an adrenaline high, right? You're like, yeah, of course. But then you really think about it, like, wait a minute. The work you got to do to do this is like, <laughs> it's a lot, you know, yeah. And I'm, but I'm ready. The eight-time Grammy winner revealing R&B is taking the spotlight. To have R&B have the main stage at the Super Bowl yeah. is a major thing for me. I think about what our country has, you know, kind of represented for black artists. Mm. You know, having to, at some point, go through kitchens to even be able to perform for an audience. But they had to leave back through that same door, you know, fear for their lives, as they went to the next state to do the same thing. Mm. So I'm coming through the front door with this one. Yeah. <laughs> I think about mm. all of the R&B performers yeah. who I carry in this moment. You make me want to say, oh, 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 oh. A career spanning three decades, this Super Bowl performance will be another page in the legacy. I didn't start where I am now, and I didn't get there by myself. So everybody that has been a part of it, I'm carrying them with me. All of my fans, my loved ones, the people who, you know, may have felt like they have been forgotten, they haven't. I'm carrying you right with me when I walk on that stage that night. For ABC News, Kelly Carter, Los Angeles. Thanks so much, Kelly. Check this out. It is now time for a big surprise. We are here right now with a 49ers super fan, Avery Martin, and we also have our GMA mega fan here, Wit. Well, Talk so personally about my Niners. Yes, I, I, there you go. I got my lucky, yes. my lucky hoodie and for my the, Niners. The, the shot yep. that you did when mm -hmm. they won. You know it. And then Gio, who you've met before. Yes, yes, yes. we got to meet. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about this because Avery has been a lifelong San Francisco 49ers yes. fan. Haven't missed a game in 13 years. That's correct. I got to surprise you with tickets to the Ravens and the 49ers game. Yes, the Christmas Day game. It was seriously the coolest moment of my life. I got to bring my boyfriend, my family, and it was the best way to spend the holiday. It wasn't the best outcome for the 49ers, but it was still a special day. For the Super Bowl, what are your plans for the big day? What are you going to do? Okay, well, I'm a total nut, so I like to lock in and just watch with my family, my boyfriend, my close core, and I like to just lock into the TV, have food nearby, bathroom breaks and during commercial commercials only, yep. so yeah, just locked in. I'm very excited for Sunday. We want to send a special message from Vernon Davis, specially for you. Oh, stop. Take a look. Oh, stop. Hi, Avery. Vernon Davis here. I know you're gearing up for Super Bowl 58. I hear you're rooting for the 49ers. That's all good. But how about this? On behalf of the NFL, instead of sitting at home on your couch, we send you to the Super Bowl in Vegas. How does that sound, stop. Avery? How does that sound? Congratulations, Avery. So why don't you we go? Go? You guys, you guys are early too. You got your ticket. Theo, you guys are literally going to give me a heart attack. Oh. We got to surprise you with tickets to Monday Night Football. Now you're going to the Super Bowl. How do you feel? Go Niners, and I'll see you there. I'm going. Yes. I'm going to the game. I can't wait. When I see you there, we're, we're going wild. We are we're going, going wild, wild for the Niner game. Go bang, Niners. bang, Niner oh, game. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Super surprised. I am surprised. You guys have good actors for the Super fans. That was really good. I believed it. Thank you, guys. I can't believe yeah. it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Ray, give her the ticket. Okay, yeah. Hey. <laughs> and thanks to the yeah. NFL for making this dream come true for Avery. That is so awesome. Love to see it. That's all for GMA's countdown to the big game. Thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to tune in to GMA on Monday, where I will be live from Las Vegas with all the highlights from Super Bowl 58.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the site of the 2024 Iowa caucuses, I'm Victor Okendo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live First, President Biden fires back what he's saying about his memory and the special counsel report on his handling of classified information. An apparent and rare show of unity at the Supreme Court. The justices appear skeptical of whether former President Trump can be removed from state ballots for his actions around January 6th, what it means for the race for the White House. Love traveling but hate packing? I've got the ultimate hacks to help keep your suitcase organized and ensure you never forget a thing in Macedo Methods. Only two days until kickoff, we're taking you to Las Vegas and getting you ready for the Super Bowl excitement in Sin City. But we begin with President Biden defending his ability to do his job after a report from the special counsel investigating his handling of classified documents. Special counsel Robert Hur's report clears Biden of criminal wrongdoing for the mishandling of classified documents, but also describes the president as an, quote, an elderly man with a poor memory, also describing his memory as hazy. Biden calls the report's assertions just plain wrong. Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas joins me now for more on that. Pierre, what stands out to you from this report? Diane, I think the thing that struck me is the very first sentence of the special counsel's report, summing up the case saying, quote, we conclude that no criminal charges are warranted in this matter. And Hurt flatly states that the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But to be clear, the special counsel said he did find some evidence that Biden intended to retain highly classified information. He pointed out the classified documents were found throughout Biden's Delaware home, in file cabinets, in his basement, even in his garage. Diane. Pierre, the report also says Biden created classified documents and used some of the information to write his book. What does that mean and how significant is that? Well, he had a series of notebooks. And the special counsel maintains that some of those notebooks had classified information in it and that Biden was using some of that information to write his book. Now, Biden's position is that these were simply private notes <clears throat> taken from his time in the White House and in the Senate, and that he was allowed to do such. Again, there's a difference of opinion on that. So that is the main thing, that there's a difference between Biden's recollection and what the special counsel lays out. Biden's saying, look, he was taking notes from private situations and conversations that they were not classified, but the special counsel saying, yes, that was classified information. So how does this compare to the classified documents charges against former President Trump? Well, that was the other striking thing about this re report. Heard takes great pains to lay out the differences. He talks about how Biden uh, 
turned in the classified documents immediately to the National Archives and to the FBI, that he cooperated fully, uh, sat down for five hours' worth of interviews, and in, in essence, basically didn't act like a person trying to hide anything. As, as far as President Trump, he pointed out that allegedly, Trump, at every turn, was given opportunities to return the information, had a subpoena for the information, still didn't return it. The FBI asked for it again and again, did not return it. And he claims that there's evidence that pre former President Trump lied about the whole situation and encouraged others to do so. All right. Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas, thank you. Pleasure. And now President Biden is in damage control mode as his legal exoneration threatens to become a political liability. He's attacking the special counsel for questioning his memory and defending his decision to run for re-election. Chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce has the latest. President Biden defiant, defending his handling of classified information and his memory, firing back at special counsel Robert Hur after he declined to prosecute the president but raised questions about Biden's mental acuity. Their task was to make a decision about whether to move forward with charges in this case. For any extraneous commentary, they don't know what they're talking about. Biden, well aware his age is a top concern for voters, defending himself. That's, that's you know what, your memory has gotten worse, Mr. No, President? Look, my memory is not gotten My memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. None of you thought I could pass any of the things I got passed. How'd that happen? The report concludes the president should not face charges, saying Biden would likely present himself to a jury, as he did during our interview of him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. The special counsel describing Biden's recollection as painfully slow and his memory hazy, writing that Biden did not remember even within several years when his son Beau died. That conclusion clearly striking a chord. Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away or passed away. How in the hell dare he raise that? Biden clearly frustrated as his age comes under increasing scrutiny. Mr. President, for months when you were asked about your age, you would respond with the words, watch me. Watch Many American people have been watching, and they have expressed concerns about your age. That is they, your judgment. They, that is your judgment. That polling. is not they the judgment concerns. of the press. And defending his decision to run for re-election. I'm the most question. qualified person in this country to be president of the United States and finish the job I started. After 13 months of investigating, the special counsel determined there was evidence Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified materials from his time as vice president, but that he should not be prosecuted because the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But the president pushing back, denying the report's key findings that he held on to classified material. I've seen the headlines since the report was released about my willful retention of documents. This, these assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. Still, the president welcoming the news that this case is now closed and emphasizing that the report lays out the stark differences between his own case and former President Trump's handling of classified material, that Biden fully cooperated with authorities while Trump did the opposite. I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. Now, moments after defending his memory, the president mistakenly referred to the president of Egypt as the president of Mexico. He did later get it right. But look, it is clear that the president, while he knows that legally this issue may be over politically, this report can still do him some damage. That obviously angers the president and is something he's trying to get ahead of. Diane. Chief White House Correspondent Mary Bruce, thank you. And the Supreme Court is considering whether former President Trump can be disqualified from running for re-election due to his actions surrounding January 6th. As they heard arguments yesterday, the justices appeared skeptical of the unprecedented effort to ban the former president from the 2024 ballot in Colorado. Senior National Correspondent Terry Moran has the latest. A rare moment of agreement, the Supreme Court's liberal and conservative justices voicing shared skepticism about this case. At issue, a Colorado court's decision to ban Donald Trump from the 2024 ballot in that state based on Trump's alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election and his role on January 6th. 
The Colorado court found Trump violated the 14th Amendment, Section 3, which declares that no one who has taken an oath to support the Constitution and then engaged in insurrection can hold public office afterwards. During three hours of oral arguments, the justices methodically took apart that ruling. Justice Brett Kavanaugh, a Trump appointee. What about the idea that um, we should think about democracy, think about the right of the people to elect uh, candidates of their choice, uh, of letting the people decide? And Justice Elena Kagan, appointed by Barack Obama. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. Trump appointee Amy Coney Barrett agreeing. It just doesn't seem like a state call. But looming over these arguments, the national trauma of the attack on the Capitol. Even though Trump himself describes that day as beautiful, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson got Trump's lawyer to acknowledge the reality of what happened. For an insurrection, there needs to be an organized, concerted effort to overthrow the government of the United States through violence. And this it, So the point is that a chaotic effort to overthrow the government is not an insurrection? No, we didn't concede that it's an effort to overthrow the government either, Justice Jackson. Right? None of these criteria were met. This was a riot. It was not an insurrection. The events were shameful, criminal, violent, all of those things. But it did not qualify as insurrection, as that term is used in Section 3. But for Donald Trump, this day in court looked like a win. This was a great day. Our Supreme Court hopefully will be doing something in terms of helping our country and preserving democracy. Efforts are underway in more than 30 states to remove Trump from the ballot. So whatever the court decides in this case will have a major impact across the country. And a decision is expected before the Colorado primary, which is on March 5th. Diane? Senior National Correspondent Terry Moran, thank you. Ukraine has a new general in charge of its military today. President Vladimir Zelensky abruptly removed his commander-in-chief yesterday in the biggest shakeup of the country's military since the start of its war with Russia. Zelensky has now appointed a well-known general within the Ukrainian military to step in. ABC News foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burich has more. The largest shakeup in Ukrainian military leadership since the war began. In a risky move, President Zelensky removing Ukraine's commander-in-chief, General Valery Zaluzhny. Zaluzhny, hugely popular among Ukrainian troops, credited for halting Russia's full-scale invasion in 2022. Zelensky's new top commander, General Sersky, now taking over at a critical time. With some Republicans blocking more U.S. military aid for Ukraine... <laughs> Our team seeing firsthand last month how frontline Ukrainian artillery units are now running low on ammunition. Well, you can really feel the force of this American gun. In Congress, the stakes for Ukraine are high. If there's one other person besides Donald Trump who is rooting for chaos in the sen Senate, it is Vladimir Putin. And without that US aid, Russia threatening to capture this eastern Ukrainian city. Avdivka in ruins, with Russian forces now making significant advances here and threatening a broader offensive in the coming weeks. And, Diane, I think this could be the hardest moment for Ukraine in this war in more than a year. Leaders here in Europe are expressing concern. All eyes are on Washington. They're looking to see whether Congress will allow the White House to send more American military aid to Ukraine. And that new military leadership in Ukraine really needs it right now. Diane? ABC News foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge, thank you. Here at home, the FAA is investigating what caused two JetBlue planes to collide on the tarmac at Boston's Logan Airport. Officials say the wing of one JetBlue plane clipped the tail of the other while on the de-icing pad. Now concerns are growing about airline safety amid mounting issues at airports around the country. ABC's transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has the latest. Another head-scratching moment on a tarmac at one of the nation's busiest airports. We were hit by another aircraft. Early Thursday at Boston's Logan International Airport, the left winglet of this JetBlue plane bound for Las Vegas clipped another JetBlue plane while de-icing on the runway. We don't know how to damage the aircraft. Both jets were damaged, but there were no reported injuries to passengers. Dave Souter was sitting on that plane. Our uh, left 
wing took a big chunk, you know, two or three feet off of uh, the tail of another plane. As the turn was happening, it was too close. Brian O'Neill was also on board with his daughter and took this video. It felt like we hit a pothole. It was, it was something like in the road and I'm like, oh, wait. This is the second incident in less than a year at Logan Airport. Last June, the FAA launched an investigation into this moment. Oh, my Lord. The wing of a United Airlines plane clipped the tail of a parked Delta plane while the United flight was taxiing to a holding pad. While nobody was hurt in this latest incident, it's an example of the kinds of accidents the FAA is trying to get to the bottom of. Having three of these occur in a fairly short period of time means that there's a training issue, even though it may not involve the same airline. Transportation correspondent Gio Benitez, thank you. And a new report from the Federal Trade Commission says Americans lost more than $10 billion to scams last year. The report says financial fraudsters are using email, the phone, even text messaging to trick victims. ABC's Elizabeth Shelsey has the latest. And these new numbers from this FTC report are pretty staggering. Nationwide last year, Americans lost more than $10 billion to fraud. That is the highest amount on record, up 14% from the year before. The number one place that people are losing money, $4.6 billion total, is to investment scams. This is when consumers are tricked into thinking that they can make a lot of cash fast with little or no risk. So think of a fake cryptocurrency company offering you guaranteed immediate returns. Americans lost another $2.7 billion to imposter scams. This is when scammers pretend to be a business or a person that you trust and then they convince you to send them money. The way that people are lured into these schemes is also changing. For the first time ever, email was the most common method, followed by phone calls and then texts. A telltale sign is a scammer, and it's so important to know they will put pressure on you to act fast. So always take a minute to stop and think, hang up the phone, or better yet, don't even answer it in the first place. ABC's Elizabeth Shelsey, thanks for that. And Prince Harry's lawyer says he has settled all remaining claims in his legal battle with British tabloid over phone hacking allegations. A British court awarded the Duke of Sussex about $170,000 after finding Mirror Group hacked his phone. Prince Harry says he was motivated to sue by a desire to protect his wife, Meghan, and threatened to pursue another trial if he wasn't awarded appropriate damages. His attorney now says Mirror Group has agreed to pay a substantial additional sum and there will be no second trial. Coming up, the 15-year-old hailed a hero, how he may have helped avert a school shooting and why what his dad's saying about his son doing the right thing. Also ahead, Big Pharma in the hot seat, how the CEOs of major companies are defending sky-high medication costs in the U.S. Whenever news breaks, we are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live, streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. What You Need to Know, a third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC.
Welcome back to ABC News Live First. An Ohio teen is being hailed a hero after speaking up and potentially stopping a school shooting. The school district says the 15-year-old stopped a credible plot to harm students and staff. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has more. A teen is credited with helping thwart a school shooting allegedly plotted by his classmate at this high school in Ohio. That was more important than his life was protecting his classmates. And I could not be more proud of him. And I mean, he's a hero for what he did. Zach Swalen says his son, Boom, wasted no time earlier this week, telling him that his classmate had revealed a plan to shoot people at Marie Mont High School. The swift action was definitely warranted, and I'm grateful that my son reached out. Investigators say that classmate allegedly planned to kill eight students and a teacher. It was an obvious um, threat. There was no doubt that this was going to occur. Authorities say text messages reveal the would-be shooter was conspiring with an adult who was out of state. The teen suspect allegedly texting, I need them dead really soon. The adult allegedly responding, I got you, bro. Police say the teen responded, can you do tomorrow? Swaylin says his son saw the teen's plan on paper and told him Tuesday. The next day, the teen was arrested and is now accused of conspiracy to commit aggravated murder. Swaylin says the suspect threatened Boom if he told anyone about the plan, but that did not stop Boom from doing the right thing. He literally told me that he didn't care if, uh, if he got killed as long as he was able to protect his classmates. The prosecutor in this case says she plans to request the teen suspect is charged as an adult. This tragedy was averted, but this year already, according to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been 38 mass shootings, 24 kids killed, and 124 teenagers killed. The student who told his dad about the alleged plot says one message he hopes is taken away from everything is that others should reach out and help if they see another student hurting. Diane. Stephanie Ramos, thank you. And lawmakers on Capitol Hill are blaming drug makers for the high price of prescription medications. This after CEOs from Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Bristol Myers Squibb testified on Capitol Hill yesterday with senators on both sides of the aisle demanding answers. ABC's Witt Johnson has more. Big Pharma CEOs in the hot seat Thursday over the high price of prescription drugs. Those drugs mean nothing to anybody who cannot afford it. The heads of Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Bristol-Myers Squibb grilled about why costs are so high, citing research and development while defending the billions paid in dividends to stockholders. We have to pay dividends because it's the only way that the company can remain operational and sustainable. The Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, chaired by Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, aiming to lower costs for Americans. Ten of the top pharmaceutical companies in America made over $110 billion in profits in 2022. They are doing phenomenally well while Americans cannot afford the cost of the medicine they need. The committee focusing on several popular drugs, saying Johnson & Johnson charges Americans with arthritis $79,000 for Stelera, while the same product is about $16,000 in the UK. And Merck charges diabetes patients $6,900 for Genuvia, when that same product can be purchased for $900 in Canada and $200 in France. That unfortunately comes at a fairly significant cost for those patients outside of the U.S. In Canada, patients will wait roughly three and a half to four years to get access to a medicine that is available in the U.S. Wait, Johnson, thank you. Coming up two days until the Super Bowl, we're taking you to Las Vegas just ahead. But first, love traveling but hate packing? I've got the ultimate hacks to help keep your suitcase organized and help ensure you never forget a thing in Macedo Methods. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoon. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. I've never seen a place like this in my life. at the Apex Summit in San Francisco. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. It's time for Macedo Methods, where I show you some of my favorite hacks to make life a little easier. And today I bring you my favorite packing hacks to help stay organized, pack faster, and actually remember everything you need. There are a few things I love more than traveling. There's just one problem. I absolutely hate packing. Right, here we go. Especially now that I also pack for my kids, I find computing all the different things we might need mentally exhausting, and my brain looks for any opportunity to procrastinate. All right, let me check my packing list. Ooh, a text message. All right, let me check the weather. Ooh, a sale. Then once I've conquered the actual packing, there's the anxiety that I forgot something important, because I probably have. <laughs> One time I remembered everything I could possibly need and I fit it all in my carry-on. And then I realized I forgot underwear. But those days are behind me, thanks to a few game-changing hacks. I used to pack in categories, so sweaters went in one section, pants in another, shirts in another, socks in another, and so on. But I realize now that made it hard for me to ensure I had everything I needed, and it meant my suitcase looked like a bomb went off within a day of arriving. So now I pack by outfit in clear compression cubes. These not only help to keep things organized, but if you fill them well, they actually help you fit more clothes in the bag. And my favorite part is I have a reusable checklist right on each cube. Use clear labels or a Sharpie and seal with clear tape. Then use a wine marker to check off items as you pack them and wipe off to start over for your next trip. No more forgotten underwear. And now once I arrive, getting dressed is as simple as pulling out that cube. No more suitcase scavenger hunt. I use a similar approach with my makeup and toiletries, only these stay packed all the time. And it costs a little more money to have duplicates of all this stuff, but it is so worth it for me for the time and stress I save. Then there's my binder zipper pages. Remember how I use those in my purse and diaper bag? Well, I have one for my suitcase too, for all my other recurring travel items. Just go through the pages and if a pocket's empty, you know exactly what's missing. I need to put my deodorant in there. And finally, when it comes to my toddler stuff, my secret weapon is a shoe organizer. Each pocket holds a complete outfit and there's no need to unpack. Just hang this in a closet or on the back of a door, and if someone else dresses the baby, the outfit's basically laid out for them. As an added bonus, you can use the same system when you're repacking to ensure everything makes it back home. Where are we going next? And if you have a problem you want me to tackle, let me know on Instagram at Diane R. Macedo, and I just might feature it on the next Macedo Methods. Coming up, moms on mushrooms. The dramatic increase in magic mushrooms being confiscated as more mothers say they're microdosing to help with stress. We'll explain the emerging trend and potential dangers and benefits. Also ahead, the fraud alert you need to know about. The most common scams costing us billions and what you can do to avoid them. Plus, history through song. I'm speaking with award-winning singer Erica Campbell about what makes gospel the heart and soul of the black experience in America.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift, you're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy, you should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you Usher now. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You're looking at Las Vegas, where preparations for the Super Bowl are in full effect, and we will take you there in just a minute. But first, we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. President Biden is defending his ability to do his job after a report from the special counsel investigating his hand handling of classified documents. Special counsel Robert Hur's report clears Biden of criminal wrongdoing for the mishandling of classified documents, but also describes the president as an elderly man with a poor memory also describing his memory as hazy. Biden calls the report's assertions just plain wrong. Parts of Wisconsin and Illinois are recovering after rare tornadoes damaged homes and farms. Now a new storm is bringing flooding and severe weather to the south. 12 states from Washington to Texas are under snow and avalanche alerts. The FCC has ruled the use of AI-generated voices in robocalls is illegal. The ruling takes effect immediately and will allow states to take legal action against bad actors during this year's election. The use of fraudulent AI-generated voices has been on the rise, including during the New Hampshire presidential primary. And the Los Angeles Lakers are honoring Kobe Bryant with a new statue outside their arena. The 19-foot-high bronze statue shows the Hall of Famer as he walked off the court after his 81-point game in 2006. It's the first of three statues of the five-time champion. One will feature him with his daughter, Gianna, who was among those killed with Bryant in a helicopter crash four years ago. And excitement is building as the Chiefs and 49ers prepare to face off in the biggest football game of the year this Sunday. Thousands of football fans are descending on Las Vegas as the city ramps up for its first ever Super Bowl weekend. ABC's Will Reeve is in Las Vegas with more.
The excitement is building for Super Bowl 58. We gotta bring the Bay to Vegas, you know, keep it faithful. Fans descending on Las Vegas. Who doesn't love Vegas? An expected 330,000 of them, many taking it all in at the Super Bowl experience. We're starving for this. Kansas City, they've had it, they've had it. It's our turn now. What do you like about the Chiefs? I like like how their team like is like put together and like they know how to win. Allegiant Stadium expected to hold 72,000 fans for the big game, and it's a hot ticket. StubHub saying it's the third best-selling Super Bowl ever. The get-in price hovering around six thousand dollars, and an average ticket costing nearly nine thousand. Purdy stays up on his feet somehow. The main event may well be worth the money when the 49ers and the Chiefs battle it out on Sunday. All of the strain, the stress is to get to this moment. It's going to be a great challenge, and, and for all of us, the receivers, O-line, everybody, we got to be on point for this one. San Francisco's been one of the best teams in the NFL all season, and red-hot Kansas City is seeking their second consecutive title. And it's caught by Kelsey for the touchdown. The number three is, uh, is a big number in terms of uh, dynasties and things like that, so... Hopefully we can get this thing and yeah, you guys can start talking about dynasties. I just, I'm trying to get this third ring though. I mean, uh, someone's got to be the underdog. Um, and so uh, they've been a great football team all year long. Um, so they deserve to be the favorite in this game. And all we can do is go out there and play our best football. And Will Reeve is there in Vegas in the center of it all. Well, it looks like Vegas is already pumped up. Oh, it absolutely is, Diane. And my friends here from the Chiefs and 49ers are pumped up as well at this early hour. It, the, Vegas is a spectacle to begin with. So when you add the Super Bowl on top of it, of course, it's going to be even bigger. There's 330,000 fans expected to be here uh, this week. We were walking around the Super Bowl experience yesterday. Fans from all over just here to take it all in. Some are going to the game, some are not just here to enjoy everything that Vegas has to offer. But I think now that we're headed into the weekend, everyone's really getting their mind right and focused on the big game. Well, I'm trying really hard to focus on you, but the mascots are really stealing the show right now, I have to say. <laughs> Talk okay, to me about The mascots are stealing the show? I'm well, absolutely who, who knew, loving, right? loving the energy. How are the teams preparing? Well, walk me through this. So the teams, Diane, are staying at hotels about 25 miles away from Las Vegas. The NFL said we're putting the teams as far away from the Strip as possible because it is all about the game. And what the teams do is a lot of media at the beginning of the week when they get here, there's the big opening night and there's all the media availability. And then as the week goes on, it becomes more and more about the football. They go through walkthroughs without pads on just to sort of figure out their plays go through some reps, and then things intensify as the week goes on. Travis Kelsey actually said that at Wednesday's practice, when the starters on offense and defense were going against each other, things got chippy, which said it really, he said it really fired him up. I think, you know, once the teams are going against each other in that way, they're ready to play the game. And now we're just two days away from that actually happening. All right, sounds good. Well, Reeve in Las Vegas, maybe having too much fun. We appreciate it, Will. Thank you. You got it. Thanks. And Sirius XM radio host and ABC News contributor Mike Muse is joining me now for more on the big game. Mike, these are two incredibly different, like just calling them very different quarterbacks feels like it doesn't even hammer home the point. Patrick Mahomes is his veteran. He's got two Super Bowl rings, a half a billion dollar contract yeah. going up against Mr. Irrelevant. Talk to me about this matchup and what you're watching for on Sunday. I love how you ended the question with the Mr. Irrelevant because it's you It's my favorite. Yeah. Like, just the fact that that is his nickname and here he is at the Super Bowl just showing it to everyone. You, know? you got it. For those who may not know what Mr. Irrelevant means, it was the person who gets selected last in the NFL draft. So you have Mr. Irrelevant, Brock Purdy, going up. Who will I love it so much. I know. It, it's a favorite thing. And it, who's going up um, against Patrick Mahomes, who is on the track uh, to be one of the greatest of all time. He hasn't given him the attribute of the GOAT yet, but if he continues in the direction that he is, he will become the GOAT. So you have Mr. Irrelevant going up a future uh, GOAT and Hall of Famer who's been at the Super Bowl twice already. And if Patrick Mahomes can lead his team uh, to the third Super Bowl, they will be uh, one of those teams that win three Super Bowls in five years positioning the Chief as one of those dynasty teams. And positioning him as one of those dynasty teams, it puts them on track uh, to be one of the greatest teams of all time. Mahomes is key in the clutch. He loves pressure. Uh, he has a way of making these very impossible plays, in particular coming down the stretch. The Chiefs had a rough start starting out in the season, but they really got fired up towards the back half of the season, particularly in the playoffs. I think momentum is on their side. The 49ers have been consistent in the regular season, but the question I am, because I'm slightly petty and because I'm 
I'm a Detroit Lions guy. <laughs> they, they got in there more so because the Lions lost the game oh, versus the 49ers okay. actually winning okay. the game. Um, and so, but uh, Mr. Relevant has a lot to prove. And as we know, football is all about mental. And so we'll see what he can overcome. What does this mean for Purdy, though? If he were to win, if the team wins on Sunday, for him to say, you know what, as last pick, I'm one of the lowest paid quarterbacks, <laughs> And now what? <laughs> it's more like, how do you like me now? Right, right? right. It is ultimate bragging rights. It is Mr. Irrelevant has become Mr. Irrelevant, right? But then it also, too, changes his trajectory uh, from endorsement deals to co strength of contract negotiations. He comes on from a strength of position. All right. So I'm one of those people that I want silence during the commercials because I want to pay attention to the ads. What are the big commercials you're watching for? <laughs> Diane, this is why you and I are friends. I am the exact <laughs> same way. Uh, I mean, how can you not, not like the Clydesdale Budweiser commercial? Yes. Those are traditional commercials that I just love. I love seeing them stump through the snow, so I'm curious to see how they're going to position that. I'm loving, too, what's hey. happening right now with the Beckhams, uh, Victoria and David Beckham. Today uh, they have tell a commercial the truth, with, right? yeah, Tell the truth. The Uber Eats. Eats. I love that commercial. I saw a sneak preview already. Orange. It's a riff off okay. the viral uh, sensation video that went so viral with them. Uh, her David, saying that she comes from a working tell class family, but he's like, you had a Rolls Royce. Yeah. Uh, so what car like, did your father drive? Exactly. And then also, too, I'm really excited to see the Christopher Walken and Usher um, okay. commercial okay. BMW. Oh. This is Usher moment, and I am so excited so uh, to see him in a commercial too, as yeah. well. And the Beehive is buzzing about a potential Verizon commercial. Uh, What's happening there? Diane, you're gonna get us in trouble with the Beehive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're onto something, though. Uh, when you look at the clip of the Verizon commercial, uh, you see the gentleman squeezing lemons. Uh, one could say that is a nod to Beyonce's uh, Lemonade album uh, that that she had. But literally at the end, Diane. You can hear a song for about two seconds. And the song sounds very familiar uh, to the song that was released during the Renaissance film uh, called My House. Um, and so there is speculation amongst the Beehive uh, that could this be a big announcement coming up? Don't forget, Diane, uh, Renaissance is three volumes. And so we still need volume two and three. So maybe we could see an announcement for volume two uh, coming out with Renaissance. I love the, the, the internet sleuths out there, especially yeah. when it comes to Beyonce. Um, we also have to talk about the halftime show. Usher. Some of us are looking forward to the Usher concert this weekend. We're already dancing, right? Diane. Like there's yeah. a football game happening, but really, we're watching yeah. Usher. So talk to me about that. I'm so excited, Diane, for Usher. And guess what? They gave our guy an extra two, three minutes. He now has a 15-minute halftime show. So he has the longest halftime show of any performance thus far. And that's because, Diane, he is the king of Vegas. He had this incredible residency that was absolutely sold out. Everyone loved it. Everybody's flying into it. You have to give the king of Vegas more time. He has a catalog. He has he has the voice, he has the choreography, he has the dance moves to fill up that entire full arena, and he is going to rock the house. Uh, my prediction is going to kick off with uh, You Don't Have to Call. Oh, I, I have a feeling of mid tempo. Adam Blackstone, when he produces his halftime, he's doing the pre halftime show, but he always says he likes to do the big hit second. Mike and I are already having a dance party here. All right, I got to go, but quick predictions. Who wins the game? Ah, the Chiefs. The Chiefs okay. take it, and Mahomes will be the MVP. You heard it here first. There you have <laughs> it from the else. Petty Lions fan, <laughs> our serious XM radio host, ABC News contributor Mike Muse. Thanks, Mike. I danced my ear thing off. <laughs> <laughs> and if you are hosting a Super Bowl party this year, you might be worried about those rising prices at the grocery store. So we've got some of the best food deals for your celebration that won't break the bank. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus <laughs> has the details on that. Alexis, we we want to enjoy the game, but we also want to save some money here. How do we do that if we're throwing a party this year? Yeah, week? I still have Usher in my head now after <laughs> that segment, guys. I love it. Unfortunately, inflation is showing up at your Super Bowl party because overall, the cost to celebrate the big game up about 4% compared to last year. But of course, there are some ways to save if you make the right menu choices. So let's take chicken wings, for instance. The price of fresh wings down about 5% this year. Frozen wings, you'll do even better there, down 11% compared to a year ago. If you love shrimp like me, and maybe a little shrimp cocktail to start things off, you're gonna be happy to hear that prices are down about six and a half percent. But beef prices, that's gonna be the big one, up about 12% from last year. And that's a staple at these parties, but a good cheaper alternative how about turkey for that game day chili or pulled pork sliders since pork prices are also down from last year. That's a favorite of mine. Throw that in the slow cooker and forget about it. 
Alexis, pizza and the Super Bowl go hand in hand, and so we're giving up for a, a big National Pizza Day celebration here in the studio. Yeah. What are the deals for Sunday? They abound if you are in the mood for pizza. Here are just a couple, Pizza Hut and Little Caesars, each offering $7 off on Grubhub. And Domino's, you knew somebody had to do it. They're targeting the Swifties out there with their perfect combo deal. You're going to get a bunch of goodies for just $19.89. Get it? And when you use the coupon code, 1387. Uh, you can decode that by, we know, right? We're Swifties. 13 is Taylor's lucky number, 87. Travis Kelsey, her boyfriend's jersey number. I don't have skin in this game because I'm a Giants fan. I just want to see a really good game. All right. Alexis Christophorus, we hope you get one. Thank you. <laughs> And you know this weekend, the Taylor and Travis love story will be buzzing. The big question is, will she be there in Vegas after her tour stop in Tokyo? For more on their relationship, set your alarm for the Impact by Nightline episode, Taylor and Travis, the pop star and the NFL player, airing right here on ABC News at 7 a.m. Eastern and 6 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. And after you get caught up there, head over to Hulu for a deeper dive into Usher's legendary career and a hint at what's to come this Super Bowl Sunday. You can watch the latest episode of Impact by Nightline, Usher, My Way to the Super Bowl, now streaming on Hulu. New episodes of Impact drop every Thursday. Coming up, moms on mushrooms, the dramatic increase in magic mushrooms being confiscated as more mothers say they're microdosing to help with stress. We'll explain the emerging trend and potential dangers and benefits. Also ahead, waking up in the middle of the night can be really annoying. So how can you stay asleep? You asked and Dr. Patel has the answer next. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift, you're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy, you should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you Usher down. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. A new report finds that law enforcement seizures of psychedelic mushrooms have increased dramatically all over the country. The report comes as a new trend is emerging. Moms microdosing to help deal with stress. Eva Pilgrim has more. A dramatic increase in magic mushrooms confiscated. A new study finding seizures of shrooms containing the psychoactive component psilocybin increased from 400 in 2017 to nearly 1,400 in 2022. These numbers coming as all across the country, the fascination with shrooms is growing. These are dried magic mushrooms. Tracy T is part of an emerging trend. Moms turning to microdosing to help deal with stress. Do you think you're a better mom on mushrooms? I think I'm a more empathetic mom. And I actually started listening and looking at my kid from the heart. 
In Colorado, where Tracy lives, growing, having, and using psilocybin in private isn't against the law. The state expects to begin allowing sales in a clinical setting starting in 2025. Colorado and Oregon are the only two states to legalize the use of the drug. Multiple cities in four other states have decriminalized it at the local level. But for all the attention on microdosing, the research is sparse. We know very little about microdosing. What I do say to people when they ask me, like, should I microdose? <laughs> uh, I say, well, um, I can't tell you that, but you should know that you're, you're kind of experimenting on yourself. For some, using psychedelics may trigger a severe psychiatric episode. They may also raise heart rate and blood pressure and have not been studied in pregnant or breastfeeding women. Experts say you should talk to your doctor before using them. And when you look at the study, the seizures of magic mushrooms are actually happening all over the country, the largest in the Midwest. The researchers say you can't look at those numbers and predict use, but they do acknowledge that attitude towards psychedelics have recently changed dramatically. Our thanks to Eva Pilgrim for that report. And it is time now for our weekly segment, But Tell It Like It Is, where ABC News contributor Dr. Lok Bachel shares health advice on the topics that matter most to you. And today he's answering some of your questions. So Dr. Patel, let's start with Zoe from Santa Monica. Zoe asks, if you only do drugs on the weekend, can you still have an addiction? You absolutely can. If you were just using a substance, even if it's cannabis or alcohol on the weekends, you can still show shines, signs of addiction or substance use disorder, such as wanting to cut down, but you can't, increase tolerance, withdrawal, putting yourself in risky situations, or your substance use affecting your home, social, or work life. And Diane, we do have studies showing that in a large proportion of patients who have weak end substance use, it can turn into weekday substance use. So if you or anyone you know is showing signs of addictions and wants help, it's important that you reach out to a healthcare professional. Treatment could be therapy, counseling, medications, or a combination of all three. And Christy from Oman wants to know, what's the best medicine for hives? I do appreciate our international audience asking such important questions. Itchy, scary, painful, itchy, sometimes hives. You know, the most important thing when it comes to treatment is understanding prevention and warning signs. Now, most people know that hives are those red raised bumps or patches that can be triggered by your immune system, and the triggers are everywhere. They could be bug bites, food, pollen, latex, medications, even extreme weather. And in some cases, if it's just isolated hives and nothing more serious, a healthcare professional may advise that you use a topical cooling lotion or a medication like an antihistamine. In cases of chronic hives, it could be steroids or another medication, but it's important to understand that hives could also be the sign of a severe allergic reaction, such as anaphylaxis, and these symptoms are broad. So if you notice anything like shortness of breath, you have faint nausea, vomiting, you feel confused, and you have hives or a previous history of severe allergies, you wanna make sure you seek It looks like we lost Dr. Patel. We will try to get him back, but in the meantime, Dr. Patel, thank you. And if you have questions for Dr. Patel, leave him a message on our Instagram feed. He might answer your question right here on Friday. Coming up, history through song. Award-winning singer Erica Campbell explains what makes gospel music the heart and soul of the black experience in America. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Are you kidding me? What would you do? 
You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamal Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Oh, my God! I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. I've never seen a place like this in my life. courthouse in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Olivia Rubin. Wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. A new PBS series is taking a deep dive into the origin story of gospel music. Gospel is known as the heart and soul of the black experience in America. Now the four-hour docu-series Gospel is exploring the rich history behind the music with a companion concert special, Gospel Live. Early this week, I spoke with Gospel African Live's American executive producer, Kristen Rip Carter, and Grammy-winning gospel singer, Erica Campbell, who's hosting and performing in the concert. Take a look. Kristen, talk to me about this project. What made you want to be involved with this and to help tell the story of gospel music? Gospel has been so important to my life and to the lives of so many people, not just African Americans. And so I loved what Henry Louis Gates was doing with the gospel documentary series. And they said they wanted a companion special. And I said, we need to get the best and the I'm brightest gospel and R&B artists out to really tell that story, to share songs that they don't normally perform, share them on our stage, and also tell the history of gospel. So I'm incredibly excited that Erica was our co-host for the event. She rocked it. She was amazing as a host and performer and really helped us tell that story. Erica, how did gospel come into your life? And of all the genres out there, why did you choose to focus on this one? Ooh, born and raised in a church family. My father was a preacher and a singer. My mom was a singer and the choir director. So it's kind of in my DNA. My, my mom said my earliest song was when I was two years old. My baby sister came home and uh, I'd been singing ever since. So it is a, a part of my life's journey and I feel like my purpose. Kristen, what would, can we expect to see in this special? What you can expect to see is spirit, community. The audience is celebrating with us the entire time Absolutely. from the moment that we start <laughs> That the sounds show. right. That's, uh, yes. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you talk about gospel, it's praise and worship, and we do that at its so finest. So you will on. definitely see Every a good number. celebration. You'll also see some reflection face. moments. We have packages that include our artists talking about how they feel about gospel, how they feel about the church experience and spirituality. So I think it gives a lot of community and also music moments as well. Yeah, and Erica, you've played with the genre a little bit, mixing in hip hop beats and other yeah. upbeat sounds with some viral songs like I Love God. Yeah. What made you want to do that? And where do you see the future of gospel music? I feel, I feel like church is my fueling station. So I go there to get filled and fueled. And then I go out in the world and share it. I'm trying to encourage and uplift and inspire. Life sucks sometimes. And so if you have someone just telling you, hang in there, you know, things get better. It won't be bad like this forever. Um, it gives them a little hope and we all need hope. And so. Um, it's, it's worked for me in my life. So I, you know, have to get close to the line and sometimes cross the line to reach an unchurched audience that they don't know about this amazing love that comes from this music, this gospel music that lives and breathes encouragement and inspiration. And, and so maybe people lean on music in hard times, even if it's listening Absolutely. to a breakup song or whatnot. Right. Yeah. And gospel has so much more behind it mm -hmm. in yes. terms of people leaning on gospel music in hard times. So. Kristen, what do you hope people take away 
from watching this docuseries and watching this special alongside it. I hope that people get back to the root of, of gospel, understanding it. We have our R&B and gospel artists um, singing songs that they used to play when they were younger mm -hmm. that inspired their careers. And I want people to take a look at the history of gospel and think about how gospel has helped them in their lives as well and get back to the roots of it. I love that. Well, thank you both so much for coming on. Kristen thank Carter, you. Erica Campbell, such a pleasure to meet you both. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you so much. And you can watch Gospel Live tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern on PBS. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. tuning in for Taylor Swift, you're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy, you should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you Usher now. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Rebecca Jarvis reporting from the New York Stock Exchange, and wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live First, President Biden is firing back. What he's saying about his memory and the special counsel report on his handling of classified information. The high-stakes Supreme Court hearing on Donald Trump's eligibility for re-election. The justices appeared skeptical of whether the former president can be removed from state ballots for his actions around January 6th, what it means for the race for the White House. And the fraud alert you need to know about, the common scams costing us billions and what you can do to avoid them. But we begin with President Biden defending his ability to do his job after a report from the special counsel investigating his handling of classified documents. Special counsel Robert Hur's report clears Biden of criminal wrongdoing for the mishandling of classified documents, but also describes the president as an elderly man with a poor memory, also describing his memory as hazy. 
Biden calls the report's assertions just plain wrong. Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has the latest. The very first sentence of Special Counsel Robert Hurst's 345-page report sums up the case. Quote, we conclude that no criminal charges are warranted in this matter. And Hurst flatly states the evidence does not establish that Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But to be clear, the special counsel said he did find some evidence that Biden intended to retain highly classified material. He pointed out that classified documents were found throughout Biden's Delaware home, in file cabinets, in his basement, even in his garage, basically among junk. And Hur says that Biden shared some of the information with a ghostwriter of his memoir. But Hur acknowledged the possibility that documents could have been sent to Biden's home and other offices without his knowledge, in other words, by accident. Another factor in Hur's decision, apparently the president's poor memory, which might make him sympathetic to a jury. Finally, Hur makes clear that Biden's case is different from that of former President Trump, who was charged with mishandling classified information. Biden quickly returned all the documents, fully cooperated, and even sat for five hours of interview. Mr. Trump, according to Hur, and I quote, did the opposite, even allegedly enlisting others to destroy evidence and lie about it. Diane. All right, Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas, thank you. And now President Biden is in damage control mode as his legal exoneration threatens to become a political liability. He's attacking the special counsel for questioning his memory and defending his decision to run for re-election. Chief White House Correspondent Mary Bruce has the latest on that part of the story. President Biden defiant, defending his handling of classified information and his memory, firing back at special counsel Robert Hur after he declined to prosecute the president but raised questions about Biden's mental acuity. Their task was to make a decision about whether to move forward with charges in this case. For any extraneous commentary, they don't know what they're talking about. Biden, well aware his age is a top concern for voters, defending himself. That's, that's you know what, your uh, memory has gotten worse, Mr. No, president? No, my memory is not gotten, my memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. None of you thought I could pass any of the things I got passed. How'd that happen? The report concludes the president should not face charges, saying Biden would likely present himself to a jury, as he did during our interview of him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. The special counsel describing Biden's recollection as painfully slow and his memory hazy, writing that Biden did not remember even within several years when his son Beau died. That conclusion clearly striking a chord. Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away or he passed away. How in the hell dare he raise that? Biden clearly frustrated as his age comes under increasing scrutiny. Mr. President, for months when you were asked about your age, you would respond with the words, watch me. Watch Many me. American people have been watching and they have expressed concerns about your age. That is they, your judgment. They, that is your judgment. To public that is not the judgment concerns. of the press. And defending his decision to run for re-election. I'm the most question. qualified person in this country to be president of the United States and finish the job I started. After 13 months of investigating, the special counsel determined there was evidence Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified materials from his time as vice president, but that he should not be prosecuted because the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But the president pushing back, denying the report's key findings that he held on to classified material. I've seen the headlines since the report was released about my willful retention of documents. This, these assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. Still, the president welcoming the news that this case is now closed and emphasizing that the report lays out the stark differences between his own case and former President Trump's handling of classified material, that Biden fully cooperated with authorities while Trump did the opposite. I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. Chief White House Correspondent Mary Bruce, thank you. And let's bring in White House Correspondent Mary Alice Parks, along with senior reporter Catherine Falders for more. Mary Alice, President Biden says he's pleased with the findings in the report, but he's clearly unhappy with some of the language in it. How damaging could this be for his campaign? 
Yeah, Diane, last night the president came out and really wanted to underscore the parts of the report that looked good for him, saying that it was clear from the report there were po the possibility that some of the documents uh, might have been placed without his knowledge by mistake. He even uh, quoted the report page, uh, chapter, and verse uh, talking about where exonerated him from any guilt. But he was so mad in the room, Diane, about that language, about his age and his memory. I was standing there and I asked the president if he feels that he is, his memory has gotten worse. Uh, and he, he said his memory is fine. He said, look what he's been able to get done. None of you thought that I could pass the things I got past. But I'm thinking back to that moment, especially where he talked about his son, the death of his son. Uh, the special counsel made note of it in his report and said that the president had a hard time remembering what year that even was. The president addressed that head on and became emotional in the room. I uh, said so that no one should question uh, that, that every day he remembers that day, that every day he thinks about the death of his son. He was furious, Diane. The question now is, will he be, he'll be able to transfer sort of that anger he has towards the special counsel, the defiance that he has about his age, into a convincing argument to voters uh, that his age is not an issue because it was hard to see anything beyond that anger last night. Now, Catherine, the report says that Biden also created classified documents and used some of that info to write his book. What does that mean and how significant is that? Well, creating as in taking notes off of classified materials, that material by nature is classified, but it gets directly to uh, this element of willful retention of classified information. It puts the ghostwriter right at the center of this report. It's interesting because special counsel Herr said that he considered actually charging Biden's ghostwriter with obstruction of justice. The ghostwriter deleted recordings of interviews that he had uh, with President Biden when Biden was describing this information. Ultimately, uh, as we know, Heard decided not to charge uh, the ghostwriter. He said that the ghostwriter um, gave plausible reasons uh, for doing it and that the ghostwriter cooperated. All right, Mary Ellis Parks, Catherine Falders, thank you both. And the Supreme Court is considering whether former President Trump can be disqualified from running for re-election due to his actions surrounding January 6th. As they heard arguments yesterday, the justices appeared skeptical of the unprecedented effort to ban former President Trump from the 2024 ballot in Colorado. Senior national correspondent Terry Moran has the latest on that story. A rare moment of agreement. The Supreme Court's liberal and conservative justices voicing shared skepticism about this case. At issue, a Colorado court's decision to ban Donald Trump from the 2024 ballot in that state based on Trump's alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election and his role on January 6th. The Colorado court found Trump violated the 14th Amendment, Section 3, which declares that no one who has taken an oath to support the Constitution and then engaged in insurrection can hold public office afterwards. During three hours of oral arguments, the justices methodically took apart that ruling. Justice Brett Kavanaugh, a Trump appointee. What about the idea that um, we should think about democracy, think about the right of the people to elect uh, candidates of their choice, uh, of letting the people decide? And Justice Elena Kagan, appointed by Barack Obama. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. Trump appointee Amy Coney Barrett agreeing. It just doesn't seem like a state call. But looming over these arguments, the national trauma of the attack on the Capitol. Even though Trump himself describes that day as beautiful, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson got Trump's lawyer to acknowledge the reality of what happened. For an insurrection, there needs to be an organized, concerted effort to overthrow the government of the United States through violence. And this it, So the point is that a chaotic effort to overthrow the government is not an insurrection? No, we didn't concede that it's an effort to overthrow the government either, Justice Jackson. Right? None of these criteria were met. This was a riot. It was not an insurrection. The events were shameful, criminal, violent, all of those things. But it did not qualify as insurrection, as that term is used in Section 3. But for Donald Trump, this day in court looked like a win. This was a great day. Our Supreme Court hopefully will be doing something in terms of helping our country and preserving democracy. Efforts are underway in more than 30 states to remove Trump from the ballot. So whatever the court decides in this case will have a major impact across the country. And a decision is expected before the Colorado primary, which is on March 5th. Diane? Senior National Correspondent Terry Moran, thank you.
Ukraine has a new general in charge of its military today. President Vladimir Zelensky abruptly removed his old commander-in-chief yesterday in the biggest shakeup of the country's military since the start of its war with Russia. Zelensky has now appointed a well-known general within the Ukrainian military to step in. ABC News foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge has more. The largest shakeup in Ukrainian military leadership since the war began. In a risky move, President Zelensky removing Ukraine's commander-in-chief, General Valery Zaluzhny. Zaluzhny, hugely popular among Ukrainian troops, credited for halting Russia's full-scale invasion in 2022. Zelensky's new top commander, General Sersky, now taking over at a critical time. With some Republicans blocking more US military aid for Ukraine, our team seeing firsthand last month how frontline Ukrainian artillery units are now running low on ammunition. Well, you can really feel the force of this American gun. In Congress, the stakes for Ukraine are high. If there's one other person besides Donald Trump who is rooting for chaos in the sen Senate, it is Vladimir Putin. And without that US aid, Russia threatening to capture this eastern Ukrainian city. Avdivka in ruins, with Russian forces now making significant advances here and threatening a broader offensive in the coming weeks. And foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge joins me now for more on this. Tom, you watched that interview between Tucker Carlson and Vladimir Putin. Did it offer any new revelations on where things stand between Russia and Ukraine? I don't think it really did, uh, Diane. I mean, look, we heard a lot of familiar grievances from Vladimir Putin on Ukraine, a lot of false narratives from the Russian leader, which we've heard time and time again. And what, and what was extraordinary about this interview, if we can really call it an interview from Carlson, was that he failed to challenge the Russian leader when the Russian leader made pretty ridiculous claims. For example, Vladimir Putin claimed that it was the West and Ukraine that started the war uh, two years ago and not Russia's unprovoked uh, invasion. And the Russian leader just, uh, sorry, Carlson just f failed to actually challenge him, him on that at all. What we did learn about is Evan Gershkovich, the American journalist in Russian jail for nearly a year now, Wall Street Journal reporter, Putin suggesting that he might be willing to release Gershkovich, saying talks for his release are ongoing. And I think that's the clearest sign yet, it offers some hope for Evan Gershkovich's supporters and his family. Diane? And Tom, President Zelensky also just changed Ukraine's commander in chief. Why shake up leadership in the Ukrainian military at this point in the war? Uh, because uh, Ukraine's counteroffensive over the summer failed. So Zelensky's saying now that he needs renewal. It's also because Ukraine needs to mobilize many more men into the military. We're expecting a new wave of mobilization soon. And we know from Zelensky himself and Zeluzhny, the general who's gone, that they were at loggerheads. They didn't agree on how that mobilization should take place. So, you know, it's not an ideal scenario. Western officials have admitted that there has been tension between the two men. But General Sersky, who's the new man in charge of the armed forces, is well known to the US and other allies. Uh, he's a very experienced general. And soldiers I've spoken to, some uh, sort of wary. They're, they're sad to see Zeluzhny. Uh, who was praised for holding Russia back in the early stages of the war. They're sad to see him go. But one soldier messaging me overnight saying, look, I've got full faith in, in Sirsky, the new general, and full faith that he is the right man to take on the job at a very difficult time for the Ukrainian military. Diane? Now, Tom, officials say Russia's firing five to ten times, excuse me, more shells than Ukraine. What does that do for where Ukraine stands right now, especially with Congress in the U.S. not passing any foreign military aid for Ukraine. Well, it's a massive dynamic. What people have to realize is that artillery is the cover fire for your infantry on the ground. So whether you are Russia at the moment trying to move forward or Ukraine, which is broadly on the defensive right now, if you don't have artillery, if your soldiers, your artillery units cannot fire, then your infantry on the ground are way more vulnerable. And what we're seeing right now in eastern Ukraine around a city called Avdivka, the Russians are now making significant advances, according to Ukrainian and Russian officials. And if the Russians take that city, and it looks like they are moving in that direction right now, it would be the most significant victory for Russia in, in at least a year. So it really is the momentum in this war moving in Russia's favor. Diane? All right, Tom Sufi Burridge in Paris, thank you.
Coming up, a fraud alert you need to know about. The common scams costing us billions and what you can do to avoid them. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I did, I did, I did, I did. Oh, my God. Oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh, are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamal Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Yeah. Oh I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Welcome back. A new report from the Federal Trade Commission says American lost more than $10 billion to scams last year. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus has more on that and your other business headlines. Alexis, what are you watching today? That's a staggering number, Diane. So this new FTC report finds Americans lost a record amount of money to fraud in 2023, more than $10 billion, and it's up 14% from the year before. Nearly half the fraud involved investment scams, including get-rich schemes promising guaranteed and immediate returns. Another popular scam, imposters pretending to be people or business you can trust and then convincing you to send the money. Email was the number one method of choice for these scammers, followed by phone calls and text messages. Donald Trump is coming to the defense of the maker of Budweiser beer. The former president's asking his supporters to give Anheuser-Busch a second chance after Bud Light's marketing promotion last year. Featuring transgender TikTok star Dylan Mulvaney sparked a customer boycott. Trump said the company is not woke and praised the beer maker's efforts to support farmers and create jobs for veterans. Trump's support comes just days before the Super Bowl when Bud Light will try to win back customers with some humorous ads. And Build-A-Bear Workshop has come a long way, you could say, from hosting kids' birthday parties. The stuffed animal company now offering adult-oriented bears like this one sporting mildly risque clothing, like T-shirts branded with Zaddy, that's a slang term for an attractive older man, or a bear dressed here like Hugh Hefner in a robe. The Build-A-Bear After Dark collection, as they're calling it, is only available online, so you kid can't stumble upon it in the store. You have to promise to be at least 18 years or older to enter the bear cave and that's not what I'm calling it that's what they're calling it the online. bear cave yeah, okay. can't make it up. well hello build a bear <laughs> Alexis Christophers thank you and if you have any finance questions for Alexis leave a message on her Instagram feed at ABC News live and she might answer your question right here on Thursday coming up if you couldn't guess by that last report, it is almost Valentine's Day. GMA Lifestyle contributor Lori Bergamato has all her favorite gifts for that special someone in your life. It's time for the right stuff when we come back. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Aaron Katursky in Worcester, Massachusetts. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. It is time for the right stuff with our friend GMA Lifestyle contributor Lori Bergamato. So every Friday, Lori brings us some of her favorite products. And this week, she's sharing the love with the best gifts for Valentine's Day. You can shop these products and what she shared on Good Morning America by scanning that QR code in the bottom left corner of your screen. So, Lori. I see chocolates. I mean, Talk to me. it can't be Valentine's Day without chocolate, can mm, it? A little sweet. Right? A little sweet. So these are from Compartes. If you guys don't know about this chocolate company, let me fill you in. They are one of the best, Diane. Handmade in LA, over 75 years of chocolate gourmet goodness. That's one of their best selling essentials. It comes wrapped in that um, faux leather green crocodile. I mean, it's gourmet. There's nuts, there's berries. Oh, They're that's known good. for taking sort of really interesting mm. modern spins on classic chocolate uh, tastes. So you can see their little hearts here. These are one of my personal favorites. These are the pink. Uh, are those macaroons? No, they're Oreos. No. They're chocolate covered Oreos. Oh, any one of these two. Pink chocolate. I mean, how Sorry can we make display, but... something iconic, what? even more iconic? Give it to mm. Compartes, guys. That is like next level chocolate. Everyone will love that. Yum. And speaking of next yeah, level. while I chow down, let's okay, talk Okay, I'll talk while you eat. Uh, these are from Urban Stems. I don't want to get poked here. Gorgeous, right? Orchids are the sort of thing that, you know, everybody, we love flowers. I love to send cut flowers, bouquets on Valentine's Day. But orchids from Urban Stems are the modern take. It's really, um, again, that modern take on a classic. And what we loved about these is that you can just click to buy. They go shipped anywhere in the country. They look beautiful. And a lot of times, like, this is a great thing if you want to send a Valentine to your mother, your sister, a teacher, a friend, like an aunt, because it lasts all year well, long. And these are alive. So unlike cut yes. flowers, they will actually stay and it grow gets, in your home. It keeps on giving, Unless you Diane. kill them like I often do, but that oh, we But you won't kill that. these. You will not kill these. Urban Stems is high these quality, affordable price. And you guys, there's a special discount code, so scan that QR beautiful. code. Beautiful. Um, okay, you have kids, I have kids. Yeah. They love a stuffed animal, people. And I saw you guys just did a Build-A-Bear story. There's now the plushies for the adults. Yeah, right? yeah, that was a different kind. That was Di a different segment. Different segment, but for this, you guys, these are for kids or for really anybody who will love them. 
My son is obsessed with this one. It's the I Love You Alotl. An axolotl, guys. Who doesn't love that? They've got their puppy here. This little uh, monster for your, you know, a monster plush for your favorite crush. And it's Build-A-Bear. So you get the certificate. You can even get some of these customized with that little voice recorder. So you can, you know, if you travel or something for business, you want to record your voice every time your loved one squeezes it. They'll get so to they hear can your squeeze voice. it into your voice even when yes. you're out there. Mine mm. says your your tag usually when I squeeze mine. It's like you can stream this ABC News Live. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you miss me kidding. so much when I'm I'm going, Diane, I'm sure. I do. Oh, but that's so sweet. Really though. I love that. Stuff. And everything's under hundred dollars. So you know, you can customize and make it more expensive. But we have all affordable options. Can you make one for your spouse so that they hear your voice? You yes, all around? the time. Clean I'm still the kitchen. Watching. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Lori Bergamato, thank, thank you. Thank you. And to shop these products and more of the right stuff, you can scan that QR code in the bottom left of your screen. And for your weekly roundup of the best lifestyle content from Lori and GMA, be sure to catch GMA Life. That's weekends at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 1 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live and streaming on Hulu. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, analysis, and every now and then chocolate-covered Oreos. We'll be right back. Tuning in for Taylor Swift, you're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my god. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy, you should put Super Bowl on there too. Usher Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. And that's why at Good Morning America, we're right here. And we got you. We got you. We got you. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You're looking at Las Vegas, where preparations for the Super Bowl are in full effect. And we will take you there in just a minute. But first, we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. President Biden is defending his ability to do his job after a report from the special counsel investigating his hand handling of classified documents. Special counsel Robert Hur's report clears Biden of criminal wrongdoing for the mishandling of classified documents, but also describes the president as an elderly man with a poor memory, also describing his memory as hazy. Biden calls the report's assertions just plain wrong. Parts of Wisconsin and Illinois are recovering after rare tornadoes damaged homes and farms. Now a new storm is bringing flooding and severe weather to the south. 12 states from Washington to Texas are under snow and avalanche alerts. The FCC has ruled the use of AI-generated voices in robocalls is illegal. 
The ruling takes effect immediately and will allow states to take legal action against bad actors during this year's election. The use of fraudulent AI-generated voices has been on the rise, including during the New Hampshire presidential primary. And the Los Angeles Lakers are honoring Kobe Bryant with a new statue outside their arena. The 19-foot-high bronze statue shows the Hall of Famer as he walked off the court after his 81-point game in 2006. It's the first of three statues of the five-time champion. One will feature him with his daughter, Gianna, who was among those killed with Bryant in a helicopter crash four years ago. And excitement is building as the Chiefs and 49ers prepare to face off in the biggest football game of the year this Sunday. Thousands of football fans are descending on Las Vegas as the city ramps up for its first ever Super Bowl weekend. ABC's Will Reeve is in Las Vegas with more. The excitement is building for Super Bowl 58. We gotta bring the Bay to Vegas, you know, keep it faithful. Fans descending on Las Vegas. Who doesn't love Vegas? An expected 330,000 of them. Many taking it all in at the Super Bowl experience. We're starving for this. Kansas City, they've had it. They've had it. It's our turn now. What do you like about the Chiefs? I like, like how their team like is like put together and like they know how to win. Allegiant Stadium expected to hold 72,000 fans for the big game, and it's a hot ticket. StubHub saying it's the third best-selling Super Bowl ever. The get-in price hovering around $6,000, and an average ticket costing nearly $9,000. Purdy stays up on his feet somehow. The main event may well be worth the money when the 49ers and the Chiefs battle it out on Sunday. All of the strain, the stress is to get to this moment. It's going to be a great challenge, and, and for all of us, the receivers, O-line, everybody, we got to be on point for this one. San Francisco's been one of the best teams in the NFL all season, and red-hot Kansas City is seeking their second consecutive title. And it's caught by Kelsey for the touchdown. The number three is, uh, is a big number in terms of uh, dynasties and things like that, so... Hopefully we can get this thing and yeah, you guys can start talking about dynasties. I just, I'm trying to get this third ring though. I mean, uh, someone's got to be the underdog. Um, and so uh, they've been a great football team all year long. Um, so they deserve to be the favorite in this game. And all we can do is go out there and play our best football. And Will Reeve is there in Vegas in the center of it all. Well, it looks like Vegas is already pumped up. Oh, it absolutely is, Diane. And my friends here from the Chiefs and 49ers are pumped up as well at this early hour. It, it, Vegas is a spectacle to begin with. So when you add the Super Bowl on top of it, of course, it's going to be even bigger. There's 330,000 fans expected to be here uh, this week. We were walking around the Super Bowl experience yesterday. Fans from all over just here to take it all in. Some are going to the game, some are not, just here to enjoy everything that Vegas has to offer. But I think now that we're headed into the weekend, everyone's really getting their mind right and focused on the big game. Well, I'm trying really hard to focus on you, but the mascots are really stealing the show right now, I have to say. <laughs> Talk okay, to me about... The mascots are stealing the show? I'm well, absolutely who, who knew, loving, right? loving the energy. How are the teams preparing? Well, walk me through this. So the teams, Diane, are staying at hotels about 25 miles away from Las Vegas. The NFL said we're putting the teams as far away from the Strip as possible because it is all about the game. And what the teams do is a lot of media at the beginning of the week when they get here, there's the big opening night and there's all the media availability. And then as the week goes on, it becomes more and more about the football. They go through walkthroughs without pads on just to sort of figure out their plays go through some reps, and then things intensify as the week goes on. Travis Kelsey actually said that at Wednesday's practice, when the starters on offense and defense were going against each other, things got chippy, which said it really, he said it really fired him up. I think, you know, once the teams are going against each other in that way, they're ready to play the game. And now we're just two days away from that actually happening. All right, sounds good. Well, Reeve in Las Vegas, maybe having too much fun. We appreciate it, Will. Thank you. You got it. Thanks. And Sirius XM radio host and ABC's contributor Mike Muse is joining me now for more on the big game. Mike, these are two incredibly different, like just calling them very different quarterbacks feels like it doesn't even hammer home the point. Patrick Mahomes is his veteran. He's got two Super Bowl rings, a half a billion dollar contract, yeah. going up against Mr. Irrelevant. Talk to me about this matchup and what you're watching for on Sunday. I love how you ended the question with the Mr. Irrelevant because it's you're... It's my favorite. Yeah. Like just the fact that that is his nickname and here he is at the Super Bowl just showing it to everyone. You, know? you got it. For those who may not know what Mr. Irrelevant means, it was the person who gets selected last in the NFL draft. So 
So you have Mr. Irrelevant, Brock Purdy, going up. Who will I love it so much. I know, it, it's a favorite thing. And it, who's going up um, against Patrick Mahomes, who is on the track uh, to be one of the greatest of all time. He hasn't given him the attribute of the GOAT yet, but if he continues in the direction that he is, he will become the GOAT. So you have Mr. Relevant going up a future uh, GOAT and Hall of Famer who's been at the Super Bowl twice already. And if Patrick Mahomes can lead his team uh, to the third Super Bowl, they will be uh, one of those teams that have won three Super Bowls in five years, positioning the Chief as one of those dynasty teams. And positioning him as one of those dynasty teams, it puts them on track uh, to be one of the greatest teams of all time. Mahomes is key in the clutch. He loves pressure. Uh, he has a way of making these very impossible plays, in particular coming down the stretch. The Chiefs had a rough start starting out in the season, but they really got fired up towards the back half of the season, particularly in the playoffs. I think momentum is on their side. The 49ers have been consistent in the regular season, but the question I am, because I'm slightly petty and because I'm a Detroit <laughs> Lions guy, they, they got in there more so because the Lions lost the game oh, versus the 49ers okay. actually winning okay. the game. Um, and so, but uh, Mr. Relevant has a lot to prove. And as we know, Football is all about mental, and so we'll see what he can overcome. What does this mean for Purdy, though? If he were to win, if the team wins on Sunday, for him to say, you know what, as last pick, I'm one of the lowest paid quarterbacks, and now what? <laughs> it's more like, how do you like me now? Right, right? right. It is ultimate bragging rights. It is Mr. Irrelevant has become Mr. Relevant, right? But then it also, too, changes his trajectory uh, from endorsement deals to con strength of contract negotiations. He comes on from a strength of position. All right, so I'm one of those people that I want silence during the commercials because I want to pay attention to the ads. What are the big commercials you're watching for? <laughs> Diane, this is why you and I are friends. I am the exact <laughs> same way. Uh, I mean, how can you not, not like the Clydesdale Budweiser commercial? Yes. Those are traditional commercials that I just love. I love seeing them stump through the snow, so I'm curious to see how they're going to position that. I'm loving, too, what's hey. happening right now with the Beckhams, uh, Victoria and David Beckham. Uh, they, they have tell a commercial the truth, with, right? yeah, Tell the Truth, the Uber sure. Eats. I love that commercial. I saw a sneak preview already. Orange. It's a riff off okay. the viral uh, it's sensation it's video that went Went viral with them, but heard David, saying I'm that she comes from a working Tell class family. But he's like, you had a Rolls Royce. Yeah. Uh, so what like, car did your father drive? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then also too, uh, I'm really excited to see the Christopher oh, Walken and uh, Usher um, okay. commercial B and W. Oh. This is Usher moment, and I am so excited so uh, to see him in a commercial too as well. Yeah. And the Beehive is buzzing about a potential Verizon commercial. Uh, What's happening there? Diane, you're gonna get us in trouble with the Beehive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're onto something though. Uh, when you look at the clip of the Verizon commercial, uh, you see the gentleman squeezing lemons. Uh, one could say that is a nod to Beyonce's uh, Lemonade album uh, that, that she had, but literally at the end, Diane, you can hear a song for about two seconds, and the song sounds very familiar uh, to the song that was released during the Renaissance film uh, called My House. Um, and so there is speculation amongst the Beehive uh, that could this be a big announcement coming up? Don't forget, Diane, uh, Renaissance is three volumes and so we still need volume two and three so maybe we can see an announcement for volume two uh, coming out with renaissance i love the the, the internet sleuths out there especially yeah. when it comes to beyonce <laughs> um we also have to talk about the halftime show usher some of us are looking forward to the Usher concert this weekend. We're already dancing, right? Diane. Like, there's yeah, yeah. a football game happening, but really, we're watching yeah. Usher. So talk to me about that. I'm so excited, Diane, for Usher. And guess what? They gave our guy an extra two, three minutes. He now has a 15-minute halftime show. So he has the longest halftime show of any performance thus far. And that's because, Diane, he is the king of Vegas. He had this incredible residency that was absolutely sold out. Everyone loved it. Everybody's flying into it. You have to give the king of Vegas more time. He has a catalog. He has has the voice, he has the choreography, he has the dance moves to fill up that entire full arena, and he is going to rock the house. Uh, my prediction is going to kick off with uh, You Don't Have to Call. Oh, I, I have a feeling of mid tempo. Adam Blackstone, when he produces his halftime, he's doing the pre halftime show, but he always says he likes to do the <laughs> big hit second. Mike and I are already having a dance party here. All right, I gotta go, but quick predictions. Who wins the game? Ah, the Chiefs. The Chiefs okay. take it, and Mahomes will be the MVP. You heard it here first. There you have <laughs> it from the else. Petty Lions fan, <laughs> our serious XM radio host, ABC News contributor Mike Muse. Thanks, Mike. I danced my ear thing. <laughs> <laughs> and if you are hosting a Super Bowl party this year, you might be worried about those rising prices at the grocery store. So we've got some of the best food deals for your celebration that won't break the bank. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus <laughs> has the details on that. Alexis, we we want to enjoy.
game, but we also want to save some money here. How do we do that if we're throwing a party this year? Yeah, I still have Usher in my head now after that <laughs> segment, guys. I love it. Unfortunately, inflation is showing up at your Super Bowl party because overall, the cost to celebrate the big game up about 4% compared to last year. But of course, there are some ways to save if you make the right menu choices. So let's take chicken wings, for instance. The price of fresh wings down about 5% this year. Frozen wings, you'll do even better there, down 11% compared to a year ago. If you love shrimp like me, and maybe a little shrimp cocktail to start things off, you're gonna be happy to hear that prices are down about six and a half percent. But beef prices, that's gonna be the big one, up about 12% from last year. And that's a staple at these parties, but a good cheaper alternative how about turkey for that game day chili? Or pulled pork sliders, since pork prices are also down from last year. That's a favorite of mine. Throw that in the slow cooker and forget about it. And pizza and the Super Bowl go hand in hand. So what are the pizza deals we can look forward to for Sunday? They abound if you are in the mood for pizza. Here are just a couple, Pizza Hut and Little Caesars, each offering $7 off on Grubhub. And Domino's, you knew somebody had to do it. They're targeting the Swifties out there with their perfect combo deal. You're gonna get a bunch of goodies for just $19.89, get it? And when you use the coupon code, 1387. Uh, you can decode that by, we know, right? We're Swifties. 13 is Taylor's lucky number, 87. Travis Kelsey, her boyfriend's jersey number. I don't have skin in this game because I'm a Giants fan. I just want to see a really good game. All right. Alexis Christophorus, we hope you get one. Thank you. <laughs> And you know this weekend, the Taylor and Travis love story will be buzzing. The big question is, will she be there in Vegas after her tour stop in Tokyo? For more on their relationship, set your alarm for the Impact by Nightline episode. Taylor and Travis, the pop star and the NFL player, airing right here on ABC News at 7 a.m. Eastern and 6 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. And after you get caught up there, head over to Hulu for a deeper dive into Usher's legendary career and a hint at what's to come this Super Bowl Sunday. You can watch the latest episode of Impact by Nightline, Usher, My Way to the Super Bowl, now streaming on Hulu. New episodes of Impact drop every Thursday. Coming up, moms on mushrooms, the dramatic increase in magic mushrooms being confiscated as more mothers say they're microdosing to help with stress. We'll explain the emerging trend and potential dangers and benefits. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Oh my! Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're gonna be tuning in for us too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you Usher now. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. Lust, greed, betrayal. 
This is one of the most complex investigations I've ever seen. 2020 true crime. They had gunshot wounds to their heads and torsos. It was hard to believe. We discovered she had a second career as an escort. She had three cameras at her apartment. Did these cameras capture her killer? Sealed with a kill. No one could have fathomed how twisted this story would become. 2020, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. Sunday, the legal blockbusters, President Biden and the special counsel report former President Trump and the Supreme Court hearing. Now, Sunday, all the fallout, the impact on the 2024 race, and what happens next for both sides on ABC's This Week. Good Morning America next week kicks off Monday with Ryan Seacrest Live. Good Morning America. And get ready to laugh because J.B. Smoove and Amy Schumer are in the GMA house on America's favorite morning show, Good Morning America. Welcome back to ABC News Live. A new report finds that law enforcement seizures of psychedelic mushrooms have increased dramatically all over the country. The report comes as a new trend is emerging. Moms microdosing to help deal with stress. Eva Pilgrim has more. A dramatic increase in magic mushrooms confiscated. A new study finding seizures of shrooms containing the psychoactive component psilocybin increased from 400 in 2017 to nearly 1,400 in 2022. These numbers coming as all across the country, the fascination with shrooms is growing. These are dried magic mushrooms. Tracy T is part of an emerging trend. Moms turning to microdosing to help deal with stress. Do you think you're a better mom on mushrooms? I think I'm a more empathetic mom. And I actually started listening and looking at my kid from the heart. In Colorado, where Tracy lives, growing, having, and using psilocybin in private isn't against the law. The state expects to begin allowing sales in a clinical setting starting in 2025. Colorado and Oregon are the only two states to legalize the use of the drug. Multiple cities in four other states have decriminalized it at the local level. But for all the attention on microdosing, the research is sparse. We know very little about microdosing. What I do say to people when they ask me, like, should I microdose? <laughs> uh, I say, well, um, I can't tell you that, but you should know that you're, you're kind of experimenting on yourself. For some, using psychedelics may trigger a severe psychiatric episode. They may also raise heart rate and blood pressure and have not been studied in pregnant or breastfeeding women. Experts say you should talk to your doctor before using them. And when you look at the study, the seizures of magic mushrooms are actually happening all over the country, the largest in the Midwest. The researchers say you can't look at those numbers and predict use, but they do acknowledge that attitude toward psychedelics have recently changed dramatically. Our thanks to Eva Pilgrim for that report. And it is time now for our weekly segment, But Tell It Like It Is, where ABC News contributor Dr. Lok Bachel shares health advice on the topics that matter most to you. And today he's answering some of your questions. So Dr. Patel, let's start with Zoe from Santa Monica. Zoe asks, if you only do drugs on the weekend, can you still have an addiction? You absolutely can. If you were just using a substance, even if it's cannabis or alcohol on the weekends, you can still so shine signs of addiction or substance use disorder, such as wanting to cut down, but you can't increase tolerance, withdrawal, putting yourself in risky situations, or your substance use affecting your home, social, or work life. And Diane, we do have studies showing that in a large proportion of patients who have weak end substance use, it can turn into weekday substance use. So if you or anyone you know is showing signs of addictions and wants help, it's important you reach out to a health professional. Treatment could be therapy, counseling, medications, or a combination of all three. And Christy from Oman wants to know, what's the best medicine for hives? I do appreciate our international audience asking such important questions. Itchy, scary, painful, itchy, sometimes hives. You know, the most important thing when it comes to treatment is understanding prevention and warning signs. Now, most people know that hives are those red raised bumps or patches that can be triggered by your immune system, and the triggers are everywhere. They could be bug bites, food, pollen, latex, medications, even extreme weather. And in some cases, if it's just isolated hives and nothing more serious, healthcare professional may advise that you use a topical cooling lotion or a medication like an antihistamine. 
Dr. Patel, thank you. And if you have questions for Dr. Patel, leave him a message on our Instagram feed. He might answer your question right here on Friday. Coming up, history through song. Award-winning singer Erica Campbell explains what makes gospel music the heart and soul of the black experience in America. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I did, I did, I did, I did. Oh, my God. Oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Oh, yeah. I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is a bizarre and twisted case of a fatal attraction. Am I ever gonna love again? What if you were being stalked by a past lover? My phone starts blowing up. I hate you. You ruined my life. Only to then find out the person you thought was stalking you was... Could it be that she's actually been dead this entire time? What? So, if she's been dead, who's the stalker? Who's the victim? This is despicable. Bad Romance, the 2020 limited series, Monday night on ABC. Reporting from Harvard University, I'm Selena Wang. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. A new PBS series is taking a deep dive into the origin story of gospel music. Gospel is known as the heart and soul of the black experience in America. Now the four-hour docu-series Gospel is exploring the rich history behind the music with a companion concert special, Gospel Live. Early this week, I spoke with Gospel Live's executive producer, Kristen Carter, and Grammy-winning gospel singer, Erica Campbell, who's hosting and performing in the concert. Take a look. Kristen, talk to me about this project. What made you want to be involved with this and to help tell the story of gospel music? Gospel has been so important to my life and to the lives of so many people, not just African Americans. And so I loved what Henry Louis Gates was doing with the gospel documentary series. And they said they wanted a companion special. And I said, we need to get the best and the brightest gospel and R&B artists out to really tell that story, to share songs that they don't normally perform, share them on our stage, and also tell the history of gospel. So I'm incredibly excited that Erica was our co-host for the event. She rocked it. She was amazing as a host and performer and really helped us tell that story. Erica, how did gospel come into your life? And of all the genres out there, why did you choose to focus on this one? Ew, born and raised in the church family. My father was a preacher and a singer. My mom was a singer and the choir director. So it's kind of in my DNA. My, my mom said my earliest song was when I was two years old and my baby sister came home. And uh, I'd been singing 
ever since. So it is a, a part of my life's journey and I feel like my purpose. Kristen, what can we expect to see in this special? What you can expect to see is spirit, community. The audience is celebrating with us the entire time Absolutely. from the moment that we start. <laughs> that the sounds show. right. That's yes. uh, that track. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you talk about gospel, it's praise and worship, and we do that at its finest. So you will definitely see a good celebration. You'll also see some reflection moments. We have packages that include our artists talking about how they feel about gospel, how they feel about the church experience and spirituality. So I think it gives a lot of community and also music moments as well. Yeah, and Erica, you've played with the genre a little bit, mixing in hip hop beats and other yeah. upbeat sounds with some viral songs like I Love God. Yeah. What made you want to do that? And where do you see the future of gospel music? I feel, I feel like church is my fueling station. So I go there to get filled and fueled. And then I go out in the world and share it. I'm trying mm -hmm. to encourage and uplift and inspire. Life sucks sometimes. And so if you have someone just telling you, hang in there, you know, things get better. It won't be bad like this forever. Um, it gives them a little hope and we all need hope. And so. Um, it's, it's worked for me in my life. So I, you know, have to get close to the line and sometimes cross the line to reach an unchurched audience that they don't know about this amazing love that comes from this music, this gospel music that lives and breathes encouragement and inspiration. And, and so maybe people lean on music in hard times, even if it's listening Absolutely. to a breakup song or whatnot. Right. Yeah. And gospel has so much more behind it mm -hmm. in yes. terms of people leaning on gospel music in hard times. So. Kristen, what do you hope people take away from watching this docu-series and watching this special alongside it? I hope that people get back to the root of, of gospel, understanding it. We have our R&B and gospel artists um, singing songs that they used to play when they were younger mm -hmm. that inspired their careers. And I want people to take a look at the history of gospel and think about how gospel has helped them in their lives as well and get back to the roots of it. I love that. Well, thank you both so much for coming on. Kristen Carter, Erica Campbell, such a pleasure to meet you both. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank, thank you, you so much. And you can watch Gospel Live tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern on PBS. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families trunk. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Memphis, Tennessee, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
get right to some new developments in the Middle East. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he's ordered the IDF to come up with a dual plan to evacuate Gaza's southern town of Rafah as Israel prepares for a ground invasion of the city. This comes as White House officials say the U.S. won't support Israel sending its troops in if it doesn't consider the impact to civilians. I'm of the view, as you know, that the conduct of the response in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip, has been um, over the top, and it's got to stop. Number. Foreign correspondent James Longman joins me now from Tel Aviv with more on this. James, Israel says the evacuation needs to happen before disbanding the Hamas battalions allegedly located there. Now, many of the Gazans in Rafah say they went there to get away from the fighting elsewhere in the region. So how realistic is it for the estimated 1.5 million people there to now leave? Yeah, Dan, it remains really unclear. Palestinians, they say this is not evacuation, this is forced displacement. Uh, where would they go? Where else in Gaza? Uh, much of the rest of the Gaza Strip has been almost entirely obliterated. There are refugee camps, but they are not safe. Uh, just today, Hamas says that 15 people were killed in the Rafah area alone uh, from airstrikes. So, yes, Rafah has been this area of shelter for uh, months now, but it hasn't been outside of the conflict. It's, it's also been a dangerous place, but from the sky. Uh, now, the danger, I think, people in that uh, city very much feel could come from the ground, could come from some kind of ground incursion. And yes, Benjamin Netanyahu is talking about the chance to, to evacuate, but where exactly to? Inside Gaza or out of Gaza? And that is an incredibly, incredibly touchy subject. There are people here in Israel who say that uh, Palestinians, they could come up with a plan to, to get them to leave Gaza, to go to other Arab states. This is massively controversial in a conflict which is all, all about uh, competing claims to land. And every time we talk to Palestinians, when we get the chance inside Gaza, of course, we can't go to where they are because Israel doesn't allow us. But uh, when we're able to speak to them on the phone uh, they and, and, and about their plans for the future, if there is one, they all say they are not going anywhere. Even if their homes are destroyed, they do not want to leave Gaza. They feel very strongly about that. So, yes, Benjamin Netanyahu has spoken about this plan for an evacuation, but it remains unclear just exactly where uh, all these people can go. One point two, up to 1.5 million people. Rafa, the population of Rafa has grown six times during the course of just four months. Diane? Wow. James, UNICEF also says thousands more could die if fighting escalates in Rafa. How dire is the situation there right now? Well, the uh, Norwegian Refugee Council has said that this is the largest displacement camp in the world. Uh, people don't have regular access to running water, to food, to sanitation. There are areas uh, where the Israeli forces have been telling civilians to go to to escape fighting all through for the last four months. They've given them zones where they're, they say they're able to go. The method of communication uh, is, has been uh, difficult. A lot of the time they're asked to log on to a screen and, and it's a digital, it's a QR code they're asked to scan, well, in a place where, where you can't really get much power. A lot of people's phones won't be working. There's very little internet connection. That's difficult enough as it is. But once they have made their way to these places, uh, often there's no sanitation. There are, we're told, stories of hundreds of people using uh, one toilet, uh, that it's very difficult for to get the right amount of food for children, that prices uh, inside uh, Gaza have skyrocketed just because there is so little getting in. And we know there are aid trucks. There have been big conversations around how many aid trucks can get in. Even on a day when uh, 80, 100 aid trucks get into Gaza, that is just a drop in the ocean for the sheer amount of need that is there. Remember, it was already a place that relied very heavily on aid before this war began. Diane? And James, an Israeli political source tells ABC News Netanyahu will likely send negotiators to Cairo in the next few days. So where do ceasefire deal and hostage negotiations currently stand? Well, when Benjamin Netanyahu the other day rejected uh, Hamas's counter proposal. He said that it was delusional. He said that there was no way that he could allow Hamas to remain uh, in Gaza. It felt like a deal was dead. But Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, was here and he said, look, 
Netanyahu hasn't completely closed the door on a deal. There is still space for an agreement and a lot of pressure inside Israel on the government to try to get those uh, hostages out. I think, though, there was a lot of disappointment here that, that perhaps they did feel that they were on the edge of something. Uh, but it, it, if we're not back at square one, we're, we're very close to it. Uh, it is clearly a race against time uh, for these hostages, up to 30 of whom we understand have already died in captivity. Diane. All right, foreign correspondent James Longman in Tel Aviv, thank you. And President Biden is defending his ability to do his job after a report from the special counsel investigating his handling of classified documents. Special counsel Robert Hur's report clears Biden of criminal wrongdoing for the mishandling of classified documents, but also describes the president as an elderly man with a poor memory and describing his memory as hazy. Now President Biden is pushing back on calls uh, and calls the report just plain wrong. Chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce has the latest. President Biden defiant, defending his handling of classified information and his memory, firing back at special counsel Robert Hur after he declined to prosecute the president but raised questions about Biden's mental acuity. Their task was to make a decision about whether to move forward with charges in this case. For any extraneous commentary, they don't know what they're talking about. Biden, well aware his age is a top concern for voters, defending himself. That's, Do you that's feel what your I'm, memory has gotten worse, Mr. No, President? No, my memory is not good. My memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. None of you thought I could pass any of the things I got passed. How'd that happen? The report concludes the president should not face charges, saying Biden would likely present himself to a jury, as he did during our interview of him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. The special counsel describing Biden's recollection as painfully slow and his memory hazy, writing that Biden did not remember even within several years when his son Beau died. That conclusion clearly striking a chord. Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away or passed away. How in the hell dare he raise that? Biden clearly frustrated as his age comes under increasing scrutiny. Mr. President, for months when you were asked about your age, you would respond with the words, watch me. Watch Many me. American people have been watching, and they have expressed concerns about your age. That is they, your judgment. They, that is your is judgment. To public that is not the judgment of the press. And defending his decision to run for re-election. I'm the most question. qualified person in this country to be president of the United States and finish the job I started. After 13 months of investigating, the special counsel determined there was evidence Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified materials from his time as vice president, but that he should not be prosecuted because the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But the president pushing back, denying the report's key findings that he held on to classified material. I've seen the headlines since the report was released about my willful retention of documents. This, these assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. Still, the president welcoming the news that this case is now closed and emphasizing that the report lays out the stark differences between his own case and former President Trump's handling of classified material, that Biden fully cooperated with authorities while Trump did the opposite. I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. Chief White House Correspondent Mary Bruce, thank you. Let's bring in White House Correspondent Mary Alice Parks along with senior reporter Catherine Falders for more. Catherine, what stands out to you from this report? I think the big headline here and what stands out to me, of course, is this willful uh, retention of information along with uh, what the documents exactly said and what they were about. Uh, we know that there is policy related to Afghanistan. Some of these documents uh, top secret, according to the report. Uh, the other element of this is that Biden also took notes from notebooks. We learned uh, a lot about his ghostwriter, his former ghostwriter, who uh, appears to be uh, at the center of this report. The Her report said that they considered uh, charging the ghost with obstruction of justice because he uh, deleted, destroyed recordings of interviews uh, that he had done with Biden for Biden's uh, memoir. The report says, goes on to say that they decided not to do that because the ghostwriter uh, cooperated. But uh, those big headlines uh, at least stood out to me, of course, at the center of this, that willful uh, retention, which Biden is denying.
Now, Mary Alice, President Biden says he's pleased with the findings of this report, but clearly he's unhappy with some of the language in it. So how's the White House responding to it? Yeah, Daniel, the president's lawyers responded directly to the special counsel's report. They said that those characterizations of his memory were not accurate, misguided, inappropriate. We saw the president himself last night respond to some of that specific language. He started off by saying he is an elderly man. He is well-meaning, uh, but he says that he can do the job. It was interesting, though, to see his tone. He was clearly angry. He played that moment there where he even raised his voice at reporters uh, when they asked about whether vo his message to voters who are concerned about his age. He said, that's your judgment, that's your judgment. But we know in reality, it's not just the judgment of the press. There are voters, there are tons of polls that show voters are concerned about his age, raising questions about his age. It's hard to see how he did himself any favors last night, seeming so defensive, so defiant uh, in the face of those real questions, Diane. Now, Catherine, former President Trump, meanwhile, is facing criminal charges stemming from his alleged mishandling of classified documents. So what's the latest in that case, and how do these cases compare to each other? Well, it was interesting that her made a point to write in his report the differences between the two. Of course, uh, we know former President Trump uh, decided to ignore a subpoena. He misleded, allegedly, his own, uh, misled his own lawyers. He essentially said that these documents were his. He refused to give them back for uh, over a year. So big differences here. We know that next week there will be hearings in the classified documents case. These will be under seal, uh, so we won't be allowed in, obviously, because they're discussing uh, classified classified information. I'm told that Trump uh, is likely to attend uh, that next week, so we might uh, get a better sense there. But we don't know yet if this uh, ultimately will go to trial, the Trump case. It's scheduled uh, for May, the classified documents case, but that's likely to get pushed, Diane. All right, Mary Alice Parks, Catherine Falders, thank you both. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court is considering whether former President Trump can be disqualified from running for re-election due to his actions surrounding January 6th. As they heard arguments yesterday, the justices appeared skeptical of the unprecedented effort to ban former President Trump from the 2024 ballot in Colorado. What about the idea that um, we should think about democracy, think about the right of the people to elect uh, candidates of their choice, uh, of letting the people decide? I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. Former President Trump called it a great day, saying hopefully the court will preserve democracy. And the January 6th attack on the Capitol and those investigations into Trump's and Biden's handling of classified documents are looming over the election cycle. This is former President Trump is celebrating his win in the Nevada caucus overnight. Trump cruised to victory after Nikki Haley ran in the separate state primary on Tuesday, losing to the option of none of these candidates. ABC News political director Rick Klein joins me now for more on that. Rick Haley says she wasn't worried about winning in Nevada because she called it a scam rigged for Trump. She says she didn't spend a dollar there. So how significant is this win for Trump? Yeah, nobody paid attention to Nevada because the, the Trump-aligned forces had created this separate caucus system. Uh, a lot of candidates uh, early on realized that they were not going to be competitive. They gave up on it and kind of wrote it off. That said, I think the more significant news was the one you just referenced about the primary, where she was on the ballot and Trump wasn't and lost to nobody, to none of these candidates. Uh, doesn't have any meaning, but it's a kind of uh, symbolic loss for her that adds to the substantive losses that she has been suffering. Bottom line is she didn't get any de uh, delegates out of Nevada. She lost badly in Iowa. She lost by double digits in New Hampshire. Um, puts more emphasis on the possible breakthrough her hopeful that, that she hopes for 15 days from now in her home state of South Carolina. But uh, it sure doesn't seem like there's a lot of energy in her campaign right now as she soldiers forward and, and hopes to get through Super Tuesday. Now, this ballot challenge before the Supreme Court isn't the only case the court could hear involving former President Trump and his role in January 6th. So how could that impact his run, assuming he is still on the ballot in November? Yeah, I think pretty clearly he's going to be on the ballot in Colorado and elsewhere. Uh, there's even ways that the Republican Party in Colorado could try to do an end around if, if there was a surprise ruling that kept him off. But much more significant is the, the case that could be before the Supreme Court soon of his sweeping claims of, uh, of presidential immunity from uh, prosecution against anything he did while president. Uh, that would cover all of the actions on and around January 6th while he was still president. Uh, and it would make that part of the special counsel's uh, investigation into him essentially go away. 
way. Uh, that has now been decided by a, by a panel of circuit court judges this week that kind of t picked apart every single argument that the Trump team put forward. Uh, but if it goes to the full circuit court and or the Supreme Court, uh, that could be far more consequential. And I think probably the most important thing, Diane, is how fast they rule, because the clock is Donald Trump's friend until it isn't. The best play he's got here is to, to, to prolong this as close to or even beyond the presidential election. If he were to become president again, he could ask his Justice Department to drop the charges or he could even potentially pardon himself. How damaging could the special counsel report on President Biden's handling of classified info be to his campaign? Look, it's far less, I think, about the, the details of classified information than about the details of, uh, of, of, his, of his own mental ability, as documented by the special counsel. It's hard to explain away when it's there in black and white. Some of the, the commentary uh, is, is superfluous. Um, some of it is, seems to be gratuitous. But the bottom line is you have a special counsel that's saying, look, we didn't prosecute or didn't decide to prosecute in part because we don't think a jury would convict because, they, because he would seem to be too old and, and, and potentially uh, his memory being so poor that he couldn't have had malicious intent. That is a heck of a thing to come from a special counsel from uh, now an official position of uh, officially put out by the Justice Department. The Biden team pushes back on it. But here's the danger in it, Diane, is I think it reinforces something that we've seen in polls and in talking to voters around the country. There are concerns about his age and his mental abilities. They've been reinforced also by things that he has said and done on the trail, including even in that news conference last night where he seemed to mix up the, the presidents of, uh, of Mexico and Egypt. So uh, I think this is something that's going to sting. And uh, again, it's, it, it gets at some of the fundamental challenges to his candidacy. All right, ABC News political director Rick Klein, thank you. You bet. Coming up, two days until the Super Bowl, we are taking you to Las Vegas just ahead. Whenever news breaks, we are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Excitement is building as the Chiefs and 49ers prepare to face off in the biggest football game of the year this Sunday. Thousands of football fans are descending on Las Vegas as the city ramps up for its first ever Super Bowl weekend. ABC's Melissa Adan is at the Super Bowl fan experience in Las Vegas with more. All eyes on Las Vegas ahead of Super Bowl 58. Sin City gearing up for the matchup between the 49ers and the Chiefs. More than 70,000 fans are expected to cheer on their favorite team at Allegiant Stadium. It's chaotic in a good way. You know, obviously the entertainment capital of the world and to have 
you know, one of the biggest events, events of the year here is, is really exciting. The 49ers hoping to hoist the trophy for the first time since 1995. For me, I understand, you know, what I'm trying to do. It comes down to three hours of football that we play. How do I do my job really well for three hours um, against the Kansas City Chiefs defense? This marking the Chiefs' fourth Super Bowl appearance in five years. I think our mindset of knowing that we're going to play our best football, um, we're playing a great San Francisco 49ers team, um, and it, it's going to be a, a great opportunity for us to go out there and, and show uh, kind of where we've come from the beginning of the season to the end. As fearless Travis Kelsey is for the upcoming game, he's just as enchanted with his lover. She's as much of a professional as anybody I've ever met, and she just has a desire and a love for what she does. Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey's romance invigorating crowds. Yeah, yeah. And so is the halftime show with Usher performing and proud to showcase his R&B roots. To have R&B have the main stage at the Super Bowl is a major thing for me. Security in Vegas heightened as well as warnings to visitors against scammers selling counterfeit goods. If you engage and peddle in this counterfeit merchandise in Nevada, we will go after you. High bets in Vegas, as some analysts are predicting this year could top last year's estimated $16 billion bet on the big game. High hopes hanging on the strongest football teams of this season. And Melissa Dunn is in Las Vegas at the Super Bowl fan experience for more. Melissa, first of all, just give us a little tour. What's it like there right now? Hey, Diane, so it is a very exciting. I actually want to go ahead and show you this. So inside of what folks call like the NFL experience, it's really cool because when you talk about going to the stadium, yeah, 72,000 people get to go to the stadium, but you know that about 300,000 north of them get to come and experience things like this. You can cheer on your favorites like the AFC champions, and you can really take it all in, walking in around, kind of seeing, okay, we have the Super Bowl rings, learning about the history of these games, and then, of course, making sure that you're cheering on your favorite team, either the NFC champions, the San Francisco 49ers, or maybe trying to see if you catch a glimpse of your favorite celebrity. Any Usher sightings, Taylor Swift out there yet? So that's what's so happening here so far, Diane. And Melissa, the Super Bowl kicks off with a coin toss. And this year, it's featuring some special honorary captains. What are you hearing about that? It is so incredible. So actually, the Lahaina Luna High School's football team, their players and coaches, they're going to be the honorary coin toss captains, which is something that is so special. We know the folks from Lahaina Luna High had such a hard time because they were deeply impacted by the Maui wildfires. It actually marked six months just yesterday when those fires that we covered extensively damaged the community, especially in Lahaina. Those players, they experienced so much. Those coaches, they had losses themselves, but they still still rallied together, played a shortened team, advanced to the championships, and now they're going to be here at the Super Bowl, Diane. All right, big thanks, Melissa, Don. Have fun. Coming up, love traveling but hate packing? I've got the ultimate hacks to help keep your suitcase organized, help you pack faster, and help you remember everything you need. Mercedo Methods is next. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're going to be tuning in for Usher, too. You're going to do it, do it big. Oh, my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there, too. Baby, let me love you. Usher Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey, man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from Mar-a-Lago in Florida, I'm Jay O'Brien. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. It is time for Macedo Methods, where I show you some of my favorite hacks to make life a little easier. And today I bring you my favorite packing hacks to help you stay organized, pack faster, and actually remember everything you need. There are a few things I love more than traveling. There's just one problem. I absolutely hate packing. All right, here we go. Especially now that I also pack for my kids, I find computing all the different things we might need mentally exhausting, and my brain looks for any opportunity to procrastinate. All right, let me check my packing list. Ooh, a text message. All right, let me check the weather. Ooh, a sale. Then once I've conquered the actual packing, there's the anxiety that I forgot something important, because I probably have. <laughs> One time I remembered everything I could possibly need and I fit it all in my carry-on. And then I realized I forgot underwear. But those days are behind me, thanks to a few game-changing hacks. I used to pack in categories, so sweaters went in one section, pants in another, shirts in another, socks in another, and so on. But I realize now that made it hard for me to ensure I had everything I needed, and it meant my suitcase looked like a bomb went off within a day of arriving. So now I pack by outfit in clear compression cubes. These not only help to keep things organized, but if you fill them well, they actually help you fit more clothes in the bag. And my favorite part is I have a reusable checklist right on each cube. Use clear labels or a Sharpie and seal with clear tape. Then use a wine marker to check off items as you pack them and wipe off to start over for your next trip. No more forgotten underwear. And now once I arrive, getting dressed is as simple as pulling out that cube. No more suitcase scavenger hunt. I use a similar approach with my makeup and toiletries, only these stay packed all the time. And it costs a little more money to have duplicates of all this stuff, but it is so worth it for me for the time and stress I save. Then there's my binder zipper pages. Remember how I use those in my purse and diaper bag? Well, I have one for my suitcase too, for all my other recurring travel items. Just go through the pages and if a pocket's empty, you know exactly what's missing. I need to put my deodorant in there. And finally, when it comes to my toddler stuff, my secret weapon is a shoe organizer. Each pocket holds a complete outfit and there's no need to unpack. Just hang this in a closet or on the back of a door, and if someone else dresses the baby, the outfit's basically laid out for them. As an added bonus, you can use the same system when you're repacking to ensure everything makes it back home. Where are we going next? Genuinely has been a game changer for me, and you can share or save this hack right now on the ABC News Live Instagram account, and stay tuned for more Macedo Methods. Thanks for streaming with us. I am Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're gonna be safe? I don't know. 
This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Oh, my God. Oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh, are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamal Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Oh, Wait, I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live First, President Biden is firing back. What he's saying about his memory and the special counsel report on his handling of classified information. The high-stakes Supreme Court hearing on Donald Trump's eligibility for re-election. The justices appeared skeptical of whether the former president can be removed from state ballots for his actions around January 6th, what it means for the race for the White House. And the fraud alert you need to know about, the common scams costing us billions and what you can do to avoid them. But we begin with President Biden defending his ability to do his job after a report from the special counsel investigating his handling of classified documents. Special counsel Robert Hur's report clears Biden of criminal wrongdoing for the mishandling of classified documents, but also describes the president as an elderly man with a poor memory, also describing his memory as hazy. Biden calls the report's assertions just plain wrong. Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has the latest. The very first sentence of Special Counsel Robert Hur's 345-page report sums up the case. Quote, we conclude that no criminal charges are warranted in this matter. And Hur flatly states the evidence does not establish that Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But to be clear, the special counsel said he did find some evidence that Biden intended to retain highly classified material. He pointed out that classified documents were found throughout Biden's Delaware home, in file cabinets, in his basement, even in his garage, basically among junk. And Hur says that Biden shared some of the information with a ghostwriter of his memoir. But Hur acknowledged the possibility that documents could have been sent to Biden's home and other offices without his knowledge, in other words, by accident. Another factor in Hur's decision, apparently the president's poor memory, which might make him sympathetic to a jury. Finally, Hur makes clear that Biden's case is different from that of former President Trump, who was charged with mishandling classified information. Biden quickly returned all the documents, fully cooperated, and even sat for five hours of interview. Mr. Trump, according to Hur, and I quote, did the opposite, even allegedly enlisting others to destroy evidence and lie about it. Diane. All right, Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas, thank you. And now President Biden is in damage control mode as his legal exoneration threatens to become a political liability. He's attacking the special counsel for questioning his memory and defending his decision to run for re-election. Chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce has the latest on that part of the story. President Biden defiant, defending his handling of classified information and his memory, firing back at special counsel Robert Hur after he declined to prosecute the president but raised questions about Biden's mental acuity. Their task was to make a decision about whether to move forward with charges in this case. For any extraneous commentary, they don't know what they're talking about. Biden, well aware his age is a top concern for voters, defending himself. That's, that's you know what, your uh, memory has gotten worse, Mr. No, President? My memory is not gotten, my memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. None of you thought I could pass any of the things I got passed. How'd that happen? The report concludes the president should not face charges, saying Biden would likely present himself to a jury, as he did during our interview of him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. The special counsel describing Biden's recollection as painfully slow and his memory hazy, writing that Biden did not remember even within several years when his son Bo died. That conclusion clearly striking a chord. Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business 
I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away or passed away. How in the hell dare he raise that? Biden clearly frustrated as his age comes under increasing scrutiny. Mr. President, for months when you were asked about your age, you would respond with the words, watch me. Watch Many me. American people have been watching and they have expressed concerns about your age. That is they, your judgment. They, that is your is judgment. To public that is not the judgment of the press. And defending his decision to run for re-election. I'm the most question. qualified person in this country to be president of the United States and finish the job I started. After 13 months of investigating, the special counsel determined there was evidence Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified materials from his time as vice president, but that he should not be prosecuted because the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But the president pushing back, denying the report's key findings that he held on to classified material. I've seen the headlines since the report was released about my willful retention of documents. This, these assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. Still, the president welcoming the news that this case is now closed and emphasizing that the report lays out the stark differences between his own case and former President Trump's handling of classified material, that Biden fully cooperated with authorities while Trump did the opposite. I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. Chief White House Correspondent Mary Bruce, thank you. And let's bring in White House Correspondent Mary Alice Parks, along with senior reporter Catherine Falders for more. Mary Alice, President Biden says he's pleased with the findings in the report, but he's clearly unhappy with some of the language in it. How damaging could this be for his campaign? Yeah, Diane, last night the president came out and really wanted to underscore the parts of the report that looked good for him, saying that it was clear from the report there were po the possibility that some of the documents uh, might have been placed without his knowledge by mistake. He even uh, quoted the report page, uh, chapter, and verse uh, talking about where exonerated him from any guilt. But he was so mad in the room, Diane, about that language, about his age and his memory. I was standing there and I asked the president if he feels that he is, his memory has gotten worse. Uh, and he, he said his memory is fine. He said, look what he's been able to get done. None of you thought that I could pass the things I got past. But I'm thinking back to that moment, especially where he talked about his son, the death of his son. Uh, the special counsel made note of it in his report and said that the president had a hard time remembering what year that even was. The president addressed that head on and became emotional in the room. I uh, said so that no one should question uh, that, that every day he remembers that day that every day he thinks about the death of his son. He was furious, Diane. The question now is, will he be, he'll be able to transfer sort of that anger he has towards the special counsel, the defiance that he has about his age, into a convincing argument to voters uh, that his age is not an issue because it was hard to see anything beyond that anger last night. Now, Catherine, the report says that Biden also created classified documents and used some of that info to write his book. What does that mean and how significant is that? Well, creating as in taking notes off of classified materials, that material by nature is classified, but it gets directly to uh, this element of willful retention of classified information. It puts the ghostwriter uh, right at the center of this report. It's interesting because special counsel Herr said uh, that he considered actually charging Biden's ghostwriter with obstruction of justice. The ghostwriter deleted recordings of interviews that he had uh, with President Biden when Biden was describing this information. Ultimately, uh, as we know, Heard decided not to charge uh, the ghostwriter. He said that the ghostwriter um, gave plausible reasons uh, for doing it and that the ghostwriter cooperated. All right, Mary Ellis Parks, Catherine Falders, thank you both. And the Supreme Court is considering whether former President Trump can be disqualified from running for re-election due to his actions surrounding January 6th. As they heard arguments yesterday, the justices appeared skeptical of the unprecedented effort to ban former President Trump from the 2024 ballot in Colorado. Senior National Correspondent Terry Moran has the latest on that story. A rare moment of agreement. The Supreme Court's liberal and conservative justices voicing shared skepticism about this case. At issue, a Colorado court's decision to ban Donald Trump from the 2024 ballot in that state based on Trump's alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election and his role on January 6th. 
The Colorado court found Trump violated the 14th Amendment, Section 3, which declares that no one who has taken an oath to support the Constitution and then engaged in insurrection can hold public office afterwards. During three hours of oral arguments, the justices methodically took apart that ruling. Justice Brett Kavanaugh, a Trump appointee. What about the idea that um, we should think about democracy, think about the right of the people to elect uh, candidates of their choice, uh, of letting the people decide? And Justice Elena Kagan, appointed by Barack Obama. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. Trump appointee Amy Coney Barrett agreeing. It just doesn't seem like a state call. But looming over these arguments, the national trauma of the attack on the Capitol. Even though Trump himself describes that day as beautiful, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson got Trump's lawyer to acknowledge the reality of what happened. For an insurrection, there needs to be an organized, concerted effort to overthrow the government of the United States through violence. And this it, so riot the point that is that a chaotic effort to overthrow the government is not an insurrection? No, we didn't concede that it's an effort to overthrow the government either, Justice Jackson. Right? None of these criteria were met. This was a riot. It was not an insurrection. The events were shameful, criminal, violent, all of those things. But it did not qualify as insurrection, as that term is used in Section 3. But for Donald Trump, this day in court looked like a win. This was a great day. Our Supreme Court hopefully will be doing something in terms of helping our country and preserving democracy. Efforts are underway in more than 30 states to remove Trump from the ballot. So whatever the court decides in this case will have a major impact across the country. And a decision is expected before the Colorado primary, which is on March 5th. Diane? Senior National Correspondent Terry Moran, thank you. Ukraine has a new general in charge of its military today. President Vladimir Zelensky abruptly removed his old commander-in-chief yesterday in the biggest shakeup of the country's military since the start of its war with Russia. Zelensky has now appointed a well-known general within the Ukrainian military to step in. ABC News foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge has more. The largest shakeup in Ukrainian military leadership since the war began. In a risky move, President Zelensky removing Ukraine's commander-in-chief, General Valery Zaluzhny. Zaluzhny, hugely popular among Ukrainian troops, credited for halting Russia's full-scale invasion in 2022. Zelensky's new top commander, General Sersky, now taking over at a critical time. With some Republicans blocking more U.S. military aid for Ukraine... Our team seeing firsthand last month how frontline Ukrainian artillery units are now running low on ammunition. Well, you can really feel the force of this American gun. In Congress, the stakes for Ukraine are high. If there's one other person besides Donald Trump who is rooting for chaos in the sen Senate, it is Vladimir Putin. And without that US aid, Russia threatening to capture this eastern Ukrainian city. Avdivka in ruins, with Russian forces now making significant advances here and threatening a broader offensive in the coming weeks. And foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge joins me now for more on this. Tom, you watched that interview between Tucker Carlson and Vladimir Putin. Did it offer any new revelations on where things stand between Russia and Ukraine? I don't think it really did, uh, Diane. I mean, look, we heard a lot of familiar grievances from Vladimir Putin on Ukraine, a lot of false narratives from the Russian leader, which we've heard time and time again. And what, and what was extraordinary about this interview, if we can really call it an interview from Carlson, was that he failed to challenge the Russian leader when the Russian leader made pretty ridiculous claims. For example, Vladimir Putin claimed that it was the West and Ukraine that started the war uh, two years ago and not Russia's unprovoked uh, invasion. And the Russian leader just, uh, sorry, Carlson just f failed to actually challenge him, him on that at all. What we did learn about is Evan Gershkovich, the American journalist in Russian jail for nearly a year now, Wall Street Journal reporter, Putin suggesting that he might be willing to release Gershkovich, saying talks for his release are ongoing. And I think that's the clearest sign yet, it offers some hope for Evan Gershkovich's supporters and his family. Diane? And Tom, President Zelensky also just changed Ukraine's commander in chief. Why shake up leadership in the Ukrainian military at this point in the war? 
because uh, Ukraine's counteroffensive over the summer failed. So Zelensky's saying now that he needs renewal. It's also because Ukraine needs to mobilize many more men into the military. We're expecting a new wave of mobilization soon. And we know from Zelensky himself and Zeluzhny, the general who's gone, that they were at loggerheads. They didn't agree on how that mobilization should take place. So, you know, it's not an ideal scenario. Western officials have admitted that there has been tension between the two men. But General Sersky, who's the new man in charge of the armed forces, is well known to the US and other allies. Uh, he's in a very experienced general. And soldiers I've spoken to, some uh, sort of wary. They're, they're sad to see Zeluzhny, uh, who was praised for holding Russia back in the early stages of the war. They're sad to see him go. But one soldier messaging me overnight saying, look, I've got full faith in, in Sirsky, the new general, and full faith that he is the right man to take on the job at a very difficult time for the Ukrainian military. Diane? Tom, officials say Russia is firing five to ten times more shells than Ukraine. And last month, you saw firsthand that the Ukrainian artillery units are running low on ammunition. So what does that do for where Ukraine stands right now, especially with Congress in the U.S. not passing any foreign military aid for Ukraine? Well, it's a massive dynamic. What people have to realize is that artillery is the cover fire for your infantry on the ground. So whether you are Russia at the moment trying to move forward or Ukraine, which is broadly on the defensive right now, if you don't have artillery, if your soldiers, your artillery units cannot fire, then your infantry on the ground are way more vulnerable. And what we're seeing right now in eastern Ukraine around a city called Avdivka, the Russians are now making significant advances, according to Ukrainian and Russian officials. And if the Russians take that city, and it looks like they are moving in that direction right now, it would be the most significant victory for Russia in, in at least a year. So it really is the momentum in this war moving in Russia's favor. Diane? All right, Tom Sufi Burge in Paris, thank you. Coming up, a fraud alert you need to know about, the common scams costing us billions and what you can do to avoid them. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Lust, greed, betrayal. This is one of the most complex investigations I've ever seen. 2020 true crime. They had gunshot wounds to their heads and torsos. It was hard to believe. We discovered she had a second career as an escort. She had three cameras at her apartment. Did these cameras capture her killer? Sealed with a kill. No one could have fathomed how twisted this story would become. 2020, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC.
Welcome back. A new report from the Federal Trade Commission says American lost more than $10 billion last year. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus has more on that and your other business headlines. Alexis, what are you watching today? That's a staggering number, Diane. So this new FTC report finds Americans lost a record amount of money to fraud in 2023, more than $10 billion, and it's up 14% from the year before. Nearly half the fraud involved investment scams, including get-rich schemes promising guaranteed and immediate returns. Another popular scam, imposters pretending to be people or business as you can trust and then convincing you to send them money. Email was the number one method of choice for these scammers, followed by phone calls and text messages. Donald Trump is coming to the defense of the maker of Budweiser beer. The former president's asking his supporters to give Anheuser-Busch a second chance after Bud Light's marketing promotion last year featuring transgender TikTok star Dylan Mulvaney sparked a customer boycott. Trump said the company is not woke and praised the beer maker's efforts to support farmers and create jobs for veterans. Trump's support comes just days before the Super Bowl when Bud Light will try to win back customers with some humorous ads. And Build-A-Bear Workshop has come a long way, you could say, from hosting kids' birthday parties. The stuffed animal company now offering adult-oriented bears like this one sporting mildly risque clothing, like T-shirts branded with Zaddy, that's a slang term for an attractive older man, or a bear dressed here like Hugh Hefner in a robe. The Build-A-Bear After Dark collection, as they're calling it, is only available online, so your kid can't stumble upon it in the store. You have to promise to be at least 18 years or older to enter the bear cave. And that's not what I'm calling it. That's what they're calling it. The online. bear cave. Yeah, okay. can't make it up. Well, hello, Build-A-Bear. <laughs> Alexis Christophers, thank you. And if you have any finance questions for Alexis, leave a message on her Instagram feed at ABC News Live, and she might answer your question right here on Thursday. Coming up... If you couldn't guess by that last report, it is almost Valentine's Day. GMA Lifestyle contributor Lori Bergamato has all her favorite gifts for that special someone in your life. It's time for the right stuff when we come back. Oh my. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're going to be tuning in for Usher too. You're going to do it, do it big. Oh they say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there, too. Usher Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey, man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the auto workers picket lines in Michigan, I'm Faith Abube. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. We're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back.
back to ABC News Live. It is time for the right stuff with our friend GMA Lifestyle contributor, Lori Bergamato. So every Friday, Lori brings us some of her favorite products. And this one, she's sharing the love with the best <laughs> gifts for Valentine's Day. You can shop these products and what she shared on Good Morning America by scanning that QR code in the bottom left corner of your screen. So, Lori... I see chocolates. I mean, Talk to me. it can't be Valentine's Day without chocolate, mm -hmm. can it? A little sweet. Right? A little sweet. So these are from Compartes. If you guys don't know about this chocolate company, let me fill you in. They are one of the best, Diane. Handmade in LA, over 75 years of chocolate gourmet goodness. That's one of their best selling essentials. It comes wrapped in that um, faux leather green crocodile. I mean, it's gourmet. There's nuts, there's berries. Oh, They're that's good. known for taking sort of really interesting mm. modern spins on classic chocolate uh, tastes. So you can see their little hearts here. These are one of my personal favorites. These are the pink uh are those macaroons? No, they're Oreos. No. They're chocolate covered Oreos. Oh, any one of these two. Chocolate. I mean, how Sorry can we make the display, something but... iconic what? even more iconic? Give it to mm. Compartes, guys. That is like next level chocolate. Everyone will love that. Yeah, and mama. speaking of next okay, level. while I chow down with Okay, I'll talk while you eat. Uh, these are from Urban Stems. I don't want to I don't want to get poked here. Gorgeous, right? Orchids are the sort of thing that, you know, everybody, we love flowers. I love to send cut flowers, bouquets on Valentine's Day. But orchids from Urban Stems are that modern take. It's really, um, again, that modern take on a classic. And what we loved about these is that you can just click to buy. They go shipped anywhere in the country. They look beautiful. And a lot of times, like, this is a great thing if you want to send a Valentine to your mother, your sister, a teacher, a friend, like an aunt, because it lasts all year well, long. And these are alive. So unlike cut yes. flowers, they will actually stay and the grow in your home. keeps on giving, Unless you Diane. kill them like I often do, but that oh, we will But you won't kill that. these. You will not kill these. Urban Stems is high These quality, affordable price. And you guys, there's a special discount code, so scan that QR beautiful. code. Beautiful. Um, okay, you have kids, I have kids. Yeah. They love a stuffed animal, people. And I saw you guys just did a Build-A-Bear story. There's now the plushies for the adults. Yeah, right? yeah, that was a different kind. That was Di a different segment. Different segment, but for this, you guys, these are for kids or for really anybody who will love them. My son is obsessed with this one. It's the I love you a lot and axolotl, guys. Who doesn't love that? They've got their puppy here, this little uh, monster for your, you know, a monster plush for your favorite crush. And it's Build-A-Bear, so you get the certificate. You can even get some of these customized with that little voice recorder. So you can, you know, if you travel or something for business, you want to record your voice every time your loved one squeezes it, they'll get so to So they can your squeeze voice. it into your voice even when yes. you're out there. Mine says your, your tag usually when I squeeze mine. It's like, you can stream this ABC News Live. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you miss me so much when I'm I do, gone, Diane, I'm sure. I do. Oh, but that's so sweet, really though. I love that. Stuff. And everything's under $100, so, you know, you can customize and make it more expensive, but we have all affordable options. Can you make one for your spouse so that they hear your voice? Yes, all around? the time. Clean I'm still the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Lori Bergamano, thank, thank you. Thank you. And to shop these products and more of the right stuff, you can scan that QR code in the bottom left of your screen. And for your weekly roundup of the best lifestyle content from Lori and GMA, be sure to catch GMA Life. That's weekends at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 1 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live and streaming on Hulu. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, analysis, and every now and then chocolate-covered Oreos. We'll be right back. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Gulf Coast of Florida, covering Hurricane Adalia. I'm Mike Ajachi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo. We begin with new developments in the Middle East. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he's ordered the IDF to come up with a dual plan to evacuate Gaza's southern town of Rafah as Israel prepares for a ground invasion of the city. This comes as White House officials say the U.S. won't support Israel sending in troops if it doesn't consider the impact to civilians. I'm of the view, as you know, that the conduct of the response in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip has been um, over the top, and it's got to stop. Number now, Israel says Rafah is the last remaining Hamas stronghold, and it needs to send in troops to complete its war plan against the militant group. ABC's James Longman has the latest from Tel Aviv, Israel. Hi, Dan. Yeah, Benjamin Netanyahu talking about the need for an evacuation plan for the hundreds of thousands, more than a million now, actually, uh, in Rafa, the last refuge in Gaza, uh, because uh, he believes that the military operation needs to continue. He's called for total victory, but with warnings from the United States to not mount a military operation in Gaza with so many civilians there, he has said that there needs to be an evacuation, but we're not sure in to where exactly that evacu evacuation would take place. Somewhere inside Gaza, so much of the Gaza Strip has been entirely destroyed. Outside of Gaza, that is massively controversial. Every time we speak to Palestinians, when we get the chance on the phone uh, in Gaza, uh, they tell us that, given the chance, they absolutely would not leave. Uh, they fear that if they did, they'd never be allowed a chance to come back. So uh, the IDF is closing in on Rafah. It hasn't been, it hasn't escaped entirely the violence, by the way, through the last four months. Yes, it's been a refuge for people on that border uh, with Egypt, but just today, Hamas says 15 people were killed uh, in an airstrike there. So the population of Rafah is now six times what it was at the beginning of this war. Quite what an evacuation order means for the people there is unclear. But when we do get the chance to speak to them, they say they're terrified that the IDF uh, is closing in on their city. Diane. Foreign correspondent James Longman in Tel Aviv. Thank you. And President Biden is defending his ability to do his job after a report from the special counsel investigating his handling of classified documents. Special counsel Robert Hur's report clears Biden of criminal wrongdoing for the mishandling of classified documents, but also describes the president as an elderly man with a poor memory and describing his memory as hazy. President Biden's pushing back, calling the report's assertions just plain wrong. And now House Republican leaders are responding with a statement calling the findings deeply disturbing. 
They say a man too incapable of being held accountable for mishandling classified information is certainly unfit for the Oval Office. Chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce has the latest. President Biden defiant, defending his handling of classified information and his memory, firing back at special counsel Robert Hur after he declined to prosecute the president but raised questions about Biden's mental acuity. Their task was to make a decision about whether to move forward with charges in this case. For any extraneous commentary, they don't know what they're talking about. Biden, well aware his age is a top concern for voters, defending himself. That's, that's you know your memory has gotten worse, Mr. No, President? My memory is not good. My memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. None of you thought I could pass any of the things I got passed. How'd that happen? The report concludes the president should not face charges, saying Biden would likely present himself to a jury as he did during our interview of him as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. The special counsel describing Biden's recollection as painfully slow and his memory hazy, writing that Biden did not remember even within several years when his son Beau died. That conclusion clearly striking a chord. Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away or he passed away. How in the hell dare he raise that? Biden clearly frustrated as his age comes under increasing scrutiny. Mr. President, for months when you were asked about your age, you would respond with the words, watch me. Watch. Many American people have been watching and they have expressed concerns about your age. That is they, your judgment. They, that is your is judgment. Public that is not the judgment concerns. of the press. And defending his decision to run for re-election. I'm the most question. qualified person in this country to be president of the United States and finish the job I started. After 13 months of investigating, the special counsel determined there was evidence Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified materials from his time as vice president, but that he should not be prosecuted because the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But the president pushing back, denying the report's key findings that he held on to classified material. I've seen the headlines since the report was released about my willful retention of documents. This, these assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. Still, the president welcoming the news that this case is now closed and emphasizing that the report lays out the stark differences between his own case and former President Trump's handling of classified material, that Biden fully cooperated with authorities while Trump did the opposite. I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. Chief White House Correspondent Mary Bruce, thank you. Let's bring in White House Correspondent Mary Alice Parks along with senior reporter Catherine Falders for more. Catherine, what stands out to you from this report? I think the big headline here and what stands out to me, of course, is this willful uh, retention of information along with uh, what the documents exactly said and what they were about. Uh, we know that there is policy related to Afghanistan. Some of these documents uh, top secret, according to the report. Uh, the other element of this is that Biden also took notes from notebooks. We learned a lot about his ghostwriter, his former ghostwriter, who uh, appears to be uh, at the center of this report. The Her report said that they considered uh, charging the ghostwriter with obstruction of justice because he uh, deleted, destroyed recordings of interviews uh, that he had done with Biden for Biden's uh, memoir. The report says, goes on to say that they decided not to do that because the ghostwriter uh, cooperated. But uh, those big headlines uh, at least stood out to me, of course, at the center of this, that willful uh, retention, which Biden is denying. Now, Mary Alice, President Biden says he's pleased with the findings of this report, but clearly he's unhappy with some of the language in it. So how's the White House responding to it? Yeah, Dan, well, the president's lawyers responded directly to the special counsel's report. They said that those characterizations of his memory were not accurate, misguided, inappropriate. We saw the president himself last night respond to some of that specific language. He started off by saying he is an elderly man. He is well-meaning, uh, but he says that he can do the job. It was interesting, though, to see his tone. He was clearly angry. He played that moment there where he even raised his voice at reporters uh, when they asked about whether vote his message 
message to voters who are concerned about his age. He said, that's your judgment, that's your judgment. But we know in reality, it's not just the judgment of the press. There are voters, there are tons of polls that show voters are concerned about his age, raising questions about his age. It's hard to see how he did himself any favors last night, seeming so defensive, so defiant uh, in the face of those real questions, Diane. Now, Catherine, former President Trump, meanwhile, is facing criminal charges stemming from his alleged mishandling of classified documents. So what's the latest in that case, and how do these cases compare to each other? Well, it was interesting that her made a point to write in his report the differences between the two. Of course, uh, we know former President Trump uh, decided to ignore a subpoena. He misleaded, allegedly, his own, uh, misled his own lawyers. He essentially said that these documents were his. He refused to give them back for uh, over a year. So big differences here. We know that next week there will be hearings in the classified documents case. These will be under seal, uh, so we won't be allowed in, obviously, because they're discussing uh, classified information. I'm told that Trump uh, is likely to attend uh, that next week, so we might uh, get a better sense there. But we don't know yet if this uh, ultimately will go to trial, the Trump case. It's scheduled uh, for May, the classified documents case, but that's likely to get pushed, Diane. All right, Mary Alice Parks, Catherine Falders, thank you both. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court is considering whether former President Trump can be disqualified from running for re-election due to his actions surrounding January 6th. As they heard arguments yesterday, the justices appeared skeptical of the unprecedented effort to ban former President Trump from the 2024 ballot in Colorado. What about the idea that um, we should think about democracy, think about the right of the people to elect uh, candidates of their choice, of letting the people decide. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. Former President Trump called it a great day, saying hopefully the court will preserve democracy. And the January 6th attack on the Capitol and those investigations into Trump's and Biden's handling of classified documents are looming over the election cycle. This is former President Trump is celebrating his win in the Nevada caucus overnight. Trump cruised to victory after Nikki Haley ran in the separate state primary on Tuesday, losing to the option of none of these candidates. ABC News political director Rick Klein joins me now for more on that. Rick Haley says she wasn't worried about winning in Nevada because she called it a scam rigged for Trump. She says she didn't spend a dollar there. So how significant is this win for Trump? Yeah, nobody paid attention to Nevada because the, the Trump-aligned forces had created this separate caucus system. Uh, a lot of candidates uh, early on realized that they were not going to be competitive. They gave up on it and kind of wrote it off. That said, I think the more significant news was the one you just referenced about the primary, where she was on the ballot and Trump wasn't and lost to nobody, to none of these candidates. Uh, doesn't have any meaning, but it's a kind of uh, symbolic loss for her that adds to the substantive losses that she has been suffering. Bottom line is she didn't get any de uh, delegates out of Nevada. She lost Badly in Iowa, she lost by double digits in New Hampshire. Uh, puts more emphasis on the possible breakthrough her hopeful that, that she hopes for 15 days from now in her home state of South Carolina. But uh, it sure doesn't seem like there's a lot of energy in her campaign right now as she soldiers forward and, and hopes to get through Super Tuesday. Now, this ballot challenge before the Supreme Court isn't the only case the court could hear involving former President Trump and his role in January 6th. So how could that impact his run, assuming he is still on the ballot in November? Yeah, I think pretty clearly he's going to be on the ballot in Colorado and elsewhere. Uh, there's even ways that the Republican Party in Colorado could try to do an end around if, if there was a surprise ruling that kept him off. But much more significant is the, the case that could be before the Supreme Court soon of his sweeping claims of, uh, of presidential immunity from uh, prosecution against anything he did while president. Uh, that would cover all of the actions on and around January 6th while he was still president. Uh, and it would make that part of the special counsel's uh, investigation into him essentially go away. Uh, that has now been decided by a, by a panel of circuit court judges this week that kind of t picked apart every single argument that the Trump team put forward. Uh, but if it goes to the full circuit court and or the Supreme Court, uh, that could be far more consequential. And I think probably the most important thing, Diane, is how fast they rule, because the clock is Donald Trump's friend until it isn't. The best play he's got here is to, to, to prolong this as close to or even beyond the presidential election. If he were to become president again, he could ask his Justice Department to drop the charges or he could even potentially pardon himself. How damaging could the special counsel report on President Biden's handling of classified info be to his campaign? 
Look, it's far less, I think, about the, the details of classified information than about the details of, uh, of, of, his, of his own mental ability, as documented by the special counsel. It's hard to explain away when it's there in black and white. Some of the, the commentary uh, is, is superfluous. Um, some of it is, seems to be gratuitous. But the bottom line is you have a special counsel that's saying, look, we didn't prosecute or didn't decide to prosecute in part because we don't think a jury would convict because, they, because he would seem to be too old and, and, and potentially uh, his memory being so poor that he couldn't have had malicious intent. That is a heck of a thing to come from a special counsel from uh, now an official position of uh, officially put out by the Justice Department. The Biden team pushes back on it, but here's the danger in it, Diane, is I think it reinforces something that we've seen in polls and in talking to voters around the country. There are concerns about his age and his mental abilities. They've been reinforced also by things that he has said and done on the trail, including even in that news conference last night where he seemed to mix up the, the presidents of, uh, of Mexico and Egypt. So uh, I think this is something that's going to sting. And uh, again, it's, it, it gets at some of the fundamental challenges to his candidacy. All right, ABC's political director, Rick Klein, thank you. You bet. Coming up, two days until the Super Bowl, we are taking you to Las Vegas just ahead. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Oh, I'm in. my God. Oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Oh, Wait, I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Lust, greed, betrayal. This is one of the most complex investigations I've ever seen. 2020 true crime. They had gunshot wounds to their heads and torsos. It was hard to believe. We discovered she had a second career as an escort. She had three cameras at her apartment. Did these cameras capture her killer? Sealed with a kill. No one could have fathomed how twisted this story would become. 2020, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. Sunday, the legal blockbusters, President Biden and the special counsel report former President Trump and the Supreme Court hearing. Now, Sunday, all the fallout, the impact on the 2024 race, and what happens next for both sides on ABC's This Week. Good Morning America next week kicks off Monday with Ryan Seacrest Live. Good Morning America. And get ready to laugh because J.B. Smoove and Amy Schumer are in the GMA house on America's favorite morning show, Good Morning America. Excitement is building as the Chiefs and 49ers prepare to face off in the biggest football game of the year this Sunday. Thousands of football fans are descending on Las Vegas as the city ramps up for its first ever Super Bowl weekend. ABC's Melissa Adan is at the Super Bowl fan experience in Las Vegas with more. 
All eyes on Las Vegas ahead of Super Bowl 58. Sin City gearing up for the matchup between the 49ers and the Chiefs. More than 70,000 fans are expected to cheer on their favorite team at Allegiant Stadium. It's chaotic in a good way. You know, obviously the entertainment capital of the world and to have you know, one of the biggest events, events of the year here is, is really exciting. The 49ers hoping to hoist the trophy for the first time since 1995. For me, I understand, you know, what I'm trying to do. It comes down to three hours of football that we play. How do I do my job really well for three hours um, against the Kansas City Chiefs defense? This marking the Chiefs' fourth Super Bowl appearance in five years. I think our mindset of knowing that we're going to play our best football, um, we're playing a great San Francisco 49ers team, um, and it, it's going to be a, a great opportunity for us to go out there and, and show uh, kind of where we've come from the beginning of the season to the end. As fearless Travis Kelsey is for the upcoming game, he's just as enchanted with his lover. She's as much of a professional as anybody I've ever met, and she just has a desire and a love for what she does. Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey's romance invigorating crowds. Yeah, yeah. And so is the halftime show with Usher performing and proud to showcase his R&B roots. To have R&B have the main stage at the Super Bowl is a major thing for me. Security in Vegas heightened as well as warnings to visitors against scammers selling counterfeit goods. If you engage and peddle in this counterfeit merchandise in Nevada, we will go after you. High bets in Vegas, as some analysts are predicting this year could top last year's estimated $16 billion bet on the big game. High hopes hanging on the strongest football teams of this season. And Melissa Dunn is in Las Vegas at the Super Bowl fan experience for more. Melissa, first of all, just give us a little tour. What's it like there right now? Hey, Diane, so it is a very exciting. I actually want to go ahead and show you this. So inside what folks call like the NFL experience, it's really cool because when you talk about going to the stadium, yeah, 72,000 people get to go to the stadium, but you know that about 300,000 north of them get to come and experience things like this. You can cheer on your favorites like the AFC champions, and you can really take it all in, walking in around, kind of seeing, okay, we have the Super Bowl rings, learning about the history of these games, and then, of course, making sure that you're cheering on your favorite team, either the NFC champions, the San Francisco 49ers, or maybe trying to see if you catch a glimpse of your favorite celebrity. Any Usher sightings, Taylor Swift out there yet? So that's what's so happening here so far, Diane. And Melissa, the Super Bowl kicks off with a coin toss, and this year it's featuring some special honorary captains. What are you hearing about that? It is so incredible. So actually, the Lahaina Luna High School's football team, their players and coaches, they're going to be the honorary coin toss captains, which is something that is so special. We know the folks from Lahaina Luna High had such a hard time because they were deeply impacted by the Maui wildfires. It actually marked six months just yesterday when those fires that we covered extensively damaged the community, especially in Lahaina. Those players, they experienced so much. Those coaches, they had losses themselves, but they still still rallied together, played a shortened team, advanced to the championships, and now they're going to be here at the Super Bowl, Diane. All right, big thanks, Melissa, Don. Have fun. Coming up, love traveling but hate packing? I've got the ultimate hacks to help keep your suitcase organized, help you pack faster, and help you remember everything you need. Mercedo Methods is next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is a bizarre and twisted case of a fatal attraction. Am I ever going to love again? What if you were being stalked by a past lover? My phone starts blowing up. I hate you. You ruined my life. Only to then find out the person you thought was stalking you was... Could it be that she's actually been dead this entire time? What? So, if she's been dead, who's the stalker? Who's the victim? This is despicable. Bad Romance, the 2020 limited series, Monday night on ABC. I'm Zoreen Shah reporting from the New Hampshire primary. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. It is time for Macedo Methods, where I show you some of my favorite hacks to make life a little easier. And today I bring you my favorite packing hacks to help you stay organized, pack faster, and actually remember everything you need. There are a few things I love more than traveling. There's just one problem. I absolutely hate packing. All right, here we go. Especially now that I also pack for my kids, I find computing all the different things we might need mentally exhausting, and my brain looks for any opportunity to procrastinate. All right, let me check my packing list. Ooh, a text message. All right, let me check the weather. Ooh, a sale. Then once I've conquered the actual packing, there's the anxiety that I forgot something important, because I probably have. One time I remembered everything I could possibly need and I fit it all in my carry-on. And then I realized I forgot underwear. But those days are behind me, thanks to a few game-changing hacks. I used to pack in categories, so sweaters went in one section, pants in another, shirts in another, socks in another, and so on. But I realized now that made it hard for me to ensure I had everything I needed, and it meant my suitcase looked like a bomb went off within a day of arriving. So now I pack by outfit in clear compression cubes. These not only help to keep things organized, but if you fill them well, they actually help you fit more clothes in the bag. And my favorite part is I have a reusable checklist right on each cube. Use clear labels or a Sharpie and seal with clear tape. Then use a wine marker to check off items as you pack them and wipe off to start over for your next trip. No more forgotten underwear. And now once I arrive, getting dressed is as simple as pulling out that cube. No more suitcase scavenger hunt. I use a similar approach with my makeup and toiletries, only these stay packed all the time. And it costs a little more money to have duplicates of all this stuff, but it is so worth it for me for the time and stress I save. Then there's my binder zipper pages. Remember how I use those in my purse and diaper bag? Well, I have one for my suitcase too, for all my other recurring travel items. Just go through the pages and if a pocket's empty, you know exactly what's missing. I need to put my deodorant in there. And finally, when it comes to my toddler stuff, my secret weapon is a shoe organizer. Each pocket holds a complete outfit and there's no need to unpack. Just hang this in a closet or on the back of a door, and if someone else dresses the baby, the outfit's basically laid out for them. As an added bonus, you can use the same system when you're repacking to ensure everything makes it back home. Where are we going next? Genuinely has been a game changer for me, and you can share or save this hack right now on the ABC News Live Instagram account, and stay tuned for more Macedo Methods. Thanks for streaming with us. I am Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. Oh, my. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're going to be tuning in for Usher, too. You're going to do it, do it big. Oh, my. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there, too. Usher Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. Go 
was shirtless. Hey, man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. And that's why at Good Morning America, we're right here. And we got you. We got you. We got you. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You're looking at Las Vegas, where preparations for the Super Bowl are in full effect. And we will take you there in just a minute. But first, we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. President Biden is defending his ability to do his job after a report from the special counsel investigating his hand handling of classified documents. Special counsel Robert Hur's report clears Biden of criminal wrongdoing for the mishandling of classified documents, but also describes the president as an elderly man with a poor memory, also describing his memory as hazy. Biden calls the report's assertions just plain wrong. Parts of Wisconsin and Illinois are recovering after rare tornadoes damaged homes and farms. Now a new storm is bringing flooding and severe weather to the south. 12 states from Washington to Texas are under snow and avalanche alerts. The FCC has ruled the use of AI-generated voices in robocalls is illegal. The ruling takes effect immediately and will allow states to take legal action against bad actors during this year's election. The use of fraudulent AI-generated voices has been on the rise, including during the New Hampshire presidential primary. And the Los Angeles Lakers are honoring Kobe Bryant with a new statue outside their arena. The 19-foot-high bronze statue shows the Hall of Famer as he walked off the court after his 81-point game in 2006. It's the first of three statues of the five-time champion. One will feature him with his daughter, Gianna, who was among those killed with Bryant in a helicopter crash four years ago. And excitement is building as the Chiefs and 49ers prepare to face off in the biggest football game of the year this Sunday. Thousands of football fans are descending on Las Vegas as the city ramps up for its first ever Super Bowl weekend. ABC's Will Reeve is in Las Vegas with more. The excitement is building for Super Bowl 58. We gotta bring the Bay to Vegas, you know, keep it faithful. Fans descending on Las Vegas. Who doesn't love Vegas? An expected 330,000 of them, many taking it all in at the Super Bowl experience. We're starving for this. Kansas City, they've had it, they've had it. It's our turn now. What do you like about the Chiefs? I like, like, how their team, like, is, like, put together and, like, they know how to win. Allegiant Stadium expected to hold 72,000 fans for the big game, and it's a hot ticket. StubHub saying it's the third best-selling Super Bowl ever. The get-in price hovering around $6,000, and an average ticket costing nearly $9,000. Purdy stays up on his feet somehow. The main event may well be worth the money when the 49ers and the Chiefs battle it out on Sunday. All of the strain, the stress is to get to this moment. It's going to be a great challenge, and, and for all of us, the receivers, O-line, everybody, we got to be on point for this one. San Francisco's been one of the best teams in the NFL all season, and red-hot Kansas City is seeking their second consecutive title. And it's caught by Kelsey for the touchdown. The number three 
is a uh, is a big number in terms of uh, dynasties and things like that. So hopefully we can get this thing and yeah, you guys can start talking about dynasties. I just I'm trying to get this third ring though. I mean, uh, someone's got to be the underdog, um, and so uh, they've been a great football team all year long. Um, so they deserve to be the favorite in this game. All we can do is go out there and play our best football. And Will Reeve is there in Vegas in the center of it all. Will, it looks like Vegas is already pumped up. Oh, it absolutely is, Diane. And my friends here from the Chiefs and 49ers are pumped up as well at this early hour. It, the, Vegas is a spectacle to begin with. So when you add the Super Bowl on top of it, of course, it's going to be even bigger. There's 330,000 fans expected to be here uh, this week. We were walking around the Super Bowl experience yesterday. Fans from all over just here to take it all in. Some are going to the game, some are not, just here to enjoy everything that Vegas has to offer. But I think now that we're headed into the weekend, everyone's really getting their mind right and focused on the big game. Well, I'm trying really hard to focus on you, but the mascots are really stealing the show right now, I have to say. <laughs> Talk okay, to me about The mascots are stealing the show? I'm well, absolutely who, who knew, loving, right? loving the energy. How are the teams preparing? Well, walk me through this. So the teams, Diane, are staying at hotels about 25 miles away from Las Vegas. The NFL said we're putting the teams as far away from the Strip as possible because it is all about the game. And what the teams do is a lot of media at the beginning of the week when they get here, there's the big opening night and there's all the media availability. And then as the week goes on, it becomes more and more about the football. They go through walkthroughs without pads on just to sort of figure out their plays go through some reps, and then things intensify as the week goes on. Travis Kelsey actually said that at Wednesday's practice, when the starters on offense and defense were going against each other, things got chippy, which said it really, he said it really fired him up. I think, you know, once the teams are going against each other in that way, they're ready to play the game. And now we're just two days away from that actually happening. All right, sounds good. Well, Reeve in Las Vegas, maybe having too much fun. We appreciate it, Will. Thank you. You got it. Thanks. And Sirius XM radio host and ABC News contributor Mike Muse is joining me now for more on the big game. Mike, these are two incredibly different, like just calling them very different quarterbacks feels like it doesn't even hammer home the point. Patrick Mahomes is his veteran. He's got two Super Bowl rings, a half a billion dollar contract, yeah. going up against Mr. Irrelevant. Talk to me about this matchup and what you're watching for on Sunday. I love how you ended the question with the Mr. Irrelevant because it's you- It's my favorite, yeah. like just the fact that that is his nickname and here he is at the Super Bowl just showing it to everyone, you know? You got it. For those who may not know what Mr. Irrelevant means, it was the person who gets selected last in the NFL draft. So you have Mr. Irrelevant, Brock Purdy, going up. Who will I love ultimate, it so much. I know. It, it's a favorite thing. And it, who's going up um, against Patrick Mahomes, who is on the track uh, to be one of the greatest of all time. We hasn't given him the attribute of the GOAT yet, but if he continues in the direction that he is, he will become the GOAT. So you have Mr. Irrelevant going up a future uh, GOAT and Hall of Famer who's been at the Super Bowl twice already. And if Patrick Mahomes can lead his team uh, to the third Super Bowl, they will be uh, one of those teams that win three Super Bowls in five years positioning the Chief as one of those dynasty teams. And positioning him as one of those dynasty teams, it puts them on track uh, to be one of the greatest teams of all time. Mahomes is key in the clutch. He loves pressure. Uh, he has a way of making these very impossible plays, in particular coming down the stretch. The Chiefs had a rough start starting out in the season, but they really got fired up towards the back half of the season, particularly in the playoffs. I think momentum is on their side. The 49ers have been consistent in the regular season, but the question I am, because I'm slightly petty and because of a Detroit Lions guy. <laughs> they, they got in there more so because the Lions lost the game oh, versus the 49ers okay. actually winning okay. the game. Um, and so, but uh, Mr. Relevant has a lot to prove. And as we know, football is all about mental. And so we'll see what he can overcome. What does this mean for Purdy, though? If he were to win, if the team wins on Sunday, for him to say, you know what, as last pick, I'm one of the lowest paid quarterbacks. <laughs> And now what? <laughs> it's well, like, how do you like me now? Right, right? right. It is ultimate bragging rights. It is Mr. Irrelevant has become Mr. Relevant, right? But then it also, too, changes his trajectory uh, from endorsement deals to con strength of contract negotiations. He comes on from a strength of position. All right. So I'm one of those people that I want silence during the commercials because I want to pay attention to the ads. What are the big commercials you're watching for? <laughs> Diane, this is why you and I are friends. I am the exact <laughs> same way. Uh, I mean, how can you not, not like the Clydesdale Budweiser commercial? Yes. Those are traditional 
traditional commercials that I just love. I love seeing them stump through the snow. So I'm curious what to see how do? they're going to position that. I'm loving, too, what's hey. happening right now with the Beckhams, uh, Victoria and David Beckham. Today, uh, they have tell commercial the truth, way, right? yeah, Tell the truth. The Uber oh, Eats, I love that commercial. I saw a sneak yeah. preview already. Oh, it's a riff off okay. the viral uh, sensation video that went viral with them, but her just saying that she comes from a working class family. But he's like, you had a Rolls Royce. What car did your father drive? Exactly. And then also, too, I'm really excited to see the Christopher oh, Walken and uh, Usher um, okay. commercial okay. BMW. Oh. This is Usher moment, and I am so excited so uh, to see him in a commercial too as yeah. well. And the Beehive is buzzing about a potential Verizon commercial. Uh, What's happening there? Diane, you're gonna get us in trouble with the Beehive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're onto something though. Uh, when you look at the clip of the Verizon commercial, uh, you see the gentleman squeezing lemons. Uh, one could say that is a nod to Beyonce's uh, Lemonade album that that she had, but literally at the end, Diane, you can hear a song for about two seconds, and the song sounds very familiar uh, to the song that was released during the Renaissance film uh, called My House. Um, and so there is speculation amongst the Beehive uh, that could this be a big announcement coming up? Don't forget, Diane, uh, Renaissance is three volumes, and so we still need volume two and three, so maybe we can see an announcement for volume two uh, coming out with Renaissance. I love the, the, the internet sleuths out there, especially yeah. when it comes to Beyonce. <laughs> um, we also have to talk about the halftime show. Usher, some of us are looking forward to the Usher concert this weekend. We're already dancing, right? Diane. Like there's yeah. a football game <laughs> happening, but really, we're watching yeah. Usher. So talk to me about that. I'm so excited, Diane, for Usher. And guess what? They gave our guy an extra two, three minutes. He now has a 15-minute halftime show. So he has the longest halftime show of any performer thus far. And that's because, Diane, he is the king of Vegas. He had this incredible residency that was absolutely sold out. Everyone loved it. Everybody's flying into it. You have to give the king of Vegas more time. He has a catalog. He has he has the voice, he has the choreography, he has the dance moves to fill up that entire full arena, and he is going to rock the house. Uh, my prediction is going to kick off with, uh, you don't have to call. Oh, I, I have a feeling of mid-tempo. Adam Blackstone, when he produces his halftime, he's doing the pre-halftime <laughs> show, but he always says he likes to do the big hit Mike and I are already having a dance party here. <laughs> All right, I gotta go, but quick predictions. Who wins the game? Ah, uh, the Chiefs. The Chiefs okay. take it, and Mahomes will be the MVP. You heard it here first. There you have <laughs> it from the else. Petty Lions fan, <laughs> our serious XM radio host, ABC News contributor Mike Muse. Thanks, Mike. I danced my ear thing off. <laughs> <laughs> and if you are hosting a Super Bowl party this year, you might be worried about those rising prices at the grocery store. So we've got some of the best food deals for your celebration that won't break the bank. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus <laughs> has the details on that. Alexis, we we want to enjoy the game, but we also want to save some money here. How do we do that if we're throwing a party this year? Yeah, weekend? I still have Usher in my head now after <laughs> that segment, guys. I love it. Unfortunately, inflation is showing up at your Super Bowl party because overall, the cost to celebrate the big game up about 4% compared to last year. But of course, there are some ways to save if you make the right menu choices. So let's take chicken wings, for instance. The price of fresh wings down about 5% this year. Frozen wings, you'll do even better there, down 11% compared to a year ago. If you love shrimp like me and maybe a little shrimp cocktail to start things off, you're going to be happy to hear that prices are down about 6.5%. But beef prices, that's going to be the big one, up about 12% from last year. And that's a staple at these parties, but a good cheaper alternative how about turkey for that game day chili or pulled pork sliders since pork prices are also down from last year. That's a favorite of mine. Throw that in the slow cooker and forget about it. And pizza and the Super Bowl go hand in hand. So what are the pizza deals we can look forward to for Sunday? They abound if you are in the mood for pizza. Here are just a couple, Pizza Hut and Little Caesars, each offering $7 off on Grubhub. And Domino's, you knew somebody had to do it. They're targeting the Swifties out there with their perfect combo deal. You're going to get a bunch of goodies for just $19.89. Get it? And when you use the coupon code, 1387. Uh, you can decode that by, we know, right? We're Swifties. 13 is Taylor's lucky number, 87. Travis Kelsey, her boyfriend's jersey number. I don't have skin in this game because I'm a Giants fan. I just want to see a really good game. All right. Alexis Christophorus, we hope you get one. Thank you. <laughs> And you know this weekend, the Taylor and Travis love story will be buzzing. The big question is, will she be there in Vegas after her tour stop in Tokyo? 
For more on their relationship, set your alarm for the Impact by Nightline episode. Taylor and Travis, the pop star and the NFL player, airing right here on ABC News at 7 a.m. Eastern and 6 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. And after you get caught up there, head over to Hulu for a deeper dive into Usher's legendary career and a hint at what's to come this Super Bowl Sunday. You can watch the latest episode of Impact by Nightline, Usher, My Way to the Super Bowl, now streaming on Hulu. New episodes of Impact drop every Thursday. Coming up, moms on mushrooms, the dramatic increase in magic mushrooms being confiscated as more mothers say they're microdosing to help with stress. We'll explain the emerging trend and potential dangers and benefits. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Hit me with them good vibes. Pictures on my phone lives. Every bit of so far. Little bit of sunshine. Dance more, just a little bit. Breathe more, just a little bit. Smile a little more in a minute. Ah, 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 ah. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're going to be tuning in for Usher, too. You're going to do it, do it big. Oh, my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there, too. Baby, let me love you Usher down. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey, man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. ABC next Thursday night. I was one of nine wives. I had eight mothers, 62 brothers and sisters. I became the 65th wife of Warren Jeffs. I believe that polygamy breeds abuse. We've always been taught law enforcement was out to get us. Back off! While Warren was imprisoned, his power grew. If the law officials doesn't stop Warren, thousands will die. Doomsday Prophet, next Thursday night on ABC. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back to ABC News Live. A new report finds that law enforcement seizures of psychedelic mushrooms have increased dramatically all over the country. The report comes as a new trend is emerging. Moms microdosing to help deal with stress. Eva Pilgrim has more. A dramatic increase in magic mushrooms confiscated. A new study finding seizures of shrooms containing the psychoactive component psilocybin increased from 400 in 2017 to nearly 1,400 in 2022. These numbers coming as all across the country, the fascination with shrooms is growing. These are dried magic mushrooms. Tracy T is part of an emerging trend. Moms turning to microdosing to help deal with stress. Do you think you're a better mom on mushrooms? I think I'm a more empathetic mom. And I actually started listening and looking at my kid from the heart. In Colorado, where Tracy lives, growing, having, and using psilocybin in private 
isn't against the law. The state expects to begin allowing sales in a clinical setting starting in 2025. Colorado and Oregon are the only two states to legalize the use of the drug. Multiple cities in four other states have decriminalized it at the local level. But for all the attention on microdosing, the research is sparse. We know very little about microdosing. What I do say to people when they ask me, like, should I microdose? <laughs> uh, I say, well, um, I can't tell you that, but you should know that you're, you're kind of experimenting on yourself. For some, using psychedelics may trigger a severe psychiatric episode. They may also raise heart rate and blood pressure and have not been studied in pregnant or breastfeeding women. Experts say you should talk to your doctor before using them. And when you look at this study, the seizures of magic mushrooms are actually happening all over the country, the largest in the Midwest. The researchers say you can't look at those numbers and predict use, but they do acknowledge that attitude towards psychedelics have recently changed dramatically. Our thanks to Eva Pilgrim for that report. And it is time now for our weekly segment, Patel It Like It Is, where ABC News contributor Dr. Lok Patel serves health advice on the topics that matter most to you. And today he's answering some of your questions. So Dr. Patel, let's start with Zoe from Santa Monica. Zoe asks, if you only do drugs on the weekend, can you still have an addiction? You absolutely can. If you were just using a substance, even if it's cannabis or alcohol on the weekends, you can still show shines, signs of addiction or substance use disorder, such as wanting to cut down what you can't, increase tolerance, withdrawal, putting yourself in risky situations, or your substance use affecting your home, social, or work life. And Diane, we do have studies showing that in a large proportion of patients who have weak end substance use, it can turn into weekday substance use. So if you or anyone you know is showing signs of addictions and wants help, it's important you reach out to a healthcare professional. Treatment could be therapy, counseling, medications, or a combination of all three. And Christy from Oman wants to know, what's the best medicine for hives? I do appreciate our international audience asking such important questions. Itchy, scary, painful, itchy, sometimes hives. You know, the most important thing when it comes to treatment is understanding prevention and warning signs. Now, most people know that hives are those red raised bumps or patches that can be triggered by your immune system, and the triggers are everywhere. They could be bug bites, food, pollen, latex, medications, even extreme weather. And in some cases, if it's just isolated hives and nothing more serious, a healthcare professional may advise that you use a topical cooling lotion or a medication like an antihistamine. Dr. Patel, thank you. And if you have questions for Dr. Patel, leave him a message on our Instagram feed. He might answer your question right here on Friday. Coming up, history through song. Award-winning singer Erica Campbell explains what makes gospel music the heart and soul of the black experience in America. Lust, greed, betrayal. This is one of the most complex investigations I've ever seen. 2020 true crime. They had gunshot wounds to their heads and torsos. It was hard to believe. We discovered she had a second career as an escort. She had three cameras at her apartment. Did these cameras capture her killer? Sealed with a kill. No one could have fathomed how twisted this story would become. 2020, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I did, I did, I did, I did, I did. Oh, my God. Oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow.
So the question is... Okay, here we go. Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamal Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Oh I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all, that's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good Morning America. We want you to know, every morning, we're right here. And we got you. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. A new PBS series is taking a deep dive into the origin story of gospel music. Gospel is known as the heart and soul of the black experience in America. Now the four-hour docu-series Gospel is exploring the rich history behind the music with a companion concert special, Gospel Live. Early this week, I spoke with Gospel African Live's American executive American producer, Kristen Rhythm Carter, and Grammy-winning gospel singer, Erica Campbell, who's hosting and performing in the concert. Take a look. Kristen, talk to me about this project. What made you want to be involved with this and to help tell the story of gospel music? Gospel has been so important to my life and to the lives of so many people, not just African Americans. And so I loved what Henry Louis Gates was doing with the gospel documentary series. And they said they wanted a companion special. And I said, we need to get the best and the I'm brightest gospel and R&B artists out to really tell that story, to share songs that they don't normally perform, share them on our stage, and also tell the history of gospel. So I'm incredibly excited that Erica was our co-host for the event. She rocked it. She was amazing as a host and performer and really helped us tell that story. Erica, how did gospel come into your life? And of all the genres out there, why did you choose to focus on this one? Ooh, born and raised in a church family. My father was a preacher and a singer. My mom was a singer and the choir director. So it's kind of in my DNA. My, my mom said my earliest song was when I was two years old and my baby sister came home. And uh, I'd been singing ever since. So it is a, a part of my life's journey and I feel like my purpose. Kristen, what can we expect to see in this special? What you can expect to see is spirit, community. The audience is celebrating with us the entire time Absolutely. from the moment that we start <laughs> That the sounds show. right. That's, yes. uh, that tracks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you talk about gospel, it's praise and worship, and we do that at its finest. So you will definitely see a good celebration. You'll also see some reflection moments. We have packages that include our artists talking about how they feel about gospel, how they feel about the church experience and spirituality. So I think it gives a lot of community and also music moments as well. Yeah, and Erica, you've played with the genre a little bit, mixing in hip-hop beats and other yeah. upbeat sounds with some viral songs like I Love God. Yeah. What made you want to do that, and where do you see the future of gospel music? I feel, I feel like church is my fueling station, so I go there to get filled and fueled, and then I go out in the world and share it. I'm trying mm -hmm. to encourage and uplift and inspire. Life sucks sometimes, and so if you have someone just telling you, hang in there, you know, things get better, it won't be bad like this forever, um, it gives them a little hope, and we all need hope, and so... Um, it's, it's worked for me in my life. So I, you know, have to get close to the line and sometimes cross the line to reach an unchurched audience that they don't know about this amazing love that comes from this music, this gospel music that lives and breathes encouragement and inspiration. And, and so maybe people lean on music in hard times, Absolutely. even if it's listening Absolutely. to a breakup song or whatnot. Right. Yeah. And gospel has so much more behind it yes. in terms of people leaning on gospel music in hard times. So. Kristen, what do you hope people take away from watching this docuseries and watching this special alongside it? I hope that people get back to the root of, of gospel, understanding it. We have our R&B and gospel artists um, singing songs that they used to play when they were younger mm -hmm. that inspired their careers. And I want people to take a look at the history of gospel and think about how gospel has helped them in their lives as well and get back to the roots of it. 
I love that. Well, thank you both so much for coming on. Kristen thank Carter, you. Erica Campbell, such a pleasure to meet you both. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you so much. And you can watch Gospel Live tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern on PBS. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Lindsay Davis reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Right now on ABC News Live, President Biden defiant after a report from the special counsel questioned his memory and his mental faculties. Biden told reporters he's the most qualified person in this country to be president. But do voters agree? Plus, another escalation. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has ordered the Israeli military to prepare for an evacuation of the entire town of Rafah inside Gaza, home to more than a million Palestinians. We've got the latest from Tel Aviv. And get ready for the big game. We've got a supersized Super Bowl preview from, from Las Vegas coming right up. Good afternoon, I'm Terry Moran. We're going to begin with breaking news. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has told his military to prepare for an evacuation of Rafah ahead of the expected Israeli invasion there. Netanyahu gave his military forces orders to prepare to clear out a place where an estimated 1.2 Palestinians now live, many whom have, of whom have fled their homes elsewhere. That's more than half of Gaza's population now crammed into one spot. Rafah, of course, is where the Israeli Defense Forces uh, have uh, surrounded and are now ready to go, according to Benjamin Netanyahu. Let's bring in our ABC News uh, foreign correspondent James Longman. Yeah, hi, Terry. Benjamin Netanyahu calling now for an evacuation of Rafah. This is the southern city of Gaza, which has come to be somewhat of a shelter for uh, the many hundreds of thousands, over a million now, in Rafah, having fled uh, the war in the rest uh, of Gaza. Uh, so this is what he said, but this is fraught with problems. I mean, Palestinians regard this as a forced displacement, not an evacuation. When, they're when they've been told previously to go to, quote-unquote, safe areas of Gaza, uh, 
often they tell us they have found that they were not safe uh, and the bombs find them when they get there. Uh, so, look, he has said that they must move, but uh, so far no real plan as, as to what that'll actually mean. Remember, so many of these people have already moved uh, multiple times. And this is coming off the back of some pretty harsh criticism from the United States, unprecedented, I think, so far uh, in this conflict. President Biden saying that the Israeli response broadly in Gaza has been, quote, over the top. Uh, and when asked uh, at the uh, State Department, uh, the spokesman there saying military operations right now in Rafah would be a disaster for people there. So the U.S. is stepping up its criticism. There's a, there's a kind of sense, I think, here in Israel that they're really on borrowed time now uh, to try to bring this military operation to a close. But from the very outset, remember, they did say that they had a number of uh, objectives, and one of those was identifying Yahya Sinwa, finding him, uh, tracking him down, and taking him uh, into custody or neutralizing him, the leader of Hamas in Gaza. And so far, that has not happened. So presumably, the IDF thinks that they might find him uh, in the Rafah area. Uh, that remains uh, to be seen. So, look, we'll see what exactly this evacuation process looks like, where in Gaza exactly these people will be able to go. But this will be a very, very difficult operation. Uh, the population of Gaza has multiplied six times since this conflict began. Terry? Mm. All right, James Longman, thank you very much for the developments from the Middle East. Back in Washington, President Biden is firing back at the special counsel's office after a report into his handling of classified documents cast doubt on the president's mental acuity and his memory. Although special counsel Robert Hur's report clears Biden of criminal wrongdoing surrounding the classified documents, the report also describes the president as, quote, an elderly man with a poor memory. And it even suggested that President Biden could not recall when his son, Beau, actually died. The president angrily defended himself during remarks at the White House last night. I know there's some attention paid to some language in the report about my recollection of events. There's even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, wasn't any of their damn business. ABC's White House correspondent Karen Travers joins us now. Karen, you're there a lot. You've been covering Biden for years. And I just want to ask you, as a reporter, what do you see? Yeah, I mean, Terry, I was with the president all day on Wednesday when he was traveling in New York and doing a series of fundraisers. And it was in two of those fundraisers where the president was telling a very familiar story that he tells about going to a summit back in 2021, talking to the French president, and then the German chancellor telling him a story. But, Terry, twice on Wednesday, the president made a reference to Helmut Kohl, a former German chancellor back in the 80s and the 90s, who died in 2017. The story, of course, took place, though, for the president in 2021. So that was something that started to raise questions this week and cause stories to be written about the president and misspeaking, getting names wrong. Earlier this week, he did the same thing, getting the French president's name wrong. That was before the special counsel's report came out that talked about the president's memory being hazy, his significant limited uh, recollection of different things. And this is now becoming a big issue for the White House. And they're going to have a lot of questions about this coming up at the briefing in just a couple minutes. Absolutely, because the, the repertorial observations you just made are, are basically the kinds of observations that voters are legitimately making as they see the president. They'll, everybody will reach their own independent judgment on it. Uh, Karen, will. Kamala I Harris. Sorry, mm -hmm. please, don't, go on. No, and, and I asked the White House about this yesterday, that this is something that polls show Americans are concerned about, a big concern about the president's age as he seeks re-election. And Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre tried to filibuster for a significant amount of time, talking about all of the accomplishments of the last three years for Joe Biden and what he has done and what he is going to run on. But eventually she acknowledged that people misspeak. And she went through others who have done this, from Sean Hannity to the House Speaker, Mike Johnson. She said she even makes mistakes. She said this is not uncommon. Terry, though, that was before the special counsel's report came out. It's very different now today when you see that in black and white in writing. It is a different landscape. And Vice President Kamala Harris has just responded to all this. What did she say? She was asked a question by our colleague Selena Wang about her being a former prosecutor and whether she thought this report was fair. Here's what she had to say. That's a good question.
We have a technical issue there. That is not Vice President Kamala Harris. That's a map of Israel and the Gaza Strip. But uh, Karen, you know, thank you for your reporting though. on this. Yeah. Well, t I, tell us I, what she said. Yeah, the vice president had a very strong response on this and went after the special prosecutor. She says that she believes that as a former prosecutor, the comments made by special counsel Robert Hur were gratuitous, inaccurate, and inappropriate. She said the way the president's demeanor was characterized in that report clearly could not be more wrong on the facts. And Vice President Harris said the report was clearly politically motivated. Terry. All right, so this is now a major issue in the campaign because of the special prosecutors, uh, special counsel's report, Karen Travers at the White House. Thank you very much for that reporting. And so President Biden's age and, and his, his acuity, his health, those are all going to be part of the campaign in the months ahead of the presidential election. A new NBC poll finds 76% of voters, 76%, say they either have major or moderate concerns that President Biden does not have the necessary mental or physical health to be president for a second term. So let's bring in our political director, Rick Klein, and 538's Galen Druk to break it all down. First, Galen, uh, let's start with you and this new poll and in general what the public is saying about the fact that our first 80-year-old president is now running for re-election. So as you can see in that poll, there is a gap there when it comes to perceptions of the age of Trump and Biden, almost 30 points. But what specifically are Americans concerned about? I think this comes down to competence and effectiveness. In that same poll, you see that there is a 16-point gap in Trump's favor when it comes to the question of who will be more competent or effective as president. Back when Joe Biden ran against Trump in 2020, Biden had a nine-point lead. Now, not only have those numbers reversed, but Trump has a bigger advantage. And I think this is a sensitive subject, so I want to try to be as empirical as possible here. Looking at the polls, it does not look as though the concern is about something like life expectancy. It's more about this competence question. And frankly, being as empirical as possible, looking at data from the government, so even social security actuarial tables, for example, the average 81-year-old today in America, 81-year-old man, is expected to live more than seven more years. Biden is not average. He's a high-status individual with access to the best health care in the world. And so I think the concern is not, when we talk about physical health, I think we are talking about performance in the presidency, not something like, you know, will he survive a second term in office? Absolutely. And people age at different, at different rates, some faster, some slower, some uh, with more issues, some with fewer issues. Rick Klein, let's let's go to you on the on the politics of all this. This is obviously a, a major issue in the campaign. How do you read it playing out in the wake of what is now a formal government document, the special counsel's report that finds him infirm? Yeah, it's undeniable, and it's there in black and white. And Vice President Harris can push back on it, but she wasn't in the room. Robert Hur's team was, and this is a description not of uh, not of some uh, independently observed by others. This was them in the room talking about their own observations, and it was stunning to see in the report. And I think gives it more weight than just someone's random anecdote because it's there written in an official special counsel report. All of that said, as a matter of politics, I've talked to a number of Democrats close to Biden who said. A lot of this is already baked in the cake, uh, and there's nothing that Robert Hur's saying here that a lot of Americans don't already think, and that's why you have a president whose approval rating's in the 30s. That's why you have so many Americans, to Galen's point, who say that, uh, that they have concerns about Joe Biden serving the entirety of a second term, not just the concern about his health right now, but his concern, the concern over his health over the next five years, if that would be the, the completion of a, of a second term. So they know that this is a challenge for him, and that isn't new. I do think, all of that said, this is going to restart a debate that, frankly, should have happened a long time ago inside the Democratic Party, because we're we're well along into the primary nominee process. He is going to be the nominee unless he were to decide to, to, decide to step aside or a health issue made that uh, I I impossible to avoid. So it's, it, Democrats can, can be can, can worry about it, concerned about it, but they don't have any easy or obvious backup plans. And I think that is going to drive some of the political conversation is that uh, there isn't a lot of upside for Democrats to fret publicly about this. The time to have done something about it would have been six months ago, a year ago, when there was still an opportunity to challenge him in a primary. Absolutely. And, and if the optimistic uh, version of Democratic support is, well, it's already baked in the cake that he's infirm, I, I, you'd hate to see 
for Democrats, the pessimistic side of that. Rick Klein, Galen Druk, thanks very much. Well, breaking news this hour, we're now learning the identities of the five Marines that were killed in a helicopter crash near San Diego. Uh, the Pentagon uh, announced their death on Thursday. The helicopter went down Tuesday night after taking off from an Air Force base in Nevada. ABC News senior national policy reporter Ann Flaherty joins us now. Ann, we just learned the identities of these Marines. Tell us about them and the latest on the recovery efforts to find their bodies. Yeah, Terry, we just got word about 30 minutes ago, the identities of these Marines, as you say, they were flying in a nighttime training mission in really treacherous weather uh, and then crashed in the mountains outside of San Diego. We're told at this hour that the five young men, they're all between the ages of 21 and 28. There were three captains, Marine captains on board. Um, they were all pilots. So we have uh, Benjamin Moulton, age 27, Jack Casey, who's 26, uh, of New Hampshire, Miguel Nava, uh, 28, of Michigan. And then, you know, heartbreakingly, Donovan Davis, 21, of Kansas, Alec Langan, a 23, of Arizona. Um, all these young men cut down in the prime of their life. Uh, this was not the outcome that anyone wanted. We are told that at this hour, recovery efforts uh, remain ongoing, that this is a very difficult area to get to, that local authorities have had to use off-road vehicles just to access the debris field. Um, and then we know that an investigation is underway. It could take several months uh, for us to find out exactly what happened and whether or not weather was a factor in this crash. Terry. Say a lot of weather out there, and those five young men who signed up to serve our country, uh, our hearts go out to their families and all their loved ones. And Flaherty, thank you very much. Well, coming up, the escalating humanitarian crisis in Sudan, leading to one of the biggest child displacement and malnutrition problems on planet Earth. We're going to talk with UNICEF's James Elder, who was just there right after the break. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoon. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Well, welcome back to ABC News Live. The war in Sudan, after so many years of previous wars, has now created an escalating humanitarian crisis that's led to one of the biggest child displacement and malnutrition problems in the world. For more, let's bring in James Elder. He's with UNICEF, and he was just on the ground in Darfur, Sudan. James, you know, Darfur, it, we've been hearing about for so long. And now this conflict once again taking its toll on the most innocent. Tell us about uh, your experience in Darfur, what you're seeing on the ground there. 
Terry, hi there. Look, it was harrowing. For me, I, I, I was last in Darfur 20 years ago, so it was this really horrendous deja vu again of hearing these appalling stories of sexual violence against women, again, of seeing children who, whose lives could be spared but were dying from malnutrition. But I think there was something else, Terry. There was, there was something else that I kept hearing that had died, and that was young people's dreams. There were these 20-somethings who who survived the atrocities of 20 years ago and now we're all studying or had finished you know, economics and engineering and medical science. But to a person they were talked about, I can no longer dream. I had a dream, it was medical science, I no longer have that. So for a country to start losing the opportunity amongst young people, that is truly devastating and that is just one of the many things that we have to protect with things like aid, support and a ceasefire. But we're such a long way away from that, Terry. Absolutely, and uh, to destroy the dreams uh, of people in addition to the uh, human needs, the, the, the basic needs, uh, that is a, a terrible tragedy. So what are the main needs right now? How do you get back to a place where people can dream again? It's a great question, Han. We really are. There's this small window to avoid utter catastrophe. Sudan keeps breaking records, as you said. Now we see records in you know, 700,000 children this year may have the most lethal type of malnutrition. For the, today, Terry, is the 300th day of this war. On average, every day for the last 300, 13,000 children have been displaced every day. That's, you know, safety gone, home gone, worldly possessions. So there's two main things that we are doing. One is we do need aid. We need f money. UNICEF is the only provider of that magic food that keeps children alive who are severely malnourished. And our, our funding is diabolical, and that has a direct translation to child lives. The other one is we keep advocating and pushing these warring parties to ensure that we have access across the country. Yes, there are conflict zones. That's what UNICEF does. We need to make sure that our aid is not blocked, there aren't bureaucratic impediments, and that's something that we're very robust in, in trying to push. It's how I got into Darfur, but it's not happening everywhere. So that's a major push we use in the highest offices from Washington to across the region, because it's one thing getting aid into the country, you need then to get it to those brave health workers, you need to get it to children. You know, James, uh, we live in this globalized world, right? We're all, we're all on our phones and can look at social media and see silly things around the world, funny things, heartwarming things. What, what, can, what can you do, what can we do to rally more public awareness and, and public support for the efforts of UNICEF and others to, to solve this conflict and, and to help the people there? Yeah, it's a great question. I think part of it is exactly what you, you are doing. I think it's sharing that story. I, I think it's so important that people understand, as we do, a child is a child, and you have to be able to, you know, see multiple issues at the same time. So, you know, UNICEF USA is an immense force for good. Have a look on their website, and by all means, any of your viewers that, that, that are able to donate to UNICEF, it goes to those, to those children I saw with that malnourishment. And then I think it's just worth, worth looking. It's worth having that empathy trying to share those stories. You know, Terry, if I may, just for a second, there are many stories and some of them are truly horrendous, but then there are just these heroic ones. And that's the thing. These people are not waiting around for support. There are health workers who have not been paid a cent for 300 days. They turn up to work because it's their community. I met a woman who gave birth two months premature because of the stresses of war. As she was giving birth, a bomb hit her house. She protected her child. She walked for days. She's a nutritionist, Terry. And when I spoke to her, she was getting help at a UNICEF stabilisation centre. She said, I'm ashamed as a nutritionist, as a mother, that my child's malnourished. And I was like, you're heroic. You've done everything possible. You know, there are women who are burying their children. So I think for people to understand these people are victims of circumstance, but they are absolutely heroic in what they try to do to overcome these things. And if, if we can support that in some way, then that's a wonderful thing to be part of. Absolutely. Your passion and your storytelling communicate that. And as I say, you know, the technology that we have at, at our fingertips now would allow us, should allow us to to come together around something like this. And I, I, I just, if I could ask you, why do you do this? 
I, I, I think it's an immense privilege. I, I, I believe it, honestly, uh, as so many of your viewers, you have a child and you see that, that absolute beauty of childhood. And, and I got lucky. I grew up middle class in Australia and I, the lottery of birth. And I, when I see children in a refugee camp or war, I, I don't feel anything exceptional about, about me, I think, there. But for the grace of God and the fortune I have for, for what happened. And, and when you, you have a good day in my job, Terry, and you see the difference, you see a mother take a, you know, look at a child immunised for the first time or a look in a girl's eyes when she goes to school, then that, that is, a, that is a, an ama immense gift. So it's a privileged role for me. Um, and I hope, as I say, on a good day, we make that difference. When it's not a good day, you absolutely see the gap and what, what can happen to children's lives. Absolutely. We can all try to make good days. UNICEF, we go to the website, go to the social media feeds of UNICEF. James Elder with UNICEF. Thank you for bringing this to our attention, for telling the story. Appreciate it. We'll be right back. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Oh my! Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say uh, Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there too. Usher Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from the Federal Reserve, I'm ABC's Elizabeth Schulze. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're just a couple of days away now from America's biggest sporting event of the year. Thousands of football fans have descended on Las Vegas as Sin City gears up for its first Super Bowl this coming Sunday. The matchup between the San Francisco 49ers and the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm obliged to root for the Chiefs since that's my wife's team. For more, let's bring in ABC's Melissa and Don in Las Vegas. Melissa, that's a great assignment you've got there. Uh, what's the atmosphere like in Vegas? Terry, this is so fun. First, it's huge for Vegas, and the fans here are already so excited. I mean, we talk about 300,000 North people come just for experiences like this. For instance, we're at the Super Bowl fan experience. It is so cool because you can basically come out here, hang out, try different things. The 40-yard dash, the vertical dump, jump, the obstacle course. It's basically like, hey, can you try out for the NFL? Do you have what it takes? Terry, do you think I have what it takes? You know, they have the bench press here. I think I want to give it a twirl. I have a producer, Zach, that might help me out. This is one of those activities that basically you line up. You can see if you have it. I think I see those 45 pounds. Zach, you're going to spot me. Come right in here. I've been practicing for this, Terry. Let's go. All right, Zach, I got it. All right, one, two, three. Yeah. Wait a think? minute. Pretty good, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
look, Terry, they're not 45 pounds. I'll admit that. But it is so cool because it makes you feel like you can put in the work to maybe get drafted on the NFL. Yeah, until you get hit by Micah Parsons, I, I, I think. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to stick to the halftime show. Uh, Usher, tell us about yes. what, what we can expect with the halftime performance by Usher. It is so incredible. Usher is getting 15 minutes. This is a new record that he's going to set. We are so excited to see any of his special guests. And Usher is a really a big, big conversation. He actually, right here, there's a sign behind me, Wilson by Usher, already working on a partnership with the football brand. So that is pretty cool. We're going to see who he brings out because, again, with those extra two minutes, we're used to seeing 13-minute Super Bowl halftime shows. I know there will be surprises. Terry? I'm, I'm sure. There are a lot of performers uh, uh, in the history of the Super Bowl might have been able to use those extra two minutes, but I'm sure Usher's going to make the best of them. Melissa Adon in Las Vegas, thanks very much. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. The news never stops, and we'll be right back. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamal Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good Morning America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here. And we got you. ABC News, America's number one news source. Right now on ABC News Live... President Biden defiant after a report from the special counsel questioned his memory and his mental faculties. Biden told reporters he's the most qualified person in this country to be president. But do voters agree? Plus, another escalation. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has ordered the Israeli military to prepare for an evacuation of the entire town of Rafah inside Gaza, home to more than a million Palestinians. We've got the latest from Tel Aviv. And get ready for the big game. We've got a supersized Super Bowl preview from, from Las Vegas coming right up. Good afternoon, I'm Terry Moran, and we begin with that breaking news. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has told his military to prepare for an evacuation of the city of Rafah inside Gaza ahead of an expected Israeli invasion there. Netanyahu gave his military forces the orders to prepare to clear out a place where an estimated 1.2 million Palestinians now live, more than half of Gaza's population, many of whom fled their homes elsewhere, now all crammed into one spot. Rafa, of course, is where the Israeli Defense Forces have told Gazans to go for safety. Here's ABC News foreign correspondent James Longman. Yeah, hi, Terry. Benjamin Netanyahu calling now for an evacuation 
of Rafa. This is the southern city of Gaza, which has come to be somewhat of a shelter for uh, the many hundreds of thousands, over a million now, in Rafa, having fled uh, the war in the rest uh, of Gaza. Uh, so this is what he said, but this is fraught with problems. I mean, Palestinians regard this as a forced displacement, not an evacuation. When, they're when they've been told previously to go to, quote-unquote, safe areas of Gaza, uh, Often, they tell us they have found that they were not safe uh, and the bombs find them when they get there. Uh, so, look, he has said that they must move, but uh, so far no real plan as, as to what that'll actually mean. Remember, so many of these people have already moved uh, multiple times. And this is coming off the back of some pretty harsh criticism from the United States, unprecedented, I think, so far uh, in this conflict. President Biden saying that the Israeli response broadly in Gaza has been, quote, over the top, uh, and when asked... Uh, at the uh, State Department uh, spokesman there saying military operations right now in Rafa would be a disaster for people there. So the U.S. is stepping up its criticism. There's a, there's a kind of sense, I think, here in Israel that they're really on borrowed time now uh, to try to bring this military operation to a close. But from the very outset, remember, they did say that they had a number of uh, objectives, and one of those was identifying Yahya Sinwa, finding him, uh, tracking him down, and taking him uh, into custody or neutralizing him, the leader of Hamas in Gaza. And so far, that has not happened. So presumably, the IDF thinks that they might find him uh, in the Rafa area. Uh, that remains uh, to be seen. So, look, we'll see what exactly this evacuation process looks like, where in Gaza exactly these people will be able to go. But this will be a very, very difficult operation. Uh, the population of Gaza has multiplied six times since this conflict began. Terry? Mm. All right, James Longman, thank you very much for the developments from the Middle East. Back in Washington, President Biden is firing back at the special counsel's office after a report into his handling of classified documents cast doubt on the president's mental acuity and his memory. Although special counsel Robert Hur's report clears Biden of criminal wrongdoing surrounding the classified documents, the report also describes the president as, quote, an elderly man with a poor memory. And it even suggested that President Biden could not recall when his son, Bo actually died. The president angrily defended himself during remarks at the White House last night. I know there's some attention paid to some language in the report about my recollection of events. There's even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, wasn't any of their damn business. ABC's White House correspondent Karen Travers joins us now. Karen, you're there a lot. You've been covering Biden for years. And I just want to ask you, as a reporter, what do you see? Yeah, I mean, Terry, I was with the president all day on Wednesday when he was traveling in New York and doing a series of fundraisers. And it was in two of those fundraisers where the president was telling a very familiar story that he tells about going to a summit back in 2021, talking to the French president, and then the German chancellor telling him a story. But Terry, twice on Wednesday, the president made a reference to Helmut Kohl, a former German chancellor back in the 80s and the 90s, who died in 2017. The story, of course, took place, though, for the president in 2021. So that was something that started to raise questions this week and cause stories to be written about the president and misspeaking, getting names wrong. Earlier this week, he did the same thing, getting the French president's name wrong. That was before the special counsel's report came out that talked about the president's memory being hazy, his significant limited uh, recollection of different things. And this is now becoming a big issue for the White House. And they're going to have a lot of questions about this coming up at the briefing in just a couple minutes. Absolutely, because the, the repertorial observations you just made are, are basically the kinds of observations that voters are legitimately making as they see the president. They'll, everybody will reach their own independent judgment on it. Uh, Karen, will. Kamala I Harris. Sorry, mm -hmm. please, don't, go on. No, and, and I asked the White House about this yesterday, that this is something that polls show Americans are concerned about, a big concern about the president's age as he seeks re-election. And Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre tried to filibuster for a significant amount of time, talking about all of the accomplishments of the last three years for Joe Biden and what he has done and what he is going to run on. But eventually she acknowledged that people misspeak. And she went through others who have done this, from Sean Hannity to the House Speaker, Mike Johnson. She said she even makes mistakes. She said this is not uncommon. Terry, though, that was re before the special counsel's report came out. It's very different now today when you see that in black and white in writing.
It is a different landscape. And Vice President Kamala Harris has just responded to all this. What did she say? She was asked a question by our colleague Selena Wang about her being a former prosecutor and whether she thought this report was fair. Here's what she had to say. I have been privileged and proud to serve as Vice President of the United States with Joe Biden as President of the United States. And what I saw of that report last night, I believe is, as a former prosecutor, um, the comments that were made by that prosecutor, gratuitous, inaccurate, and inappropriate. All right, so this is now a major issue in the campaign because the special prosecutors, uh, special counsel's report, Karen Travers at the White House. Thank you very much for that reporting. So President Biden's age and, and his, his acuity, his health, those are all going to be part of the campaign in the months ahead of the presidential election. A new NBC poll finds 76% of voters, 76%, say they either have major or moderate concerns that President Biden does not have the necessary mental or physical health to be president for a second term. So let's bring in our political director, Rick Klein, and 538's Galen Druk to break it all down. First, Galen... Uh, let's start with you and this new poll and in general what the public is saying about the fact that our first 80-year-old president is now running for re-election. So as you can see in that poll, there is a gap there when it comes to perceptions of the age of Trump and Biden, almost 30 points. But what specifically are Americans concerned about? I think this comes down to competence and effectiveness. In that same poll, you see that there is a 16-point gap in Trump's favor when it comes to the question of who will be more competent or effective as president. Back when Joe Biden ran against Trump in 2020, Biden had a nine-point lead. Now, not only have those numbers reversed, but Trump has a bigger advantage. And I think this is a sensitive subject, so I want to try to be as empirical as possible here. Looking at the polls, it does not look as though the concern is about something like life expectancy. It's more about this competence question and frankly being as empirical as possible looking at data from the government so even social security actuarial tables for example the average 81 year old today in America 81 year old man is expected to live more than seven more years. Biden is not average. He's a high status individual with access to the best health care in the world. And so I think the concern is not when we talk about physical health, I think we are talking about performance in the presidency, not something like, you know, will he survive a second term in office? Absolutely. And people age at different at different rates, some faster, some slower, some uh, with more issues, some with fewer issues. Rick Klein, let's let's go to you on the on the politics of all this. This is obviously a, a major issue in the campaign. How do you read it playing out in the wake of what is now a formal government document, the special counsel's report that finds him infirm? Yeah, it's undeniable, and it's there in black and white, and Vice President Harris can push back on it, but she wasn't in the room. Robert Hur's team was, and this is a description not of, uh, not of some uh, independently observed by others. This was them in the room talking about their own observations, and it was stunning to see in the report, and I think gives it more weight than just someone's random anecdote, because it's there written in an official special counsel report. All of that said, as a matter of politics, I've talked to a number of Democrats close to Biden who said... A lot of this is already baked in the cake, uh, and there's nothing that Robert Hur is saying here that a lot of Americans don't already think, and that's why you have a president whose approval rating is in the 30s. That's why you have so many Americans, to Galen's point, who say that, uh, that they have concerns about Joe Biden serving the entirety of a second term, not just the concern about his health right now, but his concern, the concern over his health over the next five years, if that would be the, the completion of a, of a second term. So they know that this is a challenge for him, and that isn't new. I do think, all of that said, this is going to restart a debate that, frankly, should have happened a long time ago inside the Democratic Party, because we're we're well along into the primary nominating process. He's going to be the nominee unless he were to decide to, to, decide to step aside or a health issue made that uh, I I impossible to avoid. So it's, it, Democrats can, can, be, can, can worry about it, concerned about it, but they don't have any easy or obvious backup plans. And I think that is going to drive some of the political conversation is that uh, there isn't a lot of upside for Democrats to fret publicly about this. The time to have done something about it would have been six months ago, a year ago, when there was still an opportunity to challenge him in a primary. Absolutely. And, and if 
the optimistic uh, version of Democratic support is, well, it's already baked in the cake that he's infirm. I, I, you'd hate to see, for Democrats, the pessimistic side of that. Rick Klein, Galen Druk, thanks very much. Well, breaking news this hour, we're now learning the identities of the five Marines that were killed in a helicopter crash near San Diego. Uh, the Pentagon uh, announced their death on Thursday. The helicopter went down Tuesday night after taking off from an Air Force base in Nevada. ABC News senior national policy reporter Ann Flaherty joins us now. Ann, we just learned the identities of these Marines. Tell us about them and the latest on the recovery efforts to find their bodies. Yeah, Terry, we just got word about 30 minutes ago, the identities of these Marines, as you say. They were flying in a nighttime training mission in really treacherous weather uh, and then crashed in the mountains outside of San Diego. We're told at this hour that the five young men, they're all between the ages of 21 and 28. There were three captains, Marine captains on board. Um, they were all pilots. So we have uh, Benjamin Moulton, age 27, Jack Casey, who's 26, uh, of New Hampshire, Miguel Nava, uh, 28, of Michigan, and then, you know, heartbreakingly, Donovan Davis, 21, of Kansas, Alec Langan, a 23, of Arizona. Um, all these young men cut down in the prime of their life. Uh, this was not the outcome that anyone wanted. We are told that at this hour, recovery efforts uh, remain ongoing, that this is a very difficult area to get to, that local authorities have had to use off-road vehicles just to access the debris field. Um, and then we know that an investigation is underway. It could take several months uh, for us to find out exactly what happened and whether or not weather was a factor in this crash, Terry. Say a lot of weather out there, and those five young men who signed up to serve our country, uh, our hearts go out to their families and all their loved ones. And Flaherty, thank you very much. Well, coming up, the escalating humanitarian crisis in Sudan, leading to one of the biggest child displacement and malnutrition problems on planet Earth. We're going to talk with UNICEF's James Elder, who was just there right after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Well, welcome back to ABC News Live. The war in Sudan, after so many years of previous wars, has now created an escalating humanitarian crisis that's led to one of the biggest child displacement and malnutrition problems in the world. For more, let's bring in James Elder. He's with UNICEF, 
and it was just on the ground in Darfur, Sudan. James, you know, Darfur, it, we've been hearing about for so long, and now this conflict once again taking its... All right, we want to take you right now to the White House. The first press briefing after the release of that special counsel's report on President Biden's handling of classified documents. This is the spokesman for the White House counsel's office. His name is Ian Sams. President Biden was president or a private citizen. The special counsel's assignment when he was appointed was to determine whether any criminal conduct occurred. He found it didn't. That was the finding. The case is closed. I want to read you something from none other than Ken Starr, who most people in this room will remember is the independent counsel who investigated former President Clinton. After that investigation, here's what he said to Congress, quote, what I see the conclusion as being is just a determination that no criminal charges would be brought, period, full stop. That is it. It's all over at that stage, end quote. That rings true here. The special counsel report goes on at length about the president's unprecedented cooperation in this case. I want to share a few things about that because I think it's very important. One, when the classified documents were found, it was self-reported. The president directed his team to ensure that any classified documents were returned immediately. Why did he do that? Because the president takes classified information seriously. He always has. He did not intentionally take classified documents. He understands documents like that belong with the government. He never, never made any attempt to obstruct. Two, he took unprecedented action to get the special counsel what he needed. He opened up every room in his family home and his beach house for comprehensive FBI searches, a first time in history. He sat for two days of interviews an interview that I'll add, and the president talked about this last night, took place the day after the brutal attack on Israel. The president was managing an intensive international crisis. You just heard the vice president talk about this. He answered dozens of follow-up questions to the special counsel in writing. Three, he didn't exert executive privilege over any contents of the report. He was transparent. He had nothing to hide. There was a long, intensive, and in many ways, yes, excessive investigation. But for context, you should all remind, remember, in the case of former Vice President Mike Pence, who had a very, very similar incident occur right after President Biden, the case was closed within a few months. It was a brief one-page letter to Mike Pence. But in this case, there was a 15-month investigation. The special counsel interviewed 150 witnesses. He saw and obtained seven million pages of documents down to emails about moving trucks during the transition in 2016 and 2017. He spent more than three and a half million taxpayer dollars exploring every possible theory that he could. And what was the result? He reached the inevitable conclusion based on the facts and the evidence that there was no case here. And this is important to think about in context of how this report is being viewed and by many of you being covered. This is the first special counsel investigation ever that hasn't indicted anyone. Every theory was explored, but the facts and the evidence disputed them. The decision was that there was no case to be made. In that reality, we also need to talk about the environment that we are in. For the past few years, Republicans in Congress and elsewhere have been attacking prosecutors who aren't doing what Republicans want politically. They have made up claims of a two-tiered system of justice between Republicans and Democrats. They have denigrated the rule of law for political purposes. That reality creates a ton of pressure. And in that pressurized political environment, when the inevitable conclusion is that the facts and the evidence don't support any charges, you're left to wonder why this report spends time making gratuitous and inappropriate criticisms of the president. Over the past 24 hours, we've actually seen legal experts and former prosecutors come out and give their analysis. Former Attorney General Eric Holder said the report, quote, contains way too many gratuitous remarks and is flatly inconsistent with longstanding DOJ traditions. The former acting FBI director said he had overseen many cases like this and, quote, you have, you have to have explicit evidence of willful retention of these documents, and that is just not present in this case. 
The former FBI general counsel, who I'll add is also, was also the lead prosecutor in the special counsel Mueller investigation, said it was, quote, exactly what you're not supposed to do, which is putting your thumb on the scale that could have political repercussions. That's the assessment of seasoned professional law enforcement officials and prosecutors with deep experience at the Department of Justice. Unfortunately, the gratuitous remarks that the former attorney general talked about have naturally caught headlines in all of your attention. They're wrong and they're inaccurate and they obscure a very simple truth that I wanna repeat one last time, since I know it's hard to wade through 400 full pages. One, the report lays out example after example of how the president did not willfully take classified documents. The report lays out how the president did not share classified documents with anyone. The report lays out how the president did not knowingly share classified information with anyone. On page two, which I know you all read, the report argues that president willfully retained materials but buried way later on page 215, the report says, and I quote, there is in fact a shortage of evidence on these points. 200 pages later. Put simply, this case is closed because the facts and the evidence don't support the theories here. The gratuitous comments that respected experts are saying is out of line are inappropriate. And they shouldn't distract from the fact that the case is closed and the facts and evidence show that they reached the right conclusion. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, just a couple of housekeeping. Uh, when and whom um, the, was the president briefed about on the contents of the report? The president was briefed by his lawyers. Um, and second, um, the president, um, and as you mentioned again, you thought some, that some of the characterizations were gratuitous. Does the president um, still have confidence in Merrick Carlin after selecting her uh, to be put in this position? Uh, if the president spoke to this last night, I think, I can't remember which of you asked uh, him what his thoughts were on the appointment of the special counsel, and he answered that, I think, thoughtfully and powerfully, and I don't really have anything to add beyond what the president said. Just finally, does the president support the release of the entire transcript of his interview uh, to put to rest uh, some of these things that you think are being overlooked? It's a reasonable question. I think that uh, it's important to know that we're dealing with classified materials in this conversation. There are classification issues there. I don't have any announcement on, you know, releasing anything today, but it's a, it's a reasonable question, and there are classified stuff, and we'll have to work through all that. So, but once you can work through, like, say, a redacted version, would the president uh, support uh, the release as long as you can obviously keep what needs to be kept secret secret? Well, we'll take a look at that and, and make a determination. Thanks, Ian. Um, two questions. First, uh, you said in the top that the president takes classified information seriously, and the president said last night that he never discussed classified material with anyone. But the special counsel's report said that on three different occasions he did discuss it with his ghostwriter. I, I understand it didn't meet the bar for prosecution, but how do you reconcile the president's statement with what's in the report? Sure. Well, if you read the full report, it actually gets into each of those three instances. I think Justin rightly points out that we're talking about three instances out of 200 and you know, 50 pages of evidence that they're talking about uh, criticizing. Um, I think it's important to look at those three examples. Two of them are his own notes to himself in his personal diary that he was reading about to his ghostwriter for his memoir, for a memoir about uh, his life after his son Bo died. And he was reading these passages that he had written to himself to share information with him. And he took pains, and the report lays this out to express how sensitive some of the information was and that we should be careful with it. And of those two passages from his diaries that he talked about with his ghostwriter, weren't in the book. There's no classified information in the book. And so, and so I want to just make that point. And the second is there's a kind of an allegation of, uh, you know, willfully taking a, a classified document that he talked about uh, with his ghostwriter. That's false. As the president talked about last night, he was again talking about a handwritten letter that he had sent to President Obama and faxed to him about the Afghanistan troop surge. Like these are these are the president's own personal writings, you know, the president's own diary notes to himself. And I think there's an important thing to think about here. There's plenty of historic historical analogs. Uh, the most notable of which is Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, whose diaries very famously uh, became a subject of a lot of attention in the country. Uh, and the Justice Department knew that President Reagan's diaries had classified information in them. Knew it at the time. 
He took those diaries home. He read those diaries to people. He shared the actual physical copy of the, of the, of the diaries, which uh, the special counsel report talks about. Joe Biden never even gave custody of his notebooks to anybody. And, uh, and, and they never even asked for those diaries back, and they never launched an investigation. And why is that? It's because historically, going back to the beginning of the country, presidents keep diaries. They, we, we should want our presidents to be thoughtful and deliberative about the decisions that they make on the most consequential issues of our time. And we have, we have entrusted presidents to be safekeepers of this information, and, to, and we have expressed you know, great gratitude uh, including many of you in the press, when, when presidents share through books and other things insights into their thinking and decision-making and historical context. And so I think it's lost in the shuffle of all of this that the president did what all of his predecessors had done, which was take notes for himself, keep a diary of his own daily life so that he could think back on these big moments of, of the time. And so, you know, those are, that's important to know about this allegation that there was, that there was sharing the classified Right. Is your contention that just because the president rewrote classified material in his own words and then shared it with somebody who didn't have the security clearance for it, that it was okay? Well, let's look at the report. I mean, we talked a little lot about the report. I understand. It's long, 400 pages. I, you know, I'm not sure how many people in this room have read the entire thing. Page three, which I think is what everybody's asking about and understandably says, quote, Mr. Biden shared information, including some classified information, with his ghostwriter, right? But if you go to page 248, the report says, quote, we conclude that the evidence does not establish that Mr. Biden willfully disclosed national defense information to his writing assistant. That's in the report. That's the conclusion that was made based on the evidence. And, and I, there's something else I want to add about this because it's gone, we've gone back and forth. On page one of the report, it says the president willfully retained classified marked documents relating to Afghanistan. But on page 215 of the report, it says, quote, there's in fact a shortage of evidence on these points. On page five of the report, everybody read that, first few pages, says, quote, Mr. Biden's memory was significantly limited. But here's something that everybody should make sure that they see. Elsewhere in the report, he says, quote, we expect the evidence of Mr. Biden's state of mind to be compelling, pointing to him providing, quote, clear and forceful testimony. That's his comments on his state of mind later in the report. And so I think it's important to kind of take the report in its totality and understand that in that report, the facts and evidence refute the theories that are floated that they explored. I think maybe we disagree on if he should have used the word will play last time, but there's one other thing I wanted to ask you about, which is that his attorney has said that they were going to work on a process to make sure that none of this happens again. Yeah. Uh, obviously, there's the potential that this administration has less than a year left, so I'm wondering if you could detail uh, <laughs> uh, what the timeline is on that what you guys are considering for, uh, for that type of process. Yeah, it's a great question. I think that something that this uh, issue a year ago brought to light is uh, that this is a, unfortunately, very common occurrence uh, in our country. The National Archives has talked about how 80 different libraries and collections just in the last um, decade or so have called and said, oh, we found classified documents in these papers. And they have a process that you're supposed to turn those back in. But then, you know, we had the issue with President Biden. Immediately after that, we had the issue with Vice President Pence. And I think it's important to understand that this is a common occurrence, and the president thinks that we should fix it. Like, he gave all these documents back. He knew he did not, that these governments should be in possession, that the government should be in possession of these documents. And so what we're going to do is the president's going to appoint a task force to review how transitions look at classified material to ensure that there are better processes in place so that when, you know, staffs around the building are rushedly packing up boxes to try to get out during a transition as quickly as possible, at the same time and up until the very moment that, you know, they're still governing and doing matters of state, you know, they're going to try to make recommendations that that can be fixed, and he's going to appoint a senior government leader to do that. We'll have more on that soon. 2017 that he had classified material downstairs. He posted about it. In your advocacy here and in the president's counsel writing back to uh, Mr. Herr, you're saying that there were gratuitous comments, that there are false pieces of information. How is the American public supposed to process this when we also live in a world where former President Trump asserts that there was a politicized process that resulted in his prosecution related to classified documents and other things? So for the public, if Democrats and this administration say, 
trust the Department of Justice, trust the institutions, but you are also arguing here gratuitous political cheap shots and false assertions. How are they to process? Well, I talked about this actually a minute ago, and I think, you know, when you have the former attorney general, when you have the former acting FBI director, when you have the former general counsel of the FBI, you know, these are experienced people at the Justice Department who spent decades working at the Justice Department, and they're saying it's gratuitous. They're saying that this is inappropriate, that this is inconsistent with DOJ policy and practice. That's them saying it. We agree. You know, you heard the president speak forcefully about this last night. You heard the vice president speak forcefully about this today. We certainly agree that it's gratuitous. But I explained this a little bit in the opening. You know, we're in a very pressurized political environment. And when you are the first special counsel in history not to indict anybody, there is pressure to criticize and to make, you know, statements that maybe in otherwise you wouldn't make. And, you know, I, I think that it leaves you wondering why some of these critiques are in there. But I think it's also important to just fundamentally distinguish between the, the prior case that you mentioned. I want to be careful in terms of commenting on that. But the special counsel report goes into great detail about the differences and distinctions there. And I think it's important to understand that the criticisms that you're hearing of the gratuitous comments in the report, which are wrong, frankly, um, you know, this is being shared by people who have deep experience at the Justice Department. On the many issues related to memory, they certainly seem to prompt an angry response from the president and from his advocates. Is there anything being done to address that issue uh, in an ongoing way? Obviously, counsel wrote asking for some of those things to be removed. It is potential that Robert Hur could be called before Congress to testify in public. Are there any steps that the administration would take addressing that specific issue? Is it in relation to overall medical uh, physician's report of the president or other things to demonstrate what is the issue with memory and is it a factor that deals with his capacity uh, to serve? Well, I have a lot of issues with the contents of that question and Green's answered a lot about the president's transparency in his medical records and his uh, physical and things of that nature. Uh, and I, you know, leave that to, to, to Corrine to handle. But I'll say, I just read you this, page 248, or sorry, excuse me, uh, later in the report, he says, quote, we expect the evidence of Mr. Biden's state of mind to be compelling, pointing to him providing, quote, clear and, quote, forceful testimony. I can't explain why the report veers all over the place on this issue. I can just say, and as you've heard from the vice president, you heard from members of Congress yesterday talking about their recent interactions with the president. One, Congressman Goldman from New York, talking about his interaction with the president the day before this interview when Congressman Goldman was on the ground in Israel and the long and intensive and detailed conversation they had about what was going on on the ground. We just reject that this is true. And, and I think that, I think that it, it does raise questions about the gratuitousness and it raises, you know, makes you wonder why that's in there. Thank you, Kareem, and thank you, Ian. So you are discrediting some of the findings in this report. You are discrediting some of the observations of President Biden. So why should the American public accept the conclusion that charges weren't warranted? I'm not sure I understand exactly what you're asking. I'm saying you're claiming that much of the report is inaccurate. So why are you so confident that the conclusion is correct? It's the conclusion like has been obvious beginning. from the very beginning. It was a long, intensive, sort of meandering investigation that came to the conclusion that in February of last year, everybody knew that this wasn't intentional, that this was an accident, that they were found, and as soon as they were found, the president said, give them back, get them back as soon as we can and fully cooperate with everything. So he reached the inevitable conclusion because it's the truth. The conduct of the investigation throughout and the gratuitous comments in the report are troubling and they're inappropriate. But I think that the, the finding was the obvious one because it's the truth. President Biden blamed his staff largely for the mishandling of documents and where they ultimately ended up. Does the president believe he did everything right when it comes to handling classified material? Well, just look at the, um, again, look at the report. I know it's long, but the report talks about how the evidence is that these were most likely things that were packed up by staff during movements and transitions and things of that nature. So that's reflected by the report. It's not some accusation by the president. It's just true. I mean, you guys know, you guys work with White House staff all the time. We support the principal. That's our job. And principal relies on their staff to help them with things. And the president said this last night. You know, he talked about how 
you know, looking back, if he had been more he, he was you more engaged in that process of the packing and the moving things to make sure that things were being done the right way. And I think the most important thing to remember is once it was realized that something wrong had happened, he did everything right to get it back and to fix the problem. What about all the stuff that he talked about that was in his home, in filing cabinets that were either locked or able to be locked in his house? What stuff was he talking about? Classified materials? Well, we talked about, I mean, the report goes on at length about this. I'd encourage you to, to read it. It well, talks I'm about- about what he said last <laughs> night. He said the stuff in my house was all in filing cabinets that were either locked or able to be locked. Didn't he put them in his home? I'm, I'm not really following the question. I think that what's clear is that, and I told this to Justin a minute ago, you know, he has personal diaries that he had. Of course he has his personal diaries. The documents that were taken were jumbled up in boxes and found inadvertently in places, and, and that's, that's what happened, so. We, we gotta move on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how concerned is the president and, and the team here that the, quote, gratuitous comments are going to damage him, damage public perception of him? I think the public is smart, and I think that they can see uh, what's going on. I think that they see a president who fully cooperated. I think they see a president who did the right thing and made sure everything got back. Uh, and I think that they see that this was a long investigation that ended without a case to be made. And you know, I think that they can see and understand, uh, you know, when people are gratuitous and and make comments that they shouldn't make and that are beyond the the, the remit of a prosecutor to do. Um, I think that they understand that, and I think that they, I think that they'll, they'll understand that the president did the right thing here. If the seventh and eighth were obviously, or eighth and ninth were obviously like very busy days where the president was overstretched, taking calls in the middle of the night, all of this, why continue with the interview with her? Why not do it on another day? Uh, why give him the opportunity to have these lines in the report about lapses, about timelines? That he should have thrown up roadblocks. Is that what you're saying? I mean, I, no. I'm he, he, he committed to it, and as and like, hey, the world is on fire. Could we do it another I'll, I'll day? I'll tell you what's interesting about this, and this is um, oddly not in the report, is at the beginning of uh, his interview, the special counsel told the president, "I understand that you know you're dealing with a lot of things right now, and I'm going to be asking you questions about stuff from a long time ago. I want you to try to recall to the best of your abilities." you know, things of that nature. That's often what prosecutors would tell witnesses. Uh, so, you know, he understood that, but the president was gonna commit to being cooperative. He talked about this last night. He wanted to make sure he had everything he needed and he didn't want to throw up roadblocks. We gotta move on, good Thanks, Green. Um, just a first question, has the president read the entire report and when was he given the, the report? Did, did he review it when his lawyers did the privilege review? Um, and do you have any just context on when he himself found the, the findings of it? Uh, we received the report yesterday uh, from the Justice Department and formally like present, you know, sending it over. Um, obviously the president's lawyers were, were doing the privilege review that we disclosed to everybody was happening and disclosed when we had concluded it. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, uh, they were, you know, they, they had briefed him on uh, on the on the material as the client, you know, as is typical in a in a legal case, um, and then we received the full report yesterday. You know, the president's been pretty busy. I'm not sure he's read 400 pages. I'm not sure how many, you know, folks in this room have read all 400 pages of it. But he certainly is familiar with the contents of the report. Just one quick follow-up: the president was animated last night, uh, rejecting the idea that he did not remember when his son died. Can you provide a little bit more context about? Was he directly asked in the interview by the special counsel for the dates? Was it part of a broader conversation? I just think some additional context to understand what is in that report um, might be helpful. Yeah, I think, I mean, the president was pretty clear last night, and I think that the American people have heard from him for years about the pain and the suffering that they went through when Bo passed away um, and the gravity of that. And I think to suggest that he couldn't remember when his son died is really out of bounds. Um, you know, the conversations in the in the interview back and forth, you know, he's being asked about, you know, file folders from a basement and how did they get there and what is that and what were you doing around that time and things of that nature. I don't want to, but just to be very careful, I don't want to get into specific, you know, things while it's still in a classification process. But, you know, it is safe to say that, of course, the president knows when his son died. So do you have any sense of why the special counsel would write explicitly in the report that the president did not was unable to recall when his son died? 
uh, you'd have to ask the special counsel why he chose to include that. Thanks, Corrine. Thanks, Ian. So you said that you told the special counsel that the criticisms of President Biden were inaccurate, gratuitous, and wrong. So how did the special counsel respond when you told them that? I put out his report. So they I, I, I'm unaware of any uh, uh, changes that were made in response to our very strong, forceful, and rooted in evidence arguments that we provided. And you had just mentioned how these interviews happened <clears throat> shortly after the October 7th attacks. The president mentioned it last night. In mentioning that, does that mean that possible memory lapses happened because he was so distracted by what was happening overseas? Or do you dispute that he had any memory issues during those hours of interviews? I, I dispute that the characterizations about his memory that were in the report are accurate because they're not. Um, and I think the president spoke very clearly about how he, his mind was on other things. I mean, he, he was dealing with a huge international crisis of great global consequence. And, you know, he was trying his best to, to answer questions in this interview because he wanted to be fully cooperative. So there were no memory lapses during... I think you know, I think there's something important that people should remember about the way that sort of interviews like this happen. I God forbid, you know, one of you guys ever have to get interviewed by a prosecutor and you know, I hope you don't. Uh, uh, you know, witnesses are told, as I mentioned by special counsel, to do the best they can to recall or remember things. And they're they're not supposed to speculate, you know, they want facts. They want facts and evidence. And so, you know, I think probably in almost every uh, prosecutorial interview, you can imagine that people have uh, said that they don't recall things because that's what they're instructed to do. So I think that's just important context to keep in mind. And just lastly, in September, the president was asked about Trump's classified documents being found in Mar-a-Lago, and he said, quote, how could that possibly happen? How could anyone be that irresponsible? But there were classified documents found in the president's garage in a damaged cardboard box. So would that be considered irresponsible? Uh, look, I think the president made clear that he gave everything back as soon as he found out that he had it. And so, you know, I think that it's fundamentally incorrect to try to analogize the situation or to, tr and, the, and frankly, the report says that too. And the idea that, um, that he did anything except be totally cooperative and to take great strides to ensure that the classified documents were returned speaks for itself. Thank you. Um, Ian, the vice president referred today to the report as being politically motivated. Is that the position of the White House, that this report was politically motivated? Well, I, I saw the vice president's remarks. I thought they were very powerful. And I talked about this a little bit at the top of our conversation here today. You know, there's an environment that we are in that generates uh, a ton of pressure because you have congressional Republicans, other Republicans attacking prosecutors that they don't like. And it creates, you know, a, a need. If you're going to determine that charges weren't filed, people are human and they're thinking through, you know, what do we need to do? And, um, uh, you know, it leaves one to wonder exactly why he included a lot of the criticisms that were in there. Also, on, with regard to the staff, <laughs> President Biden has had some staff members who've worked for him for decades. Uh, he referenced their mistake last night as he had a visit with any of these staff members? Do the staff members who are responsible for taking those documents to his house, do they still work for the president? Have there been any consequences? Well, I think I talked about this also before. I mean, this is an issue that has plagued administrations of both parties for 50 years, where accidentally things get shuffled up and taken and removed. And the archives has, you know, literally they put a frequently asked questions page on their website about what you do if you find them accidentally. That's how often it happens. And, you know, he gave them all back as soon as he found out about it. We understand that mistakes happen sometimes. I'm not going to get into sort of individual witness or parsing like that from the it report. Didn't for President Obama, President Clinton, President Bush Sr., or President Bush Jr. I don't know if three people makes it a common. That, that's actually not true. Officials from all administrations from the past, you know, half century or so have had this accidentally happen. But you're, you're parsing two things. You asked me about the fact that, and the report states this clearly, that this is likely a result of inadvertent packing by staff. And uh, you asked exactly about the staff issue, and so I'm responding about the staff issue. Okay. And you can't say whether the staff still works for President Biden? Well, I'm saying that, that the, the, the question you're asking about uh, the frequency and normalcy, unfortunately, of mistakes like these being made, they happen. And what, what matters is how you respond to it. And when you find out that there was a mistake that was made, you give everything back. And that's exactly what was done. Trying to get as much people as possible. Thanks, Ian. Um, what, does it, what does it say about Mayor Carlin's judgment 
that he appointed someone who ultimately put out a report that was so egregious, so inappropriate, and flouted department regulations and norms. I think the president actually answered this question last night. I'm not sure which of you asked him it, but he talked about you know his views on the appointment of the special prosecutor, and I really don't have anything beyond what he said. Two things I was hoping you could uh, quickly clarify. The report says that in 2017, the president told his ghostwriter that he just found all the classified stuff downstairs. Why did he not report that at the time? Well, and this is included in the report as well, if you read through it. Um, the president was talking about a handwritten letter that he had uh, sent to President Obama that he faxed to him about the Afghanistan uh, policy in 2009. And, um, you know, he says, in, you know, and this is in the report that he's, and he said last night, you know, I should, have I should have said sensitive. I should have said, you know, really careful, you know, more careful language about that. Because he was talking about something that was a personal, like a letter he sent to the president. So in his mind, it was sensitive, but what he said was classified. Yeah, this is in the report. They talk a lot about how, um, you know, the president actually took great care when talking with his book writer to note things like, hey, I, you need to be really careful with some of this stuff. I'm not entirely sure about it. And so I think that I think that that's important to realize that the report itself actually talks about what care he took with this sort of information as they explore all the theories and go through all the evidence that sort of refutes most of those theories, almost all of actually all of those theories when you think about the judgment that there will be no case in this in this matter. So, you know, that's that's addressed in the report. And, and the second thing, um, the president also said last night, all the stuff that was in my home was in filing cabinets that were either locked or able to be locked. But the report uh, says that some of the classified documents were in cabinet drawers, uh, while others about Afghanistan, for example, were in unsealed and badly damaged box sitting in his garage. So did the president misspeak last night? Look, I think the president was responding to a number of inaccurate uh, allegations in this uh, in this report. Um, we've talked a lot about, uh, Justin asked about the diaries. I mean, this is his personal diaries. Of course, he has them in his house. Um, so, you know, I don't have anything kind of to add on what he said last night. Um, I want to follow up on the vice president's comments on, you've been saying gratuitous. She said politically motivated. Is it this, is it this administration's stance that this report was issued in part, or there was a motive in this issue, a goal, a goal with this report to inflict political harm on the president? I think that you have to look at what, I mean, we talked about this at the beginning of our conversation today. You, know, you have a situation where former DOJ officials are talking about the political repercussions of these actions, and that it's incumbent upon the prosecutor to take great care to follow departmental policy, to not criticize unindicted conduct and behavior or, or characteristics, which we've seen in, in this that's, case. That's and former GOJ officials. But this White House right now, is it the stance by this White House that this report was issued in part with a motive and a goal to inflict political harm on the president? I, I, I heard the question the first time, and I'm just, I'm, I, I you know, have nothing to object to in what the vice president said. I thought she was powerful and forceful. But, but also, just to follow up, I'm sorry, this administration, as you said, you said that Republicans have often attacked prosecutors, yeah. independent that's systems, well and you said that's created an environment where, if I've interpreted this right, there is an incentive by the special counsel to include some of this language. But often I've heard from Democrats and this White House say that those attacks against independent systems can also sow distrust with the public and those independent institutions. By saying that this is politically motivated, not just gratuitous, but politically motivated, does this not also sow distrust with the public? And I, I reject that. I, I reject that question. You see this, and it's in the report, the letter that the, the president's lawyer and the White House counsel's office sent to the special counsel to talk about the Department of Justice norms and policies that they see as being violated by some of the comments and remarks made in the report. And so, you know, I think that that's a false equivalence kind of question, uh, because what we have argued and what we continue to say and believe is that you're not supposed to make these sorts of things according to Justice Department policy. We, the president, when he ran, and you guys all know this because you heard this, talked about how important it was to restore the rule of law. And he understands that. And he talked about this last night, to MJ's point, about the appointment of the special counsel and sort of how he felt about that. Um, you know, this is a president who is committed to, the, to restoring those norms. And I think when we object to some of the gratuitousness in the comments that you're asking about, you know, we're, and you hear me talk about the former attorney general and other people who've made those comments, you know, 
they are criticizing that this does not follow those norms. Do you think it was political? Yeah, we got to keep going. With respect to the portion of the video in the transcript where he was asked about his time as vice president and about Bo Biden's death, why not release those parts of the video? Those aren't classified. It's a transcript we're talking about, and I already addressed this uh, with Justin. Okay, so, so, so what you're saying is this wasn't a, a video, There was, there's not tapes that you can release of that? I was just responding. I think that the question is about the transcript. Okay, and, and, and as far as attorney, former Attorney General Holder is concerned, you referenced him and the normal DOJ review process. He brought that up in his tweet as well, or his ex-posting. What part of the normal DOJ review process is the White House saying was violated or bypassed in some way? Well, there's actually, it's an interesting question, it's a little in the weeds, pardon me, but this, the, the special counsel regulations that exist at the Justice Department govern the process that is supposed to happen here, and the Justice Department has its own sort of manual of procedures, and, you know, as you've heard from those experts, you're not supposed to sort of criticize unindicted conduct when you're making these determinations. Okay, Claire. still in the back. Thank you. Uh, a follow-up and then a separate question. You said a moment ago that the president was responding to inaccurate information mm -hmm. when he claimed uh, last night that all the stuff in my home was behind locked filing cabinets. Is he entirely clear now, at this point, where all the documents were discovered? And does he now know that his statement about locked filing cabinets is false? The, the report lays out in 400 pages of detail all of the evidence and all of the review that they conducted in looking into this matter. Uh, the president made sure that all of the classified documents that were found were returned promptly to the government, which is what you're supposed to do, which is why this is the inevitable conclusion that there is no case here. And that's not what I asked, though. Does he know that his statement yesterday that all the documents were behind locked cabinets yeah. was inaccurate? Is he clear in his mind? I know that last night was perhaps, you know, stressful, confusing environment, but does he I, I understand what you're trying to ask, Phil, and I think that I've answered I, the I, question. I, so I have a separate okay, follow-up question, and that is my follow-up question okay. after that lack of a response was there was an eye-popping moment in the report specifically about the, the president's ghostwriter. And that was that after he learned that the special counsel had began an investigation, he deleted some of his recordings. Now, those recordings were able to be recovered. What I'm curious about is, can you say um, definitively whether or not the president or anyone else at the White House was in contact with his ghostwriter? Um, this is in the report. I mean, read the report. In the report, it says that, that they sought this, they looked into this, and that, that they didn't. So, so they that's in the report. John, they were not in contact. Thank John. you, Kareem. Uh, Ian, thank you so sure. much. Yeah. And two questions. Just for clarity, you're from the White House Counsel's Office, correct? correct? But you're not a lawyer, correct? That's correct. Okay. I'm a spokesperson. Okay. Uh, any chance that we'll get the White House counsel to come out here and answer questions uh, directly? Yeah, I, should I be offended by that? I mean, I, 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 I was... I get offended I was, all the time. I know. I mean, what? I mean, come on. You did say something that was factually I was, I incorrect. Was asked, I, 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 there has been a previous I, 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 special counsel. John, 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 finish, finish your question, please. Uh, I was asked to come today by your colleagues in the press corps and we happily obliged. As you know, former President Trump, he was charged with a slew of criminal charges related to classified documents in his possession, including counts of willful retention mm -hmm. of national defense information. In this report, uh, it's made clear by the special counsel that President Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified material. He kept it in unsecured locations after his vice presidency, uh, which presented, according to the special counsel, serious risks to national security. So my question to you, Ian, is can you explain to every voter out there, every American, why it is that President Biden essentially is let off the hook and former President Trump is now facing these slew of criminal charges, which seem to most people very similar. Great wind-up, John. I mean, I mean, really a good wind-up. I talked about this uh, already. Page one, willful retention. Page two, 15. There is, in fact, a shortage of evidence on these points. The report itself goes through in great detail the facts and evidence that led to the obvious conclusion that there was no case here. The report itself answers the question you're asking about the distinction between two cases, as you guys have heard us from the White House say for a long time. We're very careful about commenting on certain cases like that. Just, I would encourage you, perhaps all of you, read the report. I've read the report, and that's the reason why I asked that question, and the reason why so many people seem confused, because you hear willful retention of national defense information related to Trump, 
willful retention of classified, classified material related to President Biden, and yet one individual is facing a criminal trial being brought by the Department of Justice in Fort Pierce, Florida, and the other one sure, is not facing is, any charges sure. whatsoever. I, and I think I've talked to many of, of you guys in the room over the last 24 hours about this. Uh, uh, the allegation that there was willful retention of documents is refuted by the evidence in the report. And the conclusion was made directly that the evidence does not support that claim. He explored the theory. It's in there on page two. Everybody focused on it. I'm exploring the theory of willful retention, but that the evidence as a whole was insufficient because that's not what the facts show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Karine. Yeah. Really appreciate, appreciate it, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, there was yeah. a previous special counsel <laughs> that did not result in indictments, by the way. The Ham Jordan case. Okay, thank you. I would say refer to the White House special counsel, and now not special counsel, but legal counsel. They're here. They came. Okay, go ahead, Almer. Oh. Excuse me. Uh, two questions, just following up on yeah. comments that the president made last night. Yeah. Um, president Biden called the military operations in Gaza mm -hmm. over the top. Um, and this comes after the White House has pretty consistently defended Israel's conduct. What's changed, and what exactly did the president mean by over the top? Yeah, so first of all, I, I you know, I would say nothing has changed. His position hasn't changed. His, I don't think his messaging has, has changed. Uh, we don't think his messaging has changed. He doesn't believe his messaging has changed. This isn't something uh, the first time he's done so, what you heard from him yesterday. Look, the president made it very clear uh, in his comment that he was obviously talking about uh, Israel's conduct in Gaza. Uh, and he's been clear. He's been clear that the United States uh, wants to see Hamas, a, a terrorist organization, defeated. He's been very clear on that. Uh, that is a shared goal that we have, obviously, with Israel. Uh, but at the same time, at the same time, while we have said that, we have been also very clear, the president has been very clear, that they must do so by ensuring that uh, their operations are targeted and conducted in a way that we are protecting innocent civilians. And that is something that we have been incredibly consistent uh, about here uh, in this administration. We want to make sure that we are also protecting innocent civilians. So that is what uh, the president was uh, was uh, speaking to yesterday. Uh, he was asked, a, obviously, a direct question, and he answered that. Okay, just, uh, secondly, um, the president last night um, bristled against the fact that many Americans have concerns about his age. Um, I think uh, to a question of one of my colleagues, he said, that's your judgment, suggesting it's the media's judgment. Uh, there's no shortage of published polls that, that suggest Americans have concern about his age and stamina, and it's been put in all sorts of different ways. So is the president out of touch with what Americans feel about this issue? So, uh, you know, look, obviously when it comes to the report more broadly, you just heard from uh, my colleague um, Ian Sams, that part of the report we don't think lives in reality, and that's what he was speaking to, where, uh, uh, where you know, comments were made in that report about that, about uh, obviously about his memory that we don't believe uh, lives in reality. And no, 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 I'm going to answer your question. Just give me, just give me, just give me a beat. I'm going to answer your question. When you have a president that has been one of the most productive, if not the most productive and effective presidents in modern time, that you would assume is a president that is indeed in touch uh, with where the American people are, right? That would assume that the president understands what's going on around the kitchen table when Americans are sitting around the kitchen table trying to figure out how are they going to deal with the economy? How are they going to deal with the health care? So in our opinion, in my opinion, he is very much in touch with what Americans are feeling out there uh, as it relates to lowering costs, as it relates to making sure that we big, beat big pharma. This isn't the president who understands what the American people are feeling. Look, as it relates to his age, as it relates to uh, what has been said uh, by, you know, by uh, in this report, it is something that we don't believe lives in reality in the sense of this is a, this is a president I have spent, I've known this president since 2009. I've known this president. He's been not just my boss, but a mentor to me. And no one in this building would say that what we saw in this report about his memory. Everybody sees somebody who works very, very hard, has spent hours with him, understanding exactly where the American people are and what they're feeling, and also how to deliver uh, on those critical, important issues to them. Your argument on, his, on the report and uh, the assertion that it's gratuitous is well taken, as well as yeah. what you believe is his performance. I get that. Yeah. 
but he seemed to be playing with a different set of facts. The facts are that this is an issue that America. Okay. That's the White House press briefing there, Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre and the spokesman for the White House Counsel's Office just previously, Ian Sams. They say the best defense is a good offense, and there's no question uh, that the White House is going on offense aggressively against uh, Special Counsel Robert Hur's report on his investigation into President Biden's mishandling of classified documents. Ian Sams, uh, the White House Counsel's Office spokesman, uh, really went after the report in detail, uh, what he called after a long, intensive, excessive investigation. It resulted, he said again and again, in no justification for a case being made. He went uh, page by page, phrase by phrase in this long report, uh, more than 300-page report, saying that uh, the special counsel for all of the verbiage in it came to the conclusion that there was not evidence that President Biden had in any criminal way mishandled uh, classified information. And on the question that got the attention of the country and still has it, the president's capacities, mental capacities at the age of 81, which this report has ignited the conversation about around the country by talking about his poor memory. Uh, just like other officials, Ian Sams and Karine Jean-Pierre called what the special counsel had done on that subject, quote, gratuitous and inappropriate. Again and again, he said it was gratuitous for the special counsel and that investigative team to say that the president had a poor memory and was showing signs of age. Let's bring in for more on this our ABC News White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks and ABC News political director Rick Klein. Uh, Mary Alice, first let me go to you. You cover Biden. You have covered Biden a long time. Here is... As I said, uh, a, a vigorous and aggressive defense against both the, the notion that the president in any way, shape, form, or fashion mishandled classified information uh, and that he is losing uh, a, a speed uh, mentally. What, what do you think of how this defense was launched? I mean, they're absolutely in damage control, Terry. The question is, has the damage already been done? It is not fun for this White House to be talking on a second day about the president's age. This is the last thing they want to be talking about, but here they have to respond. Uh, it's one thing for a staff member, someone that works for this president, to defend him. Uh, it might work, but what is so hard right now is you have an outsider. You have a special counsel who wrote in black and white uh, what he thought of the president, and that is what is so tough for these uh, the members of the president's team to fight against and respond to. It's very interesting to me that the vice president was ready to respond in front of the cameras today on this issue. She also used that word, said this was gratuitous, inaccurate. She referenced being a former prosecutor and said that she just found this completely inappropriate uh, from the special counsel. Like you said, they are all in on this. They are attacking the special counsel's conduct here, but I don't know if it'll be enough. I, I, and let me go to the politics. Thank you, Mary Alice. Let's go to Rick Klein. The politics of this. So, so Rick, they're calling it gratuitous, and I, I actually just looked it up to make sure I had the ad, absolute uh, understanding. And gratuitous means done without reason. No reason to include these comments. That investigators who sat with the president for hours uh, believed that he had slipped mentally, that he, his memory was, was poor as an elderly person. And, and, Rick, it seemed that what the White House is doing is not directly attacking the press special prosecutor, but saying that Republicans are so mean and so aggressive to prosecutors who don't do with their bidding that this prosecutor apparently felt uh, that he had to include something negative about President Biden. At least that's what I got from the White House counsel's office spokesman. He offered no evidence for it, but he just said the general negative Republican Party Republicans act uh, attacking prosecutors who don't do what they like, that that's why these comments were included. Do I have that right? Does that make sense? I think it does, Terry. I think there's a, an inherent contradiction in what you're hearing from the White House right now, which is essentially believe the good parts of this report, don't believe the bad parts. Believe the good parts in that there's no charges being filed, uh, that they don't find like there's a reason to, to bring a case. But don't believe all of these descriptions about mentals, uh, mental ability or Joe Biden's c concerns around his age. A and one of the problems with that is that they're actually connected. If you read the report, one of the reasons, rightly or wrongly, one of the reasons the special counsel says it's not going to prosecute is that they feel like a jury would probably not convict someone uh, who, who presents themselves to be at, at the age and the, the geniality and the mental condition overall of Joe Biden. Now, 
Obviously, Biden allies, including the White House, hate that. They hate that suggestion, and they are pushing back in the broad generalities of it, although we haven't seen specific evidence from transcripts to, to say that, yes, he was wrong uh, to, to, to point out the inconsistencies in his memory. Um, I think that's a little bit of a dance that's engaged here. I think the broader political problem, though, is bigger than any of that, which is that what this report does is confirm what people have already felt. They've already said it has been in public opinion polling for a long time now that people are concerned about Joe Biden's age and mental acuity and a little bit less concerned around Donald Trump's. And if this is the choice between the American people, as it appears very likely that it is, this is a debate that is now going to be happening very much out in the open. It's not going to be uh, able to be relegated to, to the back corners or the whispers of cloakrooms. This has to be now litigated very publicly among Democrats, among Republicans and independents, because we are looking at this as the reality. There's no realistic chance that Joe Biden um, is not the Democratic nominee unless he were to decide to, to step away. And Donald Trump is likely to be the Republican. Nominee. And these polls that were out there predated by some time this report from the special counsel. And it, what this does essentially is underscore a big political weakness that a lot of Americans feel about him. Great point there, then. We're looking at some of the polling numbers here. And Mary Alice, you, you, you've got a great perspective to help people understand this because you spent a lot of time covering the Biden White House and you've been out on the campaign trail and you like to talk to people, you like to talk to voters. Does the voter, do the voters' concerns about Biden track with what you can observe as a reporter, uh, personally, at your work, in your work at the White House? Yeah, Terry, there are strident Democrats who dismiss this outright. They say people have made fun of Biden for years. People have said he's too old for years. This is a guy who's made gaffes for years. Forget it. Move on. I'm done. They're ready to go to bat for him. They like talking about his accomplishments. I was struck just last weekend. I was with a group of college Democrats. He's so young uh, who were defending him on this question of his age. They are Democrats. They want to vote for a Democrat. The question is everyone in the middle. The question is all those voters who aren't sure, who maybe aren't interested in voting again for former President Trump, but they are feeling a concern about this president. They take note when he stumbles. They're not sure about his recall. They notice those moments when he trails off in his sentences uh, where he confuses the name of a foreign leader. And they wonder, is that just something that everyone does in a moment? Is that something he's a little more prone to, or is it the sign of something different? And of course, yes, Terry, I talk to voters all the time in the middle who are not sure, and some who outright have just said they've seen enough. They worry he's too old. Hmm. And, and Rick, let me, let me go to you at, uh, on this. I'm, I'm old enough to remember when another president uh, in the middle of a presidential campaign displayed signs of what many people took to be, you know, age-related decline, not not medical, just old. Ronald Reagan got lost in an answer at the first debate he had with Walter Mondale. He came back, he cracked a joke, everybody laughed and seemed to put that to bed, uh, and then served a second term. And then a few years later was diagnosed uh, with Alzheimer's. And I just wonder, yeah, and he was 69 uh, when he left office. Biden's 81. And I, and I wonder if there are any lessons to be drawn for the, for the White House, and for voters from, from Ronald Reagan. I mean, Ronald Reagan had a productive second term, no question about it. What do you think? Yeah, look, and I, and I think it's, it's it, instructive to look at episodes like that to see how it was handled. And there's evidence that's come out in later years about people around Ronald Reagan that made things a little more comfortable for him and for the decision-making process. And the fact of the matter is the president's surrounded by a, a lot of people that can help ease a decision-making process and potentially protect him. I also think it's telling to me that there haven't been a lot of leaked anecdotes from either White House aides or staffers or Capitol Hill, uh, p people that are involved in the direct interactions with this president on a regular basis that have got to the same kind of level that Robert Hur is talking about here. Clearly, there have been public stumbles that we've talked about. And I also think that this discussion around chronological age, I think, has to be a little bit separate than the discussion around mental acuity and ability. I mean, look, I, Terry, you were a year or two ahead of me in college. I was a year or two ahead of Mary Alice in college. I know our viewers think we're all about 25 years old. But bottom line is that people age at different, at, at different uh, phases when it comes to mental ability. And yes, Donald Trump is only a few years younger than, than Joe Biden. A lot 
lot of this comes down to perceptions. Biden reads older right now by the way he moves, by the way he talks, and all of that is among the things that people can make a judgment about in an election. That is what is going to happen right here. And yeah, there's going to be a lot of whataboutism, and people will point to the other side, and that's all fair game for the discussion. But people are going to be considering, based not just on the reality of, of what happened and what's in a special counsel's report, but on their feelings about what their comfort level is. And for whatever, whatever combination of factors, people were comfortable with a somewhat older Ronald Reagan in that second term. That will be a big question facing Joe Biden. Absolutely. They are the decision makers. They, that, that's their office that they get to fill, and they will take into account whatever they can. And you just made my day, Rick. I think I'm more than a couple of years ahead of you. <laughs> but thank you. I'll you take never know it. it. And, and Mary Alice Parks, thank you, as always. Thanks very much on that. <clears throat> All right, we're going to turn the page to a, a very serious uh, event that's happening overseas. Breaking news. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has told his military to prepare for an evacuation of the city of Rafa inside of Gaza ahead of an expected Israeli invasion there. Netanyahu gave his military forces the orders to prepare to clear out a place where an estimated 1.2 million Palestinians now live. That's more than half of Gaza's population, many of whom fled their homes elsewhere, now all crammed into one spot. Rafa, of course, is where the Israeli Defense Forces has told Gazans to go for safety. Here's ABC News foreign correspondent James Longman on this. Yeah, hi, Terry. Benjamin Netanyahu calling now for an evacuation of Rafa. This is the southern city of Gaza, which has come to be somewhat of a shelter for uh, the many hundreds of thousands, over a million now in Rafa, having fled uh, the war in the rest uh, of Gaza. Uh, so this is what he said, but this is fraught with problems. I mean, Palestinians regard this as a forced displacement, not an evacuation. When, they're when they've been told previously to go to, quote, unquote, safe areas of Gaza, uh, Often, they tell us they have found that they were not safe uh, and the bombs find them when they get there. Uh, so, look, he has said that they must move, but uh, so far no real plan as, as to what that will actually mean. You remember, so many of these people have already moved uh, multiple times. And this is coming off the back of some pretty harsh criticism from the United States, unprecedented, I think, so far uh, in this conflict. President Biden saying that the Israeli response broadly in Gaza has been, quote, over the top, uh, and when asked... Uh, at the uh, State Department uh, the spokesman there saying military operations right now in Rafa would be a disaster for people there. So the U.S. is stepping up its criticism. There's a, there's a kind of sense, I think, here in Israel that they're really on borrowed time now uh, to try to bring this military operation to a close. But from the very outset, remember, they did say that they had a number of uh, objectives, and one of those was identifying Yahya Sinwa, finding him, uh, tracking him down, and taking him uh, into custody or neutralizing him, the leader of Hamas in Gaza. And so far, that has not happened. So presumably, the IDF thinks that they might find him uh, in the Rafa area. Uh, that remains uh, to be seen. So, look, we'll see what exactly this evacuation process looks like, where in Gaza exactly these people will be able to go. But this will be a very, very difficult operation. Uh, the population of Gaza has multiplied six times since this conflict began. Terry. All right, James Longman there on this conflict. Thank you very much. Well, new this hour, there's a massive manhunt that's underway for the gunman who shot a tourist and fired at an officer inside a store in Times Square, New York. Police say the suspects entered the store and started stealing clothing, possibly sneakers, and that's when a loss prevention officer confronted them, and police say one of the suspects opened fire, missing that officer hitting an innocent bystander. Here's ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky. Terry, this all unfolded Thursday evening in Times Square, and police are now hunting for a teen that they say was responsible for opening fire inside that sporting goods store, aiming, they said, at a security guard who had snatched away stolen items from him and two others, but striking a woman from Brazil who was visiting New York she was struck in the leg, taken to the hospital. She's going to be okay. But now there's a manhunt underway because the teen and the others fled the store on foot when police gave chase. Police said that the teen turned, fired his gun toward the officers, and then ditched his jacket and ducked into the subway to make his escape. The authorities have been on edge because of uh, different crime sprees in and around migrant shelters in Times Square 
This teenager is believed to be from Colombia. He may also have ties to the Bronx, where he's wanted for questioning in a different unsolved robbery. Uh, so police now know who they're looking for, uh, but they are urgently trying to find him. Terry? All right, Aaron Kotursky on that manhunt. Thanks very much. Well, coming up, lawmakers on Capitol Hill are blaming drug makers for the high price of prescription medications, but will that mean an actual change in the laws? We're on Capitol Hill when we return. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Oh my! Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you Usher now. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill are blaming drug makers for the high price of prescription medications. This comes after CEOs from Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Bristol-Myers testified on Capitol Hill yesterday as senators on both sides of the aisle demanded answers. ABC News' Jay O'Brien has the latest from Capitol Hill. Hey, Jay. Terry, this was lawmakers, chief among them the chair of this committee, Senator Bernie Sanders, grilling the CEOs of Merck, Johnson & Johnson, and Bristol-Myers Squibb, big pharmaceutical companies. The stated goal of this hearing, Sanders says, was to highlight what he says are drug prices in the United States that are just too high. He pointed to the fact that it, he said Americans pay twice as much as citizens of other countries for health care and chief among those costs are high drug prices. He also accused these drug companies of, of taking their profits and instead engaging in stock buybacks and big salaries for executives rather than reinvesting that money or, as the purpose of this hearing was, cutting prices for some of these drugs, which he says is something that Americans of all political affiliations and all ideologies can get behind. Here's a little bit of Sanders' opening statement to these executives. In 2022, Johnson & Johnson made nearly $18 billion in profit paid its CEO over $27 million in compensation and spent over $17 billion on stock buybacks and dividends. That same year, Merck made $14.5 billion in profits, handed out over $7 billion in dividends in their, uh, to their stockholders, and paid its CEO over $52 million in compensation. 
Now, the pharmaceutical industry says that these profits are then reapplied back into research, which gives the pharmaceutical industry the ability to advance new cancer treatments and new treatments for other diseases and try to find cures that perhaps weren't there in science before. That's something that Republicans on the committee pointed to. Additionally, pharmaceutical executives said that customers in the United States get access to these pharmaceutical treatments, particularly the breakthroughs, far sooner than people in countries across the world. Nonetheless, Democrats on the committee specifically pointing to these high drug costs, saying it's a key issue for voters, which we've seen bear out in the polling as well. But the reality here, the takeaway from this hearing, Terry, is that no one emerged, none of the lawmakers, with any kind of concession or agreement from these CEOs to lower prices, Terry. Right, absolutely. Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill on that crucial issue. Thanks very much. Well, a new law in Australia would make it very difficult for your boss to send you a text outside of office hours. The Australian federal government has proposed a raft of proposed changes to industrial relations laws, which it says would protect workers' rights. It's passed the Senate. Now it just needs to clear their house. So let's talk about this. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophus joins us now with more. So that's Australia. Let's... Let's think about this in the United States, and not in our business, of course, because we've always got to be on call because of breaking news. It sounds appealing. What do you make of it? It does sound appealing, and you're right. Uh, news couldn't really abide by this law very well. Neither could the healthcare industry, right, with doctors on call and hospitals and all of that. But it sort of brings new meaning to the word, uh, you know, to the words, tune out your boss. Because if this does become law in Australia, it looks like it's going to be. It would make it illegal uh, for an employer to reach out to you after hours with a phone call or an email on your personal time. I, the, the thought process here is that they want to avoid worker burnout, and they say that... You you know, if you're not being paid overtime 24 hours a day, then you shouldn't be penalized if you're not on call to answer a call or go online. Um, Australia is not the only one doing this or who wants to do this. A lot of European countries already have similar laws on the books. Uh, France, Italy, Spain, Belgium uh, already have similar legislation in place. It sounds good, right, Terry? But some are saying this could backfire. They say it's heavy-handed legislation. Uh, they're overreaching here. They say it could actually cause more problems in the workplace. Maybe people will wind up losing their jobs. And it doesn't exactly make the case for working from home, which we know became very popular during the pandemic, and many folks are still doing it now. Absolutely. You know, I'm surprised to see that list you just gave us of France and Belgium and other countries. I lived, uh, you know, in London and worked in Europe for five years. And the work-life balance seemed already totally different than the United States. I'd be in the office at 6 o'clock, look around, there'd be nobody there. And, and, <laughs> and it, that was just cultural, right? Now, there's no question, Americans, it's out of, it's out of whack, work-life balance. So I, I, I wonder, is this, is this the right way to approach what might be a genuine problem in some countries? Well, you know, I'm with you because I think a lot of the folks in Europe look at us and think we're crazy for, for the way we work. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, the Japanese, the Chinese, uh, a lot of worker productivity there, they, I don't think these kinds of rules would fly in their in their countries either. Um, but, yeah, a, a lot of people believe that, you know, while it might not be the, the law of the land in the U.S. anytime soon, and I think you're right, you hit it, it's a cultural thing here, right? I mean, some people even wear it as a badge of honor. I'm always connected, I'm always on, I'm always Always working. I think a lot of us stepped back from that, though, especially uh, during the pandemic. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see if um, any law like that is proposed here. I think more than that, Terry, we might see companies, right? And we, we're already seeing that, uh, have their own policies in-house to sort of achieve that mental well health and well-being and, and work-life balance. That's or at least right. we can always hope. No, hope. I always wondered why globalization was a one-way street. Everybody gets McDonald's, but we don't get siestas or... or, or. <laughs> Or whatever. No, we don't. <laughs> we don't. Alexis Christophorus, as always on these issues. Thanks very much. You bet. Well, coming up, the British publisher Mirror Group agrees to pay Prince Harry over $500,000. We'll tell you why when we return. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, 
We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I did, I did, I did, I did, I did. Oh, my God. Oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamal Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Oh, yeah. I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. And here's some of the top headlines we are following at this hour at ABC News Live. The National Transportation Safety Board has released its preliminary report about what happened to this Atlas air jet in late January to cause it to catch fire over Miami. Take a look at that. Uh, the preliminary report says a maintenance worker failed to properly replace a small plug in the engine after inspecting the Boeing 747 aircraft. Despite the flames, the flight landed safely after the incident. Well, the results of Pakistan's parliamentary election are now rolling in, and the vote was delayed several times by sporadic violence in that country, cell service shutdowns as well, and the barring of imprisoned former Prime Minister Imran Khan and some of his allies from running. The first results show that independent candidates who were backed by Khan in the lead over the incumbent Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. The Pakistani military says 12 people were killed and 39 wounded in dozens of attacks by militants trying to disrupt that vote. And in the UK, British publisher Mirror Group Newspapers says it has agreed to pay Prince Harry 400,000 pounds. That's equal to roughly 505,000 US dollars. This payment comes after a judge found that the group, which publishes the Daily Mirror, engaged in, quote, widespread and habitual phone hacking, including of the prince's personal phone. Harry still has ongoing cases against the publishers of The Sun and The Daily Mail over allegations of similar breaches of privacy. Well, thanks for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. We will be right back with more news. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. I'm Alex Perche in East Palestine, Ohio, one year after that toxic train derailment. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Right now on ABC News Live, President Biden defiant after a report from the special counsel questioned his memory and his mental faculties. Biden told reporters he's the most qualified person in this country to be president. But do voters agree? Plus, another escalation. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has ordered the Israeli military to prepare for an evacuation of the entire town of Rafah inside Gaza, home to more than a million Palestinians. We've got the latest from Tel Aviv. And get ready for the big game. We've got a supersized Super Bowl preview from Las Vegas. That's coming up. Well, good afternoon. I'm Terry Moran. And our top story this hour, President Biden is firing back at the special counsel's office after a report into his handling of classified documents cast doubt on his mental acuity and memory. Although special counsel Robert Hur's report clears Biden of criminal wrongdoing, it described the president as, quote, an elderly man with a poor memory. Uh, this report even suggested that President Biden could not recall when his son Beau actually died. The president angrily defended himself at the White House last night. I know there's some attention paid to some language in the report about my recollection of events. There's even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. And we heard from the White House Counsel's Office a short time ago as they tried to shut down criticism and insisted that Biden has no issues with his memory. <clears throat> I mean, now, Selena, you were in the room as the White House Counsel spoke following the report. What stood out to you? Yeah, Terry, I mean, look, this is a White House that is clearly in damage control mode. And Ian Sams, he was defiant. He pushed back on the way the president was characterized. He called the special counsel's descriptions of the president as gratuitous, inappropriate. He called it an excessive investigation. And he really wanted to hit home on how this was all an accident and that as soon as the president found out that there was classified information, he himself decided to immediately get that returned. And he really tried to draw the contrast between how President Biden allegedly handled these classified documents and how former President Trump had allegedly handled these documents. Now, he mentioned a few times about how this, the interviews he had with, with the special counsel, how they were hours of interviews and they happened shortly after the October 7th Hamas attacks on Israel. And he said how clearly the president was focused on big international issues. So I followed up with Ian Sam saying, is that, are you basically saying that the president was distracted and he did have memory lapses because he was focused on this international response? And he said, look, it is common in interviews like this with prosecutors to have issues like this. And he tried to basically just brush it off. And later with Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre, I was asking about the several gaffes that the president has made recently, including mixing up last night the president of Egypt with the president of Mexico. And her response was, the president has been making gaffes for decades, his entire career. It's nothing more than that. Clearly, this White House in damage control and trying to defend the president, his mental acuity, and his handling of those documents, Terry. All right, that was a great summary. Thank you for that. And you're fighting your colleague who's about four feet next to you and yelling. Uh, but, uh, but we got it loud and clear from you, and I appreciate that. And I want to ask you about Vice President Kamala Harris. I, I know that, uh, that you've asked her a question as well. How is she responding? Yeah, Terry. Well, Kamala Harris, the vice president, she was extremely forceful. She was painting this document as essentially sort of like a partisan memo, saying it was politically motivated. So take a listen to this exchange I had with her. What I saw of that report last night, I believe, is, as a former prosecutor, um, 
the comments that were made by that prosecutor gratuitous, inaccurate, and inappropriate. So the way that the president's demeanor in that report was characterized could not be more wrong on the facts and clearly politically motivated. Gratuitous. And the vice president also spent a fair amount of her answer talking about how the president led and coordinated the response to the October 7th attack, saying that he was in front of it all, speaking with world leaders, speaking with all of the leaders here in the United States to coordinate all of that, trying to defend his mental acuity. Now, the legal issue here may be cleared and over, but as you mentioned, Terry, politically, this still could be damaging for some time. And the last thing that this White House wants to be dealing with at this moment, that the campaign wants to be dealing with at this moment, is to have questions about President President Biden's age and mental fitness once again at the center of the conversation here. Well, it seems to me, Selena, they better get used to it since it is clearly a, a priority for voters to think through that, reach their own decisions. Selena Wang at the White House. Thanks very much. The Israeli army is now preparing to evacuate the city of Rafah in Gaza ahead of an expected Israeli invasion there. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu gave his military orders to prepare to evacuate a place where an estimated 1.2 million Palestinians live. More, that's more than half of Gaza's population, many of them refugees from elsewhere in Gaza, crammed now into one spot. Rafah, of course, is where the Israeli Defense Forces told Gazans to go for safety. Uh, while they made war in other parts of uh, Gaza. So let's go to ABC News foreign correspondent James Longman, who's been covering this conflict since the beginning. He's in Tel Aviv with more on this. Uh, James, Rafa's population now has grown s six times, I understand, since October the 7th. And now uh, Netanyahu talks about a massive operation underway. What, 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 what do we know at this hour? Well, Netanyahu says he's been talking about what he calls total victory. And for him, Rafa is also a target. He, there's the sense that there's more Hamas uh, operatives there. They've said that there are, the IDF have said there are four Hamas battalions in the Rafa area. And don't forget, at the beginning of all this, they did say one of their main objectives was finding Yahya Sinwar, the, the leader of Hamas, the man who planned the October 7th attack. That still hasn't materialized. So one assumes they believe him to be somewhere in that area. But you do get a sense that Israel's now running on slightly borrowed time when it comes to this military uh, operation. Uh, unprecedented unprecedented uh, really from Joe Biden uh, on, in his criticism uh, of the Israeli operation since October 7th. He said it was over the top. You've had Josh Kerb Kirby at the National Security Council saying uh, that the, the United States would not support a military operation in Rafa if uh, it meant that all those civilians were still there uh, and in the way of it and that it would be a disaster for them. So he's having to balance that plus criticism in this country from a lot of uh, detractors who say that he's just trying to draw out this war for as long as possible so he doesn't have to face the music because a lot of people hold him responsible for the security lapse that led to October 7th. But there is the real sense here in Israel that Hamas cannot be allowed to remain uh, as any kind of viable force inside Gaza. So that begs the question, just how can they go after them in this area where so many have gone for safety? We don't have the details on what this evacuation would look like. Palestinians uh, look at these as, uh, as forced, uh, you know, they're being forced, forcibly moved around uh, Gaza. And when they've been told previously to move, it's not been safe for them. We, we speak to Palestinians uh, on the phone uh, re relatively regularly when we can. Obviously, Israel doesn't allow us into Gaza to speak to them face to face. And they tell us that when they're asked to move, uh, it often they find that the bombs uh, follow them and many of the, all of the probably the families who've moved to Gaza have had to move six, seven, eight, nine times so far. So I'm sure in the next 24, 48 hours we'll get more detail on just what this evacuation looks like. But certainly tonight in Rafa, it must be a, a very, very scary time with this indication that the military operation will go to Rafa. You know, James, that is such a startling thing to say, that families in this war, which began on October 7th, have already moved five, six, seven times. Rafa, really the last safe haven de 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 established by Israeli forces. Where are they going to go? Where are all those people going to go? Is there some plan to get them out of Gaza altogether and into the Sinai? 
Well, so inside Gaza, uh, the IDF uh, and the Israeli authorities have previously indicated areas which they've designated as safe zones. We should say that when we speak to Palestinians, they find that they are not safe. The other is main issue, and a lot of uh, international organizations, the United Nations that works in Gaza, also say that it's just not feasible for people to be there for any length of time. You've, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people in places where there is no sanitation, there's no real access to food or water, hundreds and hundreds of people all sharing one toilet. You have a lot of children there. Half of the population of Gaza uh, is under 18. And so moving this number of people into anywhere which is safe, quote unquote safe, looks like a massive challenge. And on that issue of being moved out of Gaza, well, that, as you know, Terry, is very, very controversial. The idea that these people in Gaza would be moved moved out of uh, the Strip uh, in a conflict which is all about competing claims to land. Every time we speak to Palestinians, they say they absolutely will not move. They will go back to their homes, even if they're destroyed. They will. I spoke to one man, I, I remember a few weeks ago, and he said, if I, if I get the chance to go home, I will. Even if my home is destroyed, I will pitch a tent because I'm not going anywhere. So that is the kind of sense of feeling among Palestinians inside Gaza. Uh, but this kind of logistics of, of moving this population around and then trying to defeat, quote unquote, Hamas at the same time looks incredibly complicated. This, this will take weeks. Uh, and one imagines that this, uh, this uh, negotiation for an end to the fighting, which has been going on behind the scenes, which is running in parallel, will have to be paused while this happens, because this seems to be what the Israelis want to do. They want to go after Hamas in southern Gaza. And so any negotiation with Hamas looks like it's going to have to take a back seat. That will come uh, as a huge, uh, huge shock and sadness to the families of the hostages who've been pushing very, very hard for a negotiation. We know that there are still uh, 100 hostages inside Gaza, and uh, as many as 30 of them, uh, the IDF have said, have died in captivity. Terry? Uh, just, uh, just a nightmare. Just a, just a nightmare that, that you described for us. James Longman, thank you very much for your coverage throughout. Appreciate it. Well, new this hour, a manhunt is underway for a Tennessee man accused of killing a sheriff's deputy and injuring another during a traffic stop. Police say 42-year-old Kenneth Wayne DeHart is wanted for multiple charges, including first-degree murder. ABC News correspondent Victor Akendo is following the story. Victor, what do we know uh, about the moment that led up to this shooting, and where does the search stand now? Terry, a statewide alert has been issued for this suspect, the Blount County Sheriff in Tennessee, saying that, yes, this all started with a traffic stop. According to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, the suspect here, 42-year-old Kenneth DeHart, did not cooperate with these two deputies that he refused to get out of his car. Those deputies then used a stun gun, but apparently it had no effect, and that's when DeHart was able to pull a gun, fire, hitting both of these deputies, uh, and then he fled from his scene in his car. The initial reports say that car was an SUV, a silver Lexus. The suspect is now wanted for first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, and being a felon in possession of a firearm. He was last seen in the Wildwood area of East Tennessee, so residents there really need to be on alert as he is considered armed and dangerous. Terry? Yeah. Uh, and, Victor, what, what do we know about the sheriff's deputy who was killed? Uh, and what about the other deputy injured? What's the news there? So the deputy who was killed, 43-year-old Greg McCowan, in a Facebook post from the Blunt County Sheriff's Office, they said that he joined the department in 2020. They called him a hero in both life and death and that everyone there is heartbroken at his senseless death. The second officer, Deputy Shelby Eggers, she was injured after returning fire, she was taken to the hospital. Thankfully, Terry, she was treated and has since been released. All right, some good news there. Victor Okendo on that manhunt. Thanks very much. Uh, well, new this hour, uh, there is another manhunt underway for a gunman who shot a tourist and fired at an officer inside a store in Times Square. Police say the suspects entered the store and started stealing clothing and possibly sneakers. That's when a loss prevention officer confronted them. And police say one of the suspects opened fire, missing that officer and hitting an innocent bystander. Here's ABC News and senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky. Terry, this all unfolded Thursday evening in Times Square, and police are now hunting for a teen that they say was responsible for opening fire inside that sporting goods store 
aiming, they said, at a security guard who had snatched away stolen items from him and two others, but striking a woman from Brazil who was visiting New York. She was struck in the leg, taken to the hospital. She's going to be okay. But now there's a manhunt underway because the teen and the others fled the store on foot when police gave chase. Police said that the teen turned, fired his gun toward the officers, and then ditched his jacket and ducked into the subway to make his escape. The authorities have been on edge because of uh, different crime sprees in and around migrant shelters in Times Square. This teenager is believed to be from Colombia. He may also have ties to the Bronx, where he's wanted for questioning in a different unsolved robbery. Uh, so police now know who they're looking for, uh, but they are urgently trying to find him. Terry? All right, Aaron Katursky on that manhunt. Thanks very much. Well, coming up, the federal government cracking down on robocalls that use AI-generated voices. What the FCC is now saying about those calls when we return. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Well, the federal government has cracked down on robocalls that use fake voices generated by artificial intelligence. The FCC now says those scam calls are illegal. The agency says the AI voices often mimic voices of celebrities, political candidates, or even close family members. Our reporter, Emmanuel Saliba, has been following this story. She's here to break it down for us. Emmanuel, how have bad actors, and there are plenty of them out there, used artificial intelligence-generated voices to make these scam calls? How's it work? Well, Terry, first of all, I haven't met a single person that hasn't received a robocall at least once in their life. But here's what's been changing. With artificial intelligence, with these new tools, it's now easier than ever to mimic the voices of celebrities, of presidents, of your own family members to make them say things they've never said before. And they can encourage you to, for example, not vote in an election or to buy a product. Um, there's a recent example of New Hampshire residents receiving calls in January encouraging them not to vote. And if you were on the other, other side of that call, you might have thought it was President Biden telling you that. But in fact, it was an AI-generated voice uh, mimicking President Biden. Wow. I mean, then that, that can have real impact. I guess we all better buckle up, given the presidential election is accelerating through the year. Manuel, the FCC has now said those calls are illegal. How are they going to enforce that? 
So this is going to give them the ability to find the bad actors behind these AI voice robocalls. They can go after the companies who are using them. And it's also going to give individual states more power to crack down on these AI voice spam calls. All right, and this is all part of a broader effort to stop bad actors using artificial intelligence. You know, when I think about that, you know, good luck with that. Look how bad actors have used every other aspect of uh, modern technology to do bad stuff. But, but what other efforts are they making? Because AI is so powerful. Well, Terry, there's actually some encouraging news. There's forward momentum. So states, individual states, are taking their own, are passing their own legislation to ban a deepfakes, de uh, deceptive deepfakes, meaning videos, audio, and images, not just audio. Um, there's a big question mark as to whether or not we're going to see a, a federal legislation passed. But there's also tech. Um, there's a tech and, um, and software companies coming together to work on a new digital standard that will help people like us, like anyone using the internet, to figure out whether something was made using a human or, um, or a machine. So imagine you're on the internet, you come across an image. Well, if this new digital standard is used across platforms, we would be able to click on a little icon and it would give us all of the information on how that image was created, from whether it was using an, an AI-generated tool, whether we took it with our phones or with a camera, but all of that information would be transparent. And this week, Google announced that they would be joining this coalition to uh, encourage the use of this digital standard. OpenAI announced that any image that is created using their tools would have this metadata embedded onto their products. So, you know, there's some real encouraging momentum happening that uh, hopefully will keep moving along before the elections roll around. Absolutely, that sounds smart, that, that you'd be empowered yourself as a user. You wouldn't have to wait for some regulator or some somebody at a tech company to get on top of it. You could just see, okay, that doesn't look right to me, and it's not, maybe. Uh, yeah. All right, a little hope there, a little hope there. Emmanuel Saliba, <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you, Terry. Well, when we return, the biggest party in football is underway in Vegas, baby. A huge weekend for sports, and our Melissa Adan is live in Sin City. Well, there's a lot of excitement out there. We're here. Here in Las Vegas, we are out here at the Super Bowl experience, and there's a lot of activities fans can try, and we're going to check one out and show you how it is right after the break. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for best news program in all of television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift, you're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy, you should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you Usher now. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from the auto workers picket lines in Michigan. I'm Faith Abube. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
We're following some breaking news right now. A large earthquake has hit Hawaii. The 6.3 magnitude quake hit the Big Island, Hawaii, roughly 21 miles south of Hilo. There are no reports of a tsunami threat at this time. And we will keep you updated on this earthquake on the Big Island in Hawaii. We are just days away now from America's biggest sporting event of the year. Thousands of football fans have descended on Las Vegas as Sin City gears up for Super Bowl Sunday. The matchup between the San Francisco 49ers and the Kansas City Chiefs. For more, let's bring in ABC's Melissa Adan in Las Vegas. Melissa, you get the best assignments, really. Vegas, known for pomp <laughs> and circumstance, known for some other stuff, too. Uh, for gambling, Look. right? But, but the Super Bowl's at it. What's the atmosphere like that? Definitely, Terry, this is such a big deal for them. The first time that they're hosting a Super Bowl, that's huge. So we're talking about what it looks like for them in the future. And, of course, what we're at is the Super Bowl experience. You think about what the NFL players get to go through, like the NFL draft. That is just quintessential for any of these players. So what's so cool is, yes, so many of the people that come to the a game, they're going to go to the actual Super Bowl. But not everyone can afford those tickets. So lots of fans get to come to stuff like this. We're expecting about 300,000 people. And they're going to be doing this. They're going to be able to come right here, go up these stairs, and take a moment to pretend that they are here and hoping to be part of this NFL draft experience. And so what's super cool is that I want to show you, actually, you can come up, essentially grab one of your cards, grab one of those opportunities, and see what you are, what team you're going to make it. And mine, Terry, actually says Melissa Adon. Chiefs. There you go. There you go. Number one on the Chiefs. There you go. My wife will be happy. She's a yes. big Chiefs fan. And I'm really glad they you got this assignment. They said that it was because <laughs> they said it was because of my bench press record. I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, yeah. I saw the bench press. I'm not buying it. But but the, the, I'm glad you got this assignment because you have so much fun doing it. But let's talk football, right? This Super Bowl, a tale of two quarterbacks. Future Hall of Famer Patrick Mahomes, people already saying he, he may be the GOAT. And he's facing Brock Purdy, the, the Mr. Irrelevant, because he was the last pick of the NFL draft. What do you think fans make of this matchup? I mean, it's so incredible. Purdy has such an amazing story. And that's something that when you talk about an underdog and, you know, up and coming, that is just so cool because, gosh, everyone who doesn't love an underdog, I get that. So, but of course, Mahomes, what he's trying to do, winning back-to-back -back Super Bowls, we haven't seen that for 19 years since the Patriots last did it. So, hello. It's also pretty cool to see a record like that get that opportunity. So, I think that we have two really stellar quarterbacks here. Absolutely. It'd be fun to watch. And let's let's be honest, there are a lot of people in my household and others who want to know if Taylor Swift is going to be able to make it to Allegiant Stadium in time for the game. And her boyfriend there, Travis Kelsey, what do you think? <laughs> I appreciate all the reporting done on this. I was really into this about Taylor Swift because we all know all too well that our girl Taylor is in Tokyo, right? So she's going to do that concert and she is committed there to head back here to Vegas to see her lover, Travis Kelsey. And the U.S. Embassy in Japan says they're committed to making sure she makes it here on time. The time travel will make a difference, basically. The time distance uh, is going to help in her favor and she'll likely be here wearing her color. Red. There you go. Terry. There you go. Melissa down in Las Vegas, have a great weekend. Not too great, but have a great weekend. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. And go Chiefs on behalf of on behalf of my wife. I'm a Bears fan, so we're just watching again. Thank you for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. The news never stops, and neither do we. We're gonna be right back. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. 
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're gonna be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Oh, my God, look. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Oh, my God! I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Right now on ABC News Live, President Biden defiant after a report from the special counsel questioned his memory and his mental faculties. Biden told reporters he's the most qualified person in this country to be president. But do voters agree? Plus, another escalation. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has ordered the Israeli military to prepare for an evacuation of the entire town of Rafah inside Gaza, home to more than a million Palestinians. We've got the latest from Tel Aviv. And get ready for the big game. We've got a supersized Super Bowl preview from Las Vegas. That's coming up. Well, good afternoon. I'm Terry Moran. And our top story this hour, President Biden is firing back at the special counsel's office after a report into his handling of classified documents cast doubt on his mental acuity and memory. Although special counsel Robert Hur's report clears Biden of criminal wrongdoing, it described the president as, quote, an elderly man with a poor memory. Uh, this report even suggested that President Biden could not recall when his son Beau actually died. The president angrily defended himself at the White House last night. I know there's some attention paid to some language in the report about my recollection of events. There's even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. And we heard from the White House Counsel's Office a short time ago as they tried to shut down criticism and insisted that Biden has no issues with his memory. We now, Selena, you were in the room as the White House Counsel spoke following the report. What stood out to you? Yeah, Terry, I mean, look, this is a White House that is clearly in damage control mode. And Ian Sams, he was defiant. He pushed back on the way the president was characterized. He called the special counsel's descriptions of the president as gratuitous, inappropriate. He called it an excessive investigation. And he really wanted to hit home on how this was all an accident and that as soon as the president found out that there was classified information, he himself decided to immediately get that returned. And he really tried to draw the contrast between how President Biden allegedly handled these classified documents and how former President Trump had allegedly handled these documents. Now, he mentioned a few times about how this, the interviews he had with, with the special counsel, how they were hours of interviews and they happened shortly after the October 7th Hamas attacks on Israel. And he said how clearly the president was focused on big international issues. So I followed up with Ian Sam saying, is that, are you basically saying that the president was distracted and he did have memory lapses because he was focused on this international response? And he said, look, it is common in interviews like this with prosecutors to have issues like this. And he tried to basically just brush it off. And later with Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre, I was asking about the several gaffes that the president has made recently, including mixing up last night the president of Egypt with the president of Mexico. And her response was, the president has been making gaffes for decades, his entire career. It's nothing more than that. Clearly, this White House in damage control and trying to defend the president, his mental acuity and his handling of those documents, Terry.
All right, that was a great summary. Thank you for that. And you're fighting your colleague who's about four feet next to you and yelling. Uh, but, uh, but we got it loud and clear from you, and I appreciate that. And I want to ask you about Vice President Kamala Harris. I, I know that, uh, that you've asked her a question as well. How is she responding? Yeah, Terry. Well, Kamala Harris, the vice president, she was extremely forceful. She was painting this document as essentially sort of like a partisan memo, saying it was politically motivated. So take a listen to this exchange I had with her. What I saw of that report last night, I believe is, as a former prosecutor, um, the comments that were made by that prosecutor, gratuitous, inaccurate and inappropriate. So the way that the president's demeanor in that report was characterized could not be more wrong on the facts and clearly politically motivated, gratuitous. And the vice president also spent a fair amount of her answer talking about how the president led and coordinated the response to the October 7th attack, saying that he was in front of it all, speaking with world leaders, speaking with all of the leaders here in the United States to coordinate all of that, trying to defend his mental acuity. Now, the legal issue here may be cleared and over. But as you mentioned, Terry, politically, this still could be damaging for some time. And the last thing that this White House wants to be dealing with at this moment, that the campaign wants to be dealing with at this moment, is to have questions about President President Biden's age and mental fitness once again at the center of the conversation here. Well, it seems to me, Selena, they better get used to it since it is clearly a, a priority for voters to think through that, reach their own decisions. Selena Wang at the White House. Thanks very much. The Israeli army is now preparing to evacuate the city of Rafah in Gaza ahead of an expected Israeli invasion there. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu gave his military orders to prepare to evacuate a place where an estimated 1.2 million Palestinians live. More, that's more than half of Gaza's population, many of them refugees from elsewhere in Gaza, crammed now into one spot. Rafah, of course, is where the Israeli Defense Forces told Gazans to go for safety. Uh, while they made war in other parts of uh, Gaza. So let's go to ABC News foreign correspondent James Longman, who's been covering this conflict since the beginning. He's in Tel Aviv with more on this. Uh, James, Rafa's population now has grown s six times, I understand, since October the 7th. And now uh, Netanyahu talks about a massive operation underway. What, 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 what do we know at this hour? Well, Netanyahu says he's been talking about what he calls total victory, and for him, Rafa is also a target. He, there's the sense that there's more Hamas uh, operatives there. They've said that there are, the IDF have said there are four Hamas battalions in the Rafa area. And don't forget, at the beginning of all this, they did say one of their main objectives was finding Yahya Sinwar, the, the leader of Hamas, the man who planned the October 7th attack. That still hasn't materialized, so one assumes they believe him to be somewhere in that area. But you do get a sense that Israel's now running on slightly borrowed time when it comes to this military uh, operation. Uh, unprecedented uh, really from Joe Biden uh, on, in his criticism uh, of the Israeli operation since October 7th. He said it was over the top. You've had Josh Kerb Kirby at the National Security Council say uh, that, that the United States would not support a military operation in Rafah if uh, it meant that all those civilians were still there uh, and in the way of it and that it would be a disaster for them. So he's having to balance that plus criticism in this country from a lot of uh, detractors who say that he's just trying to draw out this war for as long as possible so he doesn't have to face the music because a lot of people hold him responsible for the security lapse that led to October 7th. But there is the real sense here in Israel that Hamas cannot be allowed to remain uh, as any kind of viable force inside Gaza. So that begs the question, just how can they go after them in this area where so many have gone for safety? We don't have the details on what this evacuation would look like. Palestinians uh, look at these as, uh, as forced, uh, you know, they're being forced, forcibly moved around uh, Gaza. And when they've been told previously to move, it's not been safe for them. We, we speak to Palestinians uh, on the phone uh, re relatively regularly when we can. Obviously, Israel doesn't allow us into Gaza to speak to them face to face. And they tell us that when they're asked to move, 
uh, it often they find that the bombs uh, follow them and many of the, all of the probably the families who've moved to Gaza have had to move six seven eight nine times so far so I'm sure in the next 24 48 hours we'll get more detail on just what this evacuation looks like but certainly tonight in Rafa it must be a, a very very scary time with this indication that the military operation will go to Rafa. Yeah, you know, James, that is such a startling thing to say, that families in this war, which began on October 7th, have already moved five, six, seven times. Rafa, really the last safe haven de 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 established by Israeli forces. Where are they going to go? Where are all those people going to go? Is there some plan to get them out of Gaza altogether and into the Sinai? Well, so inside Gaza, uh, the IDF uh, and the Israeli authorities have previously indicated areas which they've designated as safe zones. We should say that when we speak to Palestinians, they find that they are not safe. The other is main issue, and a lot of uh, international organizations, the United Nations that works in Gaza, also say that it's just not feasible for people to be there for any length of time. You've, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people in places where there is no sanitation, there's no real access to food or water, hundreds and hundreds of people all sharing one toilet. You have a lot of children there. Half of the population of Gaza uh, is under 18. And so moving this number of people into anywhere which is safe, quote unquote safe, looks like a massive challenge. And on that issue of being moved out of Gaza, well, that, as you know, Terry, is very, very controversial. The idea that these people in Gaza would be moved moved out of uh, the Strip uh, in a conflict which is all about competing claims to land. Every time we speak to Palestinians, they say they absolutely will not move. They will go back to their homes, even if they're destroyed. They will. I spoke to one man, uh, I, I remember a few weeks ago, and he said, if I, if I get the chance to go home, I will. Even if my home is destroyed, I will pitch a tent because I'm not going anywhere. So that is the kind of sense of feeling among Palestinians inside Gaza. Uh, but this kind of logistics of, of moving this population around and then trying to defeat, quote unquote, Hamas at the same time looks incredibly complicated. This, this will take weeks. Uh, and one imagines that this, uh, this uh, negotiation for an end to the fighting, which has been going on behind the scenes, which is running in parallel, will have to be paused while this happens, because this seems to be what the Israelis want to do. They want to go after Hamas in southern Gaza. And so any negotiation with Hamas looks like it's going to have to take a back seat. That will come uh, as a huge, uh, huge shock and sadness to the families of the hostages who've been pushing very, very hard for a negotiation. We know that there are still uh, 100 hostages inside Gaza, and uh, as many as 30 of them, uh, the IDF have said, have died in captivity. Terry? Uh, just, just a nightmare. Just a, just a nightmare that, that you described for us, James Longman. Thank you very much for your coverage throughout. Appreciate it. Well, new this hour, a manhunt is underway for a Tennessee man accused of killing a sheriff's deputy and injuring another during a traffic stop. Police say 42-year-old Kenneth Wayne DeHart is wanted for multiple charges, including first-degree murder. ABC News correspondent Victor Akendo is following the story. Victor, what do we know uh, about the moment that led up to this shooting and where's the search stand now? Terry, a statewide alert has been issued for this suspect, the Blount County Sheriff in Tennessee, saying that, yes, this all started with a traffic stop. According to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, the suspect here, 42-year-old Kenneth DeHart, did not cooperate with these two deputies that he refused to get out of his car. Those deputies then used a stun gun, but apparently it had no effect, and that's when DeHart was able to pull a gun, fire, hitting both of these deputies, uh, and then he fled from his scene in his car. The initial reports say that car was an SUV, a silver Lexus. The suspect is now wanted for first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, and being a felon in possession of a firearm. He was last seen in the Wildwood area of East Tennessee, so residents there really need to be on alert as he is considered armed and dangerous. Terry? Yeah. Uh, and Victor, what, what do we know about the sheriff's deputy who was killed? Uh, and what about the other deputy injured? What's the news there? So the deputy who was killed, 43-year-old Greg McCowan, in a Facebook post from the Blunt County Sheriff's Office, they said that he joined the department in 2020. They called him a hero in both life and death and that everyone there is heartbroken at his senseless death. The second officer, Deputy Shelby Eggers, she was injured after returning fire, she was taken to the hospital. Thankfully, Terry, she was treated and has since been released. All right, some good news there. Victor Okendo on that manhunt. Thanks very much. Uh, there is another manhunt underway for a gunman who shot at 
tourist and fired at an officer inside a store in Times Square. Police say the suspects entered the store and started stealing clothing and possibly sneakers. That's when a loss prevention officer confronted them. And police say one of the suspects opened fire, missing that officer and hitting an innocent bystander. Here's ABC News and senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky. Terry, this all unfolded Thursday evening in Times Square, and police are now hunting for a teen that they say was responsible for opening fire inside that sporting goods store aiming, they said, at a security guard who had snatched away stolen items from him and two others, but striking a woman from Brazil who was visiting New York. She was struck in the leg, taken to the hospital. She's going to be okay. But now there's a manhunt underway because the teen and the others fled the store on foot when police gave chase. Police said that the teen turned, fired his gun toward the officers, and then ditched his jacket and ducked into the subway to make his escape. The authorities have been on edge because of uh, different crime sprees in and around migrant shelters in Times Square. This teenager is believed to be from Colombia. He may also have ties to the Bronx, where he's wanted for questioning in a different unsolved robbery. Uh, so police now know who they're looking for, uh, but they are urgently trying to find him. Terry? All right, Aaron Katursky on that manhunt. Thanks very much. Well, coming up, the federal government cracking down on robocalls that use AI-generated voices. What the FCC is now saying about those calls when we return. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Well, the federal government has cracked down on robocalls that use fake voices generated by artificial intelligence. The FCC now says those scam calls are illegal. The agency says the AI voices often mimic voices of celebrities, political candidates, or even close family members. Our reporter, Emmanuel Saliba, has been following this story. She's here to break it down for us. Emmanuel, how have bad actors, and there are plenty of them out there, used artificial intelligence-generated voices to make these scam calls? How's it work? Well, Terry, first of all, I haven't met a single person that hasn't received a robocall at least once in their life. But here's what's been changing. With artificial intelligence, with these new tools, it's now easier than ever to mimic the voices of celebrities, of presidents, of your own family members, to make them say things they've never said before. And they can encourage you to, for example, not vote in an election or to buy a product. Um, there's a recent example of New Hampshire residents receiving calls in January, encouraging them not to vote. And if you were on the other, other side of that call, you might have thought it was President Biden telling you that. But in fact, it was an AI-generated voice uh, mimicking President Biden. Wow. I mean, then that, that can have real impact. I guess we all better buckle up given the presidential election is accelerating through the year. Manuel, the FCC 
has now said those calls are illegal. How are they going to enforce that? So this is going to give them the ability to find the bad actors behind these AI voice robocalls. They can go after the companies who are using them. And it's also going to give individual states more power to crack down on these AI voice spam calls. All right, and this is all part of a broader effort to stop bad actors using artificial intelligence. You know, when I think about that, you know, good luck with that. Look how bad actors have used every other aspect of uh, modern technology to do bad stuff. But, but what other efforts are they making? It, it, because AI is so powerful. Well, Terry, there's actually some encouraging news. There's forward momentum. So states, individual states, are taking their own, are passing their own legislation to ban a deepfakes, de uh, deceptive deepfakes, meaning videos, audio, and images, not just audio. Um, there's a big question mark as to whether or not we're going to see a, a federal legislation passed. But there's also tech. Um, there's a tech and, um, and software companies coming together to work on a new digital standard that will help people like us, like anyone using the internet, to figure out whether something was made using a human or, um, or a machine. So imagine you're on the internet, you come across an image. Well, if this new digital standard is used across platforms, we would be able to click on a little icon and it would give us all of the information on how that image was created from whether it was using an, an AI-generated tool, whether we took it with our phones or with a camera, but all of that information would be transparent. And this week, Google announced that they would be joining this coalition to uh, encourage the use of this digital standard. OpenAI announced that any image that is created using their tools would have this metadata embedded onto their products. So, you know, there's some real encouraging momentum happening that uh, hopefully will keep moving along before the elections roll around. Absolutely. That sounds smart that, that you'd be empowered yourself as a user. You wouldn't have to wait for some regulator or some, somebody at a tech company to get on top of it. You could just see, okay, that doesn't look right to me, and it's not, maybe. Uh, yeah. All right, a little hope there, a little hope there. Emmanuel Saliba, <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you, Terry. Well, when we return, the biggest party in football is underway in Vegas, baby. A huge weekend for sports, and our Melissa Adan is live in Sin City. Well, there's a lot of excitement out there. We're here in Las Vegas. We are out here at the Super Bowl experience, and there's a lot of activities fans can try, and we're going to check one out and show you how it is right after the break. Oh, my. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're going to be tuning in for Usher, too. You're going to do it, do it big. Oh, my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there, too. Baby, let me I'm sure Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey, man, that's what I do. It's Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting on the flooded streets of Treasure Island, I'm Ginger Z. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
We're following some breaking news right now. A large earthquake has hit Hawaii. The 6.3 magnitude quake hit the Big Island, Hawaii, roughly 21 miles south of Hilo. There are no reports of a tsunami threat at this time. And we will keep you updated on this earthquake on the Big Island in Hawaii. We are just days away now from America's biggest sporting event of the year. Thousands of football fans have descended on Las Vegas as Sin City gears up for Super Bowl Sunday. The matchup between the San Francisco 49ers and the Kansas City Chiefs. For more, let's bring in ABC's Melissa Adan in Las Vegas. Melissa, you get the best assignments, really. Vegas, known for pomp <laughs> and circumstance, known for some other stuff, too. Uh, for gambling, Look. right? But, but the Super Bowl's at it. What's the atmosphere like that? Definitely, Terry, this is such a big deal for them. The first time that they're hosting a Super Bowl, that's huge. So we're talking about what it looks like for them in the future. And of course, what we're at is the Super Bowl experience. You think about what the NFL players get to go through, like the NFL draft. That is just quintessential for any of these players. So what's so cool is, yes, so many of the people that come to the a game, they're going to go to the actual Super Bowl, but not everyone can afford those tickets. So lots of fans get to come to stuff like this. We're expecting about 300,000 people and they're going to be doing this. They're going to be able to come right here, go up these stairs, and take a moment to pretend that they are here and hoping to be part of this NFL draft experience. And so what's super cool is that I want to show you, actually, you can come up, essentially grab one of your cards, grab one of those opportunities, and see what you are, what team you're going to make it. And mine, Terry, actually says Melissa Adon, Chiefs. There you go. There you go. Number one on the Chiefs. There you go. My wife will be happy. She's a yes. big Chiefs fan. And I'm really glad they you got this assignment. They said that it was because <laughs> they said it was because of my bench press record. I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, yeah. I saw the bench press. I'm not buying it. But but the, the, I'm glad you got this assignment because you have so much fun doing it. But let's talk football, right? This Super Bowl, a tale of two quarterbacks. Future Hall of Famer Patrick Mahomes, people already saying he, he may be the GOAT. And he's facing Brock Purdy, the, the Mr. Irrelevant, because he was the last pick of the NFL draft. What do you think fans make of this matchup? I mean, it's so incredible. Purdy has such an amazing story, and that's something that when you talk about an underdog and, you know, up and coming, that is just so cool because, gosh, everyone who doesn't love an underdog, I get that. So, but of course, Mahomes, what he's trying to do, winning back-to-back -back Super Bowls, we haven't seen that for 19 years since the Patriots last did it. So, hello. It's also pretty cool to see a record like that get that opportunity. So, I think that we have two really stellar quarterbacks here. Absolutely. It'd be fun to watch. And let's let's be honest, there are a lot of people in my household and others who want to know if Taylor Swift is going to be able to make it to Allegiant Stadium in time for the game. And her boyfriend there, Travis Kelsey. What do you think? <laughs> I appreciate all the reporting done on this. I was really into this about Taylor Swift because we all know all too well that our girl Taylor is in Tokyo, right? So she's going to do that concert and she is committed there to head back here to Vegas to see her lover, Travis Kelsey. And the U.S. Embassy in Japan says they're committed to making sure she makes it here on time. The time travel will make a difference, basically. The time distance uh, is going to help in her favor and she'll likely be here wearing her color. Red. There you go. Terry. There you go. Melissa down in Las Vegas, have a great weekend. Not too great, but have a great weekend. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. And go Chiefs on behalf of on behalf of my wife. I'm a Bears fan, so we're just watching again. Thank you for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. The news never stops, and neither do we. We're gonna be right back. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. You're
how? Your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Oh my. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift, you're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you Usher down. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Buckingham Palace in London, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hello, I'm Terry Moran, and here are some of the top headlines we're watching at ABC News Live at this hour. We've got some breaking news. A large earthquake has struck Hawaii. The 5.7 earthquake struck the Big Island, Hawaii, roughly 21 miles south of Hilo. There is no tsunami threat at this time. Some shaking could be felt in Honolulu on the island of Oahu, which is about 200 miles to the north. So for more, let's bring in our ABC News affiliate reporter, KTV, KITV reporter, Jeremy Lee. Jeremy. You were there uh, during the earthquake, of course. You're on that island. What was it like? What can you tell us about damage? Sustained. You know, sometimes we get these kind of uh, earthquakes that last three seconds, four seconds, even north of Hilo, where I live, and I felt it. But this one just kept going. Nine seconds, ten seconds. You start wondering, should I even be indoors? I'm currently driving on Hawaii Island down towards South Point. Of course, uh, Kilauea, the volcano, is uh, to the south of Hilo, but even further beyond that is Na'aleu, where it, the town nearest the epicenter. So we're going to try to, it's a remote town, we're going to try to find out who's there and uh, how, how they felt it there at the epicenter. All right, so this is a, uh, not a common occurrence, I, I gather, and then there's always a concern, obviously, about an earthquake, uh, you know, in, in that, in the ocean, about a tsunami. What can you tell us about that? Well, the USGS, they've uh, put out an advisory that there is no tsunami uh, advisory at this point, that that is not uh, a concern right now. As far as the damage itself, again, because this one lasted so long, we're interested to find out what it was like near the epicenter south of Kilauea Volcano. Now, uh, earthquakes are very common. In Pahala, a town near the epicenter, they have hundreds of them actually in a week because you have magma under the surface that is moving. But one that was this big and that lasted as long as this one is a rare occurrence. Certainly, I haven't felt anything like it uh, since I've been here. All right. Well, great reporting for us, Jeremy Lee. In Hilo, Hawaii, stay safe, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for that report. Thank you. Well, police say a 15-year-old has been captured by U.S. Marshals after a massive manhunt was carried out, searching for the gunman who shot a tourist and fired at an officer inside a store in Times Square, New York. Police say the suspects entered the store and started stealing clothing and possibly sneakers, and that's when a loss prevention officer confronted them, and police say one of the suspects opened fire, missing that officer, hitting an innocent bystander. The 15-year-old was living in a migrant shelter, carried a 45 caliber handgun that he fired a total of three times. Well, thank you for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on various streaming services, on the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com as well. The news never stops, and GMA3 starts right now. What you need to know right now on GMA3. These assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. President Biden punches back with fiery words for the special counsel who cleared him of criminal charges and the classified documents investigation, but cast doubt on Biden's mental sharpness. 
Plus, concerns rising about the role of artificial intelligence in images on the Internet and beyond. A new measure in California tackles this issue. We'll hear from the state senator behind it. Make me want to say, oh, 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 my God. And how would you like to find out today that you're going to the big game? Our Will Reeve is in Vegas with a surprise for one community hero who's a huge 49ers fan. Also, the sweet sound of success, helping students from financially challenged families get early college acceptance off into elite schools. Our Steve Osinsami with a deep dive on the Charter School Network charting new territory. And if you or someone you love is asking, why can't I get it together? Our Faith Friday conversation today may offer some comfort and answers. And she's crushing it from Vanderpump Rules to Dancing with the Stars to starring on the stage in Chicago. Actress Ariana Maddox joins us in our Broadway Spotlight. Now from Times Square, DeMarco Morgan and Eva Pilgrim with Dr. Jen Ashton and What You Need to Know. If you don't know it now, now you know. We made it to Friday, and that is something to dance about, right? Yes. <laughs> my, yeah, my chair also does a little dance. <laughs> Look at this. Just, just moving and grooving. Yes. And it's also Super Bowl weekend. There's a lot going on this yeah. weekend. You guys got any plans? A little bit. <laughs> yes, I will be watching the big game, of course. Okay, yeah. yes. We'll all be uh -huh, watching. Uh -huh. And speaking of watching the game, it is Heart Month. February yep. is Heart Month. And there's some concern for all of us who will be watching the game not to get too excited because it can also cause a heart attack. Yeah, and recent studies support that. And I think what's really important here, all kidding aside, you know, I see life through the medical lens of a doctor. And this weekend and that big game is an example of that. A recent study found that fans who were at risk of heart disease so some of them had heart disease, some of them had risk factors for heart disease, were at increased risk for cardiac events during the game with wow. watching the game, particularly, believe it or not, if they were fans of the team that was losing. Um, now, there's a clear physiology and mechanism behind that. Blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up. You, you know, you're eating foods that are high in salt, high in fat, you're eating more, drinking more alcohol mm -hmm. potentially. So I, I think it's really important to understand that spectating can be a physical stress test and, you know, just be smart. Enjoy the game, but be smart. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about it all. Yeah. But also, so that we're not like total Debbie Downers about the game. <laughs> Cheering for your team is, can be good for your heart too. Yes, and I have 15 years as a hockey mom to support that um, because it does increase oxygen, blood flow to the brain, it can release some feel good endorphins. So again, keep it light, keep it fun. But, you know, be careful. If I'm putting celery with my buffalo chicken oh, dip. Oh, good girl. <laughs> yeah, no, little things, little things. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Jen. Yeah. Let's turn now to ABC's Jay O'Brien in Washington with our latest headlines. Good afternoon, Jay. Eva, good afternoon. And we begin with the president firing back at the special counsel who cleared him. Special counsel Robert Herr saying no criminal charges are warranted, but criticizing President Biden's memory. President Biden angrily denying the report's key findings, defending his memory and his handling of classified information. The special counsel did emphasize the difference between Biden's handling of documents in this case and former President Trump saying Biden quickly returned the documents, fully cooperated and sat down for five hours for interviews, adding that Trump allegedly did the opposite. And history unfolding in the high stakes case at the Supreme Court as justices heard three hours of oral arguments over whether former President Trump should be removed from the ballot in Colorado based on the 14th Amendment. Conservative and liberal justices alike appearing to share skepticism that the former president should be taken off the ballot. Trump's own attorney calling events at the Capitol, quote, shameful and violent, but not an insurrection. A decision on the ballot question expected to come within weeks. And the CDC is investigating a widespread gastrointestinal illness, striking vacationers on board a luxury cruise ship. More than 150 passengers reporting bouts of diarrhea, vomiting on board the Queen Victoria, operated by the Cunard Line. The ship is scheduled to arrive in Honolulu on Monday. Now we turn to Ginger Z with our weekend weather whiplash. 
Wisconsin's first February tornado on record. Those records go back to 1950. That's Evansville, where you see the video of the funnel there. That did connect, looks like, because there's damage, um, and they will assess what type of tornado it was. But we've got more where that came from. It's with a different system and a really powerful jet. Flash flood threat on Saturday from Texas all the way up through Tennessee. And then on Sunday, you could see tornadoes again. Louisiana's right in the center, Mississippi, too. Prince freaking Harry. <laughs> Man, I'm, uh... I'm in shock. That's, that's Prince Harry. Uh, Look at that. And finally, a little no, royal appreciation on stage from Pittsburgh Steeler Cameron Hayward, clearly pleased to be receiving the NFL's Walter Payton Man of the Year Award from, as you heard, Prince Harry. Prince Harry making it to that stage in Las Vegas after returning from visiting his father, being by his father's side in Britain after that cancer diagnosis, guys. Wow, what a story. Mm -hmm. All right, Jay, thank you and good to see you. Still ahead on GMA3 on this Friday, regulating artificial intelligence to help protect you and your family. We'll take a look at the new measure being called the first of its kind. Plus, a big game, big surprise for a community hero. We'll be right back. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I did, I did, I did, I did, I did. Oh, my God, oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamal Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Oh, Wait, I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back to GMA3. Everyone has been talking about AI-generated content, and concerns are intensifying after sexually explicit fake images of Taylor Swift went viral on social media. And now California State Senator Josh Becker has proposed what he is calling a first-of-its-kind legislation to address the AI issue, and he's here with us now to discuss it all. Welcome, Senator. It is good to see you. Good to see you guys. All right, so let's talk about it. Transparency and accountability on social media. Explain how this bill will work. Sure. Well, no doubt there's going to be benefits from AI, but there is real serious 
dangers as well. And we're like in the petri dish experimentation uh, phase of all this. And we need transparency. That's what this bill does. Was something created by AI? You know, I have kids. I'm passionate about tackling humanity's biggest challenges. I think climate change is one of those. But I think AI raises uh, to that level. We saw what just happened. You mentioned the Taylor Swift situation. I mean, that was appalling. And did you know, DeMarco and Eva, if just a couple seconds of audio, someone can clone your voice. Mm. And if I can share a story quickly, and this happened in my area, parents got a call from their son, a traumatic, got in a car accident, they were talking to him, uh, wired money to his attorney. It was all AI, right? It was fake. And this is not science fiction. This is happening now. So AI is new, but simple disclosure is tried and true. So my bill says two things. Number one, for a large share of AI companies, they have to put identifiers on AI content, both on the content and within the content, and second, a platform that people can go to to see was something created by AI. So how do you hold these companies accountable? What are the penalties for this? Well, there's really substantial penalties, $5,000 per infraction uh, per day uh, for these companies. So it really adds up and it gives our attorney general real power. So what about transparency on a global level? Well, California, because, so this tackles, uh, it really covers every company that has more than a million users a month. So if any of those users are in California, they're covered. And sometimes California has to lead. You know, last year I passed a First in the Nation Delete Act because there's kind of a free-for-all also on our privacy, on our information uh, about data. The data brokers have thousands of pieces of information, each one of us. And this bill lets you delete your information from data brokers. So sometimes California has to lead, and then that really sets the stage for the rest of the but country. But is it just for companies that are headquartered in California? No, no, any users, users. So it, it's really a broad coverage. And this week on GMA Meta announced that it will begin labeling images its tools can identify as uh, created by artificial intelligence product. And Meta uh, gave us this that we can show you guys. Uh, they say it will look like this, uh, but the companies acknowledge the scale and complexity of AI generated content. How does this bill account for this technology that is literally changing before our eyes. You're right. So it's great that yeah, Meta came on Good Morning America and made that announcement. And part of the goal of my bill is to bring companies uh, to the table. And I've already reached out to them, had a conversation yesterday. So we'll be talking to them. But I think the time, we, we don't really have time for voluntary disclosures. We really need uh, standards. And, and that's what this bill is focusing on. But yeah, we have to keep up. I come out of technology. I worked in, in cybersecurity, so I have an advantage. But it's a bit of an arms race, and it's really about protecting our democracy and protecting, you know, consumers. Our, my team created a website, BeckerForPrivacy.com. You can go and see some of the tips that we have on there. But it's really an arms race to protect ourselves online. And it's no secret, it's a big election year. So just how concerned are you when it comes to bad actors, uh, misinformation, and also uh, AI-generated content and political ramifications? I, I'm really concerned. That's one of the main reasons that I did this bill. Our, Democracy is already kind of vulnerable, as you, as we've all seen, and uh, so the risks of disinformation are real high. And so voters need to know: was something uh, created by uh, AI or, or not? So we have to really start with that transparency. All right. Well, thank you, California State thank Senator you, Becker. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. And just ahead here on GMA3, the dream about to come true for a community hero. Yeah, you're going to love this story. Our Will Reeve has some super news for him straight from Vegas about Sunday's big game. Stay with us. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is ABC News Live.
is the crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting on Capitol Hill, I'm Devin Dwyer. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We are counting down to Sunday's big game. And today we are meeting a 49ers super fan who has made it his mission to give back to the community through mentorship. Mm -hmm. That Usher song is so appropriate. We all know why. And ABC's Will Reeve is in Vegas with this very special local hero. Will, good to see you guys. And by the way, the shoe game is on fire. Yeah, man, we got we got the Jays on. We're having a great time here. We've got a great group here. We got 49ers cheerleaders, Chiefs cheerleaders, couple mascots in the back, and I am joined by Sean Torrey and his friends and family. Sean runs a nonprofit called King of Jewels. He's very active in the community. And Sean, the floor is yours. Tell me about your nonprofit, King of so, Jewels. So, King of Jewels, I'm a, one of the co-founders. My guy, Nicholas Matthews, over there, he co-founded it with me. But he actually came up with the idea and was like, hey, Sean, let's do a conference. And so we did a conference with both of our youth population. And once we did it, they were like, man, like, when can we meet again? So we were like, oh, man, let's, let's create something. So we decided to sit down and we created a critical mentorship program that's youth-centric so focus. Eight years later, we're still here encouraging, engaging, and empowering young men to develop the leadership skills, workforce development skills, and also creating an entrepreneurship mindset to understand the why, the purpose of why we're here. That's fantastic. Encourage, engage, what's the other E? And empower. Encourage, engage, empower, and entrepreneurship. You got the four E's right there. Yes, your family and friends, we, we were talking about you behind your back. They yeah. called you a rock star, yeah. which is very clear based on the work that you're doing and, of course, uh, the swag you got going on. <laughs> um, but I do, on a serious note, want to ask, why is giving back so important to you? You know, it was very important because there was a youth group that I joined when I was 15 that really saved my life. And I had to thank my God sister for that, convincing my mom to let me join, um, called the Alpha Men Diva to Tomorrow. If it wasn't for Waila Clark, uh, Natasha Williams, Terrence Capers, Jason Beasley, I wouldn't have gone to high school. If it wasn't for Dr. Reginald Chen Stewart, I wouldn't have became a doctorate student. If it wasn't for Lawrence Weekly, Bombay, Alex Bernal, and Melvin Ennis, Beetle, I wouldn't become the professional I am today. And if it wasn't for my big bro, Joshua Gillikay, the one who really showed me what it means to be a father and a man, I wouldn't be here. So that's why it's important to me because they told me once, once it's your time, get back. Yeah. And uh, when I prayed about this long ago, I realized that this is not my journey. This is what God wanted me to do. So it's God's, it's God's resume opposed to mine. Yeah. You know, it's got and a merit that I'm just in it. All those people you mentioned just helping you out, and that yeah. is what you're doing to a new generation. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. Let's talk a little football since we're here. It is a Super yes. Bowl. You're a Vegas guy, right? I'm, I'm born and raised in Vegas, but uh, I'm a 49ers fan. So you're a Niners fan. I'm fine, I'm fine. All right, so quickly, uh, prediction, who's going to win? Listen, we're going to make this happen. It's the 49ers. Uh, we're going to make this happen. It's going to be a close game because um, Patrick Mahomes no joke. Okay. I respect him and Kelsey, but I feel like because I paid attention closer to the end of the season, 49ers are going to end up on top, but it's going to be a close game. Are you going to the game? No. I don't, I'm going to be at home. Uh, I have. Uh, I didn't have any plans to go on them. them to That's what you think. I got a surprise for you, my friend. Wait a minute. Thanks to the NFL and the Las Vegas Super Bowl host committee, we thought you should go to the game. Wow. These are tickets. These are not. Let's give a big round of applause. I'm going to pass these out. You hold one of those. You pass one down there. Can you hold one? And then you hold this one. Okay. So just to, guys, we need a big cheer. Sean and three of his friends and family are going wow. to the Super Bowl. Wow. Thanks to our friends wow. at wow. the NFL, okay. the host committee here, the Super Bowl ticket giveaway program. So again, you're going to the Super Bowl to see your Niners in yeah. your home city. Yes, What's going through your mind right now? 
Um, never thought I'd be able to go to the Super Bowl. Never been to the Super Bowl. And honestly, this is going to be my first time going to the Raiders Stadium and watch the NFL game. So I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, this could be a big one, so, yeah, man. Your first time at Allegiant Stadium yes. with your team, the Niners, there with a yes, chance yes. to make history. You're going to be there because you are making history in your own community every day. Yes, so we thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Enjoy the game. Thank you. And everyone enjoys Sean Torrey. This guy is one of the good ones. And he's got the sick kicks to mark on you. <laughs> I love it. And yes. well deserved. Yes. Bravo from New yes. York, man. So awesome there. Congratulations. Gotta love it. Yeah, I loved all of the people's names that he shouted mm -hmm. out, called yeah. them out. Never forget, mm -hmm. never forget. Well, up next here on GMA3, is your air fryer affecting the nutritional value of your vegetables? Mm. What? <laughs> Dr. Chen takes a look. Plus, she's got a growing army of fans. Vanderpump Rules star Ariana Maddox now making her mark on Broadway. When we come back, stay with us. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Give it to me. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, we're back now with Dr. Jan talking about a new study that's taking a look at the use of some erectile dysfunction medications associated with a lower risk of Alzheimer's. Yeah, Tell us about this it. is really important medical uh, research and topic for everyone listening to know about. So first of all, erectile dysfunction for men is considered to be a potential warning sign for heart disease, for vascular disease, because it is a blood flow issue. Obviously, you can't turn on television without seeing commercials for all of these erectile dysfunction drugs that are commonly used. This study uh, done in Europe looked at men starting around the age of 40, followed them for an average of five years. They had a diagnosis of erectile dysfunction. Half of them were prescribed a medication to treat that, and uh, the other part were not. And they saw a slightly higher risk in the development of Alzheimer's disease among the men who were not prescribed an erectile dysfunction drug called the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor. That works by increasing blood flow. That's mm. how these drugs are so effective. So remember, blood flow to the brain is a potential, potential uh, risk factor for the development of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. So this study, based on observation, not cause and effect, but this is a big area of research. And if you're hearing about this study, remember, 40% of men at the age of 40 have erectile dysfunction, 50% at the age of 50, 60% by the age of 60. Get this checked out and talk to your doctor, not just about getting a prescription, but about what else could be going on that could be causing it. Mm. What does this tell us about Alzheimer's? Well, th that it's not just one thing. Blood flow is a possibility, and there are other factors um, involved in terms of lifestyle and genetics. But again, common, common, this, this got my attention. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. You bet. We're back in a moment. Something for you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, my. Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift. You're going to be tuning in for Usher, too. You're going to do it, do it big. Oh, they say uh, Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy. You should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you. Usher, Raymond.
Freeman is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families trunk. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Hello, I'm Terry Moran, and here are some of the top headlines we're watching at ABC News Live at this hour. A spectacular scene on a major Florida highway just moments ago. Florida Highway Patrol says in a statement that a small plane landed on I-75 near Naples, Florida, on the west coast of that state, and this afternoon collided with a vehicle. The aircraft burst into flames right before the crash. The plane declared an emergency landing after losing both engines. No reports of casualties yet, but we will bring you any updates on that story. Well, the White House is firing back at the special counsel's office after a report into President Biden's handling of classified documents cast doubt on his mental acuity and memory. Although special counsel Robert Herr's report clears Biden of any criminal wrongdoing in the case, it did describe the president as, quote, an elderly man with a poor memory. The report even suggested that President Biden could not recall when his son Bo actually died. Vice President Kamala Harris slammed the characterizations as, quote, gratuitous, inaccurate, and inappropriate. What I saw of that report last night, I believe is, as a former prosecutor, um, the comments that were made by that prosecutor, gratuitous, inaccurate, and inappropriate. So the way that the president's demeanor in that report was characterized could not be more wrong on the facts and clearly politically motivated, gratuitous. Well, this comes as a new NBC poll finds a growing pattern in voters who say they have either major or moderate concerns that President Biden does not have the necessary mental or physical health to be president for a second term. And history for the stock market, the S&P 500 closed above 5,000 for the first time ever after moving higher 14 of the last 15 weeks. That's the first time that's happened since 1972. And it's not just the S&P, the Dow moved lower today, but remains near record levels. And he's coming back. The Los Angeles Dodgers announced today that they have re-signed Dodger great and future Hall of Famer left-handed pitcher Clayton Kershaw to a one-year deal and his 17th season. It ensures that one of the greatest players in Dodgers history will remain with the only organization he's ever pitched for. The three-time Cy Young winner, award winner, World Series champion, and former MVP is recovering from off-season shoulder surgery. He's expected to return to the mound 
in late July. That's actually great news for baseball fans. Well, thank you for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. ABC News here Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. More GMA right now. GMA3, what you need to know, the Sisters of Charity of Leavenworth, Kansas, are showing a little love for their Chiefs in a sitcom spoof as game day approaches. No doubt enlisting a little help from above as they wave their pom-poms. It is not the first time, by the way, the Good Sisters team spirit has gone viral, and I'm sure it won't be the last. They should be in a commercial. They should is this be their way of saying God is behind the Chiefs? I, I think so. I'm, I just, think I'm so. asking questions. I'm not making statements. I'm not making statements. Just a worry. question. There might be a higher power. <laughs> Dr. Jen Ashton's here answering one of your medical questions. Here it is. This bothers me a little bit. How can using an air fryer impact the nutritional value of vegetables? That comes from Teresa oh. S. Are you pro air fryer, fryer or? You're not, not a fan. Fryer. No, I love the air oh. fryer. No, I think that's good. I mean, listen, we have one. My daughter uses it all the time. It's less oil, right? That's mm -hmm. as simple, right? And it's faster. So saturated fat, that oil, the calories, it, it's going to be way less in anything you're putting in an air fryer. So you don't, you don't have to have a, an advanced degree in nutrition to know that it's probably healthier than deep frying just based on those numbers. Mm -hmm. um, anytime you cook food, however, so it's kind of a, a hidden question in a question there. Anytime you cook food, you do alter the nutritional the value. Energy, yeah. That's why there are a lot of people who really believe in the benefits of eating raw vegetables. Um, or other kinds of raw food, I'm not one of them. So if you're gonna cook your food and you're gonna fry it, air fryer is definitely a healthier way to go. All right, your prescription for wellness. Okay, on the food topic, mm -hmm. how not to overeat too much, uh, particularly as we're going in to this weekend of uh, fun fandom. Uh, number one, you wanna wait three to four hours before bed. That's gonna help you with your sleep. Try a light physical activity after eating and a little bit before going to sleep. Light activity, staying well hydrated with water and avoiding carbonated beverages, caffeine or alcohol. Um, and then this is a good one and there's physiology and anatomy behind it. Sleep slightly with your head on a couple of pillows or with your left side down. That can help kind of your digestion. Mm. Oh, yeah. Didn't you know, know that. Helps with digestion and can help you with sleep caused by digestive issues. All right, we're listening to you. And there folks, you we're listening to you as well. So hit us up on Instagram with all of your medical questions for Dr. Jan at ABC GMA3. And kids and parents around the country live for these words from top colleges. You've been accepted. Now there are new efforts to make that moment available to many more deserving students and their families and bringing hope to tough challenges in a new way. Our Faith Friday conversation. Stay with us. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations of people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I did, I did, I did, I did. Oh, my God. Oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Yeah. Yeah. I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. 
Get Ready America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Welcome back to GMA3. You've seen those videos where students scream mm -hmm. for joy when they're accepted to college. But getting to that moment can be challenging, especially for those in underserved communities. Yeah, big challenge there. But the Charter School Network, Uncommon Schools, decided there is a better way to ensure that all their students have the opportunity to read those powerful words, you have been accepted. ABC's senior national correspondent, Steve Osinsami, has the story. Three, two, one. Yeah! <laughs> it just never gets old. This is a big moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the sound of hard work paying off, the joy of knowing you raised them well. And the pride in reading those words, you have been accepted early. Congratulations, we're delighted to offer you admission to the University of Miami for fall 2024 semesters. At North Star Academy, Lincoln Park High School in Newark, New Jersey, this charter school does all it can to get students to apply for early college decisions, to improve their chances of getting admitted into elite schools. It's a way of getting in that experts say students from wealthier families have been able to take advantage of for decades. So at the most elite universities, at the Ivies, at UChicago, at Stanford, their acceptance rate in regular decision is sometimes around 3%. And their acceptance rate in early decision is oftentimes four or five times that. The chances are just better. So this school year, more than two thirds of the top students here applied early. And 78% of them were accepted as early as December at some okay. of the best schools in the land. <sighs> okay, right, right, view update. Oh my God! <laughs> Therno Jallo started classes here in the fifth grade. Early decision for me has basically helped me get it out the way. He's now on a full academic scholarship to study computer science at Vanderbilt in the fall. Because I know where I've come from, you know, and I want to be able to use this to push me so one day I can help my parents like the way they helped me. Yeah. Early acceptance is like really important because not only do you get your decision, it gives you a higher chance at getting scholarships. It's, it's just a win-win overall. This is one of a network of 53 public charter schools, uncommon schools they're called, where homerooms are named after colleges that have graduated former students. Having colleges surround us since kindergarten has been a huge support for me, even though it's just like a name on a classroom. You go downstairs, there's an Emory University, a Columbia University, a Howard University. Homeroom. Yeah, the homerooms. The teachers and counselors help them edit college essays and work with families on the dizzying forms for financial aid. Yale University! And they celebrate in front of the whole school when students get accepted to college. And we are proud to announce that we both got into Lehigh University with full-ride scholarships! Who's, who's all the first in their family to go to college? Affording college was a big stress for you. Yeah, I just don't want to put so much of a weight on my family because mm. we, to be honest, we've had a lot of financial struggles in the past. 
On her joyful day, Natalie Espinal Reyes and her family also learned that they will stress a little less. I got a scholarship, I got a scholarship. <laughs> She'll study biology and theater at Brandeis University, where she promises to live up to their dreams. Mm. Love that so mm. much. Mm. Our thanks to ABC's Steve Osinsami. And we're told this particular school has gotten over three million in grants and scholarships. Way to go. And it's always important to know that there is help out there mm -hmm. for everybody. All right, coming up, we're going to meet the podcaster and author helping people find the joy in life. It is Faith Friday, everybody. And success from the small screen to the big Broadway stage. Ariana Maddox is in our spotlight when we come back. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Oh my! Y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift, you're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy, you should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you. Usher! Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey, man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. 911, what's your emergency? Get him out now! It takes a special someone to want to live this life. Suit up, we're heading inside. Send out an you. We're in the business of saving lives. We got a pulse! 911. No matter how dark it gets, we are here together. 911, coming March 14th to ABC. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, welcome back, everybody. It is Faith Friday here, and our next guest is a podcaster, author, and speaker sharing stories of faith during life's big moments and everything in between. In her new book, why can't I get it together? She explores ways to help readers understand why we keep facing moral conflicts mm -hmm. and how to find greater joy. Please welcome Jamie Ivey. So glad to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we got to talk about the title yes. of this book because it is Please. so relatable. <laughs> like, we have all been there. Why can't I get it together? Well, because we're all asking ourselves the same question. And I remember there was a specific moment where I found myself having something scheduled for work and then something special scheduled with my daughter at the same time. And I said to myself, like I say all the time, Jamie, why can you not get yourself together? Mm. And it was in that moment that I thought, if I feel this way, I know a lot of people feel this way. And so let's talk about it. I want to talk about why can't we get it together? And then how do we get it together? And so that's what led me to writing this book. And you're very vulnerable in here. Talk about one of the stories that you shared and the reaction that you've gotten from some of your readers. Yeah, vulnerability is something that I think is important because it shows everyone that we're all human. I think that when we aren't vulnerable with people, we kind of think we have, people start to think we have it together mm -hmm. when actually we're kind of failing on the inside. And so a lot of vulnerable stories about missing things with my daughter, about struggles that I have in my own life, struggles in my marriage, struggle in parenting. And whenever I say those struggles either 
on my podcast or in a book, I think it allows people to go, oh, we're alike. Like we have a lot of the same struggles. And if Jamie's working on it, I can as well. And so I really believe in vulnerability as a part of building community and actually walking through life together. My mom used to always say, life is part of struggles. Like, struggles is part of life. Exactly. These things right. go together. Yep, mama is right. <laughs> um, we like to ask our Faith Friday guests to give us some words of wisdom mm. as we head into the weekend. Yeah. What do you have for us? I think I want everyone to know is that they're not alone. This feeling of why can't I get it together? You both said, I feel this all the time. And I said, me too. And I think that if you realize that you're not alone and you realize that you can rest in God's truth and love and grace for you, even when there's struggles, even when life feels out of control, you actually can feel put together. Mm, you better preach, sister. I like that. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. I really appreciate it. And again, it. Thank love you. the title. Thank you so much. Right. And you can pick up a copy of Why Can't I Get It Together? Everywhere <laughs> books are sold on February 13th. All right, coming up, you know her from the TV screen and now the professional stage. Vanderpump Rules star Ariana Maddox is here killing it as Roxy in the smash hit Chicago. And she is our Broadway spotlight. Back in a bit. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Yeah. I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Me. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Watch me. Welcome back. Our next guest took lemons and made lemonade when doors started opening after, let's just call it a very public breakup mm -hmm. on the hit reality show Vanderpump Rules. She became a New York Times bestselling author, placed third on Dancing with the Stars, and she landed the lead role as Roxy Hart in the Broadway musical Chicago. Mm -hmm. Talk about superwoman. I love to say that. And she's absolutely crushing it. She marked her Broadway debut with record ticket sales for the long-running musical, all while Vanderpump Rules was hitting record-breaking numbers for its premiere. And she's here to tell us all about it. Please help us welcome Ariana Maddox to the house. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. And congratulations. Thank you. All right, Thank so let's so talk much. about it. Where were you when you got the role, when you found out you were getting the role of Roxy, and what was opening night like? Oh, my gosh. Well, when I found out I was getting the role, um, there was an initial call where there was like some interest, right? And that was when I just fully was broke down in tears crying. Couldn't even believe there was interest because this has been something I've wanted to do my whole life. Wow. And so then when I, I had to do a singing audition, I had to do a dance audition, I had to do an acting audition. And so when I found out I got it, then that's when like it really, really started to set in. And opening night was crazy. It was so much fun. I was terrified, but you know, it felt like a rock concert. Like everyone was just having a blast. It was amazing. And you mentioned this was something that you wanted to do your entire life. You studied musical theater in school. Yes. Yeah. 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 I've done 
theater all through growing up and I was a theater major in college so I have a degree in theater and it's what I initially wanted to do out of college was you know I moved here was a struggling starving artist <laughs> in New York and I actually started bartending as my survival job and bartending is obviously what led me to Vanderpump Rules which is now we're just at this huge full circle moment for me and it's just it's wild let's talk about Vanderpump Rules you had the very public breakup everyone knew about it mm -hmm. everyone was talking about it the season the new season has premiered was it hard to go back and shoot for this season? Yeah, it was very difficult. You know, it happened, the new season started filming like very, very soon after we filmed the reunion. There's not a lot of time, there's not a lot of space there, there was not a lot of life lived in between the reunion and filming this new season. So when cameras went back up, I mean, to me right now, looking at it, it feels like a time capsule. Mm -hmm. You know, it's this time capsule of this very like initial phase of me uprooting and healing and just going through like every stage of emotions. And so, you know, just like your last guest was talking about being vulnerable, um, it was difficult and I knew it was gonna be a really tough summer, but I felt like I owe it to these amazing people who watch our show and who supported me to mm. just put it out there, be raw, be vulnerable and let them see me at this phase. And hopefully one day, <laughs> gladly now, I'm in a better phase. And so, you know, you're really seeing that whole journey. Well, and I, so I'm a big fan, but also I covered the reunion for Good Morning America. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, that reunion was a lot. Yes, it was. For people who don't know. I mean, there was a lot of tension, a lot of things still going on. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with all of that? Everywhere you go, everyone knows everything. Well, they don't, actually. <laughs> there's a lot they that do. they'll never know. And there's some things that, yeah, they definitely, you know, they feel like they, they do know everything. And to be fair, they do know a lot, but there's a lot they'll never know. And I think one thing that, even with that reunion, you know, the reunion airs, I don't even remember when it aired, like in the summer sometime. Um, but it was shot three weeks, two to three weeks after everything blew up. And so things air so much longer after and you know you do get people who are saying like well why haven't you done this and that and the other thing and mm. like well it's February <laughs> this was June <laughs> <laughs> so do you think do you feel like going through something that's so common right yeah but in front of literally the it's whole so country common. helped or hurt or both mm, maybe both um, it definitely is common you know I'm not special sadly that you know I'm not the first and I certainly won't be the last um, but I think that there is a certain community or camaraderie found um, when things are public like that because you meet people who have stories that are similar and then you connect with those people and you know oftentimes someone might come to me and say I felt like I wasn't alone because of what you were talking about what you went through but you know, I feel like I'm not alone because of what they're saying. So it's really this this kind of camaraderie that comes from sharing these things, as hard as it can be. And you do realize you've helped a lot of people. I mean, you're in a happier place. So what's your best advice <laughs> to someone who's going through something right now? A breakup that's not so public. Sure. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help, whether that's friends, family, therapist, whatever it is don't think that you have to shoulder everything on your own I'm one of those people who's always like I can do it myself but it was my friends that really got me to a place where I felt like you know good things were coming and also you know just to stay true to you set boundaries that feel healthy for you and stick to them and, and don't feel bad about that and you are thriving now can yeah. we just talk about that let's <laughs> focus you. on that a little bit I mean to, to be in this place now after everything that you've been through is there some extra joy that comes with that yeah you know there is a bit of it, thing it is a little bittersweet you know because I certainly didn't want or expect things to go the way they went and you know, I think about like my dad and my grandma, like not being able to see me on this stage that, you know, they came to all the school plays and stuff. But, you know, being able to share this with my mom and my brother and just being able to know that 
when you're put through the fire, like, I think you realize sometimes that you can do hard things that you didn't think you could. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a lesson I learned because I think maybe I would have thought I could never, but I it's know like, that I can now. It's like that saying, I've seen it on, you know, social media or some card, when you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> yes, will, I love that. Come out the other side. <laughs> I love that. that. Well, we are all cheering for you. Yep. Thank yes, you so much for being thank here. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and tickets are on sale for her limited eight-week run. So if you want to see it, you have to get the tickets now, and you can tune into Vanderpump Rules Tuesday nights on Bravo. And that is what you need to know for this week. I'm Demarco Morgan. I'm Eva Pilgrim, and I'm Dr. Jen Ashton. For all of us here at GMA3 and Ariana, have a good weekend. Make it a good one. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Oh, I'm in. my God, look. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good Morning America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here. And we got you. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter. And it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from LaGuardia Airport, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Elizabeth Schulze in Washington and right now on ABC News Live, President Biden facing new questions about his mental fitness in this critical election year. The president lashing out in response to the Justice Department's special counsel report, describing his memory as hazy and faulty, how the White House is now trying to do damage control. And Israel's military is seeking to evacuate the city of Rafah in southern Gaza, where more than one million refugees have gathered to escape the fighting against Hamas. What we are learning about an expected IDF ground offensive. And back here at home, U.S. officials identifying the five fallen Marines killed in that helicopter crash in California, the latest on the investigation. But we do begin with breaking news. We are learning of an earthquake in California. Reports say it's a magnitude 4.7, about 10 kilometers northwest of Malibu. We are tracking this story and we'll report on any of those developments as we get them. At the same time now tonight, we are also learning about another powerful earthquake striking near Hawaii. The U.S. Geological Survey reporting the 5.7 magnitude quake hit just off the southern coast of the Big Island. Emergency officials say many areas have experienced strong shaking, and the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center says no tsunami is expected. We are still working to determine whether there are any reports of significant damage. Let's now bring in our world-renowned renowned seismologist, Dr. Lucy Jones. Dr. Jones, just give us your initial assessment of the potential dangers from this earthquake there in Hawaii right now. Okay, the Hawaiian earthquake is really quite deep. It's probably connected to, you know, all that lava comes out and increases the weight of the mountain, and, and actually that all sort of settles, and that looks like what that is from this earthquake. Um, I would expect a pretty 
only minor damage at best. 5.7 isn't that large, and everybody's at least uh, 20 miles away from it because it's 20 miles down. And I know we're just kind of in early reports, early reports of this 4.7 earthquake near Malibu. What can you tell us about the scale of that, given the proximity to uh, to to Malibu? Yeah. Well, luckily, a four point. It's actually down to 4.5. And in California, we build to, you know, we expect to have seven. So a four and a half shouldn't really be doing any damage. I felt it here in Pasadena. It's felt widely across the LA area. It's about halfway between Malibu and Thousand Oaks. So under the, what are called the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, there Again, there shouldn't be damage at, at, at this level because it's, uh, uh, we, we build better than that here in California. We are glad that you're okay that you felt it. And we appreciate your analysis on this right away. Dr. Jones, thank you so much. Thank you. The state of Wisconsin, meantime, saw its first tornado ever in the month of February. The tornadoes tore through the rural town of Evansville on a day that broke records for warmth. The National Weather Service confirming it was an EF2 tornado where winds usually top out at 135 miles per hour. Roofs were blown off of homes. Sheds and barns were also destroyed, but officials say that there were no reports of significant injuries. Local emergency management officials reported damages to dozens of buildings, power lines, and other structures. Here now in Washington, President Biden's age and mental acuity are under new scrutiny ahead of the 2024 presidential election. The issue was thrown into the spotlight as part of the Justice Department's special counsel's report on Biden's handling of classified documents. Special counsel Robert Hur says he will not recommend charges against President Biden. He cites Biden's inability to recall some events as one of the reasons not to pursue a case, describing Biden as an elderly man with a poor memory. The report even suggests that President Biden could not remember the date that his son, Bo died. The 81-year-old president defending himself in a fiery response, calling the report's assertions just plain wrong. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre also firing back today. As it relates to his age, as it relates to uh, what has been said uh, by, you know, by uh, in this report, it is something that we don't believe lives in reality. No one in this building would say that what we saw in this report about his memory. Let's bring in ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang and ABC News deputy political director Avery Harper. Selena, President Biden, his administration clearly in damage control mode. How is the White House trying to clean this up today? Well, Elizabeth, the White House is defiant, and the strategy they're taking is to try and discredit this report, calling it inappropriate, egregious, over-the-top, excessive, and the vice president telling me today that she believes it was politically motivated. I asked her today if what her take is as a former prosecutor herself as to whether or not this special counsel's report is fair. Take a listen to what she said. What I saw of that report last night, I believe is as a former prosecutor, um, the comments that were made by that prosecutor, gratuitous, inaccurate, and inappropriate. So the way that the president's demeanor in that report was characterized could not be more wrong on the facts. And the vice president went on to defend the president's mental acuity, talking about the countless hours of meetings he had after the Hamas attack on Israel on October 7th. And also today in the press briefing room, you had White House counsel spokesperson Ian Sams defending the president's action and taking issue with specific allegations in the special counsel's report, specifically around the allegation that he willfully retained those documents. The White House counsel spokesperson saying that it was an accident, the taking of these documents, and that as soon as the president found out, he immediately ordered that they be returned. So not only disputing the facts around mental acuity, but also the facts of the allegation. And notable trying to say that that's what his predecessors also did when it comes to classified documents. Avery, we've seen this combative response from the White House, from President Biden last night, who told reporters that he is the most qualified person in this country to be president. Do you think that this fiery reaction is doing more harm than it might be good f for the president.
he needed to come out forcefully and uh, push back on these allegations uh, in order to be able to effectively, uh, you know, talk back to how he was described in this uh, report. He couldn't be meek and also uh, push back on these allegations. Uh, you know, I I'll tell you one thing that he did that did not do him any favors was when he mixed up uh, the president of Mexico and the president of Egypt. Uh, that is only going to continue to raise questions, and we just know that he is under a lot of scrutiny anytime he's going to be in front of a camera. A lot of scrutiny and much more to come in the months ahead. Selena and Avery, thank you both so much. Moving now to the Middle East, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ordering his military to prepare for civilian evacuations in the city of Rafah ahead of an expected ground invasion there. More than half of Gaza's population, around 1.2 million Palestinians, have sought refuge in Rafah as the IDF continues its offensive across the Gaza Strip. The city is also serving as the main hub for humanitarian aid, entering into the enclave, and is home to the sole cross point between Egypt and Gaza. This all comes on the heels of Netanyahu rejecting the terms of a proposed hostage and ceasefire with Hamas earlier this week, though signaling that he is open to another round of negotiations soon. ABC News foreign correspondent James Longman is in Tel Aviv with the latest. Hi, Elizabeth. Yeah, Benjamin Netanyahu saying he wants to see the evacuation of civilians from the southern city of Rafah so that a military operation uh, can move forward in that city. But there are more than a million people living there. They've all, most of them, uh, moved there in order to escape fighting in the rest of Gaza Strip. You're talking about over a million people. Rafah City has, uh, has grown six times since uh, October 7th. So this will be a huge undertaking. And the people who are there who've tried to escape fighting elsewhere, when they speak to us, they tell us, well, we've moved six, seven, eight times, uh, maybe more, to reach Rafa. And so many times when they're told to move, it is not safe uh, in quote unquote safe zones that the IDF uh, designate. It's also just not the kind of place where a family could be for any length of time. The sanitary issues in some of these locations, hundreds of people having to share toilets. Remember, there are so many children there. Half of the population of Gaza is under 18. So this would be a massive undertaking if indeed this does happen. But the Israelis are adamant. They want to, quote unquote, defeat Hamas. There are four battalions, they say, that are in the southern area. And their main ambition at the beginning of all this was to identify Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas. That still hasn't happened. So one imagines that is part of this uh, uh, military operation. This comes on the heels of stark criticism from Joe Biden. Uh, the first time, really, he's used such harsh words since October 7th to uh, to characterize Israel's uh, military operation in Gaza, saying that it is over the top. Uh, also, you had John, Josh Kirby at the uh, uh, National Security Council saying that uh, it would be a disaster for the people of Rafah if Israel uh, started a military operation there and that the United States would not support that. So you get a sense that Israel's running on slightly borrowed time with this military operation, but uh, to move this many people is going to take a lot of time. Elizabeth? Oh. A lot of time indeed. James Longman, thank you. Joining me now is ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy. Mick, you heard James say that Rafa has been considered one of the safest places for Palestinians to seek refuge in Gaza. What do you make of this announcement from the IDF that it is considering escalating a ground invasion there? That's right, Elizabeth. This is where they were told uh, to flee when the fighting up north was happening. And although, as James mentioned, there is four battalions, believed of Hamas there, which is why this is an IDF uh, uh, military objective, there has to be a way for these civilians to get out, or we're going to see a lot of civilian casualties. 600,000 of these 1.2 million are children. And where they leave, there needs to be access to humanitarian aid. So it's a very complicated endeavor, but there needs to be time for civilians to leave. They need to be facilitated in their leaving, and they need to be able to go to a place where they can receive food and water. We've heard the rhetoric from the Biden administration just yesterday. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that any military campaign or operation that Israel undertakes needs to put civilians first. The U.S. saying it does not support this type of an invasion. Is there a break here happening with kind of this stronghold we've seen between the U.S. and Israel in this effort to defeat Hamas as this kind of continues on and escalates, Mick? Yes, I think that's a fair uh 
description of what's happening right now. Of course, the United States supports the military objective of defeating Hamas's military capability, but how they do that, I think, is becoming a problem for the White House. Uh, this type of operation is going to be very kinetic, very violent, and cause a lot of damage. If these civilians aren't allowed to leave in a corridor that they understand to go to a place where they can receive aid, there's going to be even more uh, of a human crisis going on in Gaza. And that's saying a lot because it is very desperate there. So I think the United States is really pushing for the IDF to make sure they facilitate uh, the exit of these civilians to a safe zone before they launch this operation, which could also uh, stop the flow of aid in. Because as you, as was mentioned in the report, this is where the Rafah crossing is. That's where 90 percent of the humanitarian aid comes through. And this could easily block that. And right now, there's no other real avenue of getting aid in there. Right. We've talked so much about how difficult it has been, get, been to get that aid in in the first place. Meg Morway, thank you so much, as always, for your analysis. U.S. officials identifying the five Marines who were killed in a helicopter crash in California. They are Lance Corporal Donovan Davis, Sergeant Alec Langan, Captain Benjamin Moulton, Captain Jack Casey, and Captain Miguel Nava. All were aboard the military aircraft when it crashed Tuesday night during a routine training mission flying from Nevada to an airbase near San Diego. ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez joins us now live from the Pentagon. Louis, what are you learning about these Marines and what led to this crash in the first place? Well, Elizabeth, uh, it is still unknown exactly what brought down this helicopter into that very mountainous and rugged terrain there uh, east of San Diego. It's a very treacherous uh, ter terrain, and so it's actually been very difficult to get the uh, remains out or recover any of the aircraft out right now. Uh, what we are told is that Marines actually worked uh, through the night in shifts, uh, taking care of the remains that were still there located uh, in this uh, very uh, difficult ter uh, area uh, east of San Diego. What we know about this unit is that they were conducting unit level training inside of Creech Air Force Base just outside of Neva uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, that they were on their way back to uh, their base in Miramar, uh, which is in the San Diego area. All of these Marines that were aboard this helicopter are in their 20s, very young uh, pilots, uh, very young uh, crew chiefs, um, but that doesn't mean that they're not experienced because in order to be able to fly these aircraft, they need hundreds of hours uh, and to be able to fly them, and so therefore a lot of experience there. Uh, but very young men uh, who uh, unfortunately perished pr potentially because of the bad weather that was going on in that area. Just heartbreaking loss of life for men in their 20s. And, and Louis, this is just the latest in a series of deadly crashes involving military aircraft. Have these been concerns been now escalated at the Pentagon? Well, Elizabeth, it's always a concern whenever there is any kind of an aviation accident involving any kind of hardware that the military flies because essentially it could be a potential risk for throughout the force. So whenever something like this happens, there is an investigation that's launched particular into that type of airframe. Um, they try to, to figure out exactly where, where there are many kind of weather conditions, uh, were there any, was there any other conditions that may have impacted the pilot's ability to fly their aircraft. But what we've seen now, particularly with the Ospreys over the last two months is that they've been grounded around the world because of a deadly crash off the coast of Japan two months ago. Luis Martinez, thank you, as always, for following this for us. Now to a new record on Wall Street. The S&P 500, which tracks America's 500 biggest companies and reflects most retirement accounts, closed above 5,000 for the first time ever today. It has notched 10 all-time highs just so far this year. Behind this rally on Wall Street is strength in the economy, inflation is improving, consumers are upbeat, and employers hiring at a fast pace. There's a new stunning report out today from the FTC on how much Americans are losing to scams. The study from the Federal Trade Commission shows that U.S. consumers lost more than $10 billion to fraud last year. That is the highest amount on record, up 14% from the year before. The number one place that people are losing money, $4.6 billion total, is to investment scams. Americans lost another $2.7 billion to imposter scams. And where the, that's where thieves pretend to be a business or person that you trust, convince you to send them money. And email was the most common method used by these fraudsters, followed by phone calls and then texts. Coming up, we do have a major development after a teenage boy allegedly shot a tourist and fired at an officer in Times Square. What the New York Police Department is saying, that story after the break.
whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Oh, my God. Oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Oh, Wait, I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. A manhunt in New York City is now over after police say they caught a 15-year-old who allegedly shot a tourist and fired at a responding officer in Times Square. Police say it all unfolded when three teenage boys were stopped by a security guard at the front door of a clothing and sneaker store after stealing merchandise. One of the boys then took out a gun and fired toward the security guard, instead shooting a 38-year-old woman visiting New York. Let's turn to ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky, who's been following the latest on this. Aaron, what are you learning about this teen who was taken into custody and, and what about the other uh, boys who were with him? So the other two are still in custody, Elizabeth, and they don't quite know the police what their role, if any, was. So they're, they're trying to sort that out, but they are confident now they have the shooter, a 15-year-old identified as Jesus Figueroa. He arrived in the United States from Venezuela in September, and he had been living in a, in a migrant shelter, as so many others have of late. Uh, and he was shoplifting, police say, on Thursday evening at that sporting goods store there. And you see him there in white pull out a gun after he was confronted by a security guard and opened fire, hitting a tourist, a Brazilian woman, who we spoke to and who said she came from Brazil, a dangerous place, comes to New York, and now she feels a little scared, understandably so. When he bolted from the store and officers gave chase, police say he fired twice at the officers. They weren't hit. They were not able to return fire because of the crowds. He disappeared into the subway, but he was caught late today in Yonkers, just north of New York City, uh, and now uh, he is going to be charged, potentially, with the attempted murder of a police officer. And terrifying for that tourist who was caught in the middle. Aaron Katursky, thank you for all of your reporting on this. Coming up, apparently there's some big football game this weekend. I don't know. Excitement is building for it. It's called the Super Bowl. The Chiefs and the 49ers are facing off, and we're going to go to Las Vegas right after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so
so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Martha Raddatz in Lviv, Ukraine. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Excitement is building in Las Vegas just two days before America's biggest sporting event of the year. A live look here at Allegiant Stadium hosting the Super Bowl on Sunday. Thousands of football fans have already descended on Las Vegas as the city prepares for Sunday's matchup between the San Francisco 49ers and the Kansas City Chiefs. ABC's Melissa Don is live in Las Vegas covering all of these events leading up to the big game. Okay, Melissa, definitely got one of the worst assignments this week. I don't know how you got this one. Talk about the atmosphere and experience there right now. It is so amazing. Elizabeth, go figure, and you know this out of anyone. For the economy, this is incredible for Las Vegas. Their first Super Bowl, and where we're standing is actually inside the Super Bowl experience. The NFL does this always leading up to Super Bowls, and it's become such an event. We're talking about thousands and thousands of people that can come inside here and check things out. Like you see behind me, the helmets. Those are some of the exact helmets with some of the signatures of some of the favorite players around me. You have areas with some of their jerseys that you can check out, the foot balls and even some of the activities some folks saw me earlier on news live partake in but it is a lot of fun because of course on this game day we're talking about 72,000 people filling up the stands but Vegas expecting more than 300,000 visitors just here so yes Elizabeth Vegas is happy they are making money they are happy you're happy I hope you're gonna get some souvenirs while you're there you know every game starts off with a coin toss and this year at the Super Bowl there's gonna be a special honorary coin toss captains what can you tell us about that melissa Elizabeth, this story really is so special to me. You know, so many of us covered the uh, Maui wildfires, and we know what happened to the community of Lahaina. So it actually was six months yesterday was the anniversary of the Maui wildfires that just destroyed and ravaged Lahaina. Well, guess what? The Lahaina Luna High School football coaches and players, they're going to be the surprise, or now special, rather, honorary coin toss captains. So that's going to be really remarkable because they... Even so, what happened with the fire, played their season, had a shortened season, but an amazing one because of the really well-known good football team. They made it to the playoffs for the state championships. And now, Elizabeth, they made it to the Super Bowl. So we're so excited. We're going to be cheering them on come Oh, Sunday. I love that. And I know you'll be cheering. You've been covering that story so closely. I got to say, though, are you going to go to the game or are you just going to be, like, standing outside, Melissa? Okay, so last year I stood outside. This year I stood outside, I, but I'm getting closer. This year where the media is, it's a little bit closer to the stadium. So I was like, well, okay, Every come on, year. one year I'll be in there. <laughs> we know you'll get there one day soon. Melissa Adan, thank you so much. We do have much more news ahead here on ABC News Live. In today's big story, President Biden facing growing questions about his mental acuity after that scathing report describing his memory as hazy and faulty. How is age going to affect the race for the White House as voters prepare for a potential rematch between two elderly candidates? I'll speak with a presidential historian. And in our spotlight, the use of magic mushrooms is on the rise, along with seizures by law enforcement. Our panel weighs in on whether it's time to re-examine Silas Ivan.
y'all tuning in for Taylor Swift, you're gonna be tuning in for Usher too. You're gonna do it, do it big. Oh my God. They say Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy, you should put Super Bowl on there too. Baby, let me love you Usher now. Raymond is going to get shirtless. I don't think it'll break any FCC violations. <laughs> Go shirtless. Hey man, that's what I do. It's <laughs> Usher, baby. Yeah! Usher, my way to the Super Bowl. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamau Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. President Biden is facing growing questions over his mental fitness as age becomes a top issue in the race for the White House. I'm Elizabeth Schulze in Washington. In today's big story, the president lashing out in response to the Justice Department's special counsel report describing his memory as hazy and faulty. How will age impact the election as voters prepare for a potential rematch between two elderly candidates? I'll speak with a presidential historian. And in our spotlight, the use of magic mushrooms is on the rise, along with seizures by law enforcement. Our panel weighs in on the microdosing trend. We begin with our big story as President Biden's age and mental acuity take center stage in the 2024 presidential campaign. A recent NBC poll finds that three out of four voters say they have moderate to major concerns that President Biden's physical and mental health is not strong enough for a second term. The president reacting with defiance last night after the release of the special counsel's report that did not recommend charges against him for his handling of classified documents, but did describe him as an elderly man with a poor memory. Take a look at what I've done since I've become president. None of you thought I could pass any of the things I got passed. How'd that happen? Joining us now is ABC News contributor and presidential historian Mark Updegrove. Mark, thanks so much for being here. I do want to get your reaction to the president's response to this report and also how damaging you think this was for him politically. Of course, he was exonerated legally. Yeah, I think that the, the the defensive tone of that press conference probably helped, hurt President Biden a little bit. I think he, you could see he took a, a exception 
to the conclusion of the, the special counsel about his mental acuity, and he was trying to show in a very forceful manner that he was on top of his game, that he has, has performed well as president, and that there is uh, no mental acuity that has been a, a factor for him in his presidential performance to this point. So I, there's no question that that defensive uh, 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 the, the, the defensiveness uh, that, that he showed yesterday, I think, was b both uh, hurt him and and helped him. It, it helped to show that he had the energy uh, and the, uh, uh, the the will to defend his presidency. But I think it it hurt in terms of the the passion with which he put forth in in uh, sounding that message. It sounded defensive. And as this conversation around age has resurfaced, Mark, you know, some remember back in 1984 when 73 year old President Reagan was running for reelection. He made this joke about his age in a presidential debate with his opponent, Walter Mondale. Take a listen. I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> We know President Biden has tried to make jokes about his own age. Doesn't seem that those have fully landed, at least according to some voter sentiment in the polls. And he is the oldest president. You know, are we in a similar moment in history at all here? I don't think so. I mean, Reagan was an actor. Uh, and he was enormously popular. When Reagan went into the 1984 election, he had an approval rating of 58 percent. America was far less polarized. Americans generally felt that America was going in the right direction. So the circumstances were far different. Of course, Biden has an approval rating that, that uh, has generally been below 40 percent. America is far more polarized, and there's far greater divisions in America today. I think their ages are slightly different, too. Reagan was 73 when he made that statement, and there, there had been signs that he was slipping a little mentally. Uh, but our, our candidates today are substantially older. Uh, Ronald Reagan was 77 when he finished out his term. Uh, Donald Trump is 77 now, and of course, Joe Biden is 81. So the circumstances, Elizabeth, were, were far greater. And there was a likability to Ronald Reagan. You could see there that his opponent, even his opponent, Walter Mondale, uh, laughed at that, that quip, which is uh, a, a famous moment in presidential uh, election history. Well, I want to tap into your wealth of knowledge in history. Take us through some of these other presidential races where age has become really a central defining issue. I think the one that comes to mind that's most recent, Elizabeth, is, is 1996, when uh, the, the incumbent president, Bill Clinton, was squaring off against his Republican challenger, Bob Dole. And at the time, Dole was 73 years old, and there was some doubts about his performance uh, in the job. There was a, a, a famous Newsweek cover that's, that was titled Doubts About Dole. And Time Magazine had a cover that you're showing now. Is Dole too old for the job? He seemed somewhat detached. He seemed uh, to lack energy. And there were photographs and stories about him that reinforced that image. Image is paramount to the presidency. The, the image that, that a president uh, or a presidential candidate projects is absolutely vital to his success in the job and his success among voters. So I think that's the last example of when uh, age really played into the prospects for a particular presidential candidate. And as you point out, it is a very different moment now. The polls have indicated folks do want this generational change with younger candidates, but yet the parties put forward these candidates. What do you make of this reality we are in now, you know, still nine months out from Election Day? I think the, the, uh, the Trump phenomenon is, uh, is truly anomalous for a variety of reasons. It's almost a cult of personality. And the very fact that uh, this president who was elected out of office in, in 2020 and, and helped to incite the coup on, on January 6th, the, the fact that he's still a viable presidential candidate is, is remarkable. For Joe Biden, though, it's, it's more uh, explainable. This is somebody who's performed well in the job, uh, as he talked about last night in that vigorous defense of his presidency. And I, I, I think uh, for, for Joe Biden, he believes he's up to the task of another term. 
Uh, Americans don't believe that, uh, as you see in those polls. They don't believe that, that uh, either candidate uh, is the best candidate necessarily for their parties. But we like generational change, Elizabeth, and you see that with in, in 1960 when John F. Kennedy took the presidency, succeeding the oldest president in history to that point, Dwight Eisenhower at age 70, uh, as the youngest uh, president-elect at, at 43. America is a young, vigorous nation, and we, I think we like our, our leaders to project that youthful energy and vigor. Mark Updegrove, thanks so much for your analysis and an important moment in history right now. Thank you. Let's bring the big story to our panel. Joining us today is ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse, ABC News contributor and former Republican Congresswoman for the state of Virginia, Barbara Comstock, ABC News contributor and former Democratic Senator Heidi Heitkamp, and ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper. Thank you all for being here on this Friday. Heidi, I want to start with you because we did see this very aggressive pushback from the White House today and from the president himself last night. What do you see as the best strategy when it comes to tackling these questions and doubts about President Biden's age and mental acuity? I think the best strategy last night would have been said to say, look, that's not how I remember the interview. I'm sorry that this very Republican uh, prosecutor wants to make a big deal out of this. This was gratuitous, you know. And I think I, I think that being defensive was not a good look because it made it look like anytime you're really defensive about something, it's like it hits pretty close to home. And mm. so I think yeah, it could have been handled better. And Mike, you know, clearly President Biden was defensive, saying that this is not an issue that, that the, he, he kind of pointed the finger at the press about making this an issue. Do voters care about age? I mean, we heard from Mark Updegrove there that this dates back. This is not the first time we're talking about age. And, and this really is an unprecedented situation with the president being 81 years old. It is, and no matter what happens, uh, who wins between former President Trump or current President Biden, uh, both gentlemen will be the oldest elected president entering the United States. Uh, your previous guest, Mark, was absolutely right when in terms of America loves youthfulness and vigor. Uh, the difference, that, that was a good question you asked him, Elizabeth Schulte, about President Reagan. Uh, the difference from that time period to this time period is that we have social media. And so we're always seeing constantly now images of not only our presidents, but of our other elected officials uh, from the Senate and the House and our governors. And so we're constantly seeing visuals of this. I do believe voters do care about the age uh, of both candidates. And I think it's important that President Biden accepts it, leans in, uh, not be defensive about it, and figure out a narrative of it, just as former President Trump has found a way to create that narrative. Uh, what's interesting, Elizabeth, is when do we go from the conversation of age limits to actually term limits? And I think that's mm -hmm. actually what Americans are really asking for is term limits. Well, that was the perfect so You must have known that I wanted to ask Barbara Comstock <laughs> about that because we have heard calls for term limits. And you're right to point out it isn't just President Biden, former President Trump, just a couple years younger than Biden. And we've heard candidates like Nikki Haley say maybe there should be term limits, maybe there should be mental competency tests. I don't know, Barbara, is that something that we should be talking more seriously about in this moment? Is that where the public is right now? Well, I mean, that's Nikki Haley's argument really is that neither of these guys are up for the game. Look at me and, and talking about effectiveness. And while I don't think effective, you know, effectiveness is more important than age. You know, I mean, Nancy Pelosi, who is much older than Kevin McCarthy or Mike Johnson, ran circles around them. But Nikki Haley has made, I think, an important argument on this front. Unfortunately, it's not gaining traction in the Republican Party. She also should maybe point out the number 91 in terms of 91 counts and, and his indictments are more important than maybe age two. And Avery, let me bring you in here. You've been out on the campaign trail a lot talking to voters. What do you hear from people on this question of age and this need to put forward these a generation of younger candidates and why there's this sort of resignation that here we are and you know this is the matchup it's not, it's too late for any sort of change. 
Right. Uh, when I'm out on the campaign trail, listen, voters on both sides of the aisle are talking about uh, the ages of both of these candidates. Uh, but we do see a disparity in terms of how concerned uh, they are. When we look at our, our last ABC News uh, Washington Post poll, we asked back in September, uh, we asked folks how concerned they were about the age uh, of President Biden. Uh, three quarters of Americans said that Biden was too old to serve, while only half said the same about Trump. Uh, and so there, there is this real concern concern about out there about uh, how old these guys are. But uh, those are the choices that uh, we have right now. The Democratic Party, uh, the Biden campaign is going to be more focused on defining Biden as a better choice than former President Trump, uh, than trying to convince you that he's young and sprightly, because that's just not something they're going to be able to do. Uh, Liz, if I can camp. jump in really quickly. Please, Mike. I think what Avery said was really interesting, and she's right. But I think it goes to the question that you asked me about the American public and what do they care about. Avery invoked polls. I think even the way the framing of the poll question is wrong, where it's framing President Biden as the only elderly candidate in the race, where former President Trump is just three years younger. So I think the media, and I'm putting the responsibility on us, needs to do a better job in creating not the disparity between Biden as elderly, but looking at both candidates, because only a three-year age difference. And I think that is what uh, the frustration could be uh, from the American public, that it's one-sided. And a great point, too, that it isn't just age, it's ability to do the job but of course so much of this has been muddled by some of those assertions that we got in that report yesterday from the special counsel guys thanks so much for a great conversation mike barbara heidi and avery thank you all so much we're going to shift gears a little bit when we come up in the spotlight talking about magic mushrooms how and why more people in the u.s are using psychedelic the psychedelic i'm going to talk about the shrooms boom with the panel coming up after the break Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Definitely. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Oh, my God. Oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. So the question is... Okay, here we go. Oh are you kidding me? What would you do? You just won't believe what people do when they think no one's watching. And this season, I brought Sarah Haynes and Kamal Bell along for the ride. All right, let's break it. Is John Theonis here? Oh, my I was here all the time. The all-new season of What Would You Do? premieres Sunday, February 18th on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Do you think you're a better mom on mushrooms? I think I'm a more empathetic mom. And I actually started listening and looking at my kid from the heart. That's our Eva Pilgrim reporting on the growing popularity of magic mushrooms across the U.S. And in today's spotlight, 
we're looking at how and why people are getting into the psychedelic, including a new study from the National Institute on Drug Abuse that says law enforcement seizures of magic mushrooms has increased dramatically in recent years. Let's bring back our panel, Barbara Heidi, and joining us for this panel is ABC News contributor and op-ed columnist for the Los Angeles Times, Elsie Granderson, and ABC News medical contributor, Dr. Darian Sutton. Dr. Sutton, got to start with you on this one. Tell us exactly what is psil psilocybin yep. and how does it work? So psilocybin is the active ingredient inside the, these mushrooms, which gives them the name magic mushrooms or shrooms. So we know historically and from data that it activates serotonin receptors in the brain that can be associated with mood and cognition, which is probably a part of the reason why there has been found to be some benefit in certain studies, although not robust in terms of treatment for things like PTSD, depression, and anxiety. This is a chemical that has a, a, a long history, more than 8,000 years, and now we're starting to see a rise in its use. So this microdosing has become popular with shrooms. Are there any safety concerns associated with this as this gains popularity? Yeah, there are. You know, as an emergency physician, I have to say that there are some concerns that can, that, that can become an immediate emergency. For one, these types of chemicals can destabilize someone. They can lead to an increased risk of a, psych a psychotic episode. They can e even increase one's risk of ideas of self-harm or suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. um, and so for that reason, and also not knowing its potency and possible drug interactions, you have to be really cautious with these types of substances. Dr. Darian Sutton, our medical correspondent, always laying this out very clearly for us. Barbara, this landscape is clearly evolving when it comes to recreational drug use. The study we mentioned shows that researchers found that seizures of these magic mushrooms has been going up, especially in the Midwest. What do you make of this? Well, I'm certainly very concerned and, and certainly skept, you know, skeptical about you know, how, whether this should be accepted or anything. I understand some people, if this helps with depression or PTSD, others that haven't been responsive to things, that this might be helpful. But obviously, it has to be very controlled and researched a lot more and looked at, but not in a recreational way. We have seen states like Colorado and Oregon legalize therapeutic psilocybin use. Uh, at the top of the segment, you heard that mom telling Eva Pilgrim how magic mushrooms really did change her life. LZ, do you see this becoming the norm in more states? Do you see more states passing laws like those? Well, certainly if they follow the pattern that happened with recreational medical marijuana, it certainly seems that way. But I think what really needs to happen before that is that we adjust to where we talk about recreational drugs in general. Uh, because the tone really was set by President Nixon's war on drugs, which wasn't based on science or research, but rather prejudice. And so, you know, I think we need to rejigger how we think about this. We certainly know during the Prohibition era that Americans are going to do what Americans want to do when it comes to drugs. So maybe this time around, we could be more thoughtful about it and have policies based on science and not prejudice and emotional responses. Hmm. Heidi, we'd love to get your response to that. And are, is there this attitude shift toward psychedelics and you know that we kind of saw with mar the same with recreational marijuana use is this an issue for voters as they consider you know what their votes are going to be at the ballot box you know, I, I used to do drug enforcement in North Dakota and I've watched as there's the growth of all of these products that are asking people to use something that is not normally occurring in their body to change the, their state of mind um, we have a drug problem in this country. And so to, to say, okay, that, nothing to see here. We're just going to let this catch fire the way we did uh, recreational marijuana use. I think that is a trend that we should not, it's, it's a treadmill we should not get on. And one of the reasons why this is so dangerous is because over the years, we have not researched these products because they haven't had medicinal uses otherwise and so we've got we've got the use ahead of the science here always important to know the risks even if there are those benefits guys barbara heidi lz and dr sutton thank you all so much coming up on our last call excitement is building for the big game this weekend it's the chiefs and the 49ers facing off in the super bowl our panel is going to pick who they think is going to walk away with that lombardi trophy coming up next
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the 2024 campaign trail in North Charleston, South Carolina, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is a live look here at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas, hosting the 58th Super Bowl on Sunday. And in our last call, the excitement is building. We are just a couple days, now hours away from America's biggest sporting event of the year. The San Francisco 49ers are facing off against the Kansas City Chiefs as the Sin City gears up for the big game, along with Usher's highly anticipated 15-minute halftime show. And Taylor Swift, of course, expected to be in the stands too. Thousands of fans are there already, ready to go. Let's discuss with our panel, Mike, Barbara, Heidi, and LZ. All right, Mike, a lot to get to here. 49ers are back to try to be the champion for the first time since 1995. Chiefs are eyeing a back-to-back -back win. Who are you rooting for here? Elizabeth, it's not going to happen for the 49ers. I'm sorry. Uh, this is Mahomes <laughs> Super Bowl. This is the Chiefs to take. If they win, they will be uh, one of the few teams that have won three Super Bowls in five years. Mahomes is so good down the stretch. He's good with the pressure moments. But Mr. Irrelevant, uh, Purdy of the 49ers has a lot to prove. Can he be Mr. Relevant? I say no, Schulze. You say no. All right, Heidi, what about you? A, what are you watching, the game or the halftime show or the commercials? What are you in it for? Well, I'm, def I'm definitely watching the game. I love football. And because the 49ers beat the Green Bay Packers, and I always like to think, well, if only Green Bay were there, they would have won. They would have won. I'm, I'm, I'm with the 49ers. I think they're going to take this. I'm for anyone who beats the Green Bay Packers. So there you go for that. I, what, Barbara, what about you? Who are you rooting for? <laughs> um, I'm Team Taylor Swift. She's been driving the football economy, helping the economy. But I also watch for the halftime and the commercials. <laughs> uh, I mean, look, LZ, you've talked about how we need this new rivalry here. We've we've seen this insane boost. The Swift effect is, I guess, not really a rivalry. But look, is this the rivalry we are looking for, Chiefs, 49ers? What do you make about all the hype outside of the game, too? Well, first of all, Patrick Mahomes 